Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. So undoubtedly, some of you guys are probably like, Rob, didn't you already do this? Well, the answer is yes, but not really. As a YouTuber, <laughs> <laughs> As a YouTuber, channels grow, channels expand, and they change over time. And, and you know, I do it, and I know that Benny does it. You know, we go back and we look at our old videos, and we're like, man, I can make that better. Like, I can, I can improve on that in some form or fashion. Sometimes you can't, but sometimes you can. Like, for example, what I'm going to do uh, probably in the next few months or so is I'm probably going to go back and I might remaster Infinity Gauntlet, and then I'll go into Infinity War, Infinity Crusade, and all that kind of stuff, and just do all the Infinity stories leading up to Infinity finale I think which is where Adam Warlock becomes the new living tribunal but you go back and you look at things and, and you, you kind of want to change it and going through I was going through the, the playlist for you know really Hickman's Avengers the new Avengers it was just called time runs out at that point I realized that one I only really did time runs out and two I just didn't like it I just didn't really care for those videos that was back when I was going back and forth on whether or not I wanted to keep my channel I didn't like the direction it was going in didn't like where I was and in kind of a bad spot with you know a lot of personal issues that I had and so I said okay let's just wipe all that out and let's just do it again those videos will probably stay up but we're going to go through and we're going to cover this so for those of you guys who don't know hickman's avengers and new avengers was basically the lead up to secret wars it was the collapse of the multiverse but this is a hickman story and not only that hickman stories can also be read self-contained and so if you chose to you could read avengers and new avengers separately right up until i want to say you get into the the issue number 20s of avengers and then avengers and new avengers start crossing over and so you have to read one to understand what's going on in the other but for the first you know I'd say maybe four or five volumes of Avengers. Uh, you could really just read it by itself. You don't have to tie into new Avengers, but assuming that this has any, anybody cares, <laughs> we're going to do both. Now also keep in mind that with Hickman, you, we can read like Fantastic Four and then Secret Warriors and Shield, and then we can read Avengers and new Avengers by themselves. We don't have to read anything else in Marvel Comics, just those. But what he does in the first volume here with these, these only really two issues is he basically just like retells the origin of the Marvel Universe. And that's, that's why I like this. That's why I think it's so good because when it came to the idea of recreating or really just kind of eliminating the multiverse things had to be started from scratch it was really just working from the ground up and that's why this is cool is because you don't have to read anything prior to hickman's avengers and new avengers to understand what's going on what he tells us is that in the beginning of all things there was suddenly just darkness you know, it was, it's pretty straightforward. There was darkness, there was light, things came into existence, you know, and then that was it. Now, what he's gonna do is go back and modify the history of the Marvel Universe a little bit, and we'll get to that here in a second. But what we end up doing is we actually end up, he kind of gives us this synopsis of like, here are things to come. Because remember, when Hickman writes stories, he starts at the end and works his way to the beginning. And so he already knew how all, all the things were gonna end. That's why we get things like, you know, the, the fall of the Avengers. We get Ex Nihilo first and Terraforming Mars. We have the war with the Shi'ar Empire you know, the, the collapse of all things in existence, the death of Thor Odin's son. We get all these really, really cool things, or I guess it was really the death of Odin's son and Hyperion. But what he says is that all this stuff originated, it started with two men. It started with Tony Stark and it started with Captain America. Now, the other cool thing about this too is that he kind of teases things a little bit, right? You know, when, when Tony Stark goes in and says, hey, Cap, wake up, we need to have a conversation, the two of them start to talk, but Captain America kind of references some nightmares he's been having where he sees Reed Richards, Namor the Submariner, Black Bolt, and Black Panther. Now, we know just by virtue of having done this before, those guys are the Illuminati, and they'd effectively wipe the memory of Captain America. We'll find out why later on, but when uh, when Steve Rogers, you know, meets up with Tony Stark, what the two of them do is they basically start talking about expansion. They start talking about creating an Avengers world, because keep in mind, over the course of the history of, of the Avengers mythos, and this is really kind of going back, or really, you know, hearkening back to the early days, the Avengers had started small, they grew into something huge, and they went small again. What I mean here is when the Avengers were first created in Marvel Comics, it was just a handful of guys. You had Hank Pym, Janet Van Dyne. Uh, the Incredible Hulk was there for a while, then he bailed out. You had Captain America, who was discovered later on. You had Thor, you had Tony Stark. You had maybe six or seven people. That was it. But as time progressed and the Avengers became more and more popular, what Marvel started doing is they started using the Avengers team as a way to introduce new characters. And so they would create somebody new, they'd throw them on the Avengers roster for, you know, 10, 15 issues. And if people 
like that character, they'd be rolled over into more publications and possibly get their own title. But because of this, you know, the Avengers roster exploded. I mean, there was a point where it was massive. Now, all this seemed to really come to a head when we basically got West Coast Avengers. And it was Marvel essentially splitting the Avengers roster in two. So you had the main Avengers team operating out of New York, and then you had West Coast Avengers. So you had like, uh, really it was James Rhodes uh, operating as Iron Man, who was, you know, running that whole show. But you also had Scarlet Witch, you had Vision, who were there for a while before they branched off into their own title. But it was a way to kind of split the titles. That way people wouldn't be overwhelmed by the number of things. And you wouldn't have a story where you had 50 people all fighting against, you know, one enemy. It, it kept things reasonable. The kicker with this was that eventually it all coalesced back into a single Avengers title again. And so as time progressed, this began to wax and wane and change more and more until we eventually got around to Avengers Disassembled under Joe Quesada as it was written by Brian Michael Bendis, I think. And this ended up with uh, resulting in the Avengers disbanding in their entirety and then Bendis coming back and creating new Avengers and basically starting from scratch. And so that's just kind of a quick little history lesson about the Avengers team. There's a lot more to their history than that, which I've got a video on the Avengers Explained if you want to check it out. But from here, we actually end up jumping to a month after this conversation between Steve Rogers and Tony Stark, where they talk about expanding the Avengers team overall. And we end up picking up on Mars. Now, this is where Hickman just starts introducing all new stuff. I mean, none of this stuff has been seen before. Like none of these things have appeared before in Marvel Comics. This is all brand new stuff. Aleph, uh, Ex Nihilo. I mean, th this this is all totally different, you know, totally, totally a change. Abyss was also a really cool concept too. Now, Abyss, I think may have appeared now that I think about it before, but at the very least, how we're seeing the character of Abyss in this story, how she's portrayed, is unique in and of itself to, to Hickman's writing. But what happens is Ex Nihilo, I wouldn't necessarily say is the leader here so much as he's the most vocal of the three. And they begin talking about the nature of Earth and what it is that they're doing on Mars. And it's come to the attention of Aleph, Ex Nihilo, and Abyss that Earth is sending Avengers to uh, to Mars. And so what we end up doing is picking up with, you know, Thor and Black Widow and, and Captain America, Iron Man, so on, as they make their way to Mars. Mars. The reason why they're there is because of the fact that these guys on Mars, Ex Nihilo and them, had actually started sending bombs to Earth that basically jump-started the evolution. Now, again, all this will start to make sense as we progress through this story, but of course we have Hulk and we have these different guys showing up doing the best they can, but they're almost immediately defeated. Not only that, Abyss starts to tap into the mind of the Incredible Hulk, starts to manipulate him by saying, hey, look, you know, you're under my influence now. Yes, I realize how powerful you are, and yes, Hulk is supposed to be the strongest one there is, but that guy Thor over there thinks he's stronger than you. That guy Thor believes he's the strongest one there is. Now, the reason why this works, and the reason why I think Hickman did such a damn good job writing this, is because in his Savage Hulk form, the Hulk's not that bright. He's easily manipulated. He's easily controlled. Uh, all you have to do is just kind of alter his perception of what's going on in the world. This isn't Joe Fix-It. You know, this isn't, you know, Professor Hulk. This is Savage Hulk. This is just your force of nature, easy to manipulate, incredible Hulk. And so because of this, it's really just, you know, Hulk taking on Thor for a short amount of time. Now, of course, Captain America steps in, but then he's forced to go against the left. And so the idea is that they all seem to be, you know, getting decimated in some form or another, getting absolutely crushed. But what they also end up doing, and this is actually one of the coolest parts of the story, is when all these Avengers are defeated, they take Captain America, they take his shield, they throw it on a ship, and they send it back to Earth. And what he says, is that this is a warning. We're going to send him back to Earth and show your best and brightest could not stand against us. These, these greatest superheroes, the most capable superheroes, the bravest ones you have cannot stand against us. What we are bringing to your planet is something that cannot be stopped. And so again, what we end up having here is Steve Rogers realizing what they're up against. And he effectively activates Avengers world in the sense that he starts calling in everybody. It's literally this wake the world initiative. And it's so cool because then we start getting Hyperion. We get Cap Captain Universe. I mean, it's, it's, it's. <laughs> Anyone who has ever been part of the Avengers roster, or at least the more powerful of them, end up being grabbed and brought in here. Now, initially, we're not really told exactly how this came together. We're not told, you know, how these different people were picked. But what happens is we're actually given this explanation as time goes on throughout this particular story, especially once we get into, you know, the, the second issue here. Initially, it picks up with these Avengers being held captive, you know, the, the prime Avengers being held captive. Now, the coolest thing about this, and this is really what I like about Hickman, Hickman's really, really good at drawing on previous stories that were majorly impacted impactful. For example, Giant Size X-Men issue number one. That was the landmark X-Man story. You, you ask anybody, you, you go out and talk to anybody, say, hey, what is the most significant story in the history of the X-Men? They're going to give you a handful of answers. You can count them on one hand. They'll give you Days of Future Past. They'll give you uh, Giant Size X-Men issue number one. They might even give you the original X-Men issue number one. They'll give you things like maybe House of M or something like that. But Giant Size X-Men issue number one, in my mind, is the most important of the X-Men stories because that was a transition. That was the Lin Wine, Chris 
Claremont transition from the old style Jack Kirby Stan Lee X-Men to the new generation of Chris Claremont's run on the X-Men. But that original story centered on the new generation of X-Men, Wolverine, Storm, Colossus, Nightcrawler, so on and so forth, being led by Cyclops to basically go back and save the original X-Men. That's exactly what's happening here with Hickman. Now he does it in his own style, he does it in his own way, and it works really, really well. Not only that, as they're going through and they're analyzing these different members of the Avengers, they analyze Thor, and they come to the realization that he's not a traditional Earthling. He's not an Earth-born superhero. He's from Asgard. He's a god. Now, the cool thing about this with Ex Nihilo asking these questions is Ex Nihilo is like, do you have a creation story? You know, what awaits you when it comes to your life? You know, how, how does your how does your, your primitive mind view the universe? Was there a time when your universe came into existence? And is there a time where the universe will end and you'll be reborn? Or is it just apocalypse? You'll die and you'll never come back. Now, we know that Thor has Ragnarok. Now, to sidetrack here for a second, <laughs> <laughs> and this is why I love this, because when it comes to Hickman's stories, it's what he doesn't say that makes all the makes the story so much more impactful. Thor just gives Ex Nihilo a look, but behind his eyes and behind the scene, you know, behind the scenes in his mind, we know there's Ragnarok. In Marvel Comics, for years and years and years and years and years, Marvel teased Ragnarok forever. They were like, oh, is Ragnarok coming? Ragnarok might be coming, you know? And, you know, and it was this, <laughs> this crazy thing, you know, we never knew if it was actually going to happen. But what ends up taking place in the Thor disassembled story in Ragnarok is we actually learn that it's a real thing. That Odin is basically defeated by Surtur and is effectively dead. Loki takes Surtur alongside with a host of Asgard's greatest enemies, the giants and the rock giants and so on and so forth, and leads them in an invasion against Asgard. Thor calls in Captain America and Iron Man. You know, they're, they're able to fight off the forces of Loki, but Thor ends up undertaking this task, becomes Rune King Thor, where he's like multiversally powerful. But at the end of the story, we learn that Ragnarok was a repeating cycle that for however many millennia, since the very beginning of all things, that have ever existed that Asgard existed. Ragnarok happened. That everybody in Asgard died, they were reborn, and the entire cycle kept repeating itself over and over and over again. And this destruction of Asgard and rebirth of Asgard was letting off life energy that was absorbed by the ones who sit above in shadow. And so that was one of the really cool things. Like Hickman really just draws on this and doesn't even tell us that. He doesn't even tell us Thor's thinking about Ragnarok. But if we know about Thor, we're like, yes, Thor's thinking about Ragnarok. And so what happens is Ex Nihilo goes back and he he says, okay, here's how things work. All right. And this, this is why, this is why things work with Jonathan Hickman, because in a lot of ways he requires us to sort of know, or at the very least to, to do our own, own bit of research, but that's why I'm here. <laughs> so what he says is that, you know, at the dawn of everything, at the dawn of all existence, that the oldest and most ancient race were the builders. Now this is him retconning things to a degree. This is him changing things to a degree. We know that in Marvel comics that, you know, earth one really is, or I guess earth, Earth Zero, whatever you want to call it, the, the universe prior to the main Marvel universe was where Galen came from. He was a space explorer, you had the Dweller in Darkness, the Emkron crystal was cracked, all that kind of good stuff, but it resulted in the universe being destroyed, coalescing back into a singular source of energy, which Galen was absorbed into, whereby it, you know, brewed and stirred into a cosmic egg and it exploded out into a new universe, which gave birth to the main Marvel universe as we know it prior to Secret Wars, of course, giving us Galactus and so on and so forth. Hickman keeps that. Hickman keeps that origin. He says, okay, that still in continuity, but somewhere along the line, these builders came into existence. Now, everything else spiraled out into existence as well. Now, he's going to go back and change a few things a little bit more as time goes on, because this is just given to us directly from Ex Nihilo. But for this story, for this point right now, the origin of the universe and the birth of Galactus is still in continuity. But he says that in the early days of their existence, the builders had essentially worshipped the universe itself. Now, what Hickman means here will become clear in the next little bit. But the result is that as time progressed, like any, you know, any society that lives long enough, it moves away from religion and starts focusing on science to exploration. And because of this, the builders basically took to the stars. And when they did this, they created what were called alephs or gardeners, and then they created people to tend these gardens. And so what happened is one of these gardeners, one of these guys, aleph, had undertaken the same process that all the other gardeners did, where they would basically go through and they would examine different planets. If the planets were moving along their evolutionary path adequately, they'd basically be left alone. But if the planets housed, you know, life that was considered to be uh, a failure, where they just didn't see it as being worthy of continued evolution, they would essentially wipe those planets clean. They would quite literally just cleanse them and then start all over again. And so that's what happened with one of these worlds that, uh, you know, this Aleph had essentially shown up there and said, okay, these planets are worthy of evolution. We're going to jumpstart their evolutionary process and allow them to continue. And then in turn, he also created uh, Ex Nihilo and his sister Abyss. And so the result is that as time progressed, they 
essentially worked as a triumvirate. They worked as a group of three who continued along this path of doing the exact same thing, that they would travel from world to world. They would decide if it was worthy of continued evolution or not. If it was not worthy of continued evolution, they would wipe it out, start all over again. If it was worthy, they would jumpstart this evolutionary process and send it into the next stage of existence. Now from here, we jump back to Captain America and Iron Man. And this is where we get this, this sort of question in terms of the expansion of the Avengers roster. Because when the two of them are talking to one another, of course, we have Captain Universe, we have Hyperion, we have Smasher. So we, we know this is after the introduction of Hyperion as a character. And we'll actually get into his origin story in the next video. But what happens here is they start looking around, they start combing around, and it's literally traveling and just seeing who it is that they can grab. They end up grabbing Wolverine when they say, hey man, we've got beer, <laughs> which makes sense. They grab Spider-Man when Tony Stark says, you know, we have money. Uh, they end up grabbing virtually everybody they can, you know, Shang-Chi, the whole nine yards, because the idea is to create a worldwide Avengers team to deal with threats all across the world. So think of what's happening right now with regards to uh, Tony Stark and Captain America as the Marvel equivalent or the Avengers equivalent to like Batman Incorporated you know, kind of like a superhero team worldwide or, you know, Batman team worldwide, something along those lines. But what we end up doing here is we actually jump to a guy named Eden. Now, Eden is a, is a really, really cool character. He is a, uh, he's a mutant that really goes by the code name Manifold, but he quite literally bends space and time. Now, this does not mean that he warps reality. He does not do that. What he does is he can teleport to any location by literally treating, treating space as a piece of paper and folding the ends to meet. And so he can teleport from one side of the universe to the other almost instantaneously because he's able to bend the fabric of reality in space and time. And so just think of him as like a universal teleporter is really his thing. Um, but from here, of course, you know, we end up seeing Spider-Woman. Uh, we end up having, you know, Carol Danvers uh, brought into the fold. But the reason why this matters is because all these characters will become wildly important as the series progresses. But again, you know, they, they're all just kind of, you know, coming on board with regards to Captain America's call. And the reason for this is because Earth has basically, again, been hit with all these gene bombs, these evolutionary bombs. And so people are being encased, you know, in these weird pods, and they're essentially having their evolution jump started and sped up. And it's hitting everywhere. I mean, it's not just hitting a couple places here and there. It's the Savage Land. It's Croatia. It's Norway. It's India. It's Japan. I mean, it's all over the world. And so it's literally a global attack. Now, the funny thing about this is that with Tony Stark, you know, still being held prisoner and talking to Action Hilo, in his mind, this is, you know, in Tony Stark's mind, it's hubris. It's extreme hubris to come along for Action Hilo to believe that he has the right to decide what races are worthy of evolution and which ones aren't. But from the perspective of Ex Nihilo, it's what he was made for. He's literally just carrying out what it is that he was made for. And so where he would look at Tony Stark and say, as a primitive earthling, as a primitive human, you exist to pass on your genes. I, as Ex Nihilo, exist to decide what worlds are worthy of continued evolution and which ones are not. And so because of this, you know, while this, this sort of give and take, while this conversation between these groups goes back and forth, we end up jumping back with, uh, with Captain America. Now, from here, the story moves moves forward pretty quickly. I mean, it's 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 pretty straightforward in terms of how things progress. Not only that, we also begin to see the introduction of Night Mask. So, for those of you guys who are, who have always been kind of curious about like Star Brand and Night Mask, where they come from, this is where they begin. You know, Night Mask begins with this Avengers story. Now, Star Brand is actually tied into Warren Ellis's New Universal, and Hickman's actually going to grab that when he launches the story, The Last White Event, which is one of the best stories of his run on Avengers and New Avengers. It's nothing. It's nothing short of spectacular. But when Captain America and his Avengers team show up here, they also show up in the midst of this birth, you know, basically of Night Mask. Now, what Ex Nihilo has done is he's effectively, you know, created Night Mask from scratch based off the human genome. Now, that wouldn't normally be something huge, but it is actually going to be a major focal point uh, as we get towards the end of this. But when Night Mask initially shows up, or I guess really his name's just Adam, he starts speaking builder machine code. And no one really knows what that means. And in fact, you know, it's it's kind of weird how it's explained, but it's basically, it seems like it's a code that only builders understand. The issue with this is that once Ex Nihilo begins to try to decipher what it is that Adam is saying, they're immediately attacked by the arrival of Captain America. And so from here, we get one of the coolest fights in the entire in the entire story where it's like the incredible hulk versus hyperion and it's 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 badass because hyperion is about as close as we get to well really to superman and marvel comics you know different characters represent different facets but in terms of like the overall you know well-rounded equivalent to superman and marvel hyperion's about as close as we get between origin stories powers so on and so forth but you know it's essentially you know captain america calling in the reserves spider woman wolverine carol danvers captain universe so on and so forth now captain universe is 
is one of the most important characters here. And the reason why is because Captain Universe, again, is not a singular superhero. Captain Universe binds itself to superheroes. And in fact, we actually see this taking place when the current host shows up and doesn't even know how she got there. Doesn't even know what's going on here. She's just kind of like, well, it's it's weird. You know, I, just, I felt like I blacked out and then suddenly I'm here. The, the battle's pretty straightforward in terms of people fighting. Of course, Thor summons his hammer, you know, and, and starts doing as best he can, holding off the different people as best he can. But it's really funny to see this entire event unfold because all this is, is just groundwork. It's setting the stage. But in the midst of all this, in the midst of this fighting, in the midst of all these battles, Adam is continuing to speak his, his builder machine code. And then suddenly, the entire situation is neutralized with the full emergence of Captain Universe. Now, when Captain Universe makes her presence known, this turns out to be the very being that the builders were worshiping when they were in their, you know, religious phase, when they were worshiping a religious entity. Now, of course, Aleph, as essentially a machine, doesn't see Captain Universe as an actual, you know, representation of the universe. It sees Captain Universe as a physical being, as, a, as an actual human being. Now, the reason for this is because, again, the Captain Universe is essentially the sentience of the universe to a degree. It's not really the universe itself, that's the form of eternity, but Captain Universe manifests in times of dire need when the universe itself is in danger. And so where we would literally just kind of look at this and say, oh, hey, cool, it's Captain Universe. What Hickman's telling us is that things are really about to get bad. <laughs> That if Captain Universe is here, that even if these guys don't know it yet, it means that things are going to pop off. Now, of course, when this Aleph tries to attack Captain Universe, it's like attacking the sentience of the universe itself, and this Aleph is, is easily obliterated. In response, Captain Universe takes Adam and basically says, I'm taking Adam back to Earth with me. Now, of course, when Ex Nihilo asks this question, well, why are you doing this? Captain Universe says, well, it's because of the fact that you made it human. You know, its home should be among humans. I decree it, therefore it will be that way. Now, of course, Ex Nihilo Hilo knows better than to do that. But when he asks, well, then what are we supposed to do? I mean, you know, our goal here was to basically, you know, jumpstart the evolutionary process of Earth. If that's not what we're supposed to do, then then what do we do? You know, and Captain Universe says, well, you have Mars, terraform Mars, grow life on Mars, you know, make Mars something significant. And so because of this, as Captain America and his team are leaving, and this is something that this is really where Hickman says things are about to pop off. Actually, Hilo tells Captain America, he says something I want you to think of you know, Cap, and, and he, he listens for a second. He says, we've raised countless worlds. We've, we've cleansed planet after planet after planet, but yours is the only one that Captain Universe stepped in to protect. Why do you think that is? Now, it's a it's a rhetorical question. It's not a question that's meant to be answered. It's a question that's meant to be pondered. Now, Captain America says it's because it's an Avengers world, but we're actually going to learn there's a lot more to this than, than is currently going on right now. But of course, again, this is really just Hickman setting the stage because this is what he does. This story may seem like it doesn't really lead into the collapse of the universe, and in and of itself, it doesn't. What this story was designed to do is to say, here's what the Avengers are. Here's where we stand when it comes to the Avengers mythos. Here is some of the most notable members of the team. It's him giving us a baseline. It's giving us a foundation by which to build. And damn, does he build. <laughs> But anyway, guys, if you're new here to Comics Explained, make sure you hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, leave a comment down below. Let me know what you guys think about Hickman's Avengers because it's, God, man, I'm, I'm just thinking about all the stuff that comes later on. Like when Hank Pym sees all the cosmic entities destroyed and when the Illuminati reforms, when Black, where Black Panther has to bring the Illuminati back together and when Captain America learns the truth about the Illuminati and then when he's, when he's hunting the Illuminati and then Infinity, like the Infinity event. And I'm just thinking of all these things, like the return of Thanos. It is, uh, whew. Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers is probably one of the greatest stories ever told. I'm just going to throw it out there. Like, to me, it it is incredible. I feel like Hickman writes the stories as like a book and then turns it in as a script and then somebody actually does the lettering and then somebody, you know, does the, it's, it's, it's amazing the way this gets done because it does such a, like, it tells such an incredible story. Now, here's a funny thing. This whole idea, again, basically starts the, the whole play of the collapse of the multiverse, which is to say the end of the Marvel Universe and then the starting of all new, all different Marvel. So it goes into Secret Wars and all that kind of good stuff. But like I said, it's it's a huge epic. So things just get crazy and crazy and crazy as, as time goes on. But initially what we do 
is we pick up in Wakanda about a day before really the, the current events. And so what we end up doing is of course, we follow the technologically advanced nature of Wakanda. Now, for those of you guys who are new to Marvel comics, who are new to like the Black Panther mythos, things like that, whether it's because you're getting into the movies or what have you, Wakanda is the most advanced city in the world. It's technologically advanced on a, on a multitude of different platforms. And the reason for this is because Wakanda is the only source of Wakandan vibranium. Remember, there's two types. There's anti-metal vibranium, which basically breaks down metal on the atomic level, which is what you find in the Antarctic or the Arctic or something along those lines. Wakandan vibranium can absorb sound and also amplify magic. And so because of that, it's actually the most sought after form of vibranium. But because Wakanda is the only place to get it, they can charge just insane rates for people to get a hold of it. Not, not to mention that they have like tons and tons of it. Now, keep in mind, this comes after Doom War. And so really with the events of Doom War taking place, Dr. Doom invading Wakanda, and of course you'll find that video down in the description, but Dr. Doom invading Wakanda for the purpose of basically trying to find a way to steal all the vibranium and amplify his own magical abilities for world domination. The response to this, the result, is that Black Panther rendered all vibranium across the world completely inert. Now the reason why that matters is because with vibranium being rendered useless, Wakanda basically, uh, basically destroyed his entire country's like social and economic structure. They had no means to generate money. They were just a country out there in Africa somewhere. And so because of this, uh, Black Panther, in addition to the Doom War events, had actually let his sister Shuri take his place and she became the new Black Panther. And the result was that T'Challa actually just became somewhat of a figurehead. But when the time came for him to basically retake his crown, it really wasn't there. It was, you destroyed everything that made our country what it is. You're not going to be Black Panther again. And so in this instance, because he's basically the smartest person in his country, his role has been confined more to like an advisory position and really more of like teaching and instruction. Now, because Wakanda is so advanced, they've charted all these aspects of the spaceways. I mean, they're not really launching ships into space, but they've charted all these different aspects of the spaceways. Their knowledge of science and technology is well beyond normal humans. And that's what this does. It initially emphasizes the idea that they're focusing on, you know, expanding their own, their own, you know, knowledge and, and so on and so forth. But what ends up happening is that in the midst of all this, T'Challa is actually sidetracked by the arrival of an Earth from another, presumably another dimension. Now, this is where things start to get kind of crazy and start to get kind of hairy because we don't know where this Earth came from. All we know is that this Earth is there. And so the question is, where did it come from? Well, this comes with the arrival of a character known as Black Swan. Now, this is when we start to get into like Thanos' Black Order to a degree. Um, really, Black Swan was never really part of the Black Order per se in terms of like what you think of Corvus Glaive, Ebony Maw, Proxima Midnight. Uh, the whole idea is that she actually joins it later on, but this sets the stage for all that stuff happening. Now, of course, they're actually speaking High Sumerian, a language that hasn't been spoken on Earth in, you know, years and years, you know, decades decades, thousands of years, probably not that knowledgeable about the Sumerian language. But the idea here is that Black Panther is able to understand her to a degree. But of course, once she starts speaking English, everything becomes a whole lot simpler. But this woman, Black Swan, starts speaking cryptically, talking about destroying a world, different things like that. And before Black Panther can stop her, not only does her, do her soldiers kill some of, his, uh, some of the people from his own tribe, uh, she ends up destroying the earth. Now, the death of some of these members of Black Panther's community is a no, no. Keep in mind, when it comes to T'Challa, he guards his his Wakandan uh, his Wakandan country jealously. Woe betide the poor soul who comes into his country and starts causing trouble, because chances are they won't make it out in one piece. The problem with this is, under normal circumstances, he would have killed her, no questions asked. She would have been done. It would have been one of those things. He would have killed her and buried her in the mountains, and that would have been the end of Black Swan. But because of the fact that she comes bearing, you know, this gift of destruction for a whole other world and blows the planet to pieces is he can't kill her because the question is, why is she here? And why in the world did this planet get destroyed? And so what T'Challa ends up doing is the one thing he never wanted to do, and that's reform the Illuminati. Now, a little bit of history here. Marvel Comics has had a litany of events over the course of their publication history. We've had the Onslaught Saga, we've had the Age of Apocalypse, we've had Maximum Security, where the Earth was turned into a prison planet run by Ron and the Accuser. We've had all these different events take place, Secret Invasions, Civil War, so on and so forth. The biggest and 
probably, we're well, not really the biggest, but probably the most important event to take place is the Kree Scroll War. And the reason why is because within the Marvel Universe, the Kree and the Scrolls are warring races that have been battling one another for millions and millions and millions of years. The creation of the Inhumans was a byproduct of the Kree to create a race that could basically serve as infiltrators, they could deal with espionage, and they could be soldiers. The Kree abandoned the project before anything actually came of the Inhumans, and they ended up just becoming a self-governing society. But these groups have been warring forever. Now, the Kree Scroll War came dangerously close to empire impacting Earth. And what ended up happening is Iron Man Tony Stark came to the realization that Doctor Strange, that Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four, Black Bolt of the Inhumans, that these characters knew about the Kree Scroll War. Professor X, they knew about what was going on, and each of them had a piece of the information that if brought together would have allowed them to basically stave off any and all efforts of the Kree or the Scrolls to impact Earth. And so what Tony Stark did is he formed a group called the Illuminati. And the idea is that because the humans are so isolated because Doctor Strange is isolated uh, because Reed Richards and the Fantastic Four are usually off exploring space because Professor X and the mutants are largely isolated within Westchester or at least they were at the time the result is that uh, they basically began coming together and pooling their information so that if any one major crisis took place the Illuminati would be able to operate behind the scenes now the other half of this is that the Illuminati was very hush hush nobody was supposed to know that they exist but another interesting introduction into the story is that Captain America was part of the Illuminati, and that was never originally the case. Originally, it was basically everyone you see here except Captain America. So this is a new bit of information, and it's actually pretty huge because he's going to be the voice of reason here for the most part. Now, of course, what this also does is it comes from the fallout of Avengers versus X-Men. Remember, that story, of course, you'll find that in the description as well. That story dealt with the, uh, with the return of the Phoenix Force. It resulted in Tony Stark trying to destroy the Phoenix Force. It dispersed itself among Emma Frost, Colossus, uh, Colossus' sister, Ileana Rasputin. But the most important part of this is Namor the Submariner. Because of the fact that Namor, as part of the Phoenix Five, had basically launched an attack against Wakanda and obliterated most of the city itself, this created a huge amount of animosity between Black Panther and between Namor the Submariner. The issue with this is that there was a little bit of trying to figure out what was going on. Namor was not really himself. And so while Wakanda, I'm sorry, while uh, T'Challa wanted to hold him accountable, to a degree he couldn't. At the same time, it was the rebuilding phase. So any desire he had for revenge had to be put on hold while Wakanda was being rebuilt because again T'Challa's first and most important effort is put towards his people and then everything else is secondary and so because of this the relationship between Black Panther and T'Challa is tenuous at best and there's a lot of hatred between the two of them but with Reed Richards basically showing up and speaking to uh speaking to Black Swan what she ends up telling him are these cryptic things about the wheel of death and about some being named Raboom Alal we don't really know who he is we just know that apparently he's the one that initiated this whole cycle, or at the very least, he's overseeing the entire thing. So again, this is very mysterious. This is very cryptic. But what ends up happening, and this is probably the most important thing that Black Swan says, is that those individuals who try to stop Raboom Alal, the Great Destroyer, those individuals who try to stand in the way of this wheel of destruction, uh, ultimately will end up losing themselves. They will come to a crossroads, and they will have to make a choice. Do they let a world live, or do they let a world die? And ultimately, if if they, if they choose to live, if they want to continue their lives, they're going to have to kill a world. And what it does is it breaks them on the emotional level. Because what this means now is no longer are they protectors. Instead, they're killers. Because when you destroy a world, you're destroying everybody on that world. You're destroying billions and billions of people. And that's the choice that has to be made here. Now, of course, Black Swan also hits at the idea that she's done this multiple times and she herself has lost her way. She's lost who it was that made her who she is but that's the sacrifice she makes in order to be a black swan so again with reed richards basically coming back to the uh, to the illuminati with everything he's learned what we end up finding out is this is basically a domino effect somewhere along the line a universe was destroyed we don't know how and we don't know why but we know a universe was destroyed now it works like this let's say that i take like five dominoes or say, or you know, 10 dominoes or 20 dominoes, however many. Let's take, I, let's say I take dominoes and I line them up next to each other. And let's say I pick the two middle dominoes 
and I knock them both to different sides. They will just end up knocking over dominoes next to them. And that's what's happening right now. The destruction of this universe created a cascading effect. And like you pushing, you know, walls on either side of you, it ends up just causing universes to start bumping into each other. Now, the point of impact for these universes is Earth. If both Earths hit each other, both universes will be totally obliterated. If one Earth is destroyed, then the universes will pass right through each other and nothing will happen nobody will be the wiser but that's why these earths are popping up is because it is basically the point of an incursion is what it's called when this earth pops up you have eight hours between the time you first see it and the time it crashes into you and so that's the choice that they're basically being given here that's what they're being told the survival of earth the survival of the main marvel universe hinges on the illuminati's willingness to destroy a planet. Now, of course, this also leads to Captain America immediately popping up and saying, nope, we are not going to destroy worlds. That is not gonna happen. Now, this is kind of a cool moment, and this is why Captain America is on the Illuminati, because he's the voice of reason. Keep in mind, Captain America is not the smartest, smartest person in the world. He's not the sharpest tool in the shed. What he is, is emotional and reasonable. He's able to combine those two things together to come to what would be the most reasonable decision in a circumstance. On the other hand, you've got Doctor Strange, you've got Reed Richards, you've got Black Panther, you know, you've got Professor X, got these guys well really professor x isn't here he's dead he died in avengers versus x-men which is why he's not there but you have these characters who for the most part are extremely intelligent and in a lot of ways are disconnected from humanity and so really captain america is the voice of the people he's the voice of the people in this instance saying should we kill a planet should we not kill a planet and so in his mind the act the answer to this is no not only that they have an out. And this is when we basically begin learning that each member of the Illuminati possesses an infinity stone. And the reason for this is because of the fact that one, it's designed to basically show that each member is who they claim to be. Now, of course, Doctor Strange has magic at his disposal to basically prove that these individuals are who they claim to be. But as we know from years past, stories like Infinity Gauntlet, Infinity War, Infinity Crusade, all these different things, that the infinity stones can easily overpower Doctor Strange's magic. And so, because of this, it's basically an identity verification. It's them essentially showing that they are who they claim to be. Now, the other half of this is that where, you know, Captain America says, no, we are not going to go around and kill planets. At the end of the day, the other members of the Illuminati behind Captain America's back are like, look, it's nice that he has that idea. But if it comes down to it, we will kill a world. We will obliterate a planet to save our own. That's just the way it is. Either he can be on board or he can get the boot. Now, this is huge because remember, when it comes to Captain America as a character, at least before the whole Secret Empire thing, Captain America's word in a lot of ways was law. When superheroes came along and they said, okay, like we're in this crazy situation, you know, Spider-Man, what do you think that we should do? Well, you know, I think we should do this. Reed Richards, what do you think we should do? You know, well, I think we should do this. Captain America, what do you think? I think we're gonna do this, done. That's the way it worked in Marvel Comics. When Captain America said, we're doing something, it got done for the most part. I mean, there were a few instances where it wasn't necessarily the case, but that's the respect that superheroes in the Marvel Universe have for Steve Rogers. And so what we end up doing is we basically pick up with this aftermath of sorts of Avengers versus X-Men. Because of the fact that it created a rift, because Cyclops is largely considered to be untrustworthy among the X-Men team, uh, because of the fact that, again, following the events of Schism and so on and so forth, we end up having uh, Hank McCoy, who takes up the role as being uh, the guy that basically runs um, the Xavier Institute, or at least to a degree, you know, is kind of the guy who's running the Xavier Institute. But what this means is that he's actually the person who inherits a piece of the will of Charles Xavier. Now, the funny thing about this is that Xavier just basically show, gives him an envelope, or at least he's handed an envelope created by Xavier that just says, remember. And what this does is it triggers a psychic memory. Now, this is pretty cool, and it's actually pretty ingenuitive. When it comes to Charles Xavier in Marvel Comics, his role, for the most part, was usually pretty straightforward. He was a guide, or he was a guide for the X-Men. He would train them. He would teach them. He would tell them that, hey, look, the X-Men are a team designed more of a humanitarian group as opposed 
opposed to like a group of, of soldiers or like a war group or anything like that. But the idea is that for the most part, he would plant these subliminal messages in people's minds, but usually it was done against villains or it was done to control a situation. We didn't really see instances like this where a memory was put in Beast's mind for the purpose of him basically just sort of, uh, you know, eventually realizing it when Charles Xavier triggers it. And so because of this, what he ends up, you know, being told by this psychic memory is that because Professor X was part of the Illuminati and because each member of the Illuminati possessed an infinity stone in order to verify their identity and their allegiance to the group, Charles Xavier hands his infinity stone over to Beast, who in turn is immediately contacted by the uh, by the Illuminati themselves. Now remember, one of the things that was established in the Illuminati miniseries is that where it was previously believed that the infinity stones were just these items that just kind of existed out there. Instead, they're actually inherently drawn to one another. The infinity stones always want to be brought together again. And so really it was more like this stone was like a, like, a tracking device, if anything. You know, with the Illuminati in possession of the other five stones and then Beast having his, they immediately knew where to go find it. They immediately knew where it was located at. Now, of course, this brings Hank McCoy into the situation with the question of, is he okay with what the Illuminati is looking to do? More so than that, it's actually pretty ingenious in the sense that some devices have been constructed that will basically activate when an incursion is happening or when an incursion is about to happen anywhere on the world. So if the Illuminati are off with their own respective teams and they're off doing their own thing and you know they're out in space or something along those lines and their palms start blinking red, they immediately know to head back to Earth. Now, of course, this all ends up being a moot point anyway as the story progresses just because of the fact that things sort of end up popping off. But the other funny thing about this is that Reed Richards initially goes to Black Swan with the idea of, hey, we have this idea to basically destroy or to stop the incursions from happening. And when they tell her their idea is to use the Infinity Gauntlet, Black Swan's response is, that's not going to work because like, other people have tried. <laughs> we know what the Infinity Stones are. From her universe, she knows what they are. And she's been to universes where people have tried to use them. And in every single instance, the Infinity Gauntlet always fails. Now, the biggest reason for this was actually solidified in the story. I think it was JLA, the JLA Avengers crossover. And it was the idea that the Infinity Gauntlet only works in its own universe. And this has been confirmed before, but this was really sort of etched in stone as just a solidified thing. If you are in the main Marvel universe, the Infinity Gauntlet only works in that universe. If you're in the Ultimate Universe, the Infinity Gauntlet only works in that universe. You can't take the Infinity Gauntlet from one universe into another and expect it to work. It doesn't happen. And because of the fact that these are universes crossing over and crashing into one another, ultimately it proves to be unsuccessful. Not only that, it's one heck of a show because what ends up happening is with the Infinity Gauntlet being reformed, the question becomes, who's the one who's gonna wield it? Well, again, this taps into the whole idea, the respect of Captain America, because where the Watcher realizes the Infinity Gauntlet's been reformed, Galactus, especially Thanos, where they all realize this gauntlet's been reassembled, undoubtedly, the, the only person that the Illuminati deem worthy of wielding it is Captain America, and it is crazy because he's so overwhelmed with power. But here's the difference. Captain America's will is completely unshakable. His resolve usually cannot be questioned. The only instance where I've ever seen Captain America seem to give up was in was in like Age of Ultron, when the Ultron or when Ultron had basically just conquered the earth and Captain America didn't know what to do. He was just like, I I have no plan. Like I don't know how to respond. There's nothing we can do. All we can do is wait it out and hope we survive to see tomorrow. It was the most defeated thing that I've ever seen in the history of Marvel. But in this instance, Captain America's will is basically unstoppable. And so where other members like Reed Richards, for example, got the Infinity Gauntlet and were corrupted by it, Captain America immediately knows how to control it and is immediately able to dominate it. Now, of course, this is his effort to basically push this incursing Earth away and try to get it to move away as far as he can, send that universe back. The problem with this is that the amount of energy, the sure amount of energy that it takes in order to pull this off is more than the Infinity Gauntlet can handle. And the result is that all the Infinity Stones, except for the Time Stone, shatter into pieces. The Time Stone actually just vanishes. It disappears. But in the mind of the Illuminati, this is it. There's no hope here. Like there's no way they can pull it off because remember, in the Marvel Universe, the Infinity Gauntlet is the most powerful artifact in existence. He who wields the Infinity Gauntlet controls all things that there is. And so because of this, it's 
the Infinity Gauntlet gets destroyed, then there's no way for them to win. And so once they go back and they begin trying to figure out a next way to, you know, what this next step is, everybody in the Illuminati, except for Captain America, basically begins saying, if we couldn't use the Infinity Gauntlet to destroy these incursing Earths or to push them away, then the only option we have is to blow these planets up. That's it. Black Swan was right when she said, we're going to have to destroy worlds. We're going to have to destroy each and every one of these incursing worlds. And so in this moment, we're Captain America basically says, no, I cannot abide this. I cannot side with this. You know, we have to find another way. Ultimately, what ends up happening is Doctor Strange, under the direction of Tony Stark, wipes the mind of Captain America, eliminating every, every little bit of knowledge that he's ever had that he was ever part of the Illuminati, allowing the Illuminati to go forward with the purpose of destroying worlds. Okay, so as much as I love talking about movies, we got a little carried away. Like the Infinity War trailer came out and I was like, ah, oh, movie stuff, let's talk about movie stuff. And I got, I got really, really excited for like, for like four days. It was just cranking out movie stuff. But we are comics explained. So we explain comics, <laughs> we make sense out of, it all, uh, out of it all. And in this video, we are going to be continuing our run on Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. Now, again, uh, it's been a little while since we'd done the first video, right? I mean, we went back, we were like, okay, look, hated the old stories the way we did them. Like we're going back and, and remastering it all in my current style, but we did that one a while ago. And so to kind of refresh for people who, who never really saw that first one, you'll find it down in the description so you can get like the full effect. You'll find that um, Marvel chronology playlist. But the whole idea with that story is but again, remember, when Jonathan Hickman writes stories, he's very cloak and dagger in terms of how he does things, in the sense that he starts from the end and works his way back to the beginning. And so it's basically like this huge, grandiose thing that happens at the conclusion of the story, and everything makes sense. But in the beginning, it's little tidbits here, and little tidbits there, and a little clue there, and a little clue there. And that's it. It's kind of up to us to sort of figure things out. And so what we do is we pick up in the Necropolis with Tony Stark and with Black Panther and those guys. And the reason why is because with this coming immediately, Immediately after the first video, what we saw in that was that there was basically just some being called the gardener, and we didn't really know a whole lot about him. But this was a guy who basically began to terraform Mars, basically. And his goal was to actually speed up the evolution of humanity on Earth. With the idea having been uh, been initiated that uh, the gardener had tried to create life, of course, the Avengers more or less defeated him. But one of the new beings that had been created was just this young black kid. And so the immediate aftermath of all this is basically what was going on with the character of Black Swan. This woman that just showed up from a different earth that was basically showing up, you know, in the, in the atmosphere of the main Marvel universe, you know, why did she destroy that planet? What in the world is going on? Of course, again, at the moment she's being held prisoner, but the whole idea was to basically bring in this concept of the incursions that there is basically a colliding of universes going on when an earth shows up in the atmosphere of, you know, the, the main Marvel universe, there's eight hours between those earths crashing into each other. If they both hit, both universes get destroyed. If one earth gets destroyed, the earth universes just pass through each other and that's it. The question is, what was she using to destroy these worlds? How was she blowing up this alternate earth? And so what we end up having is this sort of discussion between Reed and Black Panther and Tony Stark that she was effectively using an antimatter bomb. And it's kind of funny because Tony Stark makes this comment that there's a little bit of irony in using an antimatter bomb to destroy a world. We've talked about things like the negative zone, which is basically a sort of alternate dimension that's composed of antimatter. And what we basically said is that if antimatter hits positive matter, they'll basically cancel each other out. And so what that means is it would be like two of your fists hitting each other and just obliterating everything. And that's the whole idea of Black Swan. If you want to destroy positive matter, absolutely and definitively use antimatter. The whole idea is to also try to find ways to stop these incursions from happening. Remember, we talked in the last video that the first response of the Illuminati, of this, basically this group that we're reading about right now, their first response was to use the Infinity Gauntlet. Historically speaking, the Infinity Gauntlet is the most powerful artifact that any of these characters have used. Now, again, there is the heart of the universe, but mo the Marvel brass, the various top editors, you know, Tom Brevoort, so on and so forth, they've all come out and said that story's not in continuity. So it's not really an arguable point. But in this instance, the Infinity Gauntlet has been the most powerful artifact that's ever existed. The fact that the Infinity Stones were destroyed when they were trying to stop an incursion means that now it's a mad dash to try to keep it from happening. And so while all these various individuals have begun putting together uh, these different plans and so on and so forth, Tony Stark's idea is to actually form a Dyson sphere.
I'm by no means a scientist, <laughs> but to my understanding, a Dyson, a Dyson sphere is a theoretical concept, but a Dyson sphere is basically a giant spherical structure that's essentially built around a star and is designed to harness the power the star puts out, solar flares, different things like that, and then use that for whatever it is that, you know, its purpose serves. In this instance, and it's actually sheer genius on behalf of Tony Stark, if trying to push a universe back with the Infinity Gauntlet didn't work, then perhaps they can just sort of obliterate these planets without actually having to travel to them. That's the funny thing. With the bomb that uh, that Black Swan has, she has to jump from one world to, an, to the other. Presumably, when another incursion happens, if she's free, she would leave the Earth in the main Marvel Universe, jump to whatever alternate Earth is there, and then blow up the Earth in the main Marvel Universe. That would be her answer to try to keep the incursions from happening. Now, the whole response of Tony Stark is, well, we're just going to beat her to the punch. Anytime another alternate Earth shows up, we're going to destroy it. But they don't necessarily have the resources to continually develop all the these uh, antimatter bombs, or at least not in the time they have allotted, because they don't know when the next incursion is going to happen. And so the response of Tony Stark is, we need a long game. And so the whole point of this Dyson Sphere is to basically use a Dyson Sphere to emit a beam of energy, much like a Death Star, to destroy an Earth whenever it shows up. But the long game is to have this Dyson Sphere 100% completed, so that when another incursion happens, they can literally push the whole thing away. But it's cool, because the name that Reed Richards gives this is Saul's Hammer. This is why I say all the Jonathan Hickman stories are completely and totally cohesive. And Jonathan Hickman's run on the Fantastic Four, when the Mad Celestials from another universe invaded the main Marvel universe with the intention of conquering this entire reality, Reed Richards developed a massive gun, more or less, that could be used to blast the Celestials and blow them to pieces, and it was called Saul's Anvil. The other half of this is, remember, the Illuminati is composed of Reed Richards, Richards and Black Panther. You know, it was all these different characters that are there, but you also have Doctor Strange. Now, Doctor Strange, his specialty is the mystic arts. He's got nothing to offer when it comes to Dyson spheres and technology and so on and so forth. And so his idea is to basically use his various magics to try to find a way to end the incursions. The problem with this and with Doctor Strange is he's delving into black magic that if invoked and if misused can lead to the arrival of beings like Dormammu, Nightmare, all these different, you know, wildly powerful demonic entities that could easily lay waste to all the Earth's superheroes. So again, Doctor Strange is walking a very tight rope here, and so ultimately what they end up having is another incursion that takes place. And so what ends up going on is there's basically this incursion that takes place in Ellis Island in New York. So everyone around there sees this Earth. And so when the Illuminati take off and they basically run over to Ellis Island and their immediate response is to jump to that Earth and to figure out what's going on, once they arrive, they say, okay, we have to figure out what the scenario is. Once they basically get there, we end up finding that Galactus from this alternate reality is on this alternate Earth building a megastructure. Now remember, Galactus with all the other superheroes that existed here, Hickman just kind of leaves it to us to figure out what's going on. They know about the incursions, and that's huge because the response of Galactus's Herald at the time, Terax the Enlightened, basically says, we know about the incursions. We're aware these Earths are going to crash into each other. We're taking care of this one. Your Earth will be safe, but we won't be there forever. But what it means is that the Illuminati learning about the incursions Black Swan showing up, destroying Earth, it's not a small thing. And that's what we're going to find out as we go through this, that there are thousands of people who are out there. There are all these hundreds and dozens and thousands of iterations of the main Marvel characters in different universes who all know about the incursions and are all trying to stop it. Eventually, it'll come down to three main groups. The Illuminati is one of them. We're not going to go over the other ones because I don't want to spoil anything. What we end up finding out is that by extension of the actions of Galactus, this is a multiversal effort effort to stop the incursions from happening. Everybody realizes the end of the multiverse is at hand if the incursions are allowed to continue going on. And so that's kind of the funny thing, is because one of the other things that Terax the Enlightened says is that there have been people who have been fleeing from universes, traveling to other universes. There are some people that reside in this universe who came from other universes, and there were whispers and there were rumors about a collapse of the multiverse, incursions happening, Earths crashing into each other, all these, you know, scenarios that have been unfolding, all these things that have been going on where people are just fleeing, just trying to get out as best they can before their universe comes to an end. Terax teases this idea. They know a lot more than the Earth superheroes do, and we'd be expected to believe that's true. It's cool, and it's pretty intriguing. It's pretty interesting in terms of what's been going on and how all this has been happening. Again, a lot of that's not really given to us explicitly, but Reed Richards basically shows up with the intention of using the ultimate nullifier as an attempt to destroy Galactus in order to try to save this world and try to find a way to simultaneously stop the incursions. But the funny thing about Terax's response is, you can't. If you genuinely believe you can 
keep these incursions from happening and save both Earths, then you have no clue what's going on. And so my advice is to leave this Earth, get out of this reality, go back to your home universe and just destroy whatever Earths and curse on yours. That's the response they've been getting time and time again from Black Swan. It's always been, you can't stop the quote unquote wheel of destruction. You cannot stop the incursions from happening. But the nature of the Illuminati is there has to be a way to stop this. There has to be some scientific answer to how to keep the incursions from happening. In the face of guaranteed doom, their answer is, but there has to be a way for us to win. A fight ultimately breaks out between Terax the Enlightened and, uh, and the Illuminati. And before we find out what happens, the story basically ends. But what it does from here is it actually picks up with a young girl, with some guy that has some sort of an artifact and basically ends up dying in some major conflict. And that's really about it. But the cool thing is that the artifact morphs itself into glasses or into goggles that this girl in turn puts on. In this instance, this story focuses on a young girl named Izzy. And Izzy is basically just this girl that lives on a farm in Iowa. She's got a pretty mundane life. Izzy going out, taking these goggles with her, looking into his telescope, exploring space to a degree. It gives us a couple things about her character. The first is that she, much like a lot of people who are raised in small towns, who look for bigger and better things, dream of a better life. When she puts these goggles on, suddenly she's told that she's being given the designation of Smasher, and she's basically being sent to the planet of Chandelar. Now, this is a big deal because Chandelar is home for the Shi'ar Empire and the Imperial Guard. What we end up finding out is there's actually a Stargate that orbits Earth. This Stargate, no one knows about. It's a stealth Stargate. And it's kind of cool because what it does is it hits at this idea that the Shi'ar Empire is so technologically advanced that they can basically throw in a universal transportation device and Earth doesn't know about it. But this girl showing up here is intriguing because basically she learns that she's uh, being brought in to be one of the recruits for the Imperial Guard. Now we'll talk about them here in a second, but before we do, what we end up doing here is switching over to Avengers Tower. Now remember, because of the fact that the stories of Jonathan Hickman's run is split between Avengers and New Avengers, New Avengers is designed to tell the story of the Illuminati. Avengers is their front face. It's the face they put on for the rest of the world. And that's why you'll see them in both stories. In this instance, you have Tony Stark and everybody's basically trying to figure out who this young kid is that was created during the events of the Avengers World storyline. He basically says his name is Black Veil, or at least that's the indication that's given because what he's doing is he's speaking builder machine code. Might as well be Greek for, you know, all the good it does and these guys trying to figure it out. The best they can do is try to decipher it by a combination of just guessing their intelligence and then whatever little assistance they can get. And so they come to the conclusion that this kid's name is basically Black Veil. That's the name that he's calling himself. The other half of this is that the Avengers are starting to get an SOS from some various forces that are going on or various conflict that's taking place basically out in the galactic rim of the Shi'ar Empire. Now remember, in Marvel Comics, the Shi'ar Empire is an amalgamation of all these races that swear loyalty to the Magister or the Magistrix, whoever it is that's running it at the time. At this moment right now, it's Gladiator, the leader of the Imperial Guard. And the whole idea behind this is that with the Shi'ar Empire governing, uh, governing its, its empire very, very jealously, they never really allow anybody in unless they're invited or unless they're conquered. But what's going on here is some race, some alien society has basically begun infringing on the galactic rim of the Shi'ar Empire's territory. And so what ends up happening is we actually have Falcon along with a handful of Avengers who respond to these sort of SOSs and begin showing up and, you know, and, and basically getting involved in everything. At the same time, it's also the character of Izzy who jumps into the conflict as well. This is designed to give us this sort of universal calamity or at least this small skirmish through the eyes of a new person. This is all new to her. And in her first, really her first run out in terms of becoming an actual superhero fighting alongside these Shi'ar soldiers, she's suddenly thrown out into the middle of everything. But notice how she handles it. She takes it in stride. And that's designed to basically reiterate the fact that Izzy's ability to function as the character of Smasher and basically as a hero goes beyond the simple powers that she has, that she has a strong character about her. With the Avengers showing up and everything, the Incredible Hulk emerging, we jump back to the first time that she first flew, when she first saw the planet of Chandelar. You know, and what we end up finding out is that when she first put on those goggles, about a month had passed between the time that she had gone on her first exploration into space and the time that she returned back home. So again, she basically makes this comment about how easy it is to get lost in space, that time passes faster than you would expect it will. And so when she gets back, a couple of things go on. The first is that she basically has a conversation of sorts with her father and she's basically told, look, your granddad's sick, which is kind of disappointing because the two of them were so close. But it's also her granddad basically giving her this piece of paper that basically says, I got this from a friend of mine when I was younger. His statement was basically, if you ever need anything, give me a call. Now, when we had talked about the idea that Jonathan Hickman would borrow heavily from established comics all throughout Marvel's history, this is a perfect example. This granddad 
get at, this old man is not a random person. He's actually a guy by the name of Dan Kane. And I didn't even think about this until I saw this note that Steve Rogers left him. Um, now we got to pull out the memory banks. We got to pull out some, some old school stuff in order to, uh, <laughs> in order to remember to do this. But Dan Kane was actually a guy named Captain Terror. And back in the 1940s, when Captain America first popped up in Marvel Comics, the whole idea was that all comic books were basically part of the total war effort during World War II, in the sense that almost every facet of American society was geared towards propelling this belief that America was right. I mean, whether it was because people were contributing in the war effort in terms of, you know, making guns and tanks and so on and so forth, or whether it was propaganda like comic books. While Captain America, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, you know, while those stand out as some of the most iconic characters to come out of World War II, there were other smaller characters too. And in fact, there was a line of comics called USA Comics. And the star of that, or at least one of the stars of that, was Captain Terror, Dan Kane. But he also had a hand a bit in some of the Captain America efforts. What Jonathan Hickman is doing here is grabbing all that history and reeling it in and basically saying, Captain America knows who Dan Kane is. He fought alongside him during World War II. And that's what he means when he tells his daughter, you're part of a lineage. You're part of a history that you never knew about. Superhero epics run in our blood. It's part of who we are. And he basically teaches her the most important lesson of what it means to be a superhero. That being a superhero basically means that you inspire other people to believe that they can do great things. And so it's beautifully done. And it's this incredible encounter because what ends up happening is we actually have Gladiator of the Shi'ar Empire, the Magister who shows up with the Imperial Guard, basically the most elite fighting force in the universe who essentially eliminate, you know, all these different alien threats. And because of the actions of Smasher and basically being able to hold the line as part of the Shi'ar military force, she's given an honorary position and made part of the Imperial Guard, the first human to achieve that. So it's cool. And so in response to this, what we do is we pick up with the last little tidbit of the story back on Chandelar. And it's basically the Shi'ar Empire more or less torturing this guy for information, doing whatever it is they have to do to get information out of him on why they were encroaching on the territory of the Shi'ar. And where, you know, Gladiator believed it was an attempt at an invasion, what Oracle, their local telepath, does is she says, it's nothing like that. Instead, it's worse than what we thought it was. They weren't looking to invade us. They were fleeing. This just happened to be where we caught them. But the only reason why they were here was because something was hunting them. Something drove them from their own home territory, their own galaxy or whatever it was, and it brought them here. And we destroyed them while they were in the midst of trying to get to safety. Okay, so getting back into remastering our run on Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, I know we've taken a break for a while. Um, it's been a while since we since we kind of followed up on this. But again, we were basically waiting for, for the time being right when like Avengers Endgame was going to come out to kind of segue into this, just to show you guys how great Avengers stories can really be in Marvel Comics. But again, there is a little bit of catching up to do, but the benefit of where we stopped in terms of the previous videos means that like we can kind of just, you know, segue directly into this and then just kind of catch up as we go through. Now, for those of you guys who are following my Marvel Major Avengers chronology playlist, which is to say all the major events in Marvel Comics, uh, this will basically come before Infinity. And those of you guys who were following the events of just Infinity War and Cosmic Marvel and leaving out all the other major events like the Captain America run, Secret Empire, things like that, this will still come before Infinity, but the store, but the, the playlist will still be shorter. So again, not a whole lot changing there. Uh, you'll find both those playlists down in the description, by the way. My editor, Gordon, will, will link those down there. But what this does is it basically picks up with Shang-Chi and a girl named Tamara. Now, initially, well, and, and again, we'll kind of get, kind of get into this a little bit, but with Shang Chi, he's really uh, he's he's super good when it comes to martial arts. But the benefit of Shang Chi is that he kind of ties into this idea of sort of finding your inner self, right? Like finding some kind of inner peace, right? Like he taught Spider Man his own martial arts style called the Way of the Spider, different things like that. Um, and so Shang Chi is kind of the guy that you go to when basically you you can't solve a problem on your own and you kind of have to meditate yourself through it. And that's one of the things that sort of goes on here is he's basically asking this woman Tamara, like, who were you before all of this? And as Tamara kind of starts to try to recollect on things, she's getting small little glimpses of her past. She's talking about things like, well, you know, I don't know how long it's been. I remember being in a hospital. You know, I remember seeing like a flash of light. And basically Shang-Chi says like, you've been in the hospital for 10 years. And that's when Tamara manifests back into Captain Universe. Now, this is where a bit of explanation comes in. So in Marvel Comics, you have the concept of Captain Universe. And so ultimately, Captain Universe basically gets his power from what's called the Enigma Force. And the Enigma Force is exactly what it sounds like. It's a force of energy that basically emanates from the microverse, but nobody knows anything about it. Nobody, Marvel 
novels never bother to really explain it at all. But a person who's bestowed by the powers of Captain Universe, basically it only really manifests in times of dire need, right? When there's like a universal threat of some kind. But the power of Captain Universe is relative and it can be extremely powerful or it can just be not that powerful, right? Like when Spider-Man had the power of Captain Universe, he punched the Incredible Hulk into the atmosphere. This version of Captain Universe is astronomically powerful. So again, it's really just kind of based on what version of, of the character that we're talking about here. But basically what Captain Universe says is the universe is dying. Like the universe is coming to an end and it manifested itself and bonded itself directly to that woman because one, it was a person who was available and two, this woman's situation mirrored the nature of the universe itself, right? Like Captain Universe is a protector of the universe. The universe is broken and dying. This girl is broken and dying. Therefore, it makes sense for Captain Universe to bond itself to her. And so that's basically kind of how things segue into this. Now, from here, we switch over to Tony Stark and we basically have Captain Universe leaving Shang-Chi, going directly to Tony and then speaking with Tony and Adam. Now, this kind of goes back to the first story arc of the Avengers that we talked about, which was Avengers World. And what we found out, or at least what we saw, was that there was a guy named Ex Nihilo and there was a woman named Abyss. And basically, Ex Nihilo was what was called a gardener. The idea is that the gardeners travel from world to world and they essentially try to like perfect life on those worlds. If they cannot perfect life there, then the robot they travel with, which is called an Aleph, destroys the world. It'll just eliminate everything on the world and then destroy it. And so what happened is that in the first story arc, Ex Nihilo showed up on Mars, terraformed the planet, and then basically gave it an atmosphere and vegetation. And then after that, he targeted Earth. And what he tried to do, what he basically did is he shot an origin bomb at Earth, which essentially like jumpstarted the evolution of the planet. And so suddenly he had like all these crazy growths all over the world and different things like that. But the first humanoid to manifest itself as a result of the origin bomb and the, the super evolutionary process that was jumpstarted by Ex Nihilo was Adam. The issue was that Adam came out and basically just started speaking a language that nobody could understand. And so Tony Stark has been spending all his time here, at least a huge amount of his time, trying to decipher a language he's never heard of before. And then when Captain Universe shows up, she basically says, you've got it all wrong. Because Tony Stark's idea was that his name was Black Veil. That's like the only thing he could decipher was Black Veil. But when, when Captain Universe shows up, she's like, no, you have no idea what you're talking about. Basically, this guy's name is Night Mask. And essentially, like, what he's doing is speaking something called Builder Machine Code. And so what ends up happening is Captain Universe basically modifies the uh, speech patterns of, of Adam, giving him the ability to speak English. And he simply says, like, it's coming. And when the question is asked, what is it that's coming? You know, Nightmask says, like, it's the white event, the last white event in existence. Now, this is when things get really, really cool. Is because what ends up happening is we switch over to something called the Superflow. Now, in Marvel Comics, what you have here, and, and it's really kind of strange the way it's depicted because it's been done different ways. So bear with me here. But in Marvel Comics, what you have is this multiverse, right? Like you got this huge multiversal space. And the way this works is that between the universes, you basically have like barriers. So think of them like an invisible wall, right? Like if you if you were to look at the barrier of the universe, it would look like it just kind of extends on forever. But if you found a way to transcend that barrier and to walk through it, you would end up in a different universe. So it's kind of an invisible wall that can only be broken by certain people. And so with that in mind, in between these different universes, it's been done one of two ways. This is Jonathan Hickman basically changing everything that we know about Marvel Comics. Because prior to this, what you had was basically just the space between. That much like having insulation between the walls in your house, that where one room would be a universe and another room would be a universe, and the space in between the would, you know, would, would be the insulation, that's insulation housed a group called the Many Angled Ones, which is basically what Shumagorath is, if you guys know that. If you don't know what the Many Angled Ones are, they're just these giant, huge tentacle monsters that are absurdly powerful, but they're confined to the space between universes. What Jonathan Hickman is doing here is wiping all that away and basically saying none of that applies anymore. That instead, what you basically have is like a giant fish tank, more or less, and you've got all these different universes just kind of floating around in this giant tank that makes up the multiverse, and the space in between the universes is the superflow. And so basically, the superflow is like this, this like these straight roads, right? Like 90 degree angles, or I guess curvatures, or something like that. But basically, what it means is like they're essentially like straight shots. Is basically all it is. But you can transition from one universe to the next by riding the superflow. And so what's happening is that out here in the superflow somewhere is essentially just like this giant device, and this device is literally being destroyed by whatever powers happen to be out there that are basically going through and like leading to the collapse of the multiverse. And so what we end up doing is picking up with like this one last, really like these two last guys that are there that are on this structure. And so it's kind of cool here because with the conversation between them, as they start to talk about this, they start to address this, what they basically say is like, there's this thing called the white event. And the way this white event works, and it's actually kind of cool, is it's not an original idea by Jonathan Hickman. Instead, the white event comes from New Universal, from, from a whole nother set of publications that were created by Marvel. But what essentially happened in this other publication that was created in this new universal line of comics is you didn't really have superheroes per se. You didn't have Captain America, you didn't have Iron Man or anything like that. Instead, you would have this white event that would initiate and then like people
people would be bestowed with different abilities, but the, the abilities they had were relatives. So those of you guys who are watching Umbrella Academy, it would be like that. Basically in the sense that like different people would have different abilities, but they would come together as a singular unit and like save the world. And so what you ended up having was like a star brand, was basically one of the first beings to show up here. But what ends up going on in this instance is that because of the fact that like the, the space between them, the universes is, is collapsing due to the multiversal collapse because it's all basically coming to an end. Literally this, this singular being here designed to kind of monitor this installation where all these installations across all these other universes are basically coming to an end. He basically says just like fire, just fire off, fire a shot and just initiate the white event and see if we can, if we can jumpstart that. And that's exactly what happens. The white event is initiated. This massive beam of, a beam of energy is shot onto earth from this construct here. And like a person is chosen. And so now the question becomes, what is the white event? And that's when night mask begins to comment and basically say like the white event is essentially just like a dawning of a new age of superhero. And so basically like other individuals are going to be woken up. What night mask doesn't know is the, the white event did not go down the way it was supposed to. And so instead of there being all these other individuals beside himself, instead there will only be one that will be it. And so what this, what this essentially does is it creates a star brand. And so again, like when night mask goes through this, what he basically says is like, it's designed for the purpose of like selecting an individual of going through and like selecting a person who's best suited to contain that kind of power, a person who's the most capable. And so that's when we end up basically kind of transitioning to this college, this kid named Kevin, who's really kind of out there and not really being taken seriously by anybody. And basically like, he's the one that was ultimately chosen. Where Jonathan Hickman initially kind of went through and showed us like, you know, some people who were jerks or like jocks and different things like that. People who were really seen more traditional roles of masculine as opposed to like traditional roles of non-masculine. That basically that's what was supposed to have happened. That any one of these guys here, this jock or, or any one of these guys, the, the, the super intelligent guy, they were all supposed to be like, they were the ones who were supposed to have been chosen, but it was firing off a shot at the last minute in an act of desperation. The choice wasn't made effectively. Everything was falling apart. It's a failure of the system. The wrong person was chosen that this kid, Kevin was basically picked. And when he was hit with the power of the star brand, he didn't know how to control it. And in the process wiped out everything around him, literally unleashed this massive scale of energy and obliterated everything around him. Now this is cool because what Hickman does is he starts going in and saying, now let me show you the power of the star brand. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where things get kind of hairy. We're going to kind of jump ahead a little bit, not really jump ahead, but kind of explain ahead a little bit. When the star brand faces off against the Incredible Hulk, the Incredible Hulk is immediately sent flying into the atmosphere. Like literally the Incredible Hulk has no real chance here. Hyperion shows up, Hyperion's the next one to be taken out. Everyone who faces off against star brand ends up getting wrecked and no one can really hold off against the power this kid possesses. And the reason why is because at the outset, this is all uncontrollable. Kevin doesn't know, doesn't really know how to control this power he possesses or what he's able to do. But the caveat to the star brand is that the power is, is by definition outside of, of Kevin's control. He can harness it, but he can never control how much power he has at any point in time. The way this works is the star brand as a protector of a, of a singular system, as a protector of an earth is designed to basically have however much power he needs to defeat whatever enemy he's facing. That's a challenge to the earth. If Galactus shows up to earth, star brand could defeat Galactus. The kicker here is that if he doesn't know how to use it properly, then he can still be killed. So it's not like a, it's not a one stop shop, right? Like it's not an end all answer. Just because he has access to all this power doesn't mean he knows how to use all that power. So again, a guy with the ability to manipulate reality, if he doesn't know how to manipulate anything, can't do anything with it. It's useless, you know? So it's like having a million dollars in a bank account that you cannot access. And so it's kind of cool because basically like Night Mask literally like takes Starbrand and whisks him away and says like, it's important that you understand what your role in this world is. And it's kind of a cool thing because when this happens, he kind of takes him on a tour, basically shows, hey, look, this is where you got your power from, from what's now a collapse system. The space between universes is essentially collapsing now. There's really nothing keeping universes from crashing into each other, which we've known all along by the nature of the incursions. But again, like going through and, and showing these extreme displays of power, going through and, and, and showing like these extreme abilities is pretty cool because it means that like for the most part, Starbrand is not easily defeatable. When the Avengers catch back up to him again and you've got Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, you've got Hyperion, you've got Thor, you've got Captain America, you've got the Incredible Hulk. You have all these guys facing off against him. None of them are able to defeat feed him. Basically his power is extreme, seemingly unrivaled, and no one can really, no one, no one has a chance against this kid. And so because of that, because his power is kind of running unchecked, the Avengers do the only thing they can do. They basically say, Hey, look, we've got to keep the both of you in a, in like a safer place. We've got to keep the both of you in a place where we're like, you guys can't harm anyone. And so what they do, and, and really kind of like Kevin and I mask actually go along with it. But what they do is they throw them inside of a Dyson sphere, literally like put them inside of the cell out in the middle of space, and then basically leave them there until such a time as one, like the threat of the incursions can be dealt with, or two, the Avengers can figure out how to deal with their powers and their extreme abilities. But again, you know, just kind of continuing on to Hickman's, you know, Avengers and New Avengers, remastering the whole thing. And uh, yeah.
Okay, so in addition to our regular videos, um, I wanna be a little bit dangerous this week, right? I wanna try something. I wanna see if there's still any interest from people with regards to remastering the Avengers and the new Avengers stories, right? Because we, here's the thing, this is probably my favorite comic book story ever written, right? Like it's just, it's amazing. Like it's so huge and it's drawn out and it's 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 just, it's amazing, right? So uh, for those of you guys who wanna get caught up because this is really all just kind of Jonathan Hickman. And one of the things that I tell people a lot, we've talked about this in previous videos one of the things that i tell people a lot and i get this question all the time is what's the reading order for hickman um i usually tell people just go with like hickman's fantastic four and then go into his secret warriors and then go into avengers and new avengers which is what this is uh but you'll find that playlist down in the description right now it'll probably be bigger than simply just this because i'm calling it the best comic book stories ever uh playlist right so it'll have like other stuff besides this right like big story arcs different things like that but for those of you guys who don't want to watch all those videos and get caught up what we're basically dealing with right now or what are called the incursions, right? The idea behind this is that we didn't really know what was happening, right? All we really knew was that there was just like a, a red earth that popped up, or at least the there was an earth that popped up and the sky was red in the main Marvel universe. Now, not everyone saw it. And the reason why is because what you get there is what's called an incursion wall. It's this kind of invisible wall, right? It's almost like a portal. So if you were standing in front of an incursion wall and there was an incursion happening, for you, everything would look normal. It's not until you pass through that barrier that you see the incursion wall and you see like that incursion curse of earth, right? The red sky, that earth, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's where things kind of popped off. Now they do come in red and they come in blue. In this video, we're going to talk about what it means when they come in blue. We already know just from a previous video, but this will give us a chance to kind of reiterate that. And so what we had up to this point was basically two things going on. You had the Illuminati and then you had the standard Avengers team. And the standard Avengers team was just doing Avengers stuff. And we'll explain that as, as we go on to the rest of these videos. The Illuminati were actively working to try to stop the incursions. Now it became a Parent very fast that the incursions could not be stopped by conventional means, right? So like the Infinity Gauntlet, for example, all the stones shattered except for the Time Stone, which vanished, right? So basically the Infinity Gems were destroyed. There was no way to use them to stop the incursions, right? So there was literally nothing they could do. The only way to stop this from happening is to basically destroy the other world. And the reason why is because the Earth is basically the incursion point. So if both Earths collide, both universes are destroyed. But if one of the Earths is destroyed, then the universes pass through each other and nothing happens, right? And that's what the Illuminati wanted to do. The Illuminati wanted to start destroying incursive worlds, right? Incursing Earths that were showing up, they wanted to obliterate them. Captain America disagreed, and that's why he was originally part of the Illuminati, but his mind was wiped by Doctor Strange, and he was made to forget everything because he basically wasn't on board, and they didn't want anybody else to know what they were doing. And so that's kind of what's been happening. But what Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four did is he basically built a bridge. And the reason why is because this was designed to basically allow him to look into other universes, other versions of the Illuminati from across the multiverse and to ask the question, what are they doing to try to stop the incursions? Is there something they thought of that we didn't, right? It's literally just an intelligence mission. It's reconnaissance is all it is. And that's where this picks up, right? This picks up basically with Reed Richards from an alternate universe uh, and the Illuminati is composed of a completely different team. And so where normally the team would be composed of Namor the Submariner and Black Panther, uh, Black Bolt of the Inhumans, Tony Stark, or really it's Beast of the X-Men now because Professor X died during Avengers versus X-Men, where you would normally see see that, that kind of a roster going on here. Now, think this in this alternate reality, the whole uh, Illuminati is different. Instead, you've got Doctor Doom, you've got Black Panther, you've got Yellow Jacket, which is basically just a different version of Hank Pym. You've got Betsy Braddock, who's the sister of Brian Braddock, both of whom play the role of Captain Britain. Uh, you've got Iron Man, and you've got Emma Frost of the X-Men, right? One of the most powerful telepaths uh, really in any universe, doesn't matter what it is. Uh, this Earth is referred to as Earth 2319. It's simply just a numerical designation to differentiate this Earth from the main Marvel Universe. Now, one one of the things Hickman does is he gives us a kind of explanation in terms of how this reality came to be. And what this does is it looks very similar to the events of uh, of Days of Future Past. That's really what this looks like. Somewhere along the line, some kind of event transpired that led to the activation of the Sentinels. The Sentinels presumably took over the world, or at least were hunting down mutants. And that basically led to Magneto essentially creating his own kind of utopia, right? A place for mutants to reside absent any sort of threat or worry about the Sentinels tracking and killing them. And so what this led to was a, a kind of mutant safe haven removed from everything else. The issue with this is that the Illuminati became aware that this is where the incursion point is, right? This is the incursion wall, the the, the breach, the, the place you have to pass through in order to, to basically destroy another world or destroy that version of the Earth. The difference here is that this Earth is blue. It's not red. And and blue basically means map makers. So the map makers come in two forms. You've got the map makers themselves, and then you've got the Sidera Madris, I think is what they're called. And basically, these are guys are called bridge builders. The idea behind this is 
is that when an incursion happens, uh, you usually end up having uh, the, the Sidera Madris or really the map makers who kind of eradicate all life on an entire world. Literally, they, they destroy all forms of life, right? They siphon the earth dry. Not even organic matter on the on the surface level survives, right? It's just kind of a, a it's a husk of a world, right? Just completely and totally drained dry. And so what happens is that the map makers themselves don't have the ability to kind of jump around, right? They can't just travel through multiversal space arbitrarily. And so what they do is they basically leave these uh, these Sidera Madris on a world, right? So in this particular instance, this world, this blue earth was completely and totally destroyed by the map makers. They left the Sidera Madris here so that what would happen is that when another incursion happened and they came upon another world, the, the bridge builders, the Sidera Madris will basically come to this earth. And then what they'll do is they'll destabilize that blue world. And what'll happen is a chunk of that blue world will come crashing down onto this world. And it's basically sending out a signal. It's, it's, it's more or less making a phone call to the map makers saying, hey, uh, trace our signal. We found a new world. And the map makers will travel to this world, right? And then they'll basically eradicate all life there. The funny thing about this is as powerful as the Sidera Maris are, the map makers are even more powerful than they are, which is kind of the funny thing. But before we get into that, what we do here is we jump to a place called the Lost Lands. And the reason why is because Stephen Strange realized he didn't have enough power in and of himself to stop the incursions. And so what he's done here is he's traveled to a place called the Sinner's Market. And the idea is that you can buy pretty much anything that you want here. He's even warned, right? He's told by, by his guide, be careful because the, the market tends to change and the longer that you're here, right? So it's, it's not that it physically changes, it's simply that you just become more aware of what's going on, right? So like, like if you, you know, like when you go outside or like when you're, when you're walking by something and you just happen to get a glimpse of it and you see a tree and it's like, oh, there's a tree there. And then you look at it a little bit longer, then you realize there's people and there's a dog and there's different things. That's how this market works, right? The, the longer you stay here, the more you become aware of what's there. The reason why that matters is because the only way to really bargain anything is to bargain either magical power or bargain yourself. And that's what that's what Stephen Strange does, where he's asked, what is it that you're looking for? Are you looking for longevity? Do you want to live longer? Do you want to live forever? Are you looking for eternal bliss? Are you looking for love? You know, and Stephen Strange says, I don't want any of these things. I want power. And when he's told, but you have so much power already, his response is, I need more. I need even more power. Now, the reason why you see this here is because what Stephen Strange is looking to do is get to his classic self. So Stephen Strange has two versions over the course of Marvel's history. There's the original Doctor Strange who had the power to do anything. And then there's modern day Doctor Strange who's far less powerful. And the way you get from one to the other was a conflict that involved a group called the Vishanti, which is where Doctor Strange gets most of its power from, right? That's, they they lend a lot of their magical ability to him. I'd say probably something like, like maybe 70% of the magic that Doctor Strange uses comes from the Vishanti. Because of the fact that he wouldn't ally with them during a war that they had, they stripped him of his title of Sorcerer Supreme and took away 70% of his power. And so that basically led to him kind of going forward as just Stephen Strange, you know, Sorcerer, not really Supreme. And that basically led to like Brother Voodoo taking his place for a while. Now Marvel brought him back, but they ended up keeping his power relatively limited, right? So this was not, you know, this version of Stephen Strange you see here is not the guy who can do anything, right? He can't just hop and skip around the multiverse. I mean, I guess he can as far as he can create portals, but he's not God tier power. Powerful. That's what he's trying to get back to. And that's when he's told, well, then you're going to be wanting the throne, right? So like, follow us to this location uh, and I'll and I'll take you to the throne. Now, at this point, we basically jump back to the map makers, uh, you know, showing up here on this particular world. The bridge builders do exactly what they're supposed to, right? Like the, a chunk of this world comes crashing down. They inform the map makers of the location and the map makers follow suit. Now, at that point, that's when everything begins to pop off, right? That's when everything begins to get nuts because you have Magneto, you have Dr. Doom. These guys are exceedingly powerful powerful. They're wildly powerful in terms of what they can do. The funny thing about this is the map makers are designed to basically adapt to the abilities of anybody that they're facing, right? So they can analyze you, they can learn what your powers are, and they can learn how to overcome your abilities, right? So Magneto, for example, is an Omega level threat in this particular universe. He has been for a long time. But basically, for those of you guys who don't know, an Omega level threat is a character who is of the highest caliber of threat when it comes to the mutant population. Uh, that's called an Omega level mutant. An Omega level threat is somebody who's not really a mutant, but is equal to like an Omega level mutant in power, right? So like the Molecule Man Owen Reese, for example, is a universal reality warper. He's on par with Franklin Richards in terms of a threat level. Now the nuances of their powers change. So it's not really a one for one ratio, right? Like they're 100% equal in terms of their power. And what ends up happening here is of course, what we see is that the map makers basically say like adapting, right? Genetic markers defined and then use their power to basically nullify the abilities of Magneto and then basically like destroy him, right? Like wipe him out. And they just, they do that to every single one of these guys right? They're like initial threat contained, and then they begin the process of just destabilizing the world, right? Siphoning all this energy off the world. From there, you have like a bunch of other superheroes who jump in and do what they 
can, but none of it makes any difference, right? You've got Black Panther, you've got Captain Britain, you've got Yellow Jacket, you've got Iron Man that jumps in. Every last one of them are completely and totally destroyed. And the only one left is Dr. Doom, right? Dr. Doom literally rips one of the map makers apart, which is something that's not necessarily supposed to be able to happen because they perceive themselves as being so far above everybody else. And in a lot of ways they are, right? They they, they pretty much are in, in that realm. Uh, and so of course, Dr. Doom's powers analyzed. Dr. Doom realizes this is basically the end and the map makers completely into, you know, completely and totally destroy him, right? And so pick up with Reed Richards and the Illuminati in the main Marvel universe, watching all this happen. And they realize everybody just kind of continues to fall. And so jump over to Stephen Strange meeting in the throne room, you know, where everybody's kind of watching because everybody's kind of curious, like, is this guy really going to do it? And he approaches the throne and he's asked by one of the priests, what are you looking for? Like, like, what is it you want to achieve here? And Dr. Strange response is I have come for power. And what they end up saying is this transaction is not as simple as you think it is. You don't just get absolute power. What you need here is you have to bargain a part of yourself in order to, to achieve this, right? So how much power you get is relative to how much of your soul you're willing to sell. And the response to Stephen Strange is I want to sell 100% of my soul for 100% of power. I'm going to sell the entirety of my soul for all of this. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. Let me know down in the comment section if you guys still want to see more of these remastered videos. I'm kind of curious. Uh, and yeah, this is this is a story that I'm probably rereading for, I'd say maybe the fourth time. Like I'm reading through it again, right? It's just, I love this story so much. Okay, so judging by the responses and how popular that video seems to be, the answer seems to be yes. <laughs> <laughs> People are very much interested in me continuing the remaster of the uh, Avengers and New Avengers videos that I did back in the day. Here's a cool thing. We're actually going to include stuff in these videos that we didn't do the first time around because they didn't really seem to be important. Only for me to turn around and realize they were important. Perfect example this story. Uh, so this story is, this is cool, right? Because if you guys remember when it comes to Jonathan Hickman, he's all about like, he'll, he'll tell some great big, huge, you know, like, like six issue story or one shot story or something like that. And that story will basically just be a series of things that happen. But one thing in that story will be incredibly important and play a role later on down the line. But what this does here is it picks up with a character named Zhang, who's not exceedingly important, right? I mean, I guess a little bit important, but not exceedingly important. Instead, the big thing that's taking place here is you basically have essentially these soldiers more or less trying to break into this facility that Zhang and presumably Iron Man occupy for whatever reason. Right? They seem to be up to something that they're not supposed to be allowed to do. But the big thing that comes out of this is, is where the door initially gets smashed down and work is being done exceedingly fast, right? Where things are being done as fast as they can in order to initiate this mission, we're suddenly met by the arrival of the future Franklin Richards. Now, here's the important thing to understand here. Franklin Richards from the future will appear again in this story. And he's probably one of the single most important characters, or not really the most important characters, but at least in terms of the information he offers is probably one of the most important characters that we'll see later on in uh, in Marvel. But for the collapse of the multiverse, there's not a whole lot that Franklin Richards can do. And in fact, even if there was anything he could do, he's not going to. And we'll actually find out why later. But the cool thing here is that he basically talks about how this machine generates tachyons, right? About a thousand times above normal, and that it maintains a class five containment field, right? So basically, Franklin Richards is just kind of shown up here in the midst of everything that's, that's sort of going on and asking the question, are you guys planning a trip? And the response of Iron Man in what's probably one of the coolest Iron Man suits ever basically says like, Hey, uh, you know, don't try to stop me and what it is that I'm doing. And the response of Franklin is we've known each other for a long time. And then refers to this person as Rhodey and then says like, what, you know, why would I try to stop you in the first place? And so basically what's happened here is that this person who we can kind of assume is James Rhodes. We'll find out who it actually is later on, but we can assume it's James Rhodes and has, has in effect created a time machine. That's basically what this is. That's the question that's asked by Franklin. Like, do you know what it is that you've done? Like, do you realize what it is that you've created? here and the response is yes we know exactly what we've done right and so the question is asked uh do you know what the rules of this are and the response of james is there are no rules and that's 100 true the funny thing about this is this is a little bit of a modification by time travel from jonathan hickman R historically speaking in marvel comics when it comes to when it comes to time travel it works in the sense of branch universe theory right so let's say for example that uh the captain america got a, got his hands on a time machine and decided to go back into the past and stop the moment when uh when let's say bruce banner became the Incredible Hulk. Bruce Banner's exposed to the Gamma Bomb, he's exposed to the Rays, he becomes the Incredible Hulk. Let's say that like Captain America showed up and then grabbed him and just ran out of the bomb blast radius, right? Assuming that he could. Then what that would mean is you would have an alternate universe. That universe they're currently living in, where Bruce Banner never became the Hulk, that now becomes an alternate reality. So that's the way that time travel always worked in Marvel. It just created a whole bunch of branch universes. What Hickman did here was basically modify that and say that seemingly there's a continuing timeline. Now there's not a whole lot of reconciliation here, but it is cool because it's basically this idea that they're going to go 
I can time and modify things a bit, but for the most part, everything is going to kind of stay the same. The next thing we do is we jump to the modern day. And what this does is it basically picks up with the Avengers more or less having a barbecue. <laughs> and rightfully so, right? They just finished the whole infinity event, the builders and all that kind of stuff, that great big, huge conflict. They, they're they basically resting their souls from war. It's kind of funny because there's this conversation, you know, where, where people are asking like, what all do we have? You know, and the response of Thor is like, well, we prepared, prepared steaks and hamburgers and veggie burgers. I just want to point out that it's strange that Thor is making veggie burgers. I feel like if there's anybody on the Avengers team that would be avidly against vegetable based burgers, it would be Thor. That would be like, I, you know, veggie burgers, you know, a meal for children and, and weaklings. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that'd be the response of Thor. Thor would be like, give me meat, not fake meat, not the impossible Whopper. You know, like, I, that, that's that's how I, I'm sorry. I don't need to, to offend anybody. I'm just saying, right? Like if Thor rolled up at, at Burger King and, and ordered an impossible Whopper, not knowing what he was getting, he would take a bite of it, throw it on the ground and say, what devilry is this, right? Like, I feel like that's what would happen. <laughs> but it's kind of cool because you end up having like this, this kind of conversation where Captain Universe shows up, right? Now, Captain Universe, again, you know, we, we've talked about her before, but because of the the fact that we haven't done this in a little while, I'll do a little bit of a rehash here. Captain Universe is basically the name given to a person who possesses what's called the Enigma Force. And the Enigma Force hails from the microverse, right? This itty bitty microscopic universe inside the main Marvel universe. And the Enigma Force only ever really manifests itself in times of dire need. And it bonds itself to an individual, right? Now, once that person's bond with the Enigma Force, then they're they're christened as Captain Universe. In this instance, it was bond to a, bonded to a woman who was basically involved in a car wreck. And the, the full-on origin of her can be found down in the uh, in the playlist down in the description so you can kind of be kept aware of what's going on but she was basically kind of bonded with the captain universe and, and this is really just kind of jonathan hickman having her here for the purpose of showing how drastic things are right because it's one of these scenarios where captain universe is not all encompassing it's not this being that can basically destroy anything it wants to in the entirety of the universe there are beings out there that are vastly more powerful than captain universe right matthew malloy is a good example the marquee of death easily uh chaos king probably well i'd say definitely chaos king because it was hopping around the multiverse uh the star brand depending on what kind of threat they're facing off against, but it's not some indestructible thing. It's more of a symbolic being, right? They're like, things are that bad because the universe basically has its own defense system in the form of Captain Universe, and they still can't save anything. And now again, at this point, they're not fully aware of that. You know, we are more or less as the audience because of the fact that, you know, the story is six years old, but it's kind of a cool thing because when the question's asked uh, by Captain Universe, do you have any pie? The response of Thor is yes, right? We have made ready such pastries and have done so with vigor. <laughs> and then he says, bring forth the pies. And here comes the Incredible Hulk just bearing trays of pies, right? Like beer pie, which I don't even know what, I don't, I don't even want to know what that tastes like. Mead pie. Actually, I kind of want to know what beer pie tastes like now that I think about it. But basically the Avengers are just kind of relaxing, right? And they're enjoying themselves. Now, at this point, we jump to Iron Man and we jump to Captain America and they're basically talking about the Avengers machine, right? The Avengers program. Now, here's the important thing to understand. And I don't know if we fully covered this early on in the story. The important thing about this conversation between these two is that at some point in the past, Captain America and Iron Man Man basically came up with the idea of Avengers world in the sense that with the, the world being the way that it is, you have all various kinds of threats that are out there. And a lot of this seems to be based off of the events of Civil War, right? The 50 State Initiative, all that kind of stuff. Those of you guys who remember my Civil War videos. Uh, but the idea here is they basically said, okay, you know, we have an Avengers in the United States and that's fine. We can face off against various threats, but what we need are different Avengers teams for various threats because not all Avengers are needed for a particular conflict, right? So if we end up having a, a scenario like the Builders or something like that, we want to make sure we bring our heavy hitters, right? We bring Thor, we bring the Incredible Hulk, that we bring Tony Stark, who's a futurist, you know, somebody along those lines. We want the star brand, right? Because the builders are a super significant threat. The same thing with Thanos, right? The same thing with somebody like the Marquis of Death showing up or something along those lines. But if we have a conflict where it's just something that's relatively small beans, advanced idea mechanics, right? The scientific arm of Hydra. If they do something that's not a planetary threat, they kind of seem to go awry or whatever it is. And they just kind of have to be curtailed and reminded of their place in the bigger picture. We can send Black Widow and Hawkeye and Shang Chi and maybe a couple other people, maybe Iron Fist or somebody like that. We can send them small beans because we don't need a great big huge contingent, right? It's different Avengers teams that serve different purposes and the various Avengers teams would be placed at different locations throughout the world, hence the name Avengers World. And that's why they're having this conversation where uh, you have Captain America talking about Wolverine and saying, we're going to we're gonna move Wolverine off the board, right? He has too much going on and he does. At the time this story was written, uh, the X-Men had just come out of schism, right? So you had uh, Wolverine who broke off the X-Men team and went to go form the... Uh, the, the Jean Grey School of Higher Learning. You had Cyclops who stayed after having killed Charles Xavier and had the Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters. So you basically had two different X-Men schools. You got Wolverine's time on the Avengers. Plus you have Wolverine's own ongoing story taking place, right? So it was just kind of removing him. And it's a great way for Jonathan Hickman to kind of look at the character of Wolverine
brain with everything he's doing in Marvel Comics and basically say, we're taking him off the Avengers for the moment because he's just got too much going on. And it's kind of a funny thing because Tony Stark looks at, at Captain America and says, you're thinking about this in too rigid of a capacity. It's not a chess game, right? It's not my move, your move, my move, your move. It's not necessarily like that, right? This is one of these things where it's a living organism. The teams fluctuate, they change. Just because we have an Avengers team on one side of the world and an Avengers team here in the States does not mean that roster never changes. It doesn't mean that we don't switch people off those teams and put them into different locations. That's kind of the important thing that's going on here, right? It's these two guys creating a worldwide Avengers team with constantly moving parts. So they can shift around as they need to based on the particular conflict. Now, that's one of the most important things to come out of the story because we're going to find out later on. This becomes a lot bigger than a planetary Avengers team. But the other part of this is that they're suddenly met by the arrival of this version of Iron Man from the future. And what, of course, this version of Iron Man does is, is really kind of hit up two things. The first is that they're a little bit off target insofar as the time travel they've engaged in, that they're not as far back as they're supposed to be. Uh, and the other thing is that they know that because there's a Hyperion here, right? It's important to say, uh, to look at how this is phrased, there shouldn't be a Hyperion here. In Marvel Comics, those of you guys who are not familiar with this, in Marvel Comics, Hyperion is the closest allegory Marvel has to Superman in DC Comics, right? In this uh, run by Hickman, you actually get this amazing sort of one shot with, uh, with Hyperion, where he basically kind of outlines all the powers Hyperion has and what he can do. And he is almost a shot for shot remake of Superman. The only person that's closer than that is the Sun God, when we're basically looking at like the bridge and the alternate realities and so on. But this version of Iron Man kind of looks around and, and is a met, of course, by Tony Stark. And Tony Stark's like, what in the world is going on here? And why do you look like you have my armor? And basically this version of Iron Man shuts down the uh, the suit of Tony Stark, right? Like shuts the whole thing down. And then it's just kind of like, okay, like what in the heck is happening, right? Tony Stark's like, what in the world is going on? And this version of Iron Man basically says there's still time and basically explains that a rogue planet is headed towards Earth. Now, this seems insignificant insofar as saying there's a rogue planet on its way. It seems unimportant. The thing to keep in mind is this will become incredibly important here in a little while, right? Probably, probably in the, the next few videos that we're going to do, it's going to become incredibly important, a major plot point, right? Now, the, the other important thing that I, I feel like Hickman kind of missed here is the role of S.W.O.R.D., right? The Sentient World Observation and Response Department. S.W.O.R.D. is basically S.H.I.E.L.D., except they monitor space instead of monitoring Earth, for those of you guys who are familiar with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the whole point of S.W.O.R.D. is, or at least, the, you know, if S.W.O.R.D. had done its job like it was supposed to, it'd be aware of this rogue planet, right? They'd be like, hey guys, there's a planet heading towards Earth. We should probably do something about it. But it seems at this point, S.W.O.R.D. does not become aware of it because Iron Man basically says, you guys have about a month before this planet gets here. Now, this planet's huge in size. It's about the size of Earth, maybe a little bit bigger. And so it's one of these things where it's kind of like, you know, you guys could destroy it, but let's see if we can't do something better. But the funny thing about this is that, that Bruce Banner kind of chimes in and says, here's the thing you have to understand though, right? Like a rogue planet doesn't just appear out of nowhere. A rogue planet is basically a planet that was knocked out of its orbit by some manner and, and, and some means, right? Like you've got a, a solar system out there somewhere in some part of the galaxy or even in a wholly different galaxy outside of ours. And maybe like an asteroid or some object of sufficient strength hits it and knocks it out of its orbit, right? Then what'll happen is because planets are rotating around their stars at, you know, like half a, half a million uh, miles per hour, then if it gets hit, then it has the impact of whatever hit it, which actually speeds up how fast it's moving. And then it gets pushed, you know, out in some direction. And so basically this thing was knocked out of its orbit and it's been traveling towards Earth at 500,000 miles per hour. But the important thing to understand here is that it's doing it in a straight line. And that's what Bruce Banner and Tony Stark pick up on, right? The idea is that if it's moving in a straight line, that means somebody sent it towards Earth. Now it takes time for objects to travel from like one side of the galaxy to another. And even if something's traveling at 500,000 miles per second, it's gonna take light years for it to get here. And Bruce Banner hits up on this idea that, I mean, if this thing was shot in a straight line, then it means that thousands or millions of years ago, somebody basically sent this thing towards our direction. And so the amount of planning that it would take for a person to know that they would have to knock a planet out of orbit, send it towards the Earth, and that it would actually collide with Earth at some point in time, the calculations would be insane. It's, it's almost impossible. You'd have to see the future. It's nuts. And then Iron Man kind of asked the question, well, what makes you think that it's being sent here from like, you know, a few million years ago? What makes you think that somebody didn't just, you know, it was a rogue planet that was kind of making its way. Somebody didn't just show up recently and send it on a path towards us, right? This is the importance of Tony Stark, three-dimensional thinking, right? Thinking on multiple levels and with multiple variables, right? You know, that, that's, that's what made Tony Stark such an impactful character in Marvel Comics. If you're going to be a futurist, you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be the kind of person that Tony Stark is, you have to think on multiple levels and in multiple dimensions in order to be able to pull off any one particular task, right? This is how his mind works. And so with the help of this future Iron Man, the, the Avengers end up constructing this device so they basically plan to embed inside this 
rogue planet. And they successfully do, right? You know, the funny thing is that Tony Stark kind of asked this person, like, what are you creating, right? Some this, this Iron Man is creating something for Tony Stark and won't tell them what it is. And it's kind of like, you know, you're going to have to open it at a future date, uh, but it's basically a present for you, right? It's something that I'm leaving behind for you. And so with this particular device that's basically created, uh, once this device is, is teleported with the help of Eden, who has the ability to teleport things across various spaces, uh, you know, including a, a full universal space, uh, you end up having him basically teleport this device into space. The Incredible Hulk jumps up and then pushes it, right? Like literally with the force of his jump, pushes it directly into the path of the rogue planet. Now, when it lands on that rogue planet, instead of destroying it, once it's embedded inside and the object is activated, once it's powered on, what it does is it actually changes the phase of the object that in a sense, it's basically just slightly out of phase with the main universe, right? So, and it, it's, it's almost intangible is really more or less what it means. And what happens is it allows this world to sort of pass through or to enter into uh, to Earth's orbit, right? So they're basically the Earth and this rogue planet occupying the same space at the same time. And then once everything is all done, once the device is set to, way the, to, the, to where it's supposed to be, then basically it allows the two worlds to more or less occupy the same space at the same time and more or less marry. Now, the reason why that matters is explained with this future version of Iron Man, that when they take their helmet off, this person reveals themselves to be the granddaughter of Tony Stark. It looks like, you know, because of the fact that it's refer they're, they're referred to as, as Rhodey, it looks like it's the actual daughter of James Rhodes or the granddaughter of James Rhodes, that it's not actually the biological child of Tony Stark, but we can kind of assume that it is, right? Probably because James Rhodes died and Tony Stark took her to raise and basically, you know, raise her as his own daughter and she came to see him as a father. That's more or less what happened here. But basically, you know, she kind of explains that having these two worlds occupy the same space at the same time will provide an infinite amount of energy for Earth to basically do almost anything they want to. And the reason why this was done was because this will be important later on, that where the these uh, circumstances originally played out with the Avengers and so on becoming aware of the rogue planet and then ultimately destroying it, then instead, this will provide an energy source that's much needed. Now, again, we're going to find out why that matters once we get to the whole segment about the return of Franklin Richards. But basically, you know, this, this future version of Tony says, you know, it's, it's important that you take time to celebrate what's happening here right now, that you enjoy your life at the moment because everything is about to get exceedingly dark. All the Avengers are about to know what you've been secretly doing alongside the Illuminati. Everything, you know, all this time is about to run out. Everything that you know is about to completely and totally come to an end. What's going on guys? This is Rob and uh, a couple of announcements before we start this video. The first thing is that for those of you guys who are part of the uh, Facebook page, facebook.com slash comics explained, I'm restructuring it and reworking it from the ground up. A lot of you guys will notice a lot of the posts are gone and that's because a lot of the posts that were made on there were done by links as opposed to directly uploading the videos to Facebook. It wasn't until I brought Gordon on board and then we started working more with the Facebook page that we actually started uploading videos directly. So a lot of those links are taken away, which means a lot of those video series on there are are somewhat incomplete. I'm in the process, or at least myself and Gordon are in the process of going through and completing all those. So you're going to see a lot of videos being uploaded uh, in a really short amount of time. So don't panic. I'm not trying to spam you guys. We're going to keep it reasonable. So we're not blowing up your Facebook feed with like 50 videos a day or something stupid like that. The other part of this is I want to put a bug in your all's ear uh, that I'm currently working on a project that I think is going to be amazing. I think you guys are absolutely going to love it. Uh, it's really going to sort of elevate the, the kind of community that we have in a way that we haven't really been able to do before. I don't want to drop too many spoilers at the moment, but it's awesome. I think you guys are going to love it. I know we're excited to do it here over at Comics Explained. I'm very hyped to see what it turns into. But uh, but yeah, with all that being said, guys, I don't want to waste any more time. Uh, let's begin. All right, what's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back to covering Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. And, and this is gonna be kind of an interesting story. This is one of the stories we did not cover the first time around, right? We left this bit of a story out, which in hindsight seemed like a big mistake because there are two big things that come out of this story that go forward into the future of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, right? Two very, very, very important things. And we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, right? And, and once you guys, you guys will see one of them and you'll recognize it right off the bat, right? If you were part of our original videos, like you'll recognize it right off the bat. The other one might take a little bit more poking around, but what this does here is this initially picks up in New York, right? With what's some, what's amounts to like this giant crater in the ground. Now, of course, you've got Maria Hill who responds. Now, for those of you guys who are coming from the Marvel Cinematic Universe and you're aware of Maria Hill, but you don't know how she became director of S.H.I.E.L.D., she's been that way for quite some time. She really kind of rose to prominence as the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. during the events of Civil War. Now, there were some things that led up to that, uh, and originally it was Nick Fury, but Maria Hill's been director 
for quite some time. And the reality is she's probably the most hated director. Now, she's been the director really from, from the events of Civil War running all the way up until the modern era. And, and it wasn't really even directly Civil War. It kind of was Civil War. And then Tony Stark basically ended up more or less winning, quote unquote, the Civil War conflict, for lack of a better word. And that led to him becoming director of S.H.I.E.L.D. And then when he was more or less forced out uh, and the whole thing was disbanded, then it was reformed under uh, under Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin. And then he was defeated. That led to the reinstatement of Maria Hill as a director of S.H.I.E.L.D. But basically, Basically, what, what this means here is that she's kind of been running S.H.I.E.L.D. for quite some time. During Civil War, she was hated, right? Like, I hated her. I was like, dude, she's a terrible person, right? But it was cool to for Marvel to be able to write her in such a way to where, you know, I had like a, like I had an extremely emotional reaction to her character in the sense of like disdain, right? Like, it was just great writing on behalf of Marvel. Uh, but the reason why they're here is because, of course, there's this massive crater. You've got S.H.I.E.L.D. agents who are on site basically responding to it and, and essentially telling her, hey, like, we called you here for a particular reason. And that's because the body of Hank Pym was found here, right? The body of Ant-Man was found at this location. And so what we end up doing here is kind of jumping back by four hours and picking up with AIM Island. Now, AIM is an organization we've talked about before, but we haven't really gone super in depth. So AIM stands for Advanced Idea Mechanics. And this is an organization that was originally part of Hydra, right? So Hydra was basically formed by, by Baron Von Strucker with a little bit of a throw in from the hand in, uh, in Japan. AIM was a scientific arm of Hydra, right? Where Hydra was kind of like this overarching force. AIM were the ones who focused on the science side. And they had a whole bunch of different events over the course of the years, right? AIM, for example, they were the first ones to tap into and create a cosmic cube. Advanced Idea Mechanics has had some pretty notable roles, but what's happening here is they've basically managed to capture a kind of artifact, right? To pull an artifact through their, their you know, technological device, right? Their portal, more or less. And the whole thing is being watched over by Minister Superior. Now, Superior is an old school character. When I say old school, I mean relative, right? She was created in the Captain America comics in 1991. Uh, originally, she she was a character who was who formed a group called the Femizons, right? The idea was that she wanted to basically dominate all the men across the world. Uh, her, her campaign was put to an end pretty fast, right? She wasn't really a major villain. She's never been a major player, right? But at the moment, she's currently the Scientist Supreme. Now, the role of Scientist Supreme in Marvel Comics exists in a couple different forms. You've got the Scientist Supreme of AIM, which is basically what they call their leader. And then you have your Scientist Supreme of Earth, which is where this kind of recognized as the best scientific mind on Earth. Uh, and it's usually recognized by a higher power beyond the advanced idea mechanics. You know, for example, Hank Pym was recognized as the scientist supreme. He's the scientific equivalent of Doctor Strange, basically. And so it's it's a it's, it's kind of a cool little thing. It's important to differentiate between those two things so you don't get them confused. But the whole thing's being watched over by her. And this this whole kind of portal, this whole kind of device they have is designed to basically reach into alternate realities. Now, the reason why this matters is because the device really only ever seems to encounter beings in alternate realities when their universe is ending, right? Because remember, the incursions are happening. Happening. And so Advanced Idea Mechanics is aware of them. They're aware of these incursions and everything going on. And so this device that they use to pull things in is the same device that was used to pull Hyperion from his dying reality. And so with that happening, with the, the portal basically being open, the device going in and basically opening up and allowing beings to pass through, what we end up getting are what initially looked like the classic Avengers. And it's kind of crazy because if the device can reach through space, then it can reach through time, right? Because time and space are the same thing, right? You, you can't, you know, adjust one without adjusting the other. And so it, it's, it's kind of cool because this this kind of group here is sort of looking at the situation and it's kind of like okay this is advanced idea mechanics like this is kind of crazy and initially like they kind of have a little bit of a conversation of sorts and it's kind of like okay like when advanced idea mechanics reveals like hey you're on aim island then like it almost kind of breaks out into a bit of a skirmish and in fact the hulk almost begins to launch an attack against them but then he's basically told to stand down by the avengers which he ultimately does they go back into the portal and then they basically leave but the funny thing about this is they don't teleport back to their universe instead they end up elsewhere in the main marvel universe. They end up in New York. And so, of course, you've got Ant-Man, you've got Thor, you've got Hulk, you've got pretty much the classic Avengers roster as we knew them, right? This is the original, not really the original, this is Avengers number four going forward. And the reason why I say Avengers number four is because that's where you ended up having the discovery of Captain America. The only person that's, that's major and absent here, I would say, is probably Namor the Submariner. The cool thing is that they kind of harken back to their own reality and basically realizing that like the, that universe was coming to an end between what they were told by advanced idea mechanics and between what they've kind of figured out here at least recalled insofar as like when basically an incursion was about to take place and their universe was about to be destroyed that the portal opened up and they were basically kind of yanked through right they ended up basically jumping through to save themselves as they start to make their way around thor looks a lot more nefarious right and he kind of looks at these people around here and it's like why are you not kneeling before me well if you're not going to kneel then that's fine let me give you a taste of what it means to be a god and he uses his power and kills people and it's kind of like okay like this is a little bit bonkers right so jump back to the to the present moment right now you've got maria hill who's 
basically there in in shield headquarters or at least shield scientific base she's talking to the avengers and she asked the question like where were you three hours ago right like what were you doing three hours ago and the reason why that question is being asked is because as soon as this whole event takes place right as soon as all this goes down you basically have uh you know uh, advanced idea mechanics that kind of hits the panic button now this is just kind of a brief jump back we're not going to stay in this this one month ago period right so don't don't really focus on the fact that it's a month ago but what this basically shows us is that at some point in the past advanced idea mechanics had discovered the avengers in the midst of them basically recovering from a massive incident right this looks like one of the big catastrophes on earth has taken place during the event so far but they end up sampling dna from these from from like black widow and thor hyperion they're basically going through and and siphoning off uh, siphoning off dna samples from these various guys right and so pick up a week after that and you basically have them kind of synthesizing the dna analyzing the dna and then you know basically two weeks after that you've got advanced idea mechanics doing what they usually always do creating super adaptoids now the reason why this matters is because super adaptoids are originally an advanced idea mechanics creation and they're exactly what they sound like they're beings that are designed to adapt to to various superheroes right to take on the, their powers to take on their abilities and so on and so forth and in fact the super adaptoid itself which was the first iteration of that character and kind of went by his namesake was probably one of the most capable villains the avengers ever faced right because he basically had all their powers he could adapt to all of their abilities and that's kind of what what seemed to happen here right and so jumping back to about three hours ago where we pick up with these avengers from this this alternate reality having laid waste to the entirety of new york the reason why these super adaptoids being created by advanced idea mechanics matter is because this is cleanup duty they don't want anybody to know that they brought these individuals here and so they basically dispatch the super adaptoids to face off against these avengers and for the most part the super adaptoids are completely almost completely and totally overwhelmed the difference here is that the super adaptoids were programmed to basically subdue the avengers and bring them in now one of the other things that goes on here is that you've got you've got bruce banner you got the controller that's being used by wasp uh and it basically like when it's destroyed the incredible hulk reverts back into bruce banner that matters we'll talk about that here in a minute but one of the super adaptoids begins to basically kind of violate his own programming that instead of bringing in hank pym the super adaptoid actually kills him but the death of hank pym this is one of the single most important things to happen in this comic and this is one of the things that you kind of get into when it's jonathan hickman tying into everything else right but the long and short of this is that's where the body of hank pym comes from that the avengers basically managed to get away and that the super adaptoids are recalled by uh by advanced idea mechanics and so the, the the whole attempt to basically capture the avengers is considered to be a failure and so what this does is it picks back up in the in the current moment right now with the proper avengers right the the, the avengers that we all know being questioned by maria hill and basically saying like three hours ago like black widow was getting her nails done and carol danvers was working out thor was drinking iron man's like i was getting my nails done <laughs> But basically, Captain America is like, whatever it is that you believe you have going on didn't have anything to do with us. Enter Hyperion, basically using his Superman-esque powers, more or less, analyzing the body of Hank Pym and coming to the realization that's not our Hank Pym. That's a Hank Pym from a different universe. I don't know what the deal is with this guy, but he's not from here. And that kind of goes into the investigation of the Avengers, trying to figure out who these other Avengers are. Now, what this does is it basically leads to this revelation that where all the Avengers from the alternate reality left, and they basically went to a different location, not, not back to their reality, Reality, but they went back to a different location this leads to the discovery that bruce banner from that alternate reality avengers has actually made his way to where the main marvel universe bruce banner apartment resides and when he gets there of course he finds bruce banner from the main marvel universe so you've got these two versions of bruce who are basically encountering each other now the follow-up to this is that where the super adaptoids are put back into their stasis cells that the one who killed hank pym basically begins to think for itself and that's not how they're supposed to work right the super adaptoids are programmed for a particular cause they're programmed for a particular action and they're not supposed to be able to deviate beyond that particular action but this version basically becoming self-aware and almost kind of becoming sentient and, and essentially indeed becoming sentient leads to it actually modifying the other super adaptoids these beings were originally created for the purpose of exploring the multiverse that was a whole idea behind advanced idea mechanics designing them the way that they were but what ended up happening here is that with them basically being sent after the uh the the avengers it basically seemed to be the catalyst for why it is that like this one adaptoid managed to break away from its programming it was being tasked to do something that it wasn't originally programmed to do albeit its programming was was still intact it was basically just told on your way to exploring the multiverse take those guys out instead right it was aim hitting the panic button but this one small change allowed it to begin deviating even further away from its programming and so what it does here is we, we basically jump back to these two bruces talking to each other right and we'll basically say bruce one and bruce two because what you get here is this kind of explanation to a degree right this sense that you you have uh basically you know what we'll say bruce two is the one from 
the alternate reality and Bruce one is the the main Marvel Universe Bruce and Bruce two basically reveals that that where Bruce one can kind of you know he turns into the Incredible Hulk whenever he gets angry Bruce two basically says it used to be that way but the Avengers on his world effectively lobotomized him and he doesn't really have any access to the emotional centers of his brain the only time he becomes the Incredible Hulk is when the circuitry inside his brain that was implanted there by the Avengers is remotely activated using that remote control and they can basically turn him into the Incredible Hulk anytime they want to and it's one of these things where they're basically shown to be bad guys that these guys are basically you know bad Avengers right because what it does is it leads to the main Marvel Universe Avengers ultimately tracking down these alternate reality Avengers and then of course a great big huge fight breaks out and so it's kind of nuts because where Iron Man is facing off against this alternate reality Iron Man Tony Stark is kind of like okay like where this alternate reality version is like you're a Stark are you the Sun or something like that and and the response of Tony is yeah I mean I'm 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 the Sun but like who are you like what's your deal and this guy basically reveals that he's Jarvis he takes the helmet off and says like I killed you as soon as I got the chance like I killed your father after he built the the machine you know and then I smothered you in your crib right and then I took your Iron Man tech and then of course that leads to Tony Stark freaking out and attacking him for Captain America he's a villain in the sense that like he's a general right and he's just a nefarious guy right he doesn't really have any 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 particular powers he's still kind of Captain America the way that he always was but like he's he's just a villain from there you also have the alternate universe version of Thor and of course it's kind of one of these funny things because initially he holds off on fighting the main Marvel Universe Thor and it's like hey man we can be friends right like we can team up and we can basically conquer this world together and the response of the main Marvel Universe Thor is of what good are you if you can't watch your backside which of course leads to Hyperion swooping in and defeating the evil version of Thor now when the hammer hammer falls you end up seeing that it says Thor with two R's and it basically says whosoever lifts this hammer or holds this hammer if they be unworthy shall possess the power of Thor that'll become important later on if you are familiar with that do not spoil please for the love of God <laughs> Please, for the love of God, do not spoil for the people who have no idea what that means. And so, of course, you basically ended up having uh, one of the Bruce Banners who was subdued by the other, and then the Incredible Hulk popping up here. Now, the fact that the controller was destroyed, and the fact that we're basically dealing with, you know, this this Incredible Hulk here, really points to the idea that it's the main Marvel Universe Bruce Banner, right? That, that's that's basically who this is, like the good guy Bruce Banner. But the cool thing is that he kind of shows up here and basically allies himself with the evil Avengers. Now, this leads to advanced idea mechanics firing what's called a, 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 a tachyon cell which basically encases the entirety of both avengers teams and then freezes time inside right so for them inside this bubble time is completely frozen the important thing is that once advanced idea mechanics goes in and then once they get out everything will start to return to normal and so they basically grab the avengers abscond with them and then take off while that's happening these super adaptoids basically open the portal that accesses the multiverse and walk through and, and basically walk through to fulfill their purpose and to chart the multiverse and so from there we pick up with this this last little tidbit of the story and we have Bruce Banner who goes walking into Stark Tower and basically starts having a conversation with uh with Iron Man this takes place before the fight between both Avengers teams right so it's kind of this little any mini year period as soon as that version of Bruce is defeated by the main Marvel Universe Bruce Banner he dons his outfit takes his briefcase and then walks to go see Tony Stark and as he starts talking to Tony it's one of these things where he's kind of like Bruce Banner knows something and Tony's kind of kind of trying to catch up with what Bruce Banner knows now the funny thing about this is the way that Tony plays it Tony Stark does not like to look like he does doesn't know what's going on in the room, right? He likes to be the guy who feels like he's got it all figured out. That's the engineer in him, the narcissist. That's the arrogant part of Tony Stark that wants to believe he's the only one that really has it all figured out. Or if other people have it figured out, he's following right along with them. But he basically starts talking to, to Tony about like this, this whole program, right? This Avengers initiative that they have in effect created, right? This whole Avengers initiative program that's been launched by them. And the question is with everything that's been going on with this, this, you know, advanced idea mechanics retrieval unit, grabbing that Avengers team and then whisking them away and all that kind of stuff. With everything that's happening with regards to all these events what Bruce Banner has been doing is Bruce Banner has been thinking when Bruce basically went alongside the Avengers and then snuck off and then basically you know talked to advanced idea mechanics to understand what's going on that what advanced idea mechanics revealed to this version of Bruce because he's like hey I was the Hulk at the time I'm regular Bruce now what's going on you know and he basically says well I mean if you really want to know like what we understand at this moment is that like the multiverse is dying every every universe like what you have out there in the multiverse is you have Earths that are crashing into each other and if both Earths make contact, then both multiverses or both universes are destroyed. If one of the Earths is destroyed, the universes pass through each other, right? And so he's like, you know, advanced idea mechanics is like, from, from what we gather, that's what's happening. And what we're doing is we're basically just trying to explore. We're trying to understand it. And so that's when he basically turned into the Hulk, started freaking out and destroying everything. And then of course he shows up here at the office of Tony Stark. And what, what he basically says is like, after learning that from advanced idea mechanics, after learning all of that, I've started thinking, I've started realizing that some of the most pivotal 
events that we've been to. The events were like we were fighting the builders in space, that you weren't there, that Reed Richards wasn't there, that Black Panther wasn't there, that Doctor Strange wasn't there. Like, like a lot of these, these guys that I know are not there. So my question is, why did you build the Avengers team? And what's actually going on? Is the multiverse actually dying? And initially, like Tony Stark starts to dodge the question, right? He tries to like avoid the question, dodge the question, you know, and he starts, he starts saying like, you're building this big Dyson sphere around the sun, except like when I was there, it's obvious from the design that you have, that you have no intention of finishing it. So you're using it for a very particular purpose, but you're not going to weaponize the sun. And even if you could, it's not going to do anything. So my question is, what's the point of all this? What's actually going on? And that's when he kind of starts to, to sort of assemble everything together and say, it's actually real, isn't it? The multiverse is actually collapsing. And then Stark again, kind of tries to dodge it. And that's when Bruce Banner corners him and says, you did it, didn't you? You reformed the Illuminati. And the response of, of, of Tony Stark is yes. And then Bruce starts injecting himself with tranquilizers. Now the tranquilizers aren't necessarily designed to like put him to sleep. They're designed to keep the Hulk from manifesting because the more that Bruce is hearing, the more pissed off he's getting because he knows just like we know as the reader, the reformation of the Illuminati is never a good thing. It's always a bad thing when that happens because it always leads to problems. And so Bruce starts asking like, what have you guys done up to this point? Have you guys actually destroyed worlds yet? Is that why you guys are building weapons? And the response of Tony is, this is about as real as it gets, man. Like it's not some alien invading force that we can fight off and, and live another day. That's not how this works. These are earths that are showing up. And if they crash into ours after an eight hour window passes, our entire universe is destroyed. There's nowhere to run. Now, the reality is that there is. And that's one of the things that Black Swan talked about is that there are realities. There are universes out there where the superheroes of earth bailed on that universe. They basically opened a portal to a different dimension and then took off and they left that earth to die along with everybody with it and then took off to an alternate reality. Sometimes they encountered worlds where there were superheroes. Sometimes they encountered worlds where there were no superheroes. That was the case with the evil Avengers that showed up from the alternate reality that, that advanced idea mechanics brought in. They were sent to a different world where there were no Avengers. They would just kind of jump into a new world and, and, and literally it's just jumping, jumping a sinking ship. That's what it's called. It's considered to be a cowardly thing to do, but there are people out there who did it. There are other instances and in other realities where superheroes on earth actually destroyed their own planet to keep the, keep the, the universe from dying and then took up residence on a different planet inside the universe, right? So there's been different people who have reacted in different ways. But the, the question of Bruce Banner is what's going on with your, your plans? What have you done? You know, and, and that's where Tony basically says, we haven't really destroyed a world yet. We haven't had to, or at least we haven't destroyed an inhabited earth yet. We have not been met with an earth that has superheroes and has human beings living on, uh, living on it that we've actually destroyed. We've been lucky. But the reality is if it comes to that, I don't know if that's something that I'm, that I'm able to do. And the response of Tony in, in saying that in saying like, I don't really know if it's something that I am or am not willing to do means he's preparing himself to do that. And that's the reality of it is that time is going to come when they're going to have to destroy an inhabited world in order to save their own. And so with Bruce basically realizing this, that's when he starts to get angry. And that's when he starts to freak out. And he says, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, what am I supposed to do with this information? Am I supposed to keep it to myself? The fact that the multiverse is basically dying, that like the potential is going to be there for you guys to destroy an inhabited world with billions of innocent lives to save our own? Is that something that I'm supposed to be okay with? Like, do I hide this from Steve Rogers? Do I hide this from, from like Betty Ross, you know, or like Thunderbolt Ross? Do I hide this from people? You know, do I keep this to myself? And so what this does is it basically leads to this, this alternate reality, Bruce Banner, basically, you know, kind of showing up here or at least being met by Tony Stark. And, and what Tony end up, ends up doing is basically saying, Hey, look, uh, you know, Banner's pump full of tranquilizers. You know, we got to kind of keep things. We got to keep them on ice until things are okay. Tony attaches a, uh, a device to the back of his neck that basically keeps him from being able to talk. And so this Bruce is just kind of more or less hidden away, right? He's basically just taken away and locked in a cell where he can never become the Incredible Hulk again. And that's where this whole thing dead ends into the Necropolis. Now, the Necropolis, as most of you guys probably know from the previous videos, is the Wakandan city of the dead, right? That during Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four run, because of the story Doom War, basically showing that, that T'Challa lost the role of, uh, of Black Panther to his sister Shuri, you know, he was basically just a guy who was there. And so when he went to visit the Panther God Bass, Bass basically gave him dominion over the dead, right? His ability to communicate and talk to the dead. And so with this place basically being an insane, an exceedingly sacred location, no one's allowed here except for T'Challa. He's the only person that can get in here because he's the only person that needs to be here. He's the only person that can talk to the dead. I mean, I guess Shuri can do it too, but it's one of these kind of respectful things, right? She kind of maintains that level of respect. But the reason why that matters is because what this means is that the evil version of Bruce is basically locked away. He's hid away. This allows for Bruce Banner in the main Marvel universe for Tony Stark to pass that alternate reality version off of, uh, of Bruce as the main Marvel universe Bruce. So as far as everybody out there is aware, Bruce Banner sitting in a prison cell. It means that he can now operate in secret without anybody actually knowing what he's doing. And that's exceedingly important 
because he's now being introduced and being brought into as part of the Illuminati. And so from there, we switch over to the second epilogue here. And this is probably one of the most important parts of the story. And the reason why is because as these super adaptoids are cruising through the multiverse, they end up discovering this kind of space station, more or less, that exists between universes. And what this does is it basically has them landing on its location. And when they get there, they're met by what are basically map makers. And that's where the kind of questions asked by these map makers, do you know what you are? Like, what, what was your, what was your purpose? You know, and, and they say, well, our purpose was, was to explore, right? That was the entire basis behind us. Then the, the map makers like, but you've surpassed your creator's intentions, haven't you? And the response is yes. You know, and, and, and so ultimately, you know, when, when the questions asked, you know, what are you? The adaptoid responds, I'm an explorer. And the map maker responds, no, you're a map maker. This is where the map makers come from, right? The map makers basically originate. And we'll find out more in terms of where the original map makers came from and how it is they kind of propagate themselves this way. But the, the quick answer here is that map makers come into existence when a form of artificial intelligence basically reaches sentience, right? When it reaches a super high level of intelligence. But there's a reason why that happens. It's not simply just because of the fact that this one particular super adaptoid managed to break away from its programming. There's also something else at play here. Okay, so we are back again with our coverage of Avengers. Now, this is where things really begin to pick up right? This is where things get really, really cool. And that's, that's, that, that was one of the big issues that I think I kind of had with Hickman's Avengers run is it starts off super strong. And then there comes a point where it looks like Marvel was just wanting Hickman to kill time for a little while, which is kind of what he did, right? Now, some of it was him setting things up, but for the most part, it was just like a small little thing here and there, right? Like you guys saw the alternate reality evil version of Thor. You saw his hammer. You saw the alternate reality version of Bruce. Those two things will come back later, but it was by no means necessary to write like a full on four issue story story in order to achieve that, right? That could have been done in the blink of an eye. But what this particular part of the story does is it really sort of, it, it's kind of the, the shifting of the status quo, right? How things used to be versus how things are, or at least how things are going forward. And what we end up doing here is basically picking up with Steve Rogers having a dream, right? Now this dream is basically the sequence of events that we saw in the very, in the very beginning of the story, right? When we saw the first new Avengers arc where the Infinity Gauntlet was destroyed and all that kind of stuff, that's what this is, right? It's Captain America getting the Infinity Gauntlet, when the group was first formed or first reformed in order to face off against the incursions. And, and, you know, of course, as all the gems were basically destroyed, except for the time gem just disappeared. But the idea here is that this is essentially Captain America recalling all those moments, right? That whole entire sequence. And it kind of goes exactly the way that it did initially, right? Which is to say that when, when the infinity gauntlet fails, the, the group basically starts talking about this idea of destroying worlds, that if the destruction of their universe hinges on on another universe's earth colliding with their own, then just destroy that universe's earth and call it a day, right? Do whatever you have to do in order to preserve the existing universe. And it's kind of one of these interesting things, right? Because initially Captain America was, was wildly against it. He was like, no, we're not going to destroy any alternate realities. We can find a way to figure this out. And that's a good moral sentiment to have. But what happens when you get to a point where you cannot, where there are no other options, right? When there are no other options to explore. And that's why Captain America's memory was wiped. And that's why he was cast out because ultimately, Ultimately, he didn't have the fortitude to do what needed to be done. And that was the nature of this group, right? To make the tough choices, to do the things that other people just weren't really able or willing to do. And that's the weakness of Captain America, right? Call it moral righteousness, call it him doing the right thing, you know, whatever the case is. At the end of the day, when it hits the fan and you have to make the choice that's going to lead to other people being sacrificed, Captain America can't do it. And that's what made things so intriguing is because he's there for kind of the moral support, but he's not one of the heavy hitters when it comes to the thinking power, when it comes to brain power. He's not on par with Tony Stark or Reed Richards or T'Challa. He's not the leader of a kingdom like Name with a Submariner who's willing to do whatever it takes to preserve the kingdom of Atlantis, right? He's not that kind of a guy. He's a guy who'll do whatever he can to make sure other people survive. But at the end of the day, if the survival of others means the death of himself, then that's a problem as far as this group's concerned, right? Like Captain America would spare another universe and sacrifice his own. That kind of seems to be the case. And that sort of selflessness cannot survive in this kind of scenario. And that's why his mind was wiped, he was banished, and that was the end of that. The problem with this is that Captain America now remembers everything. Now, the reason why this happens, and it's important to explain this, the reason why this happens is because of an event that Marvel had called Original Sin. Now, Original Sin is one of these events that Marvel created, whereby it was a means to either kind of propel existing stories, you know, into a, a more suitable direction, or to just kind of, you know, introduce new concepts. For example, he had a guy by the name of Midas, right? And it was like the Midas Empire. This guy could touch stuff and turn to gold. One of the dumbest things to come out of that was like his daughter took over. Nobody 
cared, right? Nobody cared about that. What made Original Sin cool is all the small little things that we got, right? Because with Original Sin, what you ended up getting was the death of the Watcher, and one of the Watcher's eyes was secured by a villain called the Orb. Now, the Orb was dumb. He was just a giant eyeball, right? He was basically a really useless villain. But he, you know, when you had like all the various superheroes facing off against him, he ended up revealing the eye and then blasting them with the secrets of the Watcher, basically being that the Watcher sees everything, right? A lot of you guys probably know who the Watcher is. Uwatu the Watcher, he sits on the moon. He doesn't really act, right? He's the guy that basically told the Fantastic Four Galactus is coming, that kind of a thing, uh, at least in the original Galactus trilogy. But Uwatu sees everything. So the lies people tell themselves, the secrets that have been kept, everything that this group's been doing behind the back of the Avengers, right? Like traveling from world to world and the map makers and the, the you know, the rumor of the Ivory Kings and the, the, the Black Priests and all that kind of stuff. While all that's been hidden, the Watcher saw it and knows about all of it, right? And so with Captain America basically having his mind wiped by, by Doctor Strange, the fact that that happened has been revealed to him through the events of Original Sin. Now you can find the whole Original Sin playlist on the YouTube channel, right? You know, on the, on the Comics Explain YouTube channel, you can find it all there, you know, and, and, and it works, you know, for what it is. But the idea here is, is that with Steve Rogers basically waking up, he realizes that in the aftermath of what's happened, at least his, his mind being wiped between the time that happened and the, and the current moment, he's figured out a few things, right? And so what he ends up doing is of course, grabbing Hawkeye and grabbing Black Widow, who will be exceedingly important to the future of the story, along with Thor, Hyperion, and Starbrand. Now, to face off against Tony Stark, this may seem overkill, but it's not right? It's actually not. And the reason why is because once they get into the lab of Tony Stark and he's confronted by Steve Rogers, then all this gets an explanation, right? The response to Steve is, you've been lying to us. It's time the lies stop, right? It's time that all these lies come to an end. And when, when Tony's kind of like, what are you talking about? The response to Steve is, I remember. And that's when Tony Stark begins to pick up on what Steve's talking about, that he recalls everything that happened in the very beginning of this story. Tony's response is, okay, let's go talk about it, man. And Steve's just kind of like, you've done it, haven't you? Like, you've destroyed worlds. Like, you've, you've, You've had other Earths that have shown up here from other realities and you've destroyed them to save our own. And again, I side with that, right? I side with that idea. Like, yeah, I mean, hey, look, it kind of sucks, but sorry about your luck. It's just, it's, it's the way things work. You don't fix a sandwich for the hungry kids across the street if your kids are hungry at home, right? Charity starts at home my home. That's the way it works. You can call it selfish if you want to. Not really, right? I mean, if you're a superhero and you're occupying Earth and you realize that like your your Earth and your entire universe could be destroyed if another Earth crashes into it, well, then I'm sorry about those guys, but you gotta go. That's just the way, that's just the way it is, right? Practical. It's the reasonable thing to do and it makes sense. And so because of that, you know, with Captain America asking the question, whose moral compass was it that cracked first, right? Who was it that wasn't, that, who was it that broke first? The response of Tony is, you did. Because you didn't have the fortitude to do it needed to be done. You're a half measure. And, and Captain America freaks, right? Immediately just like punches the crap out of Tony Stark. And then when everybody's like, what in the world is going on? That's when he revealed they've reformed, right? Like the Illuminati's returned. And that's what makes things so crazy is because he basically ends up saying, he ends up revealing to Hyperion, to Starbrand and all these guys in their spare time that like Reed Richards and Black Panther and Namor the Submariner and Black Bolt, Doctor Strange, Tony Stark. And even now, well, he doesn't really know about Bruce Banner at the moment, but like they've been jumping around from university, like just destroying other worlds, right? That's what's been happening here. And the other crazy thing about that is that, that you know, Steve Rogers kind of hits on the idea that Tony Stark's been using them. And that's true, all right? Here's, here's you know, and, and that's why I've kind of waited up to this point to basically explain exactly what's going on here and why this all shifts. So the way this works is, as you guys have noticed, you have the Avengers set of events, and then you have the new Avengers set of events, right? The the incursions, the map makers, all that kind of stuff. You've had basically two stories going on at the same time. The whole creation of the Avengers machine by Tony Stark, which is to say a project that he was working on with Steve Rogers to expand the Avengers roster to face off against various threats, that was a distraction. So long as Captain America's doing that, he's not paying attention to anything else. He's not noticing the events of like the incursions and so on and so forth because from for, from Tony Stark's perspective Captain America is basically a two-dimensional guy and in a lot of ways he is Captain America is basic and he's two-dimensional he's not really 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 smart right he's really good at like rallying troops and leading them towards a particular cause but at the end of the day he's a soldier right he does what he's told to do that's basically what it is what Tony Stark had to do was was engineer a situation to where Captain America was doing what he was instructed to do without realizing it to basically say like it's Steve Rogers idea right to kind of curtail 
curtail his thinking process to sort of, you know, move things and, and put the pieces in a particular way so that when Captain America looked back on the whole Avengers machine, he saw himself, he saw it as kind of a reflection of his ideals that Tony Stark was able to bring into fruition, right? That's how it was all engineered by Tony. It's probably the single greatest act of manipulation in the entire history of the Marvel Universe, right? It's huge. And, and that was the whole point is basically to have the Avengers face off against various threats, right? That's it. The builders were a credible threat and nobody really saw the builders coming, right? The builders was something that had to be sorted out, that had to be dealt with. But for, for Reed and, and Tony Stark and Black Panther and all them, you know, because of the incursions and all that, the arrival of the builders was fortuitous, right? Like the Avengers from this alternate reality, you know, that were brought in by advanced idea mechanics, that was fortuitous. All these, these little, these things that basically happened that just happened to happen at the right time and benefited Tony and, and his whole crew, right? So that's, that's really what's been taking place here. It's just been manipulation on behalf of Tony Stark. And, and when he's confronted by that, by Steve Rogers, the response of Tony is, yeah, I did, man. I did what I needed to do in order to make sure that we could achieve our goal. Because if you had been left to your own devices, and if you had been made aware of what was happening, you would have done what you always do. You would have gotten in the way. You would have slowed down progress. You would have been the source of the problem, not the source of a solution. And so the response of Captain America is, it's not going to work. And the, and the response of Iron Man is, that's fine, man, but you have to understand, this is my workshop. You've walked into the lion's den. You've come into Iron Man's office, into the place where he works and challenged me to a fight. Understand, my friend, when you fight me in my workshop like this, you're not fighting me. You're fighting a legion of me. And every single Iron Man armor comes pouring out, right? Every single one. And, and it's, it's cool to see because these are enough guys to basically take those Iron Man suits down, but it's, it's just so many versions of these Iron Man suits with so many wild abilities. The problem with that is that when that happens, suddenly the time stone pops up. At the most inopportune time, the time stone pops up. It, it, it snatches up Captain America and it snatches up Black Widow and it snatches up Hawkeye and it whisks them 48 years into the future. Okay, so we're continuing on with our Avengers and new Avengers. And this one is gonna be interesting, right? This one's gonna be interesting. Um, the cool thing about this is that we do get basically a kind of full on explanation of what's going on up to this point, right? Because one of the big things that was happening here, and this is this is one of the, the kind of struggles that you get into when it comes to Hickman telling these long form stories, because there's so many complex plot threads going on, it can be difficult to keep track of it all, right? And so you kind of find yourself in this situation where you almost kind of feel free floating, right? Like you're not sure what What's happening what's still happening what's not happening anymore uh, and so what he really kind of does and you consider his whole run to be in two sections right this is kind of the, the first section leading up to this is all just one cohesive part after this you go into the quote-unquote time runs out event and that's where everything you know where everything really begins to pop off right where you really get into like the action-packed oh my god i can't believe that happened part of the story but up to this point you know what this does is kind of clear us up and get everything sorted out get everything organized and then we just go forward from there now in the last video that we did we talked about how the time zone had reappeared in front of like Iron Man and Captain America and Black Widow, Thor, Hyperion, all these guys, and basically whisked them into the future, right? Or at least just kind of took them away. Where they end up at is at 48 years in the future. Now, when they get here, uh, they're immediately set upon by what look like more or less Avengers of sorts, right? And and basically these guys are taken out relatively fast. And as soon as this, this ends, then suddenly it's a realization that's brought upon by a combination of Hyperion being able to just kind of look at organic matter, you know, the, the buildings around them, things like that, as well as the power of Starbrand and coming to the realization that they're about 48 years into the future, right? Now, for them, for the most part, it's kind of a guess, right? But when, when you end up having Hawkeye as well as uh, the future version of Thor and the future version of Hyperion, Starbrand, who all show up, then it's kind of like, okay, you know, you're basically about 50 years in the future. That's kind of the explanation that's given. Now, the funny thing about this is you kind of have this little bit of a standoff between Hawkeye, uh, the, his older self and his younger self. Now, as soon as they both fire off arrows and they both hit the others, that's how they know that like each one is legit, right? You know, future Hawkeye knows that is actually his younger self and so on. But the funny thing is that future Hawkeye kind of knows what's going on, right? Like he's aware of the idea that the time stone popped up, that it whisked them 50 years into the future. And that what he's doing here is kind of explaining a little bit to Captain America in so far that uh, there's a lot going on, right? There's a lot of things that are, that are taking place. You're going to go further into the future than where you already are right now. Now at that point, of course, he whispers something into the ear of Captain America and we will find out here in a little while. But he basically says like, there were two things that I was told to say, right? The first one was what he said to Captain America. And the second thing when, 
when Clint Barton was like, you know, when, when present day Hawkeye was like, what's the thing you were supposed to say? Future uh, Hawkeye basically attacks Tony Stark and says like, this is for everybody who died and all of us who lived through it, right? So whatever it is that happens, at least whatever it is that Iron Man does is huge, right? It's a, it's a pretty significant thing because it seems to bring pain and torment to everybody around them. But before Captain America can ask the question, like what was all that about? Or at least before he can get an answer, the time stone pops up and it's shattered pieces. It restructures itself and begins to whisk them away. And when Hawkeye's asked the question, what's going to happen next? His response is, I don't know. This is as far as I made it. I never made it beyond this point, right? And so ultimately, you know, Hawkeye never really gets, gets past this particular place. And so what it does is it picks back up in fractured temporal space. And all that means is it's basically just kind of time, just sort of in the time stream is all that is. But Hawkeye ends up falling off, right? And that's why he never made it past this point because he never sees what goes on later on. Now, at this point, we're 422 years into the future. And what ends up happening here is the Avengers basically land in the Ultron future. For those of you guys who don't know what that is, Marvel had a line of comics called Ultron Forever. And it was a three issue mini series. And we covered it on the channel, on the Comics Explained channel. So you're welcome to check it out. But the idea here was that at some point in the future, Ultron basically shows up in kind of a perfected form. He essentially kills Odin, steals the Odin force, conquers Asgard, and then conquers Earth. And basically starts merging humans and machines into like a kind of cybernetic race, right? Now, there are little pockets of surviving humans, but they're swiftly being tracked down and either eliminated or, or brought in and replaced with these cybernetic versions, right? But Ultron's essentially conquered everything. And so it's kind of nuts because you don't really get a full on, I mean, you kind of get a get an explanation, but you don't really get any reconciliation between the future Age of Ultron story that we saw from, I think it was Bendis who wrote it, and uh, and the Ultron Forever storyline. And I think they're two separate futures, but I don't remember off the top of my head. But the long and short of this is that when the Avengers show up, they basically arrive inside of this kind of stasis unit. And that's because their arrival was expected. Their arrival was planned. And we'll talk about why their arrival was planned here in a little while, or at least why their arrival was expected here in a little while. But you basically have these kind of, you know, artificial intelligence Avengers who show up and basically kind of start capturing these different guys. Now, the implication here is that this little segment here with them showing up in the Ultron Forever future, this seems to take place before the events of the Ultron Forever story, right? So that, that kind of seems to be what's going on here. But you end up having Captain America, who's basically taken by his, you know, cybernetic counterpart, who actually hates his role, right? He hates the idea that he's been programmed for this purpose. And that's kind of the way this works, right? When a human is taken and they're they're basically assigned to an Avengers role, uh, they're, they're basically programmed with all the mannerisms, right? All the personalities of those guys. The only difference is they know what they've been programmed with, so they don't really believe that they're those individual characters, right? So this, you know, a cybernetic counterpart to Captain America doesn't actually believe he's Captain America. It's just the role he's been assigned, but he hates being that person, which kind of rightfully so. Captain America's okay, but at the end of the day, he can't really do anything, right? Like if I were going to be anybody, I'd want to be like Blue Marvel or Hyperion or like Molecule Man, like somebody cool, right? Somebody interesting. But what ends up happening is, is you know, this future version uh, basically ends up taking a kind of, uh, you know, bomb device more or less and planting it in the eye of Captain America, right? Basically planting it, you know, inside of his own head and saying like, you're going to a place to where this bomb is going to be needed, right? This is going to be necessary. It's not for you in the here and now. The other part of this is that you have Black Widow, who of course has been taken uh, and she's communicating with her cybernetic counterpart. And this cybernetic version basically says like she wants to live. She wants to survive. She doesn't want to more or less perish whenever it is that this, you know, timeline or universe or what have you happens to end, that she wants to kind of continue living on. And that's an important thing because what it shows is that these cyborgs are not necessarily just robots, right? They have feelings, they have emotions, they have thoughts, and they have desires. The issue with this is that what this cybernetic version of Black Widow wants is actually very nefarious. And we'll find out why it matters here in a minute. But it's kind of an interesting thing because this cyborg version of Black Widow tells, you know, the version of herself in the past who's been transported with the Time Stone, tell the future man that his perception of Planet Ultron is wrong. That he believes Planet Ultron is basically just like a whole bunch of individual systems operating as kind of a unified whole. When in reality, it's the whole itself, right? So instead of saying that you have like a whole bunch of cybernetic organisms acting independently and that they have like kind of a shared mind, a hive intelligence, that the reality is you've got one guy running the whole show. And that's what Ultron is. Now the future man we'll talk about here in a second, which is kind of cool. What this version of Black Widow desires is to be broken away from that that sort of collective mind. She, she desires to be independent. She desires to be separate because she knows that a time will come. It's just inevitable. A time will come when this Ultron reality or this, you know, Ultron's reign over Earth will end. And she wants to ensure that when that time comes and the Ultron AI is destroyed, that she won't die with it, right? That she'll be able to kind of continue and, and live on and, and so on and so forth. And so as soon as this, this bomb is planted in the mind or in the brain of Captain America, the Time Stone reforms itself. And then him alongside Black Widow, Starbrand, Thor, and Hyperion are basically whisked away right back into fractured temporal 
temporal space. But at that point, Thor and Hyperion fall away. And that's when we end up finding out that they've been transported to 5,000 years into the future. Now, the, the question that was being asked here at the time was, where are they going, right? When Hawkeye fell off, when, when Hyperion and Thor fell off, where did they go, right? They ended up right back in Iron Man's lab. And that's where Iron Man ended up, right? Where where the, the gym in his hand uh, would basically tell him, you know, when these incursions were happening, that would also, it would allow him to kind of move through space and time, right? To move from one, one universe to another. We talked about that earlier when we were talking about the incursion wall, right? That you're basically leaving one universe and going into another one when you pass through the incursion wall. But because space and time are effectively the same thing, if you can pass from one universe to another, then you can travel back and forth through time. It was never really intended to be used for that purpose, but it was. And that's where Iron Man was sent to. Iron Man's gem was basically manipulated by the future version of Hawkeye, and he was sent back to the present day. And so that basically leaves, that really only leaves here, uh, Starbrand, Black Widow, and Steve Rogers. And once they arrive here, they kind of end up on this, this kind of garden of sorts with this colossal tree growing in the middle of it. And that's what's kind of crazy is they try to figure out what's happening, right? There's a lot of, of kind of estimation, kind of guessing going on here. The, the fact that there's long growth vegetation, the tree's absolutely massive because it takes so long for trees to grow. The response of Black Widow is she thinks it's around, you know, a few hundred years from where they were before. Captain America's frustrated because he doesn't really grasp the whole notion of time travel, right? So he feels like he's just a fish out of water. But at the end of the day, you know, the, the kind of idea is this is some sort of a garden, right? There's life growing here, there's plants, so on and so forth. And that's when they're met by the future man, also known as Franklin Richards. Now, for those of you guys who are not familiar with the work of Jonathan Hickman, this is the same future version of Franklin Richards from Hickman's Fantastic Four, right? The one who resurrected Galactus from the dead and turned him into his herald. Uh, that's this version of Franklin Richards, right? This guy is from that far in the future, right? He's from, from that far along the timeline. With that being the case, you kind of have uh, Captain America who doesn't know who this is, right? He doesn't know that it's future Franklin because remember, Captain America's never met Franklin Richards from the future. He's only ever met Franklin when he was a little kid. And so the response is, okay, who is this guy? <laughs> Who's this guy walking out of nowhere with this giant glowing orb on his chest? He kind of looks like Iron Man with long hair. Who is this guy? And that's when he says, I'm Franklin Richards. And of course, he kind of tells a little bit of a story to Black Widow about how, uh, you know, she taught him when he was younger uh, to basically, you know, mix a uh, hand soap with a uh, with a red or an orange crayon to make like a low yield poison. Just these little espionage tactics and things like that. And so it's kind of like, okay, this is the actual guy, right? This is actual, you know, the actual Franklin Richards. And that's when he kind of starts commenting and saying, okay, you know, like, like what you guys have been told up to this point is that when you, when you go forward into the future, uh, the things will be different, right? Things can kind of fluctuate. Things can kind of change. The response of Franklin is no, there are no variables here. Everything that happens happens the way it's supposed to. Now I know it sounds very cloak and dagger and it sounds very ambiguous, but Hickman does give us an explanation here, right? Before he kind of begins to spill the beans on everything, he takes him on a little bit of a, of a traveling adventure, right? Takes him out into space and takes him around the, around Saturn and basically says that like out here, humans have moved beyond the planet Earth. That where Natasha's kind of question here is, well, who owns all these mining vehicles who are mining resources from the, the asteroid belt around Saturn? You know, is it like a company or like what nation, you know, managed to pull all this off first? The response of Franklin is there are no nation states, right? There, there's no China, there's no United States, there's no Brazil, no none of that stuff, right? There, the, all you have is just a planet of human beings. And he says that at some point along the line, humanity reached that point, that humanity got to the point where it said these artificial boundaries that we create between one nation and another creating like methods of currency, different things along those lines, that it was a handicap, that it was getting in the way of our actual progress. It's very Star Trek-esque in that way, right? For those of you guys who saw First Contact, there was an explanation there from Captain Picard, who basically told the character of Lily that humanity abandoned uh, money, right? That the acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in people's lives, that people simply just exist to better themselves. And that's what this is, right? People have just kind of moved beyond these base, you know, artificial means. And it's just humanity exploring and trying to become the best version of itself that it possibly possibly can be. The crazy thing is that at this moment right now, there's around 30 billion people who are living on the moon right now. In terms of the ability to live on the moon, it's not just limited to colonies, right? Keep in mind, the moon has the blue area, which is an oxygen rich section of the moon. It's not colossal, but most likely all humanity managed to do was find a way to harness that and then expand it across the moon to basically make it an oxygen rich environment, which really begs the question, how would that impact the moon's orbit around the earth? Kevin book logic, <laughs> not something that needs to be worried about. But finally, Franklin gets around to, to saying, okay, captain, what do you want to know, right? Do you want to know who, 
like how the incursion started? Do you want to know like what, what led to all this, right? Like who's behind all this, these universes crashing into each other? And the response of Captain America is, I want to start with Tony Stark and I want to know how to defeat them. I want to know how to stop them from doing what they're doing, trying to wipe out in, you know, incursive earths, different things like that. And the response of Franklin is, okay, that cannot be done. He kind of gives us a little bit of an explanation and says, it's important that you understand what I'm going to tell you so you can understand what I tell you later. And he says, what you have here in this, this place that we're living in, in this future, 5,000 years in the future, that there is no, I mean, you do have earth to a degree, but this rogue planet, this, that, that red planet that basically came crashing towards earth that you guys managed to stop and that you guys managed to basically phase in with the earth itself. That was sent by us. And that was sent because you needed it, right? We're filling a loop like that, that rogue planet basically comes and hits earth and it hits earth, or at least it, it comes towards earth because we sent it there, right? We're kind of fulfilling this sort of cause and effect loop, but more so than that. And what's exceedingly important here is this Avengers machine that was created by Captain America and Tony Stark were uh, initially started with the idea of, okay, Tony Stark wanted to distract Captain America and all them so that if they're facing off against threats and Captain America's focusing on expanding the Avengers roster to make it, you know, something that was worldwide, that they wouldn't be worrying about the incursions or wouldn't be asking questions like what's Tony Stark doing or anything like that, uh, that it actually kind of grew and, and expanded and became its own kind of thing. And now what you have is called Avengers World. It's this massive planetary space station that serves nothing more than the purpose of just having Avengers protect the universe, right? The Avengers have moved beyond Earth and they now protect the entire universe in a wide array of different capacities. But that's the important of it all. Because when, when Captain America kind of reiterates, like, I want to know how to stop, you know, the, the, you know, stop the new Avengers from doing what they're doing. The response of, of Franklin is you can't, there's no way for you to stop them. That what's going to happen is going to happen. That time is not some thing where like some event takes place in the future. But if you go back in time and you prevent that event from happening, then, you know, everything's okay. It doesn't work that way. Everything kind of branches off. So sure, you could go back in time and you could stop the Illuminati. You could stop the, the new Avengers from doing what they're doing, but it's not going to change anything. You know, your timeline is going to continue on just like normal. You're just going to have an alternate reality out there where the Illuminati were stopped, but it wouldn't make any difference because the multiverse is still collapsing. No matter what you do, there's nothing you can do to save the day. The multiverse is going to die. You know, there are universes out there where you went back in time and you, and you destroyed the Illuminati and your world still dies, right? There's nothing you can do to end this. It's inevitable. It's always going to happen. And so that's what makes it kind of, that's what makes it kind of crazy is because he asked him, he's like, you know, do you remember what it was that Hawkeye told you? And the response of Captain America is yes, I do recall that. And he basically says, you should ignore it, but you won't because your fate is your fate. You, you make, you are who you are because of the choices that you've made. The choice that you made over the course of your life led you here and understand Captain America. This is not the first time you've been here. And where he's kind of like, what, like, what are you talking about? The time gem pops up and whisks him away. <laughs> <laughs> the time gym basically yanks them away. The other cool thing that you end up finding out here is the tree is actually Groot. That's the other thing that you end up finding out here, right? Like the tree is Groot. Like when Franklin asks, like, you know, do you think he heard what I was trying to tell him? The tree is just like, I am Groot. And he's like, yeah, me neither. <laughs> so Groot basically ends up growing into a giant tree. But what this does is it basically picks up 51,000 years into the future that, that star brand and black widow are basically dropped out from, from temporal space. So they end up back in Iron Man's workplace and 51,000 years into the future, you've basically just got like this giant planetary space, right? With this massive kind of obelisk, you know, sitting, sitting, you know, at a, at a kind of off in the distance and Captain America is guided towards this obelisk and then basically identifies himself, right? You know, he puts his hand up to the wall uh, and then identifies himself. And when he walks in, it's basically told, put your hands on the bars. And uh, that way we can, we can identify who you are. When that happens, of course, he's hit with all these, you know, prongs and things like that to go through him. And it's just for the purpose of verifying, you know, his DNA, really just like analyzing his DNA and seeing who he is. And that's when he's met by this massive world mind. And what we end up finding out here, and this is where things get crazy, the request of the, the cyborg Black Widow in the Ultron Forever universe was fulfilled by Franklin Richards, that she was basically given the kind of sentience she wanted to break off from the larger whole. But what that meant is that as time began to progress and things began to move forward, that her AI and this, this Avengers world began to kind of develop a sort of sentience. And so in effect, she, you know, a part of Ultron still resides in her. And so what it meant is that in essence, Ultron more or less is the world mind now, right? It's a giant singular consciousness that exists inside this world. The problem with this is we don't really find out how far reaching it is, right? We don't really find out how far it goes. Instead, all that ends up happening is this, this kind of artificial intelligence appears to him as Black Widow because of the fact that it's somebody he would recognize along with these sort of Avengers-esque uh, individuals and states that the intention here is to basically take the mind of Captain America, upload it into their database, scrub it of anything regarding like individuality, right? So Captain America's feelings of righteousness, his desire to save people's lives, things like that, that's all going to be removed. And he's going to become part of this kind of artificial intelligence mind frame and just exist there. His physical body, of course, 
be destroyed. But then a Captain America, of course, manages to break free. And the idea is that as he's fighting against these, these kind of holograms, there really isn't a whole lot he can do here, right? I mean, his shield isn't is the most durable material in the Marvel Universe, right? So being able to break it is not really a feasible thing. But ultimately, this device planted inside the mind of, of Captain America comes to fruition. That what this was designed to do was basically leap out of his mind. When this artificial intelligence gave itself a physical form, that it would leap out of the mind of Iron Man and land on this individual, right? And as soon as that happened, it would start breaking down the computer core. Like, it's more or less introducing a virus into a worldwide computer system. And that's exactly what happens, right? It basically shuts down the entire system. It effectively dies. And so, of course, the, the time stone reforms around Captain America and then whisks him further into the future, or at least kind of sends him uh, into the time stream and where he seems to sort of fall down into wherever it is it would end up taking him, presumably Tony Stark's lab. He's rescued by Iron Lad. He's basically rescued by Kang the Conqueror. Now, Kang is a, is a little bit of a confusing character, and we're not going to go super in-depth into him because it's really overly complicated. The long and short of this is imagine you went to, you time traveled to the year 5000, and then you left the year 5000 and went to the year 4000, right? But a version of you stays in the year 5000. And let's say that you leave the year 4000 and you go to the year 3000, and a version of you stays in the year 4000. That's what Kang the Conqueror is, right? Kang the Conqueror more or less exists in virtually all time streams. But because of that, each one of these quote unquote versions of himself have their own personalities, their own goals, their own own ambitions, different things like that. Now, Iron Lad was part of the Young Avengers, but I don't really want to go any more in depth than that because then it starts getting wildly confusing. But there is some explanation that's offered here that where, where you have Kang, you have uh, Iron Lad and you have Immortus, each of which are basically able to manipulate the time stream. You end up having them kind of, you know, making these statements of things like uh, the event is coming, right? Like the, the time events getting ready to take place, which is basically just the reformation of the time stone. As soon as that happens, as soon as the time stone begins to reform, they use their power and then basically encase it in what's called zero time. All that really means is it just nullifies the time stone. That's really all it does, right? So it's like, it's like if the time stone was a mutant, it would be like shutting off the mutant's powers, right? You know, temporarily, that's all that is. And it just kind of keeps the time stone in stasis there and it cannot reform and yank anybody else through time. And that's when we really start to get this sort of explanation here. We kind of get this, this discussion of what's going on. The idea here is that these guys have basically brought Captain America this far into the future because of the fact that the incursions happen, right? The incursions are currently happening. The multiverse is collapsing. Universes are crashing into each other. They have tried multiple times, right? Captain America has been yanked into the future like this multiple times. Uh, he's not aware of it, but basically it's happened multiple times. And the idea is they've always tried different approaches. Captain America has gone back in time and destroyed the, the Illuminati. Captain America has gone back in time and worked with the Illuminati. Captain America has gone back in time and reformed a cosmic cube to try to save the day. They've tried all these different things and none of them work. The multiverse always moves towards this inevitable end and it always ends up collapsing. Now, the question you're probably asking here is if the multiverse collapses and everybody dies, then how do they exist in the future? Okay, uh, Jonathan Hickman answered this during the, the Fantastic Four run that he had. And the way this works is it's not as though the, the incursions take place, right? Like the main Marvel universe is destroyed and then everything suddenly ceases to exist. It's almost like a tidal wave. So like imagine a meteor crashing into the earth. It's not like the earth just suddenly explodes, right? It's not like everything around the earth just instantly go, you know, bursts into flame. And instead what you have is you have this massive impact and then you have fire that begins to just quote sort of spread out. That's how that works. When the universe collapses and when, when everything's destroyed, that would happen at some point in the past. And what would, what that would mean is uh, basically like a, a tidal wave would start making its way through the time stream from the time that that initially happened going both directions, right? And so basically it would move, you know, into the past and it would move into the present and basically make its way here. And so, you know, if you had to assign a kind of time frame to it, you could say that like the main Marvel Universe Earth crashes into another Earth and the main Marvel Universe is destroyed. When that initial point of destruction happens, then it would be like 10 minutes before everything's totally wiped out. At that point, we're just throwing out arbitrary numbers, but that's basically what that means, right? That, that's basically how that works. And so that's why they're here is because technically the multiverse will be destroyed. We're just at that point, like Captain America has been transported to this moment before the future has been obliterated, right? So there's still a chance to kind of save the day. That's why they're here. But basically their, their whole response is every time you go back, nothing ever works. And so we're going to do 
the only thing we know how to do, which is to keep you here. If we keep you here and we let the uh, Illuminati do their job, then they'll basically destroy every single incursive Earth. And there's a chance that when that happens, that the main Marvel Universe will be the only universe in the entirety of the multiverse because of the fact that the heroes were able to do everything they needed to do in order to save the day. But keep in mind, Franklin Richards, you know, kind of talked about this and said, it won't work. Nothing will work. The multiverse will die. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about multiple people out there trying to find a way to keep the multiverse from ending. That in effect, everybody's wrong, right? Nobody's right. That the multiverse will actually end. We know that, right? We, we know that because that's what we're being told over and over and over again, that everything's going to die. It's just all anybody can do is the best they can do to try to stop it as best they can. But Captain America being Captain America, it's kind of interesting because he hits on this idea that he's tired of people telling him uh, that he doesn't understand, right? He's tired of people telling him like, we're going to keep you here because you don't fully understand what you're doing. He's tired of hearing that. That people kind of look at him as a guy who never fully understands the breadth of the decisions that he's making, right? That Captain America is more or less a dummy. He's just, he follows orders because that's what he's supposed to do. And he'll prize the lives of innocent people over everything else because that's just what he does. That in his mind, he doesn't weigh, you know, the 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 cost of his decisions, right? He doesn't really look at an innocent life that's, that's in, in jeopardy and then ask the question, what happens if I save that person's life? Captain America does what he does, right? He's, he preserves innocent life as best he can. But despite the case that he makes, that's his problem, right? Captain America stands up for, for righteousness. He stands up for innocent people. He helps people where he can. But at the end of the day, he doesn't have the capacity to understand the full totality of what he's doing because he's just not that smart, right? He's just not that intelligent. It doesn't mean he's stupid. It just means that he's not on the same level as Tony Stark or Reed Richards and where he should stop and think and ask, what's the end result of what I'm doing? At the end of the day, he doesn't want to. That's one of the things that was kind of interesting is that when Hawkeye from 48 years in the future was talking to him, that what he said is when he gets to this point that he's going to be asked, he's going to be told, you only have two choices to make. You, you know, the, the choice you're going to have is to, is, you know, basically either do nothing or to help Tony Stark, right? To help him and the other members of, of the new Avengers destroy, you know, alternate realities. But the third option is he could kill Tony Stark. He could destroy Tony Stark. And that's the option Captain America goes for. He basically grabs a shield, throws it, has it bounce off a couple of walls, destroy the barrier around the time stone. When it reforms around him, he's teleported back to the present day. He meets with the rest of the Avengers who were here. Tony Stark is already gone at that point, uh, but he meets with the rest of the Avengers who were here and then basically tells them, we're going to do what we should have done the entire time, right? Now that we're aware of what's going on, we're going to do the only thing that we that we can do. We're tracking down the new Avengers. We're going to track down every single one of them. Tony Stark, Reed Richards, Doctor Strange, Beast, uh, Black Bolt, T'Challa, name of the Submariner. We're going to track them all down and we're going to take them into custody. We're going to stop them from doing what they're doing, right? At the end of the day, all Captain America is really doing here is becoming a hassle. That where the, the new Avengers are doing the right thing and destroying other realities in order to save their own, Captain America is going to get in the way of that. Okay, so I was informed that I had not recorded, or at least the audio that I'd recorded for uh, The Great Society was the wrong audio, or at least the one I uploaded was the wrong audio. And I've switched computers, so now I have to re-record it, which really isn't that bad because I kind of didn't really even like the first recording that I did. I know it sounds terrible to say. You guys would be amazed how often I record a video and then realize there's something about it I don't like and re-record it. Like, you guys would be amazed how often I do that. But for those of you guys who are not even really joining us, uh, but I guess if you guys are joining us, you know, you have the collapse of the multiverse, the various incursions that are happening, which means basically Earth from alternate realities crashing into each other. And what we had here was Reed Richards building what was called a bridge. And this bridge basically served the purpose of allowing the new Avengers, the Illuminati, whatever you want to call them, to essentially peer into other universes, to see how other universes are faring with the incursions. Because one of the things that they were told by Black Swan at the beginning of all this, right, when we covered the very first volume of this, the collapse of the multiverse, all that kind of stuff, how it was all ending, the introduction of Black Swan as a new character, she basically iterated or really kind of provided us with this scenario that in other universes, people respond to the incursions in different ways. Some people have used cosmic cubes. Other, other universes have done the exact same thing that was done in the main Marvel universe where they used an infinity gauntlet and things didn't work. That there are some universes where people destroyed their own Earths and then took residence in a new planet. And when they did that, sometimes they would save the, human, uh, the humans on their world. Sometimes they would just abandon it and just destroy it and whoever, you know, and, and just essentially save themselves. There were instances when other races would destroy their Earth when they figure out what was going on, that like Galactus would show up to Earth and then obliterate it in order to save that universe. Uh, we saw it playing out in different ways. And so the idea behind this bridge is to, to basically, in one way, verify the authenticity of what it was that Black Swan said. And then two, if there are other Earths out there that are basically solving the incursions, then figuring out how it is that they're doing that, right? Because maybe they thought of something that everybody here hasn't thought of yet. And so what it does is, of course, it basically brings together Namor the Submariner and Black 
Black Panther. Now, Black Panther is the one who, at the moment, is cataloging these various worlds. And what he's found is that world after world, the ones that he's seen really just kind of seem to fall the same way. That either they're destroyed by the map makers, they're destroyed by the Black Priest, which we haven't really talked about in depth yet, but we will. They're, they're kind of a special scenario. And in reality, it wasn't really until Jonathan Hickman's Avengers, the new Avengers ended, that I actually realized what the Black Priests were, right? But we'll talk more about them once we once we cross that bridge. And then, of course, you know, you basically end up having a lot of the worlds that are, or I'm sorry, a lot of the universes that are being destroyed when they're crashing into each other. But there is one particular world that uh, T'Challa came across where they've survived not just one incursion, but two. And so the question is, how in the world did they manage to pull that off? And so what Hickman does is he gives us a little bit of backstory here. And what we end up finding out is this world is home to a group called the Great Society. Now, first things first, the Great Society is basically a stand-in for the Justice League, is really all they are. And I'll, I'll talk more about that here in a second. But the cool thing about this is that what you had at some point in time, really about four years prior to, uh, to, to what's going on at the moment, or maybe even a little bit longer than that, is you had what were called the Archetypes of Justice. Now, the indication here is this is the only superhero team that existed on Earth. It was basically Wolverine, Psylocke, that reality's version of Namor the Submariner, and a couple others. Uh, but what you ended up having is what Jonathan Hickman refers to as Xenogeneticist. It was basically a combination of the Kree and the Scrolls working together, is basically what it is. Now, we're not given a lot of backstory here. We don't know what really led to this conflict. We don't know what led to the Kree and the Scroll teaming up and basically working with each other against the uh, against the, the superheroes on Earth. We don't really know what the case is. But what we do know is that these superheroes basically fell. Now, a Assuming there were no X-Men, that there were no Justice League or anything like that, that basically these superheroes fell and the world was successfully conquered by the Kree and the Scrolls. We can largely assume superheroes, other superheroes did exist for a couple different reasons. Uh, one is because in the fall of the Archetypes of Justice, we saw the rise of the Great Society. And two, it just makes good sense, right? To just believe that other superheroes existed. It just seems reasonable. But the reality of this and the important thing here is that when the Earth was conquered, or at least this alternate reality was conquered by the Kree and the Scrolls, the Great Society rose up basically is, is kind of like a, a group of outcast superheroes that essentially cast off the Kree and the scrolls and then saved the world. And so following that, they ushered in what was called this, this great society in the sense that it was a, it was kind of in a, an age of enlightenment, right? So like the science games, championing the advancement of human potential, different things along those lines. And so these guys were basically the new wave, the new crop of superheroes and have kind of been leading the world ever since, saving the planet from a multitude of different threats. But the important thing here is what we end up doing is basically picking up with uh, with a guy by the name of Wayne. Now, Wayne also goes by the name Ryder, and he is basically Batman in this particular universe. What we also know is that some kind of an event had basically taken place where about 100 men, women, and children had died. And the result of this is that Wayne routinely goes back and visits this marker as a way to honor their memory, right? So it seems to have been a mistake that he made that led to them dying. And this is a very important element because what it does is it shows the humanity behind the characters. That with us not really knowing a whole lot about them, we wouldn't really know if they were good guys or bad guys, whatever the case was. You know, if the the rise of them in terms of saving the earth led to them becoming these these sort of you know almost fascist kind of guys, we don't really know. But what we do know now is that they're basically good guys. Now the other part of this is that a, a character by the name of the Norn had basically more or less told by virtue of his powers that another incursion was happening. So it's the Great Society's version of an early warning system. But the Norn is a stand-in for Doctor Fate, and and so with this happening, of course, you have a coming together of the various guys who were here, and that's where we really sort of get this full-on explanation, or at least this this full kind of depiction of the fact that they are more or less the Justice League, right? The Rider is Batman, Boundless is basically the Flash, the Jovian is Martian Manhunter, the Norn is Dr. Fate, Sun God is essentially Superman, and Dr. Spectrum is basically the Green Lantern. And so much like we've seen with, with you know, the, the main Illuminati themselves, you kind of get a speech about, you know, the, the collapse of the multiverse, but the difference here is that the Great Society looks at this from the perspective of everything lives, right? So they're far more far more optimistic. They're, they're really, they really are just legitimate good guys. The other cool thing about this is that once they end up teleporting to what is essentially the incursion wall, which as you guys recall, is a kind of barrier, right? So if your left hand is, is one universe and your right hand is another, what you have is a point where your hands are on the verge of touching. What the incursion wall does is it allows you to pass from your left hand to your right hand, right? It just allows you to move from one universe to the next. And so once they actually get inside that universe and they see that earth, then now they realize it's a, an incursion of map makers. And this is important. This is hugely important because one of the things to keep in mind is 
again, the map makers are wildly powerful beings. And in every other alternate universe that the Illuminati have looked at and they've seen the map makers arrive, it basically signals the absolute death of every superhero who's there. The map makers automatically react to the powers of the various people who are there. They augment themselves, modify themselves, they overcome those powers, and then they destroy them, and then they destroy the world. No one ever really succeeds in their conflict against the map makers, but the Great Society seems to know of them, and the Great Society has basically found a way to overcome them. And, and you would think that it would be virtue of some kind of scientific achievement, or they have something like the ultimate nullifier or something like that, you know, their reality's version of this device that can essentially obliterate anything from existence and basically make it as if it never was. You would think it would be something like that. No, it's just the sheer force of their power. That's all it is. It's just the complete and total power that they have. And so what you end up finding out is that one of these guys is actually donning a helmet of the Black Priest. And the reason why this matters is because they successfully managed to repel or at least destroy the bridge builders, right? The forerunners of the map makers. The, the bridge builders, for those of you guys who, who don't remember, are the ones who basically show up first. You know, whenever you have a blue earth, they're the ones who basically show up on the new earth. They basically wipe out all the superheroes and then they, they basically tell the map makers, hey, here's a spot for you to come to. Then the map makers show up and essentially kill any superheroes that the bridge builders couldn't destroy. The bridge builders are obliterated. That blue earth is destroyed and then that leads to the arrival of the map makers. And more so than that, the map makers get totally destroyed. But what do you end up finding out here is that the, the great society has actually figured things out. They figured out that like the ability for the map makers to adapt is based on a piece of technology inside their own bodies, right? That before they can adapt to their powers to rip that out, to basically destroy the computer components inside their bodies, essentially, right? Their intelligence core, whatever you want to call it. But to rip that out before the map makers can respond is the best thing. That's one of the reasons why Soundless is so important here because she's able to move so astronomically fast that she can basically act before the map makers have time to. From there, it turns to Sun God. And that's when you really get kind of a full on display of this guy's power. Because if the fight goes on too long, these map makers would probably overpower the, the Great Society, right? They would kind of continue to adapt. But Sun God basically channels all the solar energy in his body and lets off this enormous flare with the rest of the superhero team being protected by uh, by Dr. Spectrum. And then of course, all the map makers are completely and totally obliterated. And that's what makes things kind of bonkers here is because you have Namor and you have T'Challa who are watching all this go down. And it's like, okay, so like these guys are for real. Like these guys are serious contenders. But notice, this is the funny thing that you, that you do not see here. Neither of them entertained the idea of joining forces. But what you do end up getting is a really cool conversation that goes on here because Namor the Submariner has become a lot more pessimistic or you could argue realistic than Black Panther has because for all the vaunted wisdom of Black Panther, for all the vaunted wisdom of T'Challa, right? In the sense he's so smart and all that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, he's still hopeful. The response of Namor is that hope is the, is the refuge of dying men. Hope is what you have when you have nothing else left. But that's not the reality of the situation that we're in here. You know, the reality that we're in here is we're fighting against hopeless odds. We're like these guys. We have a, a small victory in a war that we're going to lose. These guys are going to lose this conflict. They're going to lose this war. So they can celebrate all they want to and their achievement in overcoming the map makers, but it won't matter because the multiverse is going to end anyway. It's a very dark perspective to have, but T'Challa really kind of comes back at that and says, no, but it's us as people and what we do in this circumstance is how we respond to it that define us as people. Everything was going to end anyway. It was inevitable that the multiverse was going to end. It was inevitable that even if the multiverse didn't end, that our universe was going to end. In the face of that knowledge, does it mean that we just give up, right? If we if we knew with absolute certainty that the universe would end, which it will, does that mean that we just refuse to live, right? It'll be billions of years, billions and billions and billions of years before that happens, or at least under any normal circumstance, it would be. With the, the incursions, it shrinks it at a geometric rate, right? Like it shrinks it at a, at a massive margin. But, you know, he's like, if, if we're born into this world and then we learn science and we realize that through that science that our universe is going to end at some point, does that mean that at whatever point point we learn that, we just sit down and die? No, we live our lives, right? We become honorable people. We have families and all that kind of stuff because one, we know that we're not going to have to worry about seeing the death of those families anytime soon. But two, even though we know our family line will die, that life is still worth living, that it's still worth it to be an honorable and a good person. And that's really what it kind of hits at here, that you look at this as though because of the fact that all hope is lost, because of the fact that there really is no means to save the multiverse, you know, because it is inevitably going to die, that we should somehow just give up on who we are and just do whatever needs to be done in order to save the day. It's us as kings of our respective kingdoms that make us great men because of the actions and the deeds that we do. And Namor comes back with this amazing point and he says, yes, we were kings and what are we now? 
we're kings of dead kingdoms, right? We are kings of men who don't really have anything to call our own, right? We're people who are just, you know, watching other universes die and hoping that we can somehow find a way to save our own. All the while, this little voice in the back of our head keeps growing bigger with every incursion that we encounter and every universe that we see destroyed. And it's saying, there's no hope here. There's no way for you guys to win. You're fighting against a hopeless cause. And so with that being the case, you know, as, as this, this kind of monitoring of the Great Society's universe can, you know, continues on, that, that suddenly Black Panther is like, Namor, you need to look at this. And it's kind of like, okay, like, what am I seeing here, right? With the two of them looking at something, it's like, what in the heck am I seeing here? Like, is this the past? Because if it's the past, none of this really seems familiar. And, and Black Panther's response is, no, this is two hours from now. And what, we, what we're basically told here by Hickman is that in two hours, the Illuminati are going to confront the Great Society. And the battle for, to save one of these worlds is going to take place, right? So who wins? Marvel's New Avengers or DC's Justice League? <laughs> All right, what's going on guys? This is Rob and we are picking back up again with Avengers and New Avengers. And what we're doing here is we're picking up a little bit in the aftermath of Infinity, right? Not, I guess, not really immediately after Infinity took place, but specifically the whole detonation of the Terrigen Bomb. Now, for those of you guys who never saw the Infinity event, you had two stories going on at the same time, right? The main story focused on Thanos, basically trying to acquire his son, ultimately locating him. And then once he was discovered, his son's, you know, powers more or less activating when Black Bolt and Thanos fought. And the reason why that matters is because in the process, Black Bolt basically destroyed the, or I guess uh, detonated the Terrigen Bomb, which would spread the Terrigen Mist across the world. And so those individuals out there in the world who were Inhumans and simply didn't know, suddenly had their Inhuman powers activated. Now Thanos of course found his son, and you can find out what happens with the rest of that story uh, down in the description. But the idea here is that in the aftermath of that, because Thanos had basically beat Black Bolt within an inch of his life, Black Bolt's been recovering with his aid, or with the aid of, uh, of his brother, Maximus the Mad. And so with Black Bolt basically recovering, the idea here is that with all these different Inhumans waking up across the world, the intention is to basically travel around the world and to gather these Inhumans together and bring them under the control of the royal family. The funny thing about this is that you actually go into an event from Marvel Comics called Inhumanity and Inhuman, uh, which really sees everything but that happening. It's actually a pretty cool line of comics, and I don't think we ever really covered it. I want to say it was Charles Soule who wrote it, and it was great, right? But from there, we switch over to Wakanda, right? And we pick up with Black Panther, and Black Panther here is basically struggling with this inner turmoil, right? The fact that he doesn't really consider whatever this action is to be weakness, that it's not really doubt, that he knows who he is. But the very idea of what he's pondering here, right? The very idea of what he's considering destroying a world is something that he's wrestling with on a moral scale. And the people he's talking to are basically his ancestors. Now, here's an important thing that I want you guys to understand, that, that I want you guys to know about. If you saw the Black Panther film in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, he was communicating with his ancestors in the afterlife. This was not a thing that Black Panther could do until Jonathan Hickman was writing the Fantastic Four and he introduced the idea that with Shuri becoming the new Black Panther after the events of Doom War and T'Challa basically being forced to step down, that T'Challa gained a new source of power in becoming the King of the Dead. And what that meant was he could now communicate and talk to his ancestors. So that's why this happens here, right? That's why you see it in the MCU. It's a relatively new thing. And so communicating and talking to his ancestors is an interesting concept because he basically kind of, you know, kind of espouses this idea and, and, and when they ask, what are you struggling with? He basically says in the next hour, there's going to be another incursion. And when that happens, our world is going to face off or is going to come face to face with another world that houses not villains or evil individuals, but people who are actually heroes like us. They're good guys. They've done good for their world. This will be the first time that we have an incursion where we have to face a threat like this. And my concern here is that we may end up having to destroy these people's worlds. And the response of his ancestors is, so? And it's, and it's, it's like the, it's the coolest response because he's like, what do you mean so, right? Like, like I've done murder, I've done terrible things and I've done it in a way where I've, I've been king and I've did what I needed to do. But there's a difference between taking out individuals who are a credible threat to Wakanda and taking out what are basically innocent people, right? Because the reality of this is if they over, if they face off against the great society and a conflict breaks out and they have to destroy the world of the great society, it's not just those heroes who die. It's billions of men, women, and children across the surface, across that world, who die as well, right? People who don't even know what's going on, who are going about their normal lives, and then suddenly the world just ends, right? Like that's what we're talking about here. And the, the response of this really comes by way of Black Panther's father himself, right? T'Chaka. And he basically says, here's the thing to understand, right? This is, you You are of Wakanda. You are a king of Wakanda. You have to understand the price that comes with that, right? Heavy is the head that wears the crown. The question you have to ask here is over the time that our kingdom has been in existence, over the time that Wakanda has been 
alive, how many people have we turned away? How many people who were seeking refuge have we told you can't come here? Because it was important to keep our society safe and secret and hidden away from the world. How many times have we done that? And, and how many men, women, and children did we kill by virtue of that? But it's what was best for our kingdom. It's what was best for our people. And he says, that's what you're facing here. Anything that could be a threat to Wakanda is a threat worth destroying. That's the way it is. That's how Wakanda is. That's how the ancestors of Black Panther saw it. That's how Black Panther himself is being told to see it. If it's a threat to Wakanda, then it needs to go. So sure, you're going to wipe out a world of however many billions of people if you decide to detonate an antimatter bomb on that earth. But the reality is either it's them or it's you. And, and as a king, your job is to protect your people, which means to choose yourself. It means to choose our earth and destroy theirs in the process. If they have a problem with it, sorry about your luck, wouldn't want to be in your shoes. That's just the way it goes. And so again, it's it's intriguing here because one of the things that's kind of asked here at the at the very last moment, you know, when all the other ancestors have basically departed is T'Chaka pulls his son aside for a second and asks him, there's one last thing. Have you killed the Atlantean yet, right? Have you killed Namor the Submariner? Now, for those of you guys who don't know what that's about, we talked about that earlier when we began the, the Avengers and New Avengers series. You should check out the Avengers versus X-Men event. When Namor was part of the Phoenix Force, he basically destroyed a huge portion of Wakanda. So because he had committed such an offense against the Wakandan people, that's why the ancestors are asking. The other part of this is Doctor Strange basically reappears, right, after having been at the Sinner's Market. Now we will learn more about that. What we end up doing at this point is we jump to Bruce Banner and we jump to Beast. Now again, Bruce Banner is the new kid on the block. He was just recently brought into the Illuminati team in order to basically help them uh, figure out what to do, right? Because the reality is with all the different ideas they have, they've yet to come to a solid solution. And Bruce Banner has a unique mind insofar as he's the most knowledgeable when it comes to gamma radiation, but he's also considered to be one of the smartest men in the world. And so the, the notion here is maybe he can help them think of something that they haven't really thought about before. But to show you guys just how far things are at the moment, we basically pick up with Tony Stark. And Tony Stark is having a conversation with Black Swan and basically saying, here's what's going to happen, right? I have just constantly been perplexed by this problem. I've constantly been perplexed by this idea of what's going on with the incursions and you giving us these these answers, basically telling us there's nothing we can do, that that either we can destroy other worlds and hope we survive to the end, or we just perish you know, when one of the other worlds destroys us. But at the end of the day, there's nothing we can do to stop it. And as his whole, uh, the, the stance of Tony Stark here is he's a futurist, right? He's the idea man. If Tony Stark can't think of it, it cannot be solved. That's just the way that it works. That's just how his mind works. He is in the most extreme degree, a guy who solves problems. And, and, and from what he's being told by Black Swan, who seems to have this information that she's just not revealing to Tony Stark that there is no way to solve the problem, right? There's nothing that they can do. And this is why Tony Stark is getting so frustrated because the, the question she asks is she asks, are you are you so sure that this is the problem or do you think the real problem is that you're simply just in denial? You're simply refusing to accept the fact that there is nothing you can do, right? Every single threat you've ever faced in your life as a superhero up to this point has been some physical, tangible person you can fight against, right? You know, Galactus shows up on Earth and you guys threaten him with the ultimate nullifier, or you grab the help of the Silver Surfer, or just through sheer force of will, you manage to topple him, right? Thanos shows up, you guys fight him off. This villain shows up, you fight. This villain shows up, you fight. It's a tangible thing. That's been your life. You always overcome the odds. You always come out on top. But for the first time in your life, Tony Stark, you guys are facing off against a threat that cannot be solved with mathematical formulas. It cannot be fixed with some infinity gauntlet. There's nothing you can do. There's no day to be saved here. Your days are numbered. When that number comes to zero, there'll be nothing left, and you along with everything that you know is going to die. Tony just cannot accept that fact, right? And so what he basically, you know, really in his paranoia, I would say, ends up stepping up and saying, here's what's going to happen. We're going to deal with this incursion, right? We're, we're going to cope with this incursion and do whatever in the hell we have to do in order to basically end it. But then following that, I'm going to bring in a telepath. I'm going to have somebody like Emma Frost come in here and probe your mind. I'm going to have them, you know, basically tear your mind apart and find out everything you know. We're going to go through every scrap of information. We're going to go through everything that we can to find out what this truth is. And her whole idea here is, I've never lied to any of you. I've never ever lied to, to a single one of you. And she gives the best response here, right? Tony asks, have you ever heard of lies of omission? And she says, yes, that's what the ignorant people call displays of their ignorance, right? You want to believe there's something there because you're too stupid to accept the fact that there's not. That's what's so cool about this, right? She's such a great character. She's so wildly interesting. And so of course, with Tony Stark storming off, this leads to Reed Richards being there. And he kind of asks her what in the world was going on. 
and she says, it's just a man coming to the end of himself, right? Tony Stark coming to the realization, there's nothing he can do. There's nothing he can offer here that all of his vaunted intelligence and all of his gadgets and all of his Iron Man armors, they're useless in the face of all this. And so from there, we pick up with basically the Illuminati team showing up on the alternate reality Earth, right? The, the Great Society Earth. And as soon as they arrive, it's kind of funny because the Great Society sort of looks up and says, okay, like we don't really know what this is, right? They're not black priests. They're not like, they're not map makers. We don't really know what these guys are. You know, are they, are they peaceful like we are or are they monsters? Like we don't know what the deal is here. And that's what's kind of cool is because as soon as the, the Illuminati show up, the Great Society greet them as friends. And this is, this is a really interesting concept, right? Because you see this, this is exactly what the Justice League would do, right? The Justice League would approach trying to attain diplomacy, that fighting would be a last resort. And much like what Sun God's doing right now, Superman would do the same thing, right? He would say, okay, like, let's see if there's a way for us to talk this out, right? If this was any other character in Marvel, they would just start fighting, right? Like Marvel's violent, man. Like all the superheroes in Marvel are just mean, man. Like we're just going to fight you first. And then like, we'll ask some questions along the way. And then if over the course of this fight, we realize you're the good guys, then we'll stop, right? Like Marvel superheroes are kind of dicks, to be honest with you guys. <laughs> They really kind of are. I love Marvel to death, been reading them for 25 years, but they're kind of dicks. Like it's just the way the superheroes are written and I love it, right? So uh, one of the things that kind of goes into this is you have, of course, Wayne, right? The the pastiche of Batman, basically the, the Marvel version of Batman who kind of says like, how can we trust you, right? And more important than that, how do you know you can trust us? And the response of Beast is we've been watching you, right? We constructed a bridge that let us look into alternate realities and we came across your world because you survived two incursions. And they say, no, we actually saw it. We, we survived three and it's kind of like, okay, but we only saw two. So, so what you end up getting here is this, this little degree of an explanation that when the questions asked by Reed Richards, one of these incursions you survived, you survived by basically moving your universe out of phase, right? That, that you more or less made your universe intangible, right? The way the vision makes himself intangible. So if you throw something at him, it'll just pass right through him. That's what they did with their universe. That instead of allowing the, the earth to crash into each other, they move their universe out of phase. So basically the other earth and the other universe, they just passed right through each other. And when they asked, how do you do that? Like, how were you able to pull that off? They said, we're well, using something called the wishing box. Now here's my mistake. I originally thought they were talking about a cosmic cube and I didn't, I, I totally forgot that like there are different all, you know, really alternate reality versions of infinity stones, right? And that's what they basically say, right? It's basically a cube that's made up of six planes of forever glass. Basically these, these, this kind of material that's made up of the fabric of the universe. It's an infinity gauntlet is really all it is. Now, this is why this is kind of cool because in Marvel comics, as far as I'm aware, this is the first first time we've seen an alternate reality version of the Infinity Gauntlet that does not look like the Gauntlet. Traditionally, in Marvel Comics, no matter what universe you're talking about, when, when Marvel references the Infinity Gauntlet, we basically get a glove with Infinity Stones on it. And the reason why is because it's recognizable, right? Like people see that and like, oh, that's the Infinity Gauntlet. In this day and age, because of the events of, of Avengers Endgame and like Avengers Infinity War, you see anybody walking down the street or you go to a con and you see a gauntlet, you immediately know what it is. And even comic book readers were just like, I know exactly what that is. That's the Infinity Gauntlet. Everybody knows what it is. It's so recognizable. And it makes sense that in almost any other alternate reality story, you you would see it designed the exact same way, just being wielded by somebody under a different circumstance. And this reality, that is basically just forever glass, right? It's just five, five pieces of glass that come into the shape of a cube, which really begs the question, is this the same thing as a cosmic cube, right? What would happen if you combine the power of a cosmic cube with an infinity gauntlet, right? What would that look like? Uh, honestly, I don't really think you'd see a difference, right? I mean, if you can, you know, basically use the cosmic cube to do the exact same thing that you would do with an infinity gauntlet, then what's the difference, right? I mean, I guess maybe you can do it like twice as fast, or you can like do it twice as much. I don't know, like infinite power times two. <laughs> I don't really know how you, how you mathematically quantify infinity uh, by a factor of two. I don't, I don't really know if you even can do that. I'm not a mathematician. I'm sure one of you guys out there in the Rob Corps went to like MIT or something like that. And you're good with maths, but uh, the, the whole thing here is that there's a lot of, of, of uncertainty, I guess is the best word to use. Ryder is highly skeptical of the superheroes, right? He's highly skeptical of the Illuminati and says, okay, here's the issue though. You show up on our doorstep and you tell us that you come bringing peace, that you're here for a peaceful resolution. But here's the problem. We've roughly got about seven and a half hours before both our universes end because the Earths are gonna crash into each other. And where Iron Man and, and Reed Richards and all these guys are talking about different ideas, then the question becomes, okay, uh, what are these ideas that you have and what happens if they fail? And that's kind of, the, that's, that's when Black 
Panther basically speaks up and says, we have a plan, right? We have an antimatter bomb. It, we basically built this bomb to destroy an entire world. And that's when Reed's kind of like, are you guys sure you don't have anything? And Sun God's like, I already told you, we have hope, right? We have hope that things will get better. And that's when Namor kind of makes fun of him and says, well, I hope you can come up with something better than hope, right? Like, because this is a serious time and we kind of need a serious solution. <laughs> we don't need this Justice League philosophy of resting on your laurels and just hoping things get better and that's enough. No, we need like actual solutions to a problem. And that's what that's what, what makes us interesting, right? Kind of these, you know, two diametrically opposing views. Now, something else that I want to throw, throw to your attention that's kind of going on here at the same time. And it's very easy for us to kind of skip over it, but we're not going to. Maximus the Mad is a very interesting character. In reality, he is in a lot of ways similar to the Joker. His schemes don't really make sense to anybody but himself. But what he's come to realize is that with everything happening, they're going to need all hands on deck. And there are some individuals who had been defeated at the hands of the Avengers or whoever that are wildly powerful, albeit evil, and they are going to be needed. What Max the Mist the Mad does here is he basically fires up a high-powered laser and with the help of Black Swan starts to crack the, the you know, contain, a containment device that holds Thanos and the Black Order. Max the Mist the Mad is freeing, freeing the Mad Titan and the Black Order. This is cool. Corvus Glaive, Proxima Midnight, all these characters, Maximus the Mad is setting them loose. Like he's getting ready to just let them return back and do their thing. And so because of all this, you know, with, uh, you know, kind of switching back to the Avengers and uh, I guess to the, the Illuminati and the Great Society, things kind of keep going back and forth, right? It's this constant kind of conversation that's going on. Namor is losing patience, right? Because you basically have them stalling the inevitable. Well, surely we can come up with an idea. Surely there's something we can do. We can talk this out. Well, what if we don't succeed? Are you going to destroy our world? Well, I mean, we don't want to destroy your world. And they're more or less beating around the bush, right? It's more or less the Illuminati kind of beating around the bush. And, and instead of outright saying, if things go south, we're going to blow your world to smithereens. It's kind of like, well, it won't come to that. We'll find a solution. We'll find a way to make it work. All this kind of going back and forth, Namor is getting very agitated and very irritated. And in that frustration, he takes his trident, throws it at Ryder and basically says, here's what's going to happen, guys. I'm tired of waiting for the inevitable. The inevitable is that none of us are going to be able to come up with a solution in the span of eight hours that's going to spare both of our worlds. If I am going to become this thing, whatever this thing is, this evil human being, this person that's willing to cast aside the lives of billions of people to protect himself, then by God, I'll do it at a, at a time of my choosing. And so when he goes with, with Ryder being attacked, Sun God responds and Ryder says, you still under, like you finally understand what's going on. You finally see what's happening here. It could not have been any other way. And with that, Sun God lashes out and the battle is on. All right, what's going on guys? This is Rob and we are picking back up again with the conclusion of the Great Society. This marks the ending of the quote unquote incursion story arc from Jonathan Hickman, right? So for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with this, uh, technically it's broken down by volumes in the sense that you do have like the trade paperbacks in terms of how they're read. The best way to do it is to go issue by issue, right? Because what you end up having is like one issue where something happens, you have like an issue of New Avengers, then you go into like three or four issues of Avengers, then you go into like three issues of New Avengers, then one issue of Avengers. When you get the trades, you're just getting them in bulk. So you're getting like the first six issues of Avengers, the next six issues of Avengers. It's better when it's read issue by issue. But what you have are like great big huge sections, right? Great big huge arcs. And this one, the, the incursions arc spans something like, like 22 or 23 different comics, right? It's pretty lengthy. And that's really what we've been covering here for a little while. But the idea is that with the, the last video we did, we talked about how the Great Society was basically DC's Justice League from an alternate reality. But what we end up doing is picking up with Doctor Strange, basically at the, the Resolute Throne, right? The intention of selling his soul for absolute power. In this instance, we kind of have to dive into a little bit of hearsay and haphazard guessing. And the reason why is because we're not really given definitive explanations here by Jonathan Hickman. When we say things or we hear things like absolute power, right? All, everything, the Godhead. When we hear that, what we're kind of left to believe here is that it would essentially be Doctor Strange becoming the one above all, right? Having absolute power enough to wipe out or destroy entire worlds. And, and it kind of points to the idea that Stephen Strange would be more powerful than he was when he originally popped up in Marvel Comics that he was a guy who could basically do anything because a spell existed for it. And Marvel Comics writers could just make up spells to explain why Stephen Strange could do stuff. The other part of this is we're talking about Stephen Strange going back to the way he was as powerful before, but he wasn't as powerful as the Living Tribunal when he first popped up or even the one above all. He was capable in, with regards to a few things, but when you put them pound for pound, Stephen Strange was not powerful enough to like wipe out entire universes or anything along those lines. So we're kind of left to sort of guess here. The other part of this is that ultimately uh, Stephen Strange is 
denied absolute power. And the reason why is because, again, he's bargaining his soul for 100% power, which means he has to be willing to give away 100% of his soul. The problem with this is he doesn't have 100% of his soul. Now, again, this is where we have to sort of delve into this guesswork. Jonathan Hickman doesn't give us a definitive explanation as to why this is the case. We're kind of left to sort of look at the nature of Stephen Strange and come to a decision on our own. The fortunate thing about this is that over the years of Marvel Comics, we've kind of gotten these explanations to a degree. We have seen things where you had like the, the mystical war between the Vashanti and ultimately Doctor Strange chose not to take their side, which is where his power was reduced when they stripped him of his ability to use their magics. Uh, ultimately, he ended up going back to himself, but only with a, with a fraction of the power he had before. And it was a way for Marvel to basically just reduce his abilities. So he wasn't a guy who could just solve any problem by doing weird looking hand gestures. And then the day was saved. It was designed to kind of prevent that stuff from happening. Uh, but over the years, Stephen Strange has delved into black magic. And on the whole, Stephen Strange doesn't normally do that because the conversation is always that when you delve into that kind of magic, there's a price to be paid. And the implication seems to be that Stephen Strange lost a piece of his soul every time that he did. That's the price that you pay. You lose a piece of yourself. And so over the years with Stephen Strange delving into these dark magics, he's cost himself a portion of his soul each time. Hence the reason why he does not have 100% of his soul. And so as a result of that, what we end up doing is jumping back to the here and now. And we pick up with this battle between the Great Society and the Illuminati themselves. And you've got like the Norn, who again is basically Dr. Fate from DC Comics. And initially he scans the landscape trying to hunt for this bomb and realizes that it's not actually on this alternate reality Earth, that it's on the Earth where the Illuminati come from, the main Marvel Universe Earth. And it makes the most sense, right? If you were going to have like a fail-safe device, like a just-in-case backup plan, why would you bring it with you if you could just detonate it remotely or just like teleport it there, right? Something like that. It'd be a stupid decision to make. <laughs> and so what ends up happening is that with the Norn figuring out where this is, he dispatches Spectrum, which is again, Marvel's version of the Green Lantern, basically, DC's Green Lantern. Uh, he dispatches Spectrum to go basically track it down and Black Bolt follows Spectrum. From there, you get a little bit of trash talk with Namor the Submariner facing off against the Jovian. And the Jovian, again, is basically Martian Manhunter. And, and Namor kind of, kind of, you know, pokes him a little bit and says like, you know, it sucks that it kind of has to come to this, but it's just the way that it is. You know, you fight and you claw and you're, and you're desperate to survive. But the one thing you fail to understand is that in the end, there's really nothing you can do. And this kind of hopelessness that Namor the Submariner has to a degree, which will become stupendously important as we get further into this story, is countered by the hopeful nature of the Jovian and saying, it sucks that you view yourself this way. It sucks that you see yourself in such a way to where you don't really believe that the day can be saved, that you really are that hopeless. But allow me to correct you, right? And the Jovian in turn takes on its physical form or really takes on more of like a shape-shifting form, right? From there, you switch over to Wayne, who's basically Batman, and he's facing off against Black Panther. Now, something that Hickman does here, which is really interesting, is Hickman has Black Panther make this offhanded comment that basically he's a great fighter, right? That Wayne is a great fighter and may very well be better than Black Panther. The reason why that matters is one of the most hotly debated topics in all of comicdom is who would win in a fight, Black Panther or Batman. Now, my vote goes to Black Panther for a few reasons. One, because of the enhanced abilities he has by virtue of the Panther God Bast. The next one is because of the various technologies he has, right? So the vibranium suit, which basically absorbs sound, uh, the adamantium claws that he has as a part of his suit, the most durable metal, like the, the hardest metal in all of Marvel comics. The only exception being uh, Thor's hammer, which adamantium cannot cut and Captain America's shield as well. Like, you know, having these kind of things at his disposal, I think would put Black Panther on top of, of Batman. But it's one of the reasons why you kind of see this, right? It's almost kind of like, hey, like maybe you are a better fighter than I am. You know, like here you go, Batman fans. We're not going to say it directly as Marvel comics because, you know, like we're Marvel comics and Black Panther Panther is a Marvel property, but if we were going pound for pound, eh, Batman will probably come out on top. <laughs> That's kind of what Hickman's saying here, right? So I feel like it's sort of a one-up for Batman fans to be like, yeah, that's pretty much right. You know, Batman would win for no other reason than the fact that he's Batman and that's all you need. <laughs> but then you got Sun God who takes on the Incredible Hulk and manages to take the Incredible Hulk out. What you're basically seeing here is that each one of the members of the Illuminati are falling before the power of the Great Society. You're talking about some wildly powerful individuals. And so when it all comes down to it, all you really have left is Iron Man and Doctor Strange who's recovering. And then Iron Man, of course, has his powers taken out by basically, you know, you know, Marvel's version of the Flash, who can move faster than the speed of light. And it's kind of funny because she makes this offhanded remark, for all your intelligence, it's useless here because I can move faster than you can think. So your intelligence is useless. By the time the thought goes from your subconscious mind into your conscious mind that you should do something, I've already done everything that I'm going to do, which is taking apart your suit. You're useless, old man. You got nothing to offer here. And he doesn't, right? Tony Stark is dismantled entirely. 
enter Doctor Strange. And this is probably one of the best moments of all of Doctor Strange. The truth is that the Norn gets a little big for his britches, right? He's kind of one of these things where it's like, you know, I have all this magical ability. Like you should, it should be obvious with all these foes, you know, all these, these, you know, with, with my group, with the great society, you facing off against us, you can't win. And it was foolish for you to come here and to believe that you could somehow destroy us and then wipe our world out. And Doctor Strange responds by just starting to utter an incantation. And what this does is it basically transitions back to uh, to before this whole incursion took place and Doctor Strange focusing on the Blood Accord. Now, the Blood Accord is, is an artifact that was introduced in this story, but given the nature of Doctor Strange, we can pretty much sort of get it right. That with Stephen Strange, what you have are basically different magical books that will grant him different magical abilities. Some spells will let him time travel. Other spells will let him jump from one universe to another. Other spells will grant him reality warping powers. It depends on what it is that he wants to do. But some spells that are out there come from dark books. And the Blood Accord is an example of that. This is a book that's composed of exceedingly dark spells, of evil and, and just terrible things. And what Doctor Strange is doing is basically summoning this demonic entity from the Blood Accord itself. This basically means that Stephen Strange is at a point of desperation because if he didn't have to do this, he wouldn't. But ultimately, there's really nothing they can do. The other part of this is he confronts the Norn and says, I need, I need you to understand something, right? Like what I've noticed about you is you don't have any magical abilities. You look like you do, but you don't, right? You don't know the dark arts. You don't know what it costs you to be a magician, to be a practitioner of magic, to delve and to, and to pull in these various forces from across the multiverse, each of which would take a piece of your soul every time that you do. You're a charlatan. You're a person who's captured these different artifacts from these different beings that you guys have encountered, whether it's, you know, native villains on your own planet or the black priests when they showed up from an alternate reality, but you're, you're fake. There's nothing about you that's real. And so ultimately he ends up casting aside all these different artifacts that the Norn has. And it's just some kid, right? It's just some young kid pretending to be somebody like Stephen Strange. And Stephen responds, let me show you what the dark arts really look like. Let me show you what happens when you're a person who can truly conjure demonic beasts. And let me show you what they look like. And this is when this demon starts to emerge and his tentacles come out and start wrapping around everybody and just draining them all of their life force, right? Draining every single one of them of all of their life energies. The problem with this is that the longer Stephen Strange allows this demon to exist on this plane of existence, the more Stephen Strange becomes corrupted by it. And that's the danger of summoning beings like this. Now, the other question we kind of have to ask here is why this guy, right? Why not summon someone like Shuma Gorath or something like that, or channel the power of Zom, right? We know Zom is a being that's wildly powerful. If Zom showed up in the main Marvel universe right now, nobody outside of like the living tribunal would be able to stop him, right? Just the living tribunal or like the one above all. If they didn't step in, Zom would wipe out everything across the entirety of the universe, right? Dormammu, all these different characters, Eternity, Infinity, they would all be obliterated by the power of Zom. That's just how powerful he is. The reason why we kind of have to assume that is because one, there's no guarantee that Zom would even lend his power to Stephen Strange in the first place. And as far as Shuma Gorath goes, if Doctor Strange unleashed him onto the Great Society, the first thing Shuma Gorath would try to do is basically take over the Illuminati, subjugate them, turn them into his servants, do the same thing with the Great Society, and then conquer that world. So it's not like Stephen Strange would be able to summon Shuma Gorath in the days saved. They'd have a massive threat to deal with on their own. And so that's why this particular monster was, was brought in here, right? Because it's powerful enough to overcome the Great Society, but not so dangerous that none of the Illuminati can overcome him if that's the case. And Stephen Strange is kind of betting on the Illuminati themselves, right? Because as he continues to allow this demon to exist, he begins to become corrupted by its influence and begins to go mad, right? He begins to go insane through this possession that he's experiencing. This leads to Tony Stark basically knocking him out using a, you know, a, a part of his uh, energy pulses, basically. And of course, back on the, in the main Marvel universe, uh, you have Black Bolt who catches up with Spectrum. He uses this quasi-sonic scream, basically like his powerful shout to knock out Spectrum and then takes the bomb and brings it back to uh, to the Great Society's Earth. And so with Stephen Strange knocked out and with the bomb back here, then the conversation turns to, okay, now it's time to consider destroying this world. And what you end up having, and it's probably one of the saddest moments here, is Sun God like approaches the heroes and says like, it doesn't have to be this way. Like you don't have to destroy my world. You don't have to kill all these innocent people here, these billions and billions of humans who don't even know that this conflict's going on in the first place. You don't need to do any of this. And the response of Reed Richards and the Illuminati is, if we could get away without destroying your world, we would, but we're this close. We're hours away from this incursion completing from your earth hitting our earth and both of our realities being destroyed. So, uh, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like one of these earths has to go and it's not going to be ours, right? It's a tough decision to make. And Black Panther almost, you know, kind of takes this, this trigger unto himself and says, I'll be the one to do it. And this is one of the coolest moments in the entirety of the story, because when this happens, 
Black Panther is met by his ancestors, right? Who basically say, you know what you have to do. But T'Challa is experiencing this massive inner turmoil because it's one thing to say, I'm a king and I'm going to protect my, my kingdom of Wakanda from whatever threats may come. But more often than not, when you make that statement, you assume the threats are malicious. You assume it's somebody like Ulysses Claw who's trying to break into Wakanda and steal his technology. You assume that it's some external force out there like Dr. Doom that's trying to do what he did in Doom War, which is set up a coup d'etat and steal all the vibranium in Wakanda, which he successfully did. Like you assume that it's some nefarious plot or something. You don't really think about it from the perspective of a world inhabited by billions of people through no fault of their own, setting on a collision course towards yours. And if both your Earths crash into each other, both realities get destroyed. And that's what T'Challa's weighing here is it's not some evil threat. These are innocent people. They don't have control over this situation, but I'm sitting here plotting the concept of destroying their world anyway in order to save our own. His ancestors do not have this kind of struggle. Their response is destroy the world. It's a threat to Wakanda. And that's the difference between T'Challa and a lot of his ancestors, right? His ancestors were hardcore. Anything out there that's a credible threat to Wakanda has to go. It's got to be taken care of. It's got to be neutralized by hook or by crook. It doesn't matter. But for T'Challa, it's, it's a little more nuanced than that. And ultimately, he ends up basically telling his father's spiritual form, I can't do it, right? I can't pull this trigger and I can't destroy all these people. In return, his father banishes him from the afterlife. What this basically means is that when T'Challa dies, he will not join his ancestors. He will not be among those former Black Panthers because as far as they're concerned, they see him as a traitor, somebody who stood against Wakanda in a time when Wakanda needed to be saved, right? The role of a king is to protect his people by any means necessary. It doesn't matter where that threat comes from and it doesn't matter who that threat is. If it's a threat, it gets destroyed, no questions asked. But the fact that T'Challa can't really do it is an indication to his ancestors, he's no true king. He's no true Black Panther. He's a half measure. And so ultimately, he's banished from, from the eternal plane of all the Black Panthers. And so whatever Black Panthers come after him, when they go to speak with their ancestors, T'Challa will not be there. He will not be a Black Panther they can commune with. That's a pretty significant thing. In response to that, Namor the Submariner picks up the trigger and basically says like, I'm the greatest man that I know. You know, compared to me, you guys are nothing. You guys are absolutely nothing. The reality of this is we knew it would come to this. And so if you can't do it, I will. And then when the Submariner activates the trigger and blows the planet to pieces, right? Destroys that entire earth and kills billions of people along with it. In response to this, he goes on like this sort of amazing, this amazing monologue where he says like, it's such a fragile thing, right? This trigger, six pounds of pressure is all it took to, to send an electrical signal to a bomb on a different world and wipe out the whole thing. And I find myself asking, how could that be done? And then I find myself answering, that's right. It was built for that purpose. We built these bombs. If we didn't think it would come to this, why did we build them? We built them because we knew it would. We built them because we knew a time would come when we were going to have to detonate a bomb on one of these worlds and wipe out innocent people. We accepted that fact. We are fallen men, right? We are men who are willing to wipe out entire civilizations in order to preserve our own universe. That's the way this goes. You guys knew what you were signing up for. And now when it comes down to it, when you've got to actually do it, suddenly you turn into cowards. Suddenly you turn into weak weak-willed men who can't do what needs to be done. Black Panther freaks, immediately goes on a warpath and starts attacking Name of the Submariner. Reed Richards jumps in, right? Basically kind of wraps himself around, begins to sort of break the two of them up. And then Tony Stark chimes in and says, we didn't believe it would actually come to this. Yes, we built those, but those were just a just in case. We believed that when the time came that we'd be able to find some kind of scenario where we could save both worlds. The response of Namor, you're a fool, Tony Stark. If you really believe that, if you really believe that with these incursions happening in the way that they were, that every earth that we went to would have people who would want to have some kind of peaceful negotiation, who would want to talk to us and to ensure that we didn't destroy our world and they didn't destroy theirs. You're an idiot because you have to understand people out there on their worlds want to save those worlds. And what if we encounter other realities where the people there are evil, where they want to destroy our world and they wouldn't think two things about it. Are you still going to talk to them? Are you still going to try to have a conversation with them? No. The people who save the day, the people who win wars are ones who do what needs to be done. Not though there's individuals who just want to talk and have a conversation, they're half measures. They're weak-willed men. Be a grown man, be a strong man, or get out of here. Be no man at all. And so with that being the case, again, the fight is kind of on to a degree between Black Panther and, and Namor the Submariner. And then the Incredible Hulk steps in, smashes the ground, and splits the two of them up. And where there is a bit of a reprieve here, right, where there is a little bit of a moment where it seems like everything has kind of died down, the response of Namor, he basically tells Black Panther, it was me. And Black Panther thinks he's talking about the trigger, right? He thinks he's talking about the, the bomb that was detonated. And Black Panther's like, yeah, we know it was. And he says, no, it was me right now. If you guys recall our 
video where we talked about how Doctor Strange ended up summoning Shuma Gorath during the events of Infinity when Thanos invaded Earth. We talked about how uh, the, the forces of Proxima Midnight and with Supergiant, Black Dwarf, all those different guys, the, the Cole Obsidian, how they had traveled to Atlantis and then inexplicably left Atlantis and then went to Wakanda. The reason why is because Namor told them to. That what ended up happening is that in the aftermath of the uh, Avengers versus X-Men story arc, right? So Namor the Submariner becomes part of the Phoenix Force and then he obliterates a huge portion of Wakanda that Wakanda was still recovering. But where T'Challa was no longer the Black Panther and instead it was his sister Shuri, she decided to go to war with Atlantis. And so with that being the case, uh, Wakandan Black Ops forces infiltrated Atlantis while Namor was away during these incursions and then wiped out a huge portion of his people. When Namor finally got back there, he found his own kingdom completely decimated. And so when the Black Order of Thanos showed up on Earth looking for the Infinity Stones and they showed up in Atlantis, Namor said, there are no Infinity Stones here, but I do know where you can find them. You can find them in Wakanda, right? He knew they weren't there. He knew there were no Infinity Stones there. What he wanted to do was see what was left of Wakanda laid waste by the Black Order of Thanos, which he knew they would most likely do. And that's exactly what they did. They showed up to Wakanda, all hell broke loose. Now, now fortunately, Wakanda managed to fight a lot of them off, but not without a whole bunch of deaths at the hands of, of the Black Order. And so with, with T'Challa realizing this, that Namor intentionally sent the forces of Thanos to Wakanda for no other reason than to basically get revenge and to see the death of his people. And with Namor the Submariner saying, I don't regret it. And if given the opportunity, I would watch your people die again. Black Panther is incensed and absolutely freaks. I mean, this guy is seeing red because the reality of this is that where Black Panther, where, where T'Challa wasn't really in a position and didn't really want to destroy a world of innocent people, understand it doesn't mean he doesn't care about his people. It doesn't mean he doesn't care about Wakanda. He'll do whatever he needs to do to protect them with the exception of killing billions of innocents, right? People who would basically be collateral damage and no conflict of their own fault. And so with this being the case, he loses his mind, right? Absolutely freaks out and tries to destroy Namor. Now, Namor is sent away by a Tony Stark, right? He's told, get out of here. Like, get out of here and do not come back. And so where you have the other members of the Illuminati who begin going their separate ways, right? Who begin basically leaving, suddenly Reed Richards' hand lights up because another incursion is happening in seven hours and 55 minutes. They keep coming faster. They keep coming sooner, right? It's just the way this goes. And so what you end up having here is basically a countdown to the incursion time, right? We pick up, you know, seven hours before the incursion happens. You've got Bruce Banner, who's basically just kind of sitting there enjoying a beer and, and almost with his incredible Hulk persona. And for the first time in a long time, Bruce Banner is actually at peace. Knowing everything is going to end, he's at peace, right? He chills here for a few hours. So at this point, we're at three hours until the incursion point happens. You end up picking up with Doctor Strange, who's talking to Wong. And it's one of the coolest conversations because when he's talking to his assistant Wong, he starts asking questions, saying things like, you know, I, I, I don't know who I am anymore. You know, I delved into the blood of core. I, I tried to sell 100% of my soul for 100% of absolute power. I've done dark things in my life. I've done it for the purpose of trying to save our universe, our reality from threats like Dormammu and Nightmare and like, and, and Satanish and like Shumagorath. I've done it over and over and over again, but I don't know if this makes me a good man. And he asks Wong, with all the evil that I've done in the name of good, am I a good person? And the response of Wong is, no, you're not. You are not a good person. Like you're basically a bad guy now, right? You're willing to sacrifice the, the lives of innocent people, even if they are in a different reality for the purpose of saving your own. From there, you transition to Tony Stark one hour until the incursion happens, until both these worlds collide into each other or until this earth is destroyed, whatever the case is, but until like this reality is totally obliterated, right? So it's basically one hour until the end of this universe. You've got Tony Stark who lines up a whole bunch of shots. And the initial thought is he's relapsing, right? He's going back into alcoholism. He's not. What he's doing is he's pouring all these different shots and says, okay, I couldn't save my universe, right? We've got one hour until the incursion. We've got no plan. We're not mobilized. You know, destroying that world like that really showed us what it is that we would have to do. And we're just not willing to do it. I'm, I'm done, right? Like, you know, I'm not, you know, if there's any one thing in this universe that I can beat, it's alcohol, right? I am not going to succumb to my alcoholism, even in my last days. That's not going to happen. And so what you do is you pick up with Reed Richards alongside Susan Storm. Now, one thing to understand, Susan Storm doesn't know what's going on, right? You know, the, the wife of Reed Richards and the Fantastic Four, the Invisible Woman, she has no idea what's happening here. She doesn't know about the incursion. She doesn't know about the collapse of the multiverse. She doesn't know that their reality is something like 45 minutes away from coming to an end, from being totally obliterated, right? Reed Richards, on the other hand, has, has been acting in a way that looks frantic to Susan Storm, right? He looks manic. He's been traveling to go see Franklin Richards. He wanted to spend time with his son, to have a conversation with him, to have a heart to heart, to assure him that everything was going to be okay with no real explanation that was given. He's gone here to Castle Doom to Latveria, right? Where Dr. Doom dwells and basically wants to meet with his daughter Valeria, who's staying with Victor Von Doom for 
for a time. And, and a lot of it just kind of seems wild and it seems off the charts. It's things that Reed Richards wouldn't normally do. And you've got Dr. Doom talking to Susan and asking the question, do you know why Reed is here? Like, do you know why he came here in the middle of the night in order to talk to Valeria? And the response to Susan is no, but I trust my husband implicitly. But again, when he asks, like he gave you no answer whatsoever. She says, no, I don't know. You know, I, I have no, I really honestly have no clue why we're here or what's going on. And Dr. Doom asks, does that concern you as much as it concerns me? And she says, yes, because this is very uncharacteristic of Reed Richards, but Valeria is no slouch. Remember, she's one of the three smartest people in the Marvel universe. You've got Valeria Richards, Reed Richards, and you've got, uh, you've got Dr. Doom, right? Valeria, you know, th this kind of top three spot or this number one spot switches among these three different characters, depending on who's writing the story. But more often than not, these three are depicted as the smartest people in the entirety of the Marvel universe. Valeria takes one look at her dad and says, what have you done? We're five minutes from the incursion happening. We're five minutes from the end of all things. You've got Black Bolt of the Inhumans, who's just sitting on the, on the oxygen rich blue area of the moon, just staring at earth, knowing that it's all getting ready to come to an end and kind of lets out this shout. 50 seconds until the incursion happens, 40 seconds, then we're at 30 seconds, and then we're at 20 seconds, then we're at 10 seconds, then we're at incursion, and nothing happens. Incursion plus 10 seconds, incursion plus 20 seconds, 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 60 seconds. What in the world is going on here, right? Like the, the like, like that's the response to Tony Stark. The world should be like, it should be the end. Our universe should just be blinked out of existence. Our earth should be totally destroyed and the entire universe blown up along with it. Where is this incursive earth? Why hasn't everything ended? It should be the end of all things, right? We should be done for. And so when the Illuminati meet back up again, right? This, this is probably the coolest moment of the incursions arc, right? Where like everything's coming to an end. The Illuminati meet back up again and they're all kind of talking amongst each other other, like what in the world's going on? Like where are our devices wrong, right? Like did we get a false positive? Were we told there was an incursion and there was no incursion at all? Like what's going on here? And the, the response of Reed is no, our devices are foolproof. They work every single time. If, if our devices said there was an incursion that was supposed to happen, then it means it was supposed to happen. And if we got to incursion and there was nothing going on, then something had to interfere. Something had to have stopped this incursion. And that's when you have Black Bolt of the Inhumans who asked the question, where's Namor the Submariner? From there, we we switched to four hours before we got to zero time with the incursions, right? And what you end up having is Namor the Submariner who's talking to Thanos and Proxima Midnight and Corvus Glaive and Terax the Enlightened and Black Swan and Maximus the Mad. What he's done is he created a cabal. The reason why that incursion didn't happen is because the incursion was stopped. And the incursion was stopped when Namor and his cabal showed up on that earth, obliterated all the superheroes and then blew it to pieces. So we are here. Time runs out. Probably the single greatest Avengers story that's ever been written in the history of Marvel Comics. Here's the thing, man. Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, this is when everything gets amazing. Every forum post that you've ever seen where people talk about how great Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers is, every time I've ever talked about how great it is, this is when we get to that point. So what we end up doing here is we end up picking up in what's basically called the Alpha One system. Now, one of the things to remember is Jonathan Hickman named systems based on their sons. So the Alpha One system is just named after its own son, Alpha One, but what you have here are a bunch of ex Nihili. Now, if you guys recall from the early stories that we did, and this is why I say when it comes to Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, everything builds on itself. If you guys recall in the very early stories when we first covered this uh, with Avengers World and all that stuff, ex Nihilo was only one member of his race, and they had been created by the builders for the purpose of creating life on various worlds. They're basically representations of life, right? Their job is to go to different worlds, create life, and if that life is, you know, deemed to be something that can't survive, or whatever the case is, then an abyss, which is basically the, the representation of death, destroys that life and they kind of start over again or something along those lines. What, what they're doing here is channeling their energy as best they can to keep the Alpha One Sun alive. And the reason why is because the sun's basically going supernova and ultimately they fail and five ex Nihili die in the process. The result of this is that where you have ex Nihilo who's asking the question like, why did this sun go supernova? Why couldn't, why couldn't we save it? Then you end up having the abyss, right? Abyss basically jumps in and says, because the sun wants to die. And, and it's one of the things where, where like the other ex Nihilo who are here are like, but that doesn't make any sense, right? This sun was supposed to survive for billions of years. By all standards of measurement, this sun was a teenager. So why did it give up its life? And the response of, of Abyss is, I don't fully know, but it looks like the universe is dying and the suns are blinking out in the process. And so what she basically kind of realizes here is this kind of energy signature for lack of a better word, right? Her ability to, de to detect the destruction of the universe is all emanating from a singular point. That point, of course, 
being Earth because of the nature of the incursions. And so what this does is it basically picks up eight months later, right? And even this little segment that we just covered is about eight months later. But the, the idea behind this and the reason why it's considered to be an eight months later event is because what you end up having, or at least what Marvel did here, is that where we finished the last story arc, right? So like the creation of the Cabal, all that kind of stuff, Marvel wanted to ensure that by the time Secret Wars picked up, that pretty much all the character arcs were wrapped up, right? So the existing Captain America story at the time, the existing Thor story by Jason Aaron at the time was basically coming to an end. And so the way this works, and, and I don't want to be too kind of crazy here, but the way this works is that if you go and you look at like Marvel's publication history during this time, that you you have a, you have like Captain America's comic, for example, it goes on for a little bit, and then you get an arc called The Final Days of Captain America, basically. Before, like right before you get to that arc, so the issue before that arc starts, dead ends into this. But again, it's, it's one of these things where everything's basically dying. And so what we do here is we actually jump to the Savage Land. And of course you have these children here. If you guys recall, those are the children who were created Created when Ex Nihilo infected the Earth and tried to try to basically force the Earth to evolve to become a sentient life form. And that was basically stopped, right? That was stopped by Starbrand when he kind of killed the sentience of the world. But these kids here were part of that evolutionary process of Ex Nihilo, like kind of creating a new form of life. But talking with Hyperion, again, eight months have passed. So you'll notice Hyperion looks a lot different than he used to. But what you also have here is advanced idea mechanics, which is now working for Robert DaCosta. So in the last videos that we did, they were just working on their own accord. When we have like the evil Avengers and things, like that, they were just doing that for their, their own purpose, right? Trying to understand the nature of the multiversal collapse in their own way. With Robert DaCosta coming along and basically now being a source of funding, and with advanced idea mechanics working for him, they now do as they're directed. And what they're trying to do here is create a device that will allow the Avengers, or at least uh, allow a small contingent of Avengers, to enter into the multiverse, right? So that's kind of what's going on there. But you end up having Hyperion, who travels to meet with Thor. And this this right here, this is probably one of the coolest parts of the entire story, right? The, the friendship between Thor and Hyperion. These guys become bros, right? It's the coolest thing. Because if you guys recall, Hyperion was like a Boy Scout. He was like Superman, right? Like, I don't drink alcohol. I fight the good fight. I believe in like the greatness of people and stuff like that. Hyperion, because of the things that he's experienced, has become a lot more hardened in the in the last eight months, things that we haven't really seen taking place, but has become a lot more hardened and a lot more understanding of how the world really is. He's become very similar to Thor, becoming like a warrior. Now for Thor himself, you guys will notice he doesn't have his hammer and he's got a metal arm. The reason for that takes place in Jason Aaron's Thor run, right? That's that's one of the things that Jonathan Hickman did was taking the information from that comic and rolling it over into here. To make this really quick, and you guys are welcome to check it out if you want to, in the Thor run, uh, Thor basically lost the ability to wield his hammer and lost his, uh, lost, you know, his arm in the, the first arc where Jane Foster took over and became the new Thor. That's why he's wielding his battle axe. He's not worthy to lift his own hammer. And so it's a, a cool little moment here because from there, it switches over to, uh, to basically Golgotha, which is essentially like a shield station, which is previously Avengers Tower. So the Avengers have been ran out of their own facility and has been completely and totally taken over by S.H.I.E.L.D. Now you've got Maria Hill who's talking to someone that's simply Archangel Command, right? So she's reporting to somebody else. But basically Maria Hill kind of gives a field response and saying like, here's what's going on where we're out here right now, right? So, hey boss, Here's what we found, is basically what she says. And what we end up finding out is they've discovered that Amadeus Cho is trying to hack into Avengers Mansion. Now, Amadeus Cho is a character that's relatively new at the time this story was published, but he's a guy who was super intelligent. One of the big issues with Amadeus Cho is that there wasn't a whole lot of expansion to his character insofar as like building him up and making him wildly interesting. But basically, he's a guy that has the ability to basically be in any situation and analyze it using mathematical probability and then find a way out, right? To, to basically figure out the best possible way for him to escape any situation that he's in. And as soon as the alarms go off, which he expected to happen, he reports to somebody else and he tells somebody else, yeah, I'm in, but the alarm's activated and he's told, get out. Now, S.H.I.E.L.D. immediately leaps in and you've got their, their S.H.I.E.L.D. agents who come running in and you've got Amadeus Cho calculating all these mathematical probabilities in his head, right? He's one of the eight smartest people in the world. He's calculating all these probabilities in his head. He's met by War Machine. He's met by Carol Danvers and he's met by Hawkeye. And he immediately gets the upper hand over all three of them, right? He manages to take out War Machine. He ends up friendly firing onto uh, Carol Danvers, and then Hawkeye has to dodge out of the way when friendly fire is set upon him, right? So it's taking over the Iron Man armor, which is no small thing. And so what that does is it gives him a chance to kind of get away. This leads to other War Machine armors flying in and trying to take out Amadeus Cho. The whole time, he's calculating mathematical probabilities, right? The whole time, he's calculating a way out until he gets to a point where he can't teleport away, right? He can't escape. And instead, the device is implanted into his hand 
hand that the Illuminati use that basically allow them to teleport to different locations is removed and it's destroyed. So right off the bat, we know Amadeus Cho is working with the Illuminati and he's the, you know, they're the ones that he was reporting to. From there, it goes into a series of questions that are being asked. Where's Iron Man? Now you guys will notice this is superior Iron Man. The way this looks, that's one of the things that took place during this eight month window. And so for a lot of people who were, who read the events of superior Iron Man and then it just ends, that's because of the fact that it ends and goes into this eight months later time period. So this is what Tony Stark was doing after the events of superior Iron Man. But the, the other questions asked, where's Hulk? Where's Ant-Man? Where's Captain Britain? Where is Doctor Strange? This is a lot of the stuff that's been going on in the last eight months. In the last eight months, Captain Britain's joined the Illuminati. Ant-Man joined the Illuminati, although we're going to find out a lot more about him than we knew before. But that's the other thing. Where's Black Bolt? Where is Black Panther? Where's Beast, right? Where is Reed Richards? We find out this question's being asked by Susan Storm. She says, where is my husband? She sided against Reed Richards and the Fantastic Four. Now, the reason for this comes by way of the fact that in the last story arc that we covered with regards to the Avengers, Captain America figured out what was going on with the incursions. He remembered. He remembered everything that was going on. What he did is he went to the Avengers and told them what was happening. Basically said, here's everything that I know. This led to a sort of split among the Avengers team that some individuals believed Captain America because of the fact that he's Captain America. He doesn't have a reason to lie. Other people thought that maybe he was losing his mind, right? That maybe there was something else going on and they sided against him or they believed that what the Illuminati were doing was right. And that basically led to sort of a rift. And so ultimately you ended up having Susan Storm siding with this whole cause. And it seems as though she's the one reporting to Captain America. And so from there, we switch over to Latveria. And what you end up having is Namor the Submariner talking to Doctor Doom. And we find out that in the last video that we did, that Namor had created the Cabal, right? Thanos and the, the Black Order and, and so on. And their job was to basically, you know, destroy worlds that were incursing onto Earth, right? To basically keep the main Marvel Universe as safe as they could by doing what the Illuminati could not do, be willing to destroy a world. The problem with this is that where the, the Black Order signed on and said, yeah, like we're definitely down for this, right? To like keep our universe intact, to keep the universe from being destroyed. What's happened is that over the course of these eight months, the Black Order has become bloodlusted, right? They take relish in not necessarily, in not only just destroying those worlds, but they take, they take relish and comfort and actually killing the superheroes. To them, it's not even about protecting the universe anymore. It's about just inflicting as much death and destruction as they possibly can. And so of course they also bring the antimatter bombs and they destroy those incursive Earths. And that's the concern that Namor has, right? That like, it's not the way it's supposed to be. This is supposed to be a group doing what they need to do. This is not supposed to be a group doing what they love to do. And that's when he basically goes to Dr. Doom and says, I need your help in trying to keep this contained. And the response of Doom is no. And 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 where Namor's like, why? Like, why wouldn't you help me with this? Dr. Doom basically says, if you believed that the Illuminati weren't able to do what they needed to do in order to keep the incursions from happening, then you could have come to me before you threw in with people like Thanos and his Black Order. You could have come to me. Like, you could have come to me, we could have talked, and we could have found a way to make it work. Do I strike you as the kind of person who would have said no to that, right? There's, there's this really great line that Dr. Doom delivers, where he's talking to Namor the Submariner, and they're talking about what it means to be kings. And he says, I love my people, like I do, but they are my people. I keep them safe from harm. I give them a better life. And at night, before they pray to whatever God they believe in, they give thanks to me. Yes, like I am an absolute ruler over this place, but I don't rule as a dictator. I rule as a just and peaceful king. And he tells Namor, you threw in your lot with the wrong people. And now you're dragging the stinking carcass of your failure to my front door, hoping that I'll somehow bail you out. No, you're on your own get out of here. Like, it's the coolest thing. This is why Dr. Doom is so awesome. One, because he delivers some of the best lines, right? Like he delivers like amazing lines. But two, he's a guy that, that basically is, is very, very prideful, right? Because at the end of the day, he really just sort of breaks it down and says like, Dr. Doom is nobody's second choice. So like at the end of the day, he's just pissed that he wasn't the first choice of Namor the Submariner. <laughs> but the other thing about this is Dr. Doom actually has a backup plan. But before we find out what it is, we end up picking up in an alternate reality designated Earth 71202. And you end up picking up with Corvus Glaive, right? And he's basically taunting Charles Xavier after having killed the X-Men. And they ask, he asks the question, like, I look around and I wonder, where is Zorn? This guy who hid the sun behind his mask. Where's his brother who hid a black hole behind his mask? Where are your X-Men, Charles Xavier? Where are your champions? Where are your heroes? And the response of Xavier is, I don't know. And, and, and literally, Corvus Glaive is like, I know. I know because when we arrived on this wretched backwater world, you sent them here to kill us. What I want to present you here is a 
the final word from your champions, from your from the from the champion of Zorn and his brother Zorn, and then it switches over to Terax the Tamer, and this is amazing thing, right? This this amazing monologue where it's like, what was the purpose in what we did, right? Where is the virtue in dying for a useless cause, right? Was it enough that we proved our bravery by flying into a conflict that we couldn't win at your request because you underestimated the forces that we were facing off against? We died for no reason at all. Are you finally proud of us? Are you finally proud of the fact that we gave our lives for your great cause? But at the end of the day, we deserved better. We deserve better than a fate of dying against forces we couldn't have possibly hoped to have defeated in the first place. And then they kiss. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> and the response of Xavier is like, you're crazy. All of you guys are crazy. What's wrong with all of you? And then the response of Corvus Glaive is, look over there, human. Look at this man, Thanos, this being, this monstrosity of a form, this force that manhandled every single one of your X-Men and crushed them with the greatest of ease. Look upon the face of death, this force that you could have never had any chance of stopping in the first place. And when Xavier asks, what do you want? The response of Corvus Glaive is very little, Professor X, a pittance, a portion, a tribute. And that's the coolest thing because that was our introduction to Corvus Glaive. If you remember the events of Infinity, when he showed up on that world and basically said, I want all your children's heads, right? That it was, it was pretty intense. And when Xavier asks, what is it? Thanos says, I want you to beg. I want you to beg me to kill you. And and where Xavier's like, like, no, that's not going to happen. And you end up having Terax the Tamer who chimes in and says, but like, we know you will though. Your X-Men are gone. There's really nothing left here, but we do have a couple of them. We have a couple of your X-Men here and we, we can save them. We can keep them alive, right? We won't execute them in front of you, but only if you beg. And because Xavier cares so much about his X-Men, he ends up begging and Thanos takes comfort in it, takes relish in, in, in Professor X begging for his life. From there, we switch to the fallen city of Wakanda, right? Wakanda has basically been, been collapsed and it's been conquered now. When the Black Order escaped, they laid ruin to it all, right? They obliterated almost the entirety of, of Wakanda. But what, la what they left behind were drones. These drones are tasked with cruising through the city and eliminating anybody that they find, right? And what you end up having is a group that basically makes its way into Wakanda itself, which are basically like the dogs of war, right? The Wakandan dogs of war. It's the coolest concept because you have Black Panther, I guess T'Challa, and you have his sister Shuri who get in there. and the reason why they're here is because they're basically accessing where all of the antimatter bombs are, right? If you guys remember that, the Illuminati created them for the purpose of destroying worlds. The Black Panther and his crew were sneaking in here to get them away, right? To ensure the Cabal cannot continue doing what they're doing because the Illuminati knows what's going on, right? So now it's the Illuminati trying to stop the Cabal from doing what the Illuminati were ultimately probably going to have to do anyway. It's just the Cabal's so extreme. They're just so rampant, just hopping across entire universes and wiping out entire Earths, right? Just killing everything out of a bloodlust. And so you end up having one of the dogs of war who steps up to this to the antimatter bombs and is immediately incinerated and then you're met with the arrival of maximus the mad right he's the one that basically freed the black order and it's kind of one of these these funny things because where t'challa says you don't really believe i can't get past this force field i'm like the third smartest person in the world the response of maximus is no i mean you know you probably could but understand you're locked in here like you're you're locked in here and you're fa you're gonna face off against proxima midnight now proxima midnight this is kind of the cool thing she is a Hoss, right? Like she's a demon. In like a one-on-one -on -one confrontation, she's very, very difficult for people to take out. Really, a couple of the Wakandans are taken out. And then you end up having one of the dogs of war who tells T'Challa and Shuri, get out of here, right? Like get out of here and run. And, and they basically end up fleeing. And he makes this amazing, this amazing line, right? He says like, look here, woman, I am a Hatut Zarazi, a dog of war. I was made to die for my country. Have you ever seen such conviction? And then pulls the pen and, and like literally blows up. And Proxima Midnight's like, Every day that I wake, I have more conviction than you could possibly ever imagine. She, of course, survives the explosion and then ends up tracking down Black Panther and Shuri. And what you end up having is Black Panther basically telling the telling the Illuminati, the mission failed. We couldn't get a hold of the antimatter bombs. There was a force field up. We were ambushed by Proxima Midnight. We had to get out of there as fast as we can. The response of Reed is, let's get out of here. And he tells Shuri, we have to go. And she says, I'm not coming. We fight for something. Like the idea is that we fight for Wakanda. We fight for our, our city. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die as the Black Black Panther of my city. I will not die anywhere else. You have a bigger mission here. You have a bigger role to play here. Go and join the Illuminati. She's not taking this from a stance of anger. You know, she doesn't look at him as somebody who's abandoning their place. No, not at all. And so you basically end up having T'Challa who says, okay, then I will undertake my mission. Shuri ends up staying behind. And so you end up having uh, Proxima Midnight who shows up here. It's like the, the 
coolest moment, right? Like, man, let me tell you something. It's the coolest moment. Proxima Midnight shows up here. And she's like, oh man, like Black Panther, like he abandoned you. Like, man, that's that's wild. Like, what are you gonna do? Because like, you're gonna die. And she asks like, do you know what I see right now? And Shuri's like, what do you see? And she's like, I see nothing that breathes tomorrow. So I'm going to give you an option. Either you can see this death coming or you can be a coward and you can turn around. Shuri leaps up right into the battle switch <laughs> we don't get to see what happens instead we pick up with dr doom right and he's asked by christoph by his son christoph bernard after namor leaves and he's like do you really believe it was a smart idea to like not take namor on as an ally and the response of doom is no because he's a broken version of himself he's no king he's not the person that he used to be above all else the only thing that we really have in this world is loyalty to who we are as soon as we lose who it is that we are we have nothing else we're just a shell of our former selves we're no longer king kings. We're no longer rulers, right? You don't have to be uh, be in charge of a kingdom to truly be a king. You just have to know who you are and understand that that's not something that you're willing to sacrifice. Besides, it's not really the biggest deal in the world. <laughs> they end up opening this door and we end up finding out the thinkers here, right? Now, the mad thinker is an old Fantastic Four villain. He would create these little like little robots, things like that to face off against the Fantastic Four. He's more or less like a 60s villain, like a 60s and 70s villain. He was peanuts, right? He was very, he was very, very, very small time, but he is exceedingly intelligent and if you guys recall, in one of the previous videos that we did, we talked about how the first incursion that happened that the Illuminati coped with, where we saw the map makers, that a piece of that Earth, or a piece of that, that alternate reality Earth, ended up landing in Latveria. And Dr. Doom got his hands on it. And what he's been doing is analyzing it this entire time. Now, if you guys recall the nature of the map makers, right, the nature of these, these Sidera Maris, is that when they land on an alternate Earth, that they bring a piece of that Earth with them. And what that piece of the Earth does is it literally sends out a homing beacon and it says, hey guys, come here. And the map makers follow that signal and then they arrive on the new earth they lay waste to any kind of life on that earth they destroy it and then they move on to the next one right like that's how that process works well with this piece being here and with it sending out a, a kind of signal what the mad thinker's been doing is analyzing it and what he ends up realizing is that this signal is actually part of a network right so it's like your computer hooking up to the internet it's sending out a signal constantly and if you can crack the signal you can trace the signal and you can see what this signal's communicating with and you can see what that signal's communicating with and and so on and so forth and ultimately end up tracing and, and really mapping the entirety of the multiversal network and so what this means is dr doom now knows everywhere the map makers have been which means he can trace them to their source he can find out where they originally came from he can basically locate the ivory kings right the white lords of wild space and when the question is asked like what plan do we have here the response of dr doom is i have everything i need i've got my plan i know exactly what i have to do to implement the plan and i have the source of power that can help me achieve this plan i have have the Molecule Man Owen Reese. Let there be suffering and woe to all who stand in my way. And that's the reality of it. Molecule Man is a multiversal powerful character. All right, what's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, but we're gonna deviate here for a second. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover uh, the last tidbit of Avengers World. I didn't really plan on it. Uh, and the reason why is some of you guys may recognize the name Avengers World, right? And that was the name of the first video that we did. And the reason why is because the first volume of Hickman's Avengers is called Avengers World. But what this did is it created a spinoff series that was largely written by Nick Spencer alongside Jonathan Hickman that focused on the whole idea of like the Avengers engine, right? So like having Avengers all across the world. It wasn't really my thing, but by the time he got to the end, it did provide some context. Now, this bit of a discussion is going to provide context to what we're talking about in relation to like the cabal going awry and like just wiping out other worlds and taking taking like comfort in it, like enjoying the idea of what they're doing uh, and how Namor lost control. And then we'll jump back into the into the, the meat and potatoes of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. So what this does is it basically picks up with the Fantastic Four on Earth 47385383. But again, this is just alternate reality stuff, right? Like actually Gabriel, uh, one of like a really long time fan. Like that guy's cool. Every time I went to New York Comic Con, we never happened to meet each other and we need to. Um, I don't even know. Gabriel, do you have a Rob Core ring? If you don't, like, like, you should have gotten one a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, hit me up on Twitter. Send me a DM on Twitter and I'll send you a, uh, I'll send you a Rob Core ring. But nonetheless, the part of the story that we saw in the last video, right? When like Thanos killed the X-Men Gabriel, that was in an alternate reality, right? So when you see like Thanos, like from this point going forward, when you see Thanos and the Black Order, like killing people on other worlds, that's, that's an alter, that's alternate reality stuff, right? On that particular world, there weren't really any superheroes except for the X-Men. That seemed to be the case. So uh, this takes place on an alternate reality as well. And, and this, you know, really seems to be 
a world where there is nobody but the Fantastic Four, right? It's really just these guys. And the Fantastic Four have like a great big huge army, that kind of a thing. But we basically pick up in the middle of the, the Fantastic Four's army going against the forces of the Black Order and getting totally overrun, right? I mean, this it's not really even much of a fight. Like these guys are just overrun and completely obliterated. Now, one thing to understand here, guys, is that this is one of those things where the longer that Thanos and his and his Black Order and Namor are out there in the multiverse facing off uh, facing off against different worlds, the more capable they become, right? Because you start to notice certain patterns that when they go to any one particular Earth, they're only ever really going to face off against one of a handful of forces, right? Like some alternate reality version of the Avengers, some alternate reality version of the X-Men, or some alternate reality version of the Fantastic Four. And getting used to the Fantastic Four's powers, getting used to the abilities of the X-Men, getting used to having face off against the Avengers, after a while, it just kind of becomes rinse and repeat. And you know exactly how to plan your attacks in order to win. And that's why they've proved themselves in being so capable and taking out all these various forces. Because after a while, it's really just practice, right? It's just an exercise in efficiency and killing. And so this basically leads to uh, to, to Namor the Submariner, who's you know seemingly on this throne of the Fantastic Four, right? And he's basically killed Reed. Susan shows up there again. This alternate reality Susan shows up there and is surprised to see that Namor is there. But with this Namor arriving here, you know he almost kind of tells Susan that he's still as much in love with her as 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 he ever was, and really more with the concept of Susan, right? With the idea of Susan Storm. And the reason why is he kind of hits at what Hickman did during Fantastic Four with uh, with Reed Richards, where it's like every universe that, he, that they travel to where they encounter a version of Susan, she's as headstrong as any other universal counterpart, right? Especially the main Marvel universe. When you look at her, she's one of these characters where she's headstrong, she's stubborn in a lot of ways, uh, but she's got it together. And if there's any one chick you want in your corner, it's definitely her, right? She's got it where it counts. Her force fields can hold off celestial power, different things like that. She's by no means someone to scoff at. But where Namor kind of comforts her and says, hey, look, you know, does the best he can to kind of ease her transition and helping her understand there's nothing you can do to save your world and your world is going to be destroyed. Ultimately, she ends up being killed by Proxima Midnight. And Proxima Midnight's like, it's time to go. Like, we're here to kill a world. There's no time for sentimentality here, right? We came here to kill a world. She's dead. Let's destroy the world. Let's go, right? We're, we're going to call it a day. And that's exactly what the Cabal do, right? They set off the antimatter bomb, they obliterate the world, and they basically leave. Now, from here, it transitions over to a small little conversation between Namor the Submariner and uh, and, and Black Swan. And this, you know, where, where you kind of have Namor who's sitting here sort of kind of recalling these memories of people who are like begging for their lives and different things like that. The reality is that what Namor signed on for is more than he can handle. And that's one of the cool things here. It really shows us that where Jonathan Hickman wrote Namor Submariner in such a way to where he's like, I will do what needs to be done if the rest of you Illuminati won't. And that's why he formed the Cabal. What it really shows is that Namor kind of bit off more than he could chew. That Namor thought he was ready to destroy worlds. He thought he was ready to do what needs to be done. But at the end of the day, the Black Swan was right when they first met her at the very beginning of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. It basically robs you of what makes you who you are. It robs you of your heroism. It robs you of your humanity. It forces you to do things that you wouldn't do, and you end up losing yourself. And that's exactly what's happened with Namor. Slowly and steadily, he's been losing himself in this time that he spent with the Cabal. He's basically surrounded by regret. He's surrounded by sadness and misery by knowing that there are so many innocent lives out there that perish. And he tries to justify it by saying, like, I do what I do in the name of the greater good in order to save my universe. But it doesn't assuage his conscience. It doesn't help him accept the fact that billions and billions, and, and really even we're getting into the trillions at this point, of innocent people have perished at the hands of the cabal that he created and has now lost control of. Now, in his conversation with the Black Swan, she tells him, I can see the chinks in your armor. I can see that you are basically showing weakness. You're regretting your choice to side with the cabal. You're regretting your choice to make it. Like, you're regretting the decisions that you've made and doing what has to be done. But understand, there's no place here for sentimentality. There's no place here for weakness. Now, this is really important here because one of the things to understand is that at this point in the story, in Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, there's a lot of things going on in the collapse of the multiverse that we still don't know, right? We don't know who the Ivory Kings are. We don't know who Raboom Alal is, right? The person that started the incursions in the first place. We don't know the origin of the Black Priest. We don't know that kind of stuff. We know the origin of the map makers, but that's basically it. There's a lot that we don't understand. And that was the whole message of, of Black Swan. The great wheel turns. Raboom Alal will get his due. Like, Raboom Alal will, will be satisfied in the destruction of these worlds. There's no room for weakness here. Understand, you signed on for this, and if you don't believe that you can handle this, then we will kill you, right? Like, we'll, we'll destroy you, and, and we'll, con we'll continue on with what we have to do. It's so interesting to have a guy who sat down and said, I do, you know, I'm, I'm going to do what I feel like I must do, but at the same time, ends up regretting it later on down the road, only to find out that those individuals who appear to be bloodlusted are actually picking up where he left off. It's, it's intriguing to see. Now, this jumps to an alternate reality where you have the Fantastic Farm, right? And this is Earth number 287, a whole bunch of random numbers. Anyway, uh, this is an alternate reality here. And, and what this 
shows, and it's, and it's kind of interesting, we're not given a lot of context to this earth. We're just given the fantastic farm, right? So Reed Richards is basically a farmer. He's still, you know, an inventor. He still creates devices and he's got some pretty advanced devices to help him tend to the yard, right? Because work smart, not hard, right? That's the best thing to do. But then he's suddenly met by the arrival of Namor the Submariner. And then you switch back to Thanos and company. And what we end up having, or at least what we end up finding out here is that Namor had called them all together for a meeting. But when they arrived there, Namor's nowhere to be found. And when the question is asked, where's Namor at? Prox from Midnight responds, he apparently took off to that earth 20 minutes ago. And that's when Thanos starts to freak out because it's like, what's going on here, right? Like what is happening here? And so Thanos feels as though he's being made a fool of. Black Swan's uh, watching on realizing, okay, this is probably the moment when Namor is going to fall. And then once you end up having Thanos and this company showing up on this world, then Namor says, well, I scouted this place out ahead of time, right? I, I scouted this place out so that, you know, I could basically save you the trouble. And he basically says like, I've taken care of the bomb. I've taken care of everything. We can just leave now, right? He like Namor tries to like shoo them off the planet basically, right? He tries to get them away. And initially Thanos is like, no, you're going to deny the, the Cabal its tribute. And the response of Namor is yes. And he punches the crap out of Thanos. And so it's kind of a back and forth and it's only really for a moment, right? It's, you know, Namor punching Thanos, getting a couple licks in and then Thanos overpowers him quite readily. And he even kind of makes this comment, I had forgotten like the thrill of a capable adversary, right? I've forgotten what it's like to face off against somebody who was on my level in, in different ways. And so what he does is he actually tells Thanos what he did. And it's the coolest thing, right? Because he, he, he asks him like, where's the bomb at, right? Like, give me the detonator. And the response of Namor is, I don't have the detonator. I don't have it on me. I understand the nature of Reed Richards and I understand the nature of Susan Storm. I fought beside them on my world for years and years and years. And this alternate reality version of their characters are the exact same. They're the exact same kind of people as the people that we're used to. And so I know that if I go and talk to them and tell them what's going on, they'll listen to reason. And that's exactly what he did. He went and told Reed, here's what's going on. Here's the nature of the incursions. This is a bomb here that could destroy your world. And I'm asking you to destroy it because it would save my world. The question you have to ask is, are you willing to make that sacrifice? Are you willing to end your world for the purpose of saving another? And it's, and it's, it's, it's the ultimate notion. It's the ultimate idea of like self-sacrifice right? And Reed Richards is a is the kind of guy, at least in this alternate reality version, that would seem to do it. Now, it seems to fly in the face of everything that we know, but then we kind of get a little bit of exposition here, right? Where Namor kind of expands on this and says, it's not just about this idea of sacrifice. Understand that if you don't do this, there is a fate worse than death that's coming for you. The Cabal will come here and they will destroy everything you know, and they won't do it quickly. They won't just annihilate you. They won't just kill Susan Storm or anything like that. They'll take their time. They'll make you suffer. They take enjoyment out of that. So I give you an option. Either you can detonate this bomb and die quickly, or you can keep it. You can, you can hold on to it. You can wait for the cabal and you can die slowly. But ultimately there's really no way for you to survive this particular incident. And so what ends up happening is you find out that this alternate reality version of Reed has the detonator. And that's when you have, that's when you have Namor laughing at Thanos and saying like, this is it. I knew it was going to end this way. And this alternate reality version of Reed pulls the trigger and detonates this antimatter bomb. And when it seems like Thanos and Namor and all of them are going to die, they're suddenly whisked away, right? They're basically, they teleport back to the necropolis, back to their base of operations. And that's when Thanos tells Namor, understand, if you believe that you're leading this cabal anymore, you're not. And if you ever really believed you were leading it, you weren't. Uh, the only thing that you were leading is yourself down the path of self lies. That's all you were doing, right? You were leading yourself down this primrose path. Understand, I am Thanos the Mad Titan. I am no one's servant. No one rules me. No one tells me what I will do. If I decide that I want to kill you, I will kill you. And so he says, if you get in the way of this cabal again, I will kill you. I will, I will kill you where you stand, right? I will, and I will snuff your life out like that. And ultimately you end up having Namor who basically acquiesces. And that's where we kind of pick up with the idea of Namor seeking out Dr. Doom and also telling the Illuminati, the cabal is beyond my control, right? They're, they're beyond my ability to manage and maintain. Now from here, we switch over to the formation of the multiversal Avengers team. And the funny thing about this is that this is the plan of Sunspot, but it's only one part of the plan, right? Sunspot's got a twofold plan here. The first is to basically form his own Avengers team, the multiversal Avengers, which will go into the multiverse and then find the source of the incursions. But the second thing that he puts into motion is a plan to answer the question, what if we can't, right? Like what if it comes down to the fact that we have to destroy our own world in order to survive? Remember, that's one of the things that Black Swan talked about. Now, you know, Sunspot doesn't, has never really met Black Swan. He probably doesn't really know who she is, but it's one of these things where he's intelligent enough to have figured it out, right? Black Swan said early on in Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, that's in some alternate reality Earths, that's what the superheroes did, right? Because the Earth was the incursion point. So if both Earths crash into each other, then it'll lead to the 
destruction of both universes or either that or one of the earths has to be destroyed for both universes to survive what it led to is some superheroes destroying their own world right and evacuating as many people off their earth as they could and then taking up residence out in space until they could find a new home and in the process obliterating their own earth right basically you know keeping their universe safe without any real home now not everyone was saved and it was actually beast it was hank mccoy who came up with the idea on alternate reality earth right it's kind of a crazy thing but the multiversal avengers team is is formed out of a couple different scenarios right and that's what aim had been working on under the direction of sunspot over the last eight months right before we picked up with the the eight month jump advanced idea mechanics was just exploring the source of the incursions they were using their resources to to explore the multiverse and find out why it was collapsing why it was dying once sunspot took over then sunspot had a more directive approach and it was let's create basically a a kind of bridge right let's create a teleportation device that can send our forces out into the multiverse into different locations and find out what's going on and so you end up getting night mask star brand hyperion thor abyss and a whole bunch of ex nihilos right a whole bunch of ex nihili who were going out there and the reason why the ex nihilos are involved here is that while they are basically life creators at the end of the day they exist to preserve life and so if there is a force out there that's ending life then by their own definition they should fight it defeat it and then allow life to proliferate right so it's really the most pure version of their individual cause but you end up having these guys basically walking through this portal traveling forward for the purpose of exploring the multiverse and trying to find out what happens next but here's an important thing this is an exceedingly important conversation here that when you end up having sunspot having a conversation with thor the two of them start talking it's one of these things where he tells thor like sending them out there into the multiverse that it feels wrong and where thor's like why like why why am why does that feel wrong and he says because i'm staying here and i'm trying to find some way to to keep our universe safe right whether it means destroying our own world and trying to find some means of surviving out there in space as essentially refugees i don't know but i feel like i should be out there right? like i feel like i should be i should be going with all of you guys and and you know trying to save as many universes as i possibly can but ultimately thor says we don't know what's out there and your mind is needed here your intelligence, your resources, they're needed here. And it's one of the things that Sunspot knows as well. It's safer for him to stay here because ultimately, if it doesn't work, if Thor and them go out there and there's there's no solution to be found, then it's like, okay, then we can rely on your plan. But Sunspot stops him and he says, look, man, you have to understand something. Like, you understand what this mission is, right? And he's like, there's no coming back from this. You guys are all going to die out there. Like, no matter what happens, you guys are going to die. If you find the source of the incursions, it's going to be unlikely that you can stop it. If you come across the Black Priests, you're probably going to die. If you come across the Ivory Kings, you're definitely going to die. Who knows what you're going to encounter? But understand, this is a one-way mission. There's no expectation of you returning here. And then Thor, Thor has like the best response ever. He says, yes, it is an end. But to die striking down the Great Destroyer, what would be better fitting of somebody like me, right? I'm Thor, the God of Thunder. I will not die sleeping in my bed. I will not grow old and die of age. If I'm going to die, I'm going to die in the most honorable way possible. I'm going to die doing everything I possibly can to stop the incursions. It's the most Thor response that anybody could ever imagine. But here's the cool thing, right? Here's the, here's the, here, well, I'm not going to do any spoilers. I'm not going to, I'm not going to spoil anything, but I will say this. Thor and Hyperion end up having what's probably the single greatest moment in the history of Marvel Comics. It is amazing and if you guys know what i'm talking about you guys know what i'm talking about like don't spoil it please do not spoil it down in the comments but it's amazing it's like it's it's like the coolest lines oh my god it's like my favorite moment from the entirety of hickman's avengers the new avengers run well almost almost my favorite moment is the is what 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 hank pym tells everybody right when hank pym gets back that's my favorite moment but that one and the one that comes up in the next video i've got so many favorite moments right like when the illuminati set that set that hologram you guys know you guys you guys read the story you know what i'm talking about like when the illuminati create the hologram and you've got like beast and and hulk playing chess dude it's like the coolest thing ever like they start talking mad trash it's the funniest thing what's going on guys this is rob and we are picking back up again with avengers new avengers right the collapse of everything the death of all that stuff and picking up from the last video that we made this one we pick up with the illuminati right and and this is this is really cool because this kicks off with the idea of what the illuminati have been doing right more so in terms of like expanding their roster and so on and so forth now for those of you guys who recall uh the last video that we did we talked about how amadeus cho who's like the eighth smartest person in the world had become part of the illuminati and they're 
purpose was, or at least his purpose was to break into basically the headquarters of S.H.I.E.L.D. and to download some information and get it to the, get it to the Illuminati themselves. Uh, what we end up getting is kind of the other half of that equation, right? In the sense that the Illuminati were actually contacting Abadeus Cho, talking with him and what they've been doing for the last eight months. And what we end up finding out is that during this eight month time skip, right, where we just jumped forward by eight months, we had this situation where uh, basically the S.H.I.E.L.D. has constantly been after the Illuminati, right? And they've been cutting them off in almost every single angle. And, and one of the things we end up learning here is they end up going low tech. Now, the cool thing about this is that they're actually in a base of operations right now. Uh, this was introduced as part of Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four run. And specifically, it was introduced under the events of S.H.I.E.L.D., right? His uh, his S.H.I.E.L.D. miniseries, which we can cover if you guys are interested. It doesn't really pertain to any of what's going on right now, but it does kind of give you the background in terms of how S.H.I.E.L.D. came into existence. So invoking characters like Leonardo da Vinci, different things like that. Let me know if that's something you guys are interested in seeing. But one of the things that's going on is that the Illuminati are also met by the arrival of Captain Britain, right? Brian Braddock. And he makes this offhanded remark that he's the last of the Captain Britons. And we'll actually find out how far deep that goes here, uh, probably here in a little while. But uh, one of the things that he kind of comments about is how the Illuminati are so advanced and how it is that they're they're moving, how they're they're functioning in such a way to where they're they're really going so low tech, right? At the same time, like once Amadeus Cho gets the information and downloaded, of course, we saw in the last video that he was essentially captured by S.H.I.E.L.D., right? So his signal immediately goes offline. This jumps next to day two. And one of the things that happens is that the Incredible Hulk sort of comments to Captain Britain where he asks the question like, man, we're, we're traveling so low tech. His response is because S.H.I.E.L.D.'s tracking everywhere we go, right? Like we, we could use those translocators where we teleport, but S.H.I.E.L.D. managed to hack the frequency. And even though they do hack it, and even though only it takes them a couple hours to, to realize where we're at, what it means is that like, if we teleport from one location to the next, we only really have a couple hours in order to focus on what it is that we're doing. And while we can do a lot within the span of two or three hours, we could do a lot more in the span of a whole day, right? So that's kind of what they're doing. They're also looking to, to sort of track down Namor. But what they're doing here is that in the aftermath of Amadeus Cho being captured, they've basically created a device, right? And, the, and, and this is this is kind of sort of interesting. You know, it's something that you don't really see all that often. And in fact, I don't really think you've ever seen it before, but where they have these translocation devices inside their hands, and these can be used for a lot of different purposes. One of the other things that it does is it allows Reed Richards to basically hack the signal and then turn it into a visual concept, meaning where you have like radio waves emanating from, from like this device, right? It just literally sends out a, a beacon, sends out a radio wave and says, hey, I'm here. I can teleport or do whatever I, whatever it is I need to do, that they can ride that frequency and in turn, watch everything that's going on. It's a pretty advanced bit of technology and well beyond any real possibility, I imagine. But it does give us a scene where Amadeus Cho is basically being uh, interrogated by S.H.I.E.L.D. And of course, he's met with the arrival of Susan Storm. Now, again, Susan Storm had turned against Reed, right? She turned against her husband. And one of the things that kind of goes on, we'll find a little more information about this later on, but she feels betrayed by Reed Richards. And that's why she had essentially turned against him. But one of the other things that happens here is that you have Amadeus Cho kind of being a little bit of a smart aleck. And, and it's, it's, it's sort of funny because Amadeus Cho was in a lot of ways depicted as a character who kind of got carried away by his own intelligence, right? In the sense that he wasn't, he wasn't like useless, right? It wasn't like, you know, he just wouldn't fight because he's like, I'm too smart for this. It was one of these things where he is exceedingly smart and anybody he thinks that's, that's less intelligent than him uh, is somebody just not worth paying attention to or toying with. And in fact, you do get this amazing sort of scenario where you end up having uh, Susan Stormer basically says like, I know a lot about you, right? Like we know all kinds of stuff about you. Like we know you're one of the smartest humans on the face of the planet. Like we know that you tested and like the top 1% of, of all people who were tested, at least in terms of their of their overall intelligence. And the response of Amadeus Cho is that's that doesn't really matter, right? That's that's totally irrelevant, right? Because if we if we extrapolate this out, then testing inside that one percentile or whatever it is, that still means that there's 250 million people out there who are as smart as me. That's not a good thing. Like that's that's not okay. Like that doesn't mean anything. It means there's 250 million people who are as smart or smarter than I am. So to, to quantify me in a percentage base is stupid because I'm smarter than that, right? I'm I'm smarter than than almost anybody out there, with the exception of like you know Reed Richards and and uh, the Incredible Hulk, depending on the circumstance. Tony Stark, you know Black Panther, different people like that. And and Susan Storm kind of gets irritated here, right? She gets a little flustered, and that was always kind of the nature of her character. Not so much in the sense that she felt stupid in comparison to somebody like Reed, but the fact that when it came to like some of the super smart people in Marvel Comics, they were always written in this way where they had this tendency to look at people who were less intelligent than they were and seem like they kind of have to uh, walk them through the process of, of making things make sense, right? Like, I'll explain this to you, but like, I'm going to hold your hand. I'm going to assume that there's nothing about this that you could understand. And while Reed, it was never really Reed's intention to make Susan Storm feel stupid, the result is that a lot of times she did. And dealing with somebody like him, and then at the same time, having somebody like Cho, who's almost kind of like this, this physical embodiment of how she felt whenever she was talking with Reed and felt, you know, not really able to 
really keep up. Uh, it kind of pisses her off. <laughs> and so she basically tells him, like, time's running out for the Illuminati, right? I'm going to catch every single one of you. I'm going to catch you all. There's nothing you can do to stop me. Now, the other part of this is that the, the information that Amadeus Cho was tasked with accessing and then downloading to the Illuminati were weapons designs by Tony Stark. And this is very important here. And the reason why is because you're dealing with some pretty smart folks, right? You're dealing with like Bruce Banner, uh, you know, Professor Hulk, whatever you want to call him, you know, just the Hulk professor. It doesn't really matter. Uh, you got Beast, of course, who's really, really smart. You got Reed Richards. You got these guys. But the reality of this is that despite their intelligence, their intelligence is usually in a particular field, right? Reed Richards is kind of the only exception. His intelligence is basically kind of in everything, right? Like I know almost everything about everything. But Beast, uh, the Incredible Hulk, their intelligence is in genetics, right? Like biology, just understanding how the human body works, gene therapy, different things like that, manipulating or I guess controlling genes and, and so on. They're not really weapons experts. That was Tony Stark. Tony Stark was the weapons guy. Tony Stark was the guy who was inventing technology and weapons for a time that hadn't yet come, right? That's, that, that was basically his entire idea. And downloading all these schematics, there's, there's, there's so many of them, right? There's all kinds of weapons that were developed by Tony Stark, like just a zillion different designs, right? Like 653 separate designs are what Beast refers to. And not all of them are going to be winners, but it gives them a lot of information that they can use to take on the Cabal, as well as to find a way to stop the incursions. The problem with this is that in the middle of all of that, they're suddenly met by, by T'Challa, right? They're suddenly met by Black Panther, who basically says like, this is it. Like, I've got to come in fast. I've got to translocate. And they're like, no, you. I mean, if you do that, Shields are going to be able to track us. And he's like, I have no choice, right? Like, like it's at the, the situation's as bad as it's been. Like, it's total failure here in Wakanda. I got to go, right? And so he basically ends up teleporting directly to them, which as we saw in the previous video was the result of uh, Proxima Midnight and those guys basically invading uh, Wakanda, the necropolis, and then taking out Black Panther. And so as soon as he, as soon as he translocates in, then the question is what happened, right? The, the, the question of Reed is what possibly happened that you had to teleport back here so fast? And the response to Black Panther is the golden city has fallen, right? Wakanda is now gone. Like there, we, we cannot go back to Wakanda. There's nothing that we can do there. And so what it does is it jumps to shield, right? It jumps to Rome. And we basically end up having like this, this package that's being deployed, right? It's a highly militaristic mission, right? It's just like sending this package through. And what we end up finding out is that this is Hawkeye. Now here's the, here's the coolest thing about this. Hawkeye is such an easy character to overlook, right? He's such an easy character to overlook and to dismiss. And, and even myself, like I'm guilty of that. Like I'm guilty of looking at, at, at Hawkeye and just being like, hey, he shoots arrows, Rahu, you know, like in the grand scheme of people like Matthew Malloy and the Marquis of Death, who cares about Hawkeye? And that's kind of true, right? Like when you compare him to like high level reality warpers, sure. Who's anybody compared to those guys? <laughs> <laughs> but but the reason why Hawkeye is so cool is because Hawkeye has all kinds of prodigious training. But the other thing is when he fires, he doesn't miss. And if what you wanted to do was to basically take out a handful of people, especially the Illuminati, right? Black Panther, uh, Beast, the, the Incredible Hulk, Reed Richards, these guys, Hawkeye's the one you send in. Hawkeye is the guy that you send in there to neutralize all those forces. The problem is as soon as he gets in there, the entire place appears to be abandoned. And he keeps referring to Archangel, right? He keeps talking to this guy, the, the guy who's basically running the show. And we end up finding out here, the person who's running the show is Captain America, right? Is Steve Rogers. That that Steve Rogers is now hunting down the Illuminati. Now, a little bit of filler here, because a lot of you guys who have never read this and or, or who are like brand new to Marvel Comics are like, why is he old? <laughs> Okay, and, and why do you have Sam Wilson who looks like Captain America? Bit of an exposition here. So leading up to this particular story, and this is why you have uh, the, the eight month gap. So you can kind of have stories involving characters that were basically running, uh, you know, coming up on their end to the point where this, this story begins to pick up, or at least this portion of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers begins to pick up. What you had was a Captain America run by a guy named Rick Remender. And Rick Remender had an amazing run. It was, it was incredibly good. Uh, but one of the things that he did here is he had Captain America fight a villain called the Nail, who siphoned off the super soldier serum from Captain America. And what it did is it forced uh, Steve Rogers into being old. The reason why this was done is so that Steve Rogers could basically be moved out of the way for Captain America and replaced with Sam Wilson to become the new Captain America. Now, whether or not you agree with this doesn't really matter. It's outside the scope of this video, but that was the move that Marvel made. And so that's why Captain America is old. When you compound this with the fact that Steve Rogers had remembered everything that had gone on with the Illuminati, then it all leads to this moment, right? The fact that they had wiped his memory of the incursions, all that kind of stuff. He recollected all of that during Original Sin. You guys see how all this stuff basically ties together, right? How all these things that happen, it, whether it's in Marvel Comics itself or it's done by Jonathan Hickman earlier, how it all comes together and creates a cohesive whole. It's why he's so good at writing. And so when Hawkeye basically rings into Captain America and says like, there's something here, like there's something down here that you need to come and see. Once the S.H.I.E.L.D. 4 
forces get there and Captain America arrives there alongside Maria Hill, uh, you end up having this, this kind of chess game being played between the Incredible Hulk and Beast. And this is probably one of the best moments of the entire story because dude they talk so much trash it's absolutely amazing right you've got like susan storm you've got hawkeye you've got maria hill and you've got you got steve rogers and you got sam wilson down here and the the message that they're playing or at least this conversation keeps repeating itself right it says i'm beginning to think that we're going to be playing this game for you know like to the very end basically and it kind of keeps repeating right there's a little more to it but captain america picks up two and two together and says okay so i need to move so like he moves one of the pieces and then the entire simulation begins to converse with him and it's, and it's nuts right because beast is just kind of sitting there like cleaning his glasses and they're just sort of taunting him you know and it's like it's like man like you're probably wondering how it is that we're interacting with you right like holograms are basically predetermined pre-programmed sequences right so you can create a hologram that can do a thing uh but you can't really create a hologram that can react in the real time but the reason why we can do that is because you're predictable because you're captain america you're about as predictable as the sunrise right that's just the nature of who you are and if you don't believe me then and let's go ahead and take a shot here. Everybody here, everybody out there in the world wants to believe they're special. They want to believe there's something unique about them that nobody else has. But the reality is that once you boil it down, people are basically just the same, right? You study personalities long enough and you come to the realization everybody's all kind of the same person. Now, it is possible, you know, like, like B says, it is possible that you think I'm being disingenuous, but would you be surprised to know that there's a 95% chance that either Clint, Sam, or Subdirector Marie Maria Hill is with you. All three of them are there. There's an 80% chance that you brought all three. And then the Incredible Hulk's like, I would take those odds. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, and oh my stars, there's even a 60% chance that you asked Susan Storm to come with you. You're predictable, man. And now the question is, what does all this mean, Steve? Like, what does it mean that I can, within a percentile better than 50, that I can predict what you are going to do? What it means is that you really are predictable. It means you really are a super predictable person. You were predictable when we first met you. You're still predictable. We know what you're going to do before you do it. And it's important that you understand this message, Steve, because because if you want to catch us, if you want to pick up the Illuminati, you want to capture us, you got to start thinking a little better than this, right? You got to start, you got to, you literally have to start thinking smarter. The downside to this is you're not that smart. So at the end of the day, you're really only ever just going to be chasing us. You just haven't quite caught up to the fact that that's all you're ever going to do. It's the greatest instance of trash talk ever, right? They basically said, Steve, you're never going to catch us because you're not smart enough. Like it's this, it's this, it's the coolest thing. <laughs> because it's true <laughs> it's 100 true captain america is just not smart enough to catch up to them that's just the way that it is right and so what you end up doing is picking back up on the on the shield helicarrier with steve rogers right once he gets there and and it's kind of you know susan storm and and so on basically kind of re-watching this whole thing where terax the tamer as part of the cabal had basically shown up to the united nations and what he and this is one of the things that's that's, that's not really given in the real moment it's kind of given to us in hindsight but he had shown up to the united nations and he had basically said the universe as you know it is ending right like your universe is going to die and there's nothing you can do to stop it but there is something that we can do you know we as the cabal can do this right if you give us wakanda if you give us the the necropolis if you give us that country then we will save your world and we will save your universe but understand this the heroes out there the the iron man like iron man and and you know reed richards of the fantastic four and black panther and all these people all these folks that you call heroes they knew and they didn't tell you because they didn't trust you with the truth but it's time that you be trusted with this information right give us what we want Want, and we will save the day. And that's how it was that the forces of the Black Order, that Proxima Midnight and all those guys, that's how it was they got into Wakanda. They were allowed to be there, right? They were given sanction there by the United Nations. They were told, you can have whatever you want, just make sure you save the day. And then the, the Cabal just started doing what they were doing best, which was wiping out everything that they could find. And so it's one of these things where it all just really kind of seems to be crumbling down, right? Like everything's falling apart. Enter Carol Danvers. And Carol Danvers basically says, okay, so there's a couple of, of residual mental imprints that the these psychics were able to pick up but really not much more than that we know that like captain britain has joined their joined their roster now we know that uh that t'challa was there for a brief amount of time but aside from that we don't really know anything else captain america starts asking questions like are there people that we can get to our side can we get betsy braddock but the response of carol danvers is you know like psylocke is protected by the x nation she's protected by mutants we can't just go there that's one of the reasons why if we capture the illuminati and we get a hold of beast we're gonna have a problem because the x-men are gonna want to take him back and deal with him on their own terms they're 
not going to want to let us do that. And the response to Steve is they don't get that choice, right? Like he joined the Illuminati. He made his choice. He knew what he was doing. The X-Men don't get to decide who it is that is, you know, that, that isn't, is not put on trial for the crimes that they commit. That's not the way this works. If they have a problem with it, sorry about their luck. We can go to war again, right? And like, it won't be like last time we'll win, you know? And so it's, it's, it's kind of cool. Like it's, it's, it's interesting to see like how extreme Captain America has become because he's hell bent on tracking down the Illuminati, right? It's the one thing he wants to do more than anything else. He also ends up learning that like Robert DaCosta bought AIM, bought advanced idea mechanics, which sucks for, for S.H.I.E.L.D. even more because with everything that's happened, S.H.I.E.L.D.'s abilities in terms of like their authority, the ability to tap into like uh, the world's intelligence agencies has been curtailed by an insane level. They, they have just, just enough leash to like monitor other countries, but they can't can't really act without getting some info or getting approval from like their prime ministers or whatever it is. The days of S.H.I.E.L.D. being able to just do what it needs to do in order to, to serve its purpose are gone, right? Like they're, they're the only thing they have, you know, real free reign over is the United States and that's it. And as long as the Illuminati are outside the U.S., it greatly hampers S.H.I.E.L.D.'s ability to function. It's one of the smartest moves that they could have made. But Robert DaCosta buying advanced idea mechanics gives him a wealth of technology and resources that are equal to or way beyond what S.H.I.E.L.D. currently has. And as in its current form where it's handicapped, right? And so all that's really being brought in here by Carol Danvers is just more bad news, right? Like, like literally the Illuminati's resources are growing by the day. Like Robert DeCosta is not on our side. He's working against us, or at least seems to be working for his own goal. He's got the resources of advanced idea mechanics. So there's really not much we can do for him or do, do with him. And those Avengers out there that decided not to side with you when you dumped information about what the Illuminati were doing and actually agreed with their cause, they've gone off the radar, right? Like they're, they're gone. Black Widow, Spider-Woman, Jessica Drew, like like we don't know where they are. Like they're 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 off reservation. Like we have no clue where they are. They turned off their transponder signals. So like you've basically created another civil war within the superhuman community. Sure, they're not fighting each other, but like they're on separate causes. And that's what's happened here, right? When Captain America revealed to the Avengers that the, the the collapse of the multiverse, that like what the Illuminati were doing, it split the entirety of the superhero community. Those individuals who agreed that what the Illuminati were doing were wrong sided with Captain America. Everybody else either sided with the Illuminati or went their own way, right? And so you it's 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 kind of nuts, right? Like the entire community is fractured. What we end up doing here is one of the greatest revelations in the entirety of the story, right? Because you end up having Susan Storm who's told by Captain America, like, let me talk to Carol Danvers, right? And so ultimately Susan Storm ends up leaving and he starts talking to Carol Danvers and he says, here's the thing, unless, if you come back in here again in this meeting and you cannot give me any information about the Illuminati, even if there's nothing, then don't come in here, right? Like the next time you come in here, give me something to report, whether it's that there's nothing to report or you have some bit of information it doesn't matter, but do not come in here empty handed again. And so you end up picking up two days later in this abandoned subway tunnel and you've got Susan Storm and she says, you can come out now. And the person she's talking to is Reed Richards. Like she's a spy. <laughs> she's a spy for the Illuminati in Captain America's camp. <laughs> It's a genius maneuver. Like Reed's like, do you think they bought it? And she's like, yeah. Like, she's like, all I had to do was just pitch some story about how I was tired of feeling like I was, you know, less intelligent than you and being left hanging by you. Every time you go off of one of your campaigns, you don't tell me what's going on, that I'm left in the dark. All I had to do was just tell them that I was tired of it, right? Because it's common knowledge. It's common knowledge that Reed will like gallivant off on some adventure and not tell Susan Storm what's going on. And she gets pissed about it, right? She gets kind of angry about it. So it makes sense that like all she has to do is go to Captain America with that story. And in his desperation, he'll believe it, right? because in times of desperation, people believe what they want to believe. And Captain America wants to believe that he's got people on his side, even if those numbers are dwindling by the day. And so it's 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 awesome because they have this sort of, of moment, right? Where it's like, I miss you. Like, I miss you so much, you know? And it's like, yeah, you know, Rita asks about the kids and they say, well, I mean, they're, they're good, you know, but Franklin, like Franklin feels like he failed you. Like he feels like he failed you and your efforts to try to stop the incursion. What that means, we'll find out later. But it's, it's another thing where she says like, Valeria has a message for you, right? Like your daughter, Valeria, she wanted me to give you a message, but understand she's our daughter Reed and I love her more than anything, but know that like Valeria is not always right, right? Like she's like the third smartest person in the world. She's wildly intelligent, but she's not always right. The reason that matters is because the note that Valeria gave Reed is it basically shows that like the future foundation, right? The kids, the smartest kids in the world that like they were all working on a solution to try to stop the incursions and Reed wanted them to work on it because kids have a way of using their imaginations in a way that adults simply can't do. And they can think of things that, that adults would normally never think of. But despite 
all of their resources, and this is important to understand, despite all of their resources, despite everything that Reed's done to try to figure out a way to end the incursions, despite everything that's happened, the formation of the Illuminati and, and their, their lack of desire to destroy worlds, Black Swan originally told Reed and all of them, like, there's no way for you to stop the incursions. But hoping against hope, Reed believed that there is a way to stop them. The downside to this is that the note Valeria reads says, you can't win, right? But like, it's time to find out a way to not lose. Now, I know that seems a little bit confusing, but it's important. Just because you don't win doesn't mean you lose. It doesn't mean it's game over. There's still a way for the heroes to find a way out of this whole thing. The job of Reed is to find a way to do that. What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are picking back up again with Avengers and New Avengers. And this one, this video is gonna be a hoss, right? This is gonna be a chunky video. <laughs> um, so what we end up doing here is we initially pick up with basically the necropolis, right? The, the city of the dead in Wakanda. And we basically pick up with the arrival of two individuals. Now, we don't immediately find out who they are. Instead, we switch over to the Black Swan. And the Black Swan's kind of going on with this little bit of a, a, like a speech of sorts, right? This kind of monologue, right? Talking about the nature of patience, that the only way that she was able to endure her captivity when the Illuminati was holding her in the basement of, or really in the, the necropolis itself, was to basically humble herself, right? To accept the fact that that's where she was, that she was basically a person who was being held captive. In doing that, she would basically allow herself to basically cope with it as best she could. That's really all it was, for her to just maintain the patience she needed to wait for the time to come when she could basically escape. And one of the things that she says here is that the only way to really become patient like that is to humble yourself, right? To overcome the natural desire to fight or fly. But that can only really be accomplished if you are willing to take the needs of others and put them before yourself, right? It's the only real way to be able to humble yourself. And that's when she basically tells Tony Stark, you'll never make it in this place because who have you ever served besides yourself? And what this does is it explains why Tony Stark is here. Now, this is kind of an important thing. It's an easy thing to kind of throw away, but it's very important if you were following Marvel Comics at the time, especially Iron Man. And the reason why was because we got some cool Iron Man stories, right? Uh, Kieran Gillen's Iron Man run but what we also ended up getting was a story called superior iron man and that's where that armor comes from the armor that's all kind of broken and, and screwed up that comes that's the superior iron man suit right the endo sim suit and what we ended up finding out was that at the end of superior iron man tony stark just took off and then we didn't hear from him again right we didn't get anything out of iron man until we basically got to the end of jonathan hickman's avengers and new avengers until we get to this point right till we get well this is near the end but until we get to this point this is the next time that we see him and one of the questions a lot of people had is what happened right what happened between the the ending of Superior Iron Man and this moment right here. And we basically get this kind of explanation that comes directly from uh, from Black Swan herself. And it really kind of comes in the way of like Tony Stark basically tormenting her, right? Where she, we're not really torming, uh, tormenting her, but kind of giving her a hard time where she starts to talk about despair and how despair will basically lead Stark to a place that he doesn't want to be in, right? That Tony Stark is basically here. He's in a place he doesn't want to be at and that despair will more or less take hold. That given time, it'll seize control of everything. And basically it'll turn his entire life upside down. And then he kind of comments and he says like, day after day, week after week, I've been here for months, right? I've been in this place for months, basically the last eight months, right? So Superior Iron Man dead ends to the beginning of the Time Runs Out story. But he's like, I've been here for months and months and months and months, and you keep showing up here and you keep talking to me. Do you want to know why I think it is that you keep showing up here and talking to me? And she asks why, and he says, because I think you're in love. And this is where Tony Stark fails. This is the failure of Tony Stark right here. In this situation that he's in, Tony Stark is stuck here, and there's a reason why he's here. And it doesn't necessarily have to do with the direct reason why he got here. We'll actually find out what this reason is here in a little while, but it's Tony Stark playing coy, that he just can't really take things seriously. You know, he's like, don't be offended, right? I mean, you know, like you're in a situation where basically you're bound by ever reducing options. Your choices are getting less and less. And because your choices are getting less and less, I'm looking better and better. Now, if I'm being honest with you guys, that's a terrible reason to love someone, right? But the idea behind this is that when it when it comes to Tony Stark, he can't take this seriously. He's just kind of goofing off. And that's and that's when, it, when he's like, look, I mean, you can, you can accept the reality of the situation, that's what it is, but I know what's going on with you, right? Like Reed told me what's inside of you. Like what you have inside of your body is basically the, the DNA capsules of your family. You wanna bring your people back. You're trying to find some universe out there. You're, you're hitching a ride with a cabal more or less, destroying worlds along the way, but you're trying to find some place that you can basically call home and you can, you can bring your family back because you're hoping against hope that not everything will end. You're hoping the cabal are successful and staving off the destruction of the multiverse, or you're, you were hoping that we were, which is why you sided with us. 
And if both of us fail, then you're going to, you're going to hit your horse to another group, hoping they're successful, but you're going to bounce from person, from group to group to group until you find one that can get you what it is that you need. But at the end of the day, you're putting off this air that like you're a person who's been changed by the wheel of death, the wheel of destruction, and you serve a boom law, the great destroyer, the person who started the incursions and you, 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 you champion all this stuff. But in reality, you're just a sad little girl who wants to bring her family back. And deep down, you know that that's never going to happen. And that's when we kind of get an explanation of what's going on here, because then she in turn counters Tony Stark and says, and who are you, but what the wheel has made you this entire cycle. That's the death of universes, destroying worlds. Who are you besides what this has done to you, right? We are all a product of the circumstance that we're in. Like, do not forget. I remember where you were when you fell, right? And what we end up finding out is that after the events of Superior Iron Man, that Tony Stark tracked down the Cabal. He tracked down Thanos. He tracked them all down and tried to destroy them and was ultimately defeated and then put here, right? It all happened off panel. And this is the only real explanation that we get, right? As far as I'm aware, it's not in any kind of a one-shot comic or anything. It's not like, you know, the last battle of Superior Iron Man it doesn't really exist out there. Not that I'm aware of. This is kind of the only explanation that you get. But in the end, she says like, they put you in this cage, you know? And, and the, the reality of this is I will find what I'm searching for, but you will not because you have failed to understand that there are things out there more important than you. And so in that moment, we basically end up finding out that the two individuals who had snuck in were Black Widow and Spider-Girl. And they were kind of watching this whole conversation between Black Swan and Tony Stark, albeit they were essentially invisible. And so once she leaves, then they make their presence known. And this is the true fall of Iron Man, right? This is the true fall of Tony Stark. Because once they approach him and he's kind of like, man, I'm so glad to see you guys. You know, it's, it's like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see friends. The response is, I'm kind of like, we're kind of amazed that you still believe you have friends. Because remember, it was the great deception of Tony Stark, right? Like it was the great lie of Tony Stark that led to the rift in the Avengers. Keep in mind, the way this played out is that Black Panther was the first one to encounter an incursion. And knowing that it was a planetary, a planetary threat because it literally led to Black Swan destroying an entire world, the Black Panther captured Black Swan and then called together the Illuminati, which includes Steve Rogers at the point, it included Captain America. And once the Infinity Gauntlet was destroyed in their first attempt to stop an, stop an incursion, which they successfully did, but it destroyed the, the Infinity Gauntlet in the, in the first place, then it turned into, okay, then how do we stop this? And that's when the Illuminati started having the conversation about destroying worlds. And then Captain America said, no, I don't want to destroy worlds, right? Like, I don't want to blow worlds up. I'm not okay with wiping out billions of innocent people just to save our own world. We're the smartest men in the room. There has to be a better, a better choice, right? This is low hanging fruit. It's the easiest option. And so in response to that, Steve Rogers' mind was wiped by Dr. Strange, right? Like Tony Stark was the one who told him to, like that was the backup plan that Tony Stark created was if Captain America is not on board, which he's most likely not going to be, then Dr. Strange wipe his mind, we'll send him back out into the world and he'll be none the wiser. In order to distract Captain America from ever really, you know, kind of having any real measure of free time in his own mind, which is to say to keep him from going on a path where he could recall everything that was going on, Tony Stark came up with the idea of the Avengers machine. Well, hey, Captain America, I've got a great idea. Well, what's that? What's that, Tony? Uh, we should create Avengers across the world. Isn't that an awesome project? You should work on this, right? Like it's your dream come true. And so in, in that, Captain America only focused on that. It was yet another ruse by Tony Stark. In the background, he and the Illuminati were doing whatever they had to do, which included destroying worlds. None of the Avengers knew what was going on. Nobody knew what was happening except for Tony Stark and the Illuminati. This led to the events of Original Sin, which saw all the secrets of basically everybody out there being spilled out to the world. And that's when Captain America recalled everything the Illuminati were doing and the fact that they wiped his mind. And that's when he cornered Tony Stark. And then once, you know, the, the whole 50,000 years in the future and all that kind of stuff ended, and then Captain America came back to the present, that's when he assembled the Avengers, told him everything that was going on. And that's what led to this rift is because once Captain America told all the superheroes and even Terax the Tamer going into the world and just telling everybody in the world what was happening, once all the superheroes learned what was going on with the collapse of the multiverse, that the Illuminati were secretly destroying worlds, different things like that, then there was a massive split. One section of the group agreed with, with, with the Illuminati, right? They sided with them and said, they're doing what needs to be done in order to save our world. Sorry about everybody else's luck. The other group sided with Captain America and saying, Steve Rogers is right. I mean, it's kind of like a civil war all over again, but they're like, Steve Rogers is right, right? They're the smartest men in the world. Surely they could come up with a better option than just wiping out worlds. The reality was that there was no other option. There was no other way. That's what Black Widow's talking about when she's like, it's amazing, you you know, amazing that you believe that you still have friends because despite the rift that was created, just because they sided with the Illuminati does not mean they agreed with Tony Stark. And that's the big difference is that Tony, they, they all believe Tony lied to them. It's just the final lie, right? It's the, fi it's the, it's the last time that they're tired of dealing with all his shit.
you know, pardon my French. They were tired of all these instances when Tony saw himself as a cut above everybody else. That's what they were exhausted with. And that's what's being explained here. Because when they in turn say, the only way we can let you out of here, the only way we can help you is if you agree with the fact that you need help, Tony Stark stands resolved and says, no, I don't need help. I'm the only one that can save anybody here, right? If it's if it wasn't for me, we would have been dead a long time ago. If you, if you pray to a God, pray to him, that's fine. But let me out of this place. Because if I'm not out there, all of you are going to die, right? It's Tony Stark to arrogance in the most extreme way, but it's also true. And we'll find out that like not having Tony Stark out there really actually does speed up the death of everything, right? Like it really, it, it really is worse for the superhero community. Now, at this point, we switch over to a character named Pod. Now we talked about Pod in a previous video, but the cool thing about this is it basically kind of clarifies things a little bit more. And what we ended up finding out was that Pod was just kind of like this organism, right? This cybernetic kind of robot looking thing that really looked a lot like the Fury from the old Mad Jim Jasper's Captain Britain comics. But basically Pod was was just like this kind of, you know, device or at least this, this robot that was uh, basically escaped from advanced idea mechanics and then fought the Avengers, laid waste to the Avengers, and then kind of took off and, and then was grabbed by advanced idea mechanics again and then sent out into the space between universes, right? Kind of this more or less holding cell. There was nothing there, so it would just kind of sit there and wait. We, we kind of get into this little bit of an explanation where we get an origin. And what we end up finding out here is that Pod was engineered by Ex Nihilo on Mars, right? Where Ex Nihilo wanted to basically evolve the Earth and turn the Earth into a living life form, that what this did is it led to the idea that Ex Nihilo, from his stance, the Earth needed a defense system, right? It needed some way to defend itself. Now, this was done absent Ex Nihilo's knowledge of, like, the Star Brand. That the Star Brand basically initiates, you know, whenever a, a planet reaches a point where its people are ready to move into the next stage of their evolution, and, and individuals as a whole, which is to say, the entirety of that planet's life forms are able to, like, move beyond their world and start exploring other things, right? Because what that would do is it would leave their world vulnerable, right? When they're ready to move move on to their next state of evolution. And so in that time, the white event would be initiated that would create a night mask, it would create a star brand, these different characters. But remember, the white event and the creation of the star brand was done prematurely, so it was never really supposed to happen. But Ex Nihilo, it's his own agenda. He's just doing his own thing out there. And so that's where Pod came from. Pod was basically a cybernetic organism that was sent to Earth by Ex Nihilo to be its defense system and then bonded to a little girl from Norway. And when that happened, it basically led to them just kind of becoming a singular entity. The issue with this was that when this bomb happened, or when this arrival happened and when this girl was bonded to the suit more or less that advanced idea mechanics popped up realizing that it could be used as a weapon took it and that's what led to the conflict between the avengers and pod and so what it does is it kind of switches over to the current moment and and one of the things that we talked about in the previous videos is that we have different plans going on right so for those of you guys who kind of feel a little bit lost with everything that's kind of happening at the current moment the way it plays out like this and it's actually really cool because hickman explains it through robert da costa right because he brings on some new people who haven't really been a part of everything to costa was doing. And what he basically says is that the incursions, of course, as we explained a minute ago, began. Black Panther was the first one to realize it was happening. He recalled the Illuminati. They started finding a way to try to, to try to stop the incursions, ultimately coming to the realization they had to destroy worlds to do it. They went off and did their own thing. The Avengers were focusing on their own thing. Original Sin happens. The Avengers become aware of the incursions and they become aware of the fact that the Illuminati are most likely destroying worlds. Captain America takes control of S.H.I.E.L.D. and in turn, he takes those friendly Avengers forces, which is to say the people, too, are, uh, the people that are to his side and he says the Illuminati are public enemy number one. Our job is to track them down, catch them, arrest them, and then put them on trial. And then while we have them, try to find some way to stop the incursions. While that was all going on, Robert DaCosta purchased advanced idea mechanics because advanced idea mechanics had also come to the real to the realization that the incursions were happening, that the, the multiverse was collapsing. But where advanced idea mechanics was doing it or at least doing their research for the purpose of trying to like find some way to use it for their own ends, Robert DaCosta bought advanced idea mechanics and then he started using their technology as a means to explore the incursions, to find out what the point was. That led to the creation of the Multiversal Avengers team, Thor, Hyperion, Ex Nihilo, Abyss, a few other characters, and their job is to go out into the multiverse and to find the cause of the incursions and then to destroy it, right? To bring it to an end. And so one of the things that ends up happening, or at least one of the revelations that we get here is that Robert DaCosta has spies on both sides. He's got spies in Captain America's camp and he's got spies in, uh, in the Illuminati. The spy in the Illuminati comes by way of Beast and it was actually Beast who approached Robert DaCosta because remember, Robert DaCosta is a mutant and he was associated with the X-Men for a little while, even though he's not really associated with them now. And so because of that, as Sunspot, he's always kind of been an, an intriguing character. But when Beast approached Cyclops and said, hey, look, like I need to talk with somebody like Robert DaCosta, right? I need to talk to him because of the fact that I'm aware of what he's doing, forming his own new Avengers group, basically advanced idea mechanics, you know, that Avengers team and so on, like I need to get with him. And so you ended up having Cyclops who facilitated the meeting between the two. And basically one of the things that Cyclops reveals is that the X-Men 
have also been trying to find a way to stop the incursions, but while their efforts are not nearly as complex or in-depth as anybody else's, they are in possession of a phoenix egg, basically meaning that if they activate it, the phoenix force would be reborn again. That's a pretty big thing. The, the, the X-Men are looking to recreate the phoenix in order to stop the incursion. So again, all hands are on deck here. Everybody's, everybody's aware of it. Everybody's trying to find a way to end it. But basically, once Beast has a conversation with DaCosta, Beast is kind of looking for absolution, right? He's not happy with the things that the Illuminati have done. They fly in the face of everything that he believes. He understands that that it's it's the role they play, but it's it's one of the things where he doesn't want to confuse, you know, expediency with desire, which is to say needs and wants. They need to find a way to stop the incursions, even if it means destroying worlds, but they don't want to. And what the Illuminati are mostly focusing on right now is stopping the Cabal, right? Trying to find a way to end the Cabal, because it's one thing to try to find a way to keep these worlds safe. Maybe they can come across another alternate reality where they found a way to, to stave off the incursions by basically taking their planet out of phase, basically making it intangible so that the Earths pass through each other instead of one hitting the other and destroying, you know, both realities. That's something the Illuminati could figure out, right? They could they could find a scientific solution to this, but the Cabal are just wiping stuff out, right? They're just showing up, showing up on worlds, obliterating the world's superheroes, if there are any, and then blowing the planet up and leaving, right? That's that's all the Cabal are doing. And so with Beast now on the side of Robert DaCosta, this basically comes to the realization that when you have Black Widow and you have uh, Jessica Drew Spider Woman, that they are on the side of Captain America, but basically they're spies for Robert DaCosta as well, right? Like they're working for him. And it's the smartest move to make. For all the arrogance that Robert DaCosta has, he's wildly intelligent. And putting spies in on both sides is actually something he learned from the first Civil War, right? So it's what Captain America and what Iron Man did. Iron Man had spies on Captain America's side. Captain America had spies on Iron Man's side. It's the way they were able to keep track on the other team. But basically the idea here is that what Robert DaCosta is doing is amassing a kind of force, right? He's amassing a way to, to stave off the incursions or a way to get out, get off of Earth, right? He's the only one that's really thinking rationally. Everybody out there is thinking about how to stop the incursions. He's the only one who's really taking Valeria's advice, despite the fact that she never gave it to him and he doesn't know what her advice is, which is to find a way to not lose. And the only way to not lose is to leave the Earth. That's the only way to do it. And then find a new world to settle down in and then destroy the world, right? Like destroy the Earth. That way the universe continues living on, despite the fact that there would be a, a lot of dead people, but it's, it's, it's literally just utilitarianism, saving as many people as you possibly can. But one of the things that, that, that he basically did, one of the measures he took was to send Shang-Chi to one of the origin bomb sites, right? Those are the sites, uh, the, the places where Ex Nihilo was trying to evolve the earth and then like shot these different bombs to earth that basically had different purposes. One was to give the earth sentience, right? To give it like a living intelligence. Another one was to give it like a defense system in the form of pod. This one was self-replication. And so the greatest martial arts master in the entirety of the Marvel universe, the, the single greatest fighter in the entirety of the Marvel universe, there's now an army of him. And what that would do is allow him to face off against any number of threats or to defeat any number of people uh, who end up showing up there, but to also give them the ability to vacate the world if it's necessary. Sheer numbers, right? The ability to multiply on a massive scale. And so with that being said, guys, I was going to continue on with the next section, basically focusing on the Black Priest, but I feel like this is a lot to take in already, right? Like I feel like this is kind of a lot to go through already. A lot has happened. So yeah, we're going to go ahead and end this video. In the next video we do, we'll focus on the Black Priest, we'll focus on basically the Multiversal Avengers and all that kind of cool stuff, and essentially everything that comes next, right? Everything that, that sort of jumps next into this, this massive event, especially with the idea that like you can't win, right? Just the you can't win story arc, which is amazing. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Okay, so we are continuing on with Avengers and New Avengers, and in this one, we're picking up with the Black Priests. Now, the Black Priests were a wildly confusing concept among the comic book fan base when they were initially introduced, because it was it was kind of hard to wrap our heads around the idea of how they functioned, what they did, like how they worked, that kind of a thing. This will clear all that up, right? Like this, this will clear all that up and make it all make sense, right? So what we end up doing here is picking up with this space. It's basically the nothing space of destroyed universes. All this is is basically the space that universe has occupied before they were wiped out right now one of the cool things to point out here is the way that jonathan hickman is able to pull this off is because of the old captain britain comics with mad jim jaspers that's why he's able to pull this off because that was really the first time in marvel comics that we got a depiction of what a universal space looks like when its universe is destroyed right you had mad jim jaspers from earth 238 who had wiped out all the superheroes the the omniversal development court didn't know that and so they basically initiated the push which is to say pushing the evolution of the of the various denizens on that earth and basically jump-starting 
being the creation of mutants. This led to Magim Jaspers getting pissed off and initiating the Jaspers Warp, which threatened the entirety of the multiverse. And so in order to keep that from happening, the Omniversal Development Court obliterated his entire universe, right? Just wiped the whole thing out and it was just a giant white void. That's what's left whenever a universe is destroyed, just a giant white space, right? It's like a white piece of paper with nothing drawn on it. And that's what the Multiversal Avengers have been finding. They've been going from, from universe to universe and either finding a giant white space or encountering like uh, the Sidera Madris, right? So like the map makers, they encountered a black priest on a world and they destroyed that black priest. But like that was just a lone black priest out there somewhere. What they've done here is probably the worst possible thing they could have, which is to land in the main base of operations of the black priest. Now, one thing to know, they don't know where they're going, right? That's the reason why Robert DaCosta told Thor, this is a one-way trip. They don't know what universe they're going to end up in, right? They can't plan and direct where it is they're going to arrive at. They literally just open a portal, jump to the next universe, and then whatever's there is there, right? So they could end up in an entire universe that's filled with like, like the Mad Celestials, for example, from Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four, and then just be completely and totally subdued. There's a possibility for them to escape if things get bad enough, but the issue is that this portal is rapidly closing because as soon as they arrive, the Black Priests are prepared for them, right? The Black Priests were basically awaiting, you know, waiting for them to show up and immediately start closing the portal off, right? So there's no real way for them to escape. And so because of that, a massive battle immediately starts breaking out. And this is when the Black Priests start to use their words, right? They start to use the phrases they use in order to wipe things out. Now, this is what confused people right? This is what threw people off, is how the Black Priests function, right? Because the, the magic of a particular word. So uh, to make this clear and make this easy to understand, let's say that what we wanted to do was we wanted to turn a table into a chair, right? We wanted to rematerialize the table. We wanted to alter its atomic structure so that we could turn it into a chair. And let's say that we had to have a spell to do it, right? Let's say the spell was table into chair, right? Three words. The way that you and I work is we can just say table into chair, and then the table becomes the chair. With Black Priests, it doesn't work that way. One priest can say table, one priest can say into, and one priest can say chair. And in order to turn the table into a chair, they have to speak those words in sequence. They come together, right? So if you kill any one of those priests, they cannot turn the table into a chair because the word they need to, to basically, you know, perform that spell is gone now, right? It doesn't exist, right? So that's, that's the way the black priests work. But that's also what makes them so incredibly powerful because they're capable of wild feats. But they're, but if you guys notice, because of that, because of that, that huge caveat, they're almost kind of broken, right? Like you would think that like, if they really are that powerful, they would be able to, to use all those words, right? Like you wouldn't need a whole bunch of priests in order to do something, any one of them could do it. But as a collective entity, as a collective whole, uh, they are insanely powerful, but there is a reason why they function that way. And this reason will be explained here in a minute. But the cool thing is that in the middle of all this, uh, basically like with a black priest destroying ex Nihili every, you know, almost all over the place, the battle is boding ill for the various, for the, for the multiversal Avengers. They quite literally showed up in the lion's den and they're falling just rapidly, right? Person after person after person is falling. You know, when it, when really it just kind of ends up dwindling down to the core group, right? Abyss, Ex Nihilo, uh, Thor, Hyperion. But then we also end up finding out that Thor has Mjolnir. Now, this is not the Mjolnir from the main Marvel universe, right? Remember, this took place after the events of Original Sin. Odin's son is not worthy of wielding his own hammer anymore. That belonged to Jane Foster. But the reason why Thor has this hammer is that if you guys recall, we had a previous video that we did where we had an alternate reality Avengers team that were evil and that the hammer said that the hammer was made for that evil version of Thor, right? Uh, you know, whosoever holds this hammer, if they be unworthy, shall possess the power of Thor's spelled with two R's. And once that Avengers team was defeated, they ended up, of course, traveling back to their own universe, but the hammer stayed behind. If you guys recall that, that's where Thor gets this hammer. This is one of those moments where Jonathan Hickman does something 15 issues ago and it doesn't become important until right now. It's one of the reasons why Hickman's so cool when it comes to writing stories because you kind of have it's it's easier to follow if you just read it in its entirety all at one time as opposed to like waiting for piece by piece to come out because it can kind of create issues right that's why i always felt hickman is a great trade paperback writer right he writes for the trade and it's cool it's, it's awesome to to see how this is done but thor of course recalls his hammer and it's like relishing in the experience right like it's so good to finally have this hammer back and it's so good to finally rip these guys up right to tear these guys apart you know and and to to use it the way that i always used to and it, and it's kind of interesting because despite what the black priests try to do in terms of quelling the hammer, they can't, right? They can't quite quell the hammer, but the, the multiversal Avengers also start picking up on the idea that if they start killing members of the black priests, they won't be able to complete certain spells. And so that's what happens. They literally start destroying as many priests as they can find to prevent them from being able to use the spells. Now, the other thing is there's only a finite number of priests. And so when a priest is destroyed,
word, that word is gone forever, right? So imagine that you could never, ever, ever speak the word happy, right? Like imagine you could never speak that word again. How would you convey that emotion? How would you convey the fact that you are, you are happy? There, there are other words that are close to it, but none of them quite really, you know, convey how it is that you're feeling like the word happy. And so with that word gone for them, it's doubly so because now there's spells that they can't use. There's things that they simply can't do. But in the middle of all this, with these priests falling, suddenly they stop, right? They stop what they're doing. And the question becomes why? And they say, because the eye is coming. The eye is here, right? The leader of the black priest is coming. And where the multiversal Avengers are like, what in the world's going on? And they, they basically go to attack him. Suddenly they're all frozen in place, right? They can't move. And so it's like, well, who in the world is this? The head of the black priest takes off his helmet and it's Dr. Strange. Stephen Strange is now the one who's leading the Black Priest. But Doctor Strange brings them, brings brings the Multiversal Avengers to his location, right? He brings them to his Citadel and kind of explains what's going on with the nature of the Black Priest. Remember, Doctor Strange was not always part of the Black Priest, but in the uh, eight-month time jump, he had actually left Earth and traveled out into the multiverse and encountered the Black Priest. And what he basically learned is, is one, what I already told you guys about how they use their words in order to create spells, but two, the Black Priests are enigmatic. And the reason why they're enigmatic is because they are the multiverse's own defense system. It's like antibodies for the multiverse. They don't belong to anybody. They weren't created by anybody except for the universe, the multiverse itself. That when the multiverse started dying, where we do have things like the Ivory Kings and you've got all these kind of all this kind of stuff going on, the multiverse sought to defend itself. And in order to defend itself from its own destruction, it created the Black Priests. And what the Black Priests were doing was going from world to world and destroying those worlds as many as they could, or at least enough that would stabilize the collapse of the multiverse. That's really what they are. That, that, that's the entire basis behind it. Unlike the Illuminati in the beginning and the Cabal now, where they're basically traveling from world to world and wiping them out simply in an effort to save their own, what the Black Priests are trying to do is stabilize the collapse of the multiverse. They don't want to kill every world. They don't want to destroy every world out there. They just want to stop the collapse, right? They want to stop this kind of cascading effect of everything basically dying. And so what you end up getting here is is the question, you know, where the, the Black Priests start asking things like, have you, have you seen them? Like, have you seen the Ivory Kings? Like, have you encountered them? What can you tell us about the Ivory Kings? Have you found out a way to defeat them, right? Remember, we still don't know who the Ivory Kings are. We haven't met them yet, right? Like they're just beings who are out there that are wildly powerful. And that's kind of what's going on. Dr. Strange explains that there's basically a war out there. You've got what's going on on Earth going on on Earth, right? It always does, right? The Illuminati, Captain America, blah, 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 blah. But on a bigger scale, you've got Rabumalal, the Great Destroyer, the person who seemingly started the incursions. And then you've got the Ivory Kings who are part of the incursions. We don't really know what their role is, but those two groups are going to war, right? The forces of Rabumalal, the forces of the Ivory Kings are at war with one another. The multiverse is collateral damage, right? The destruction of the multiverse hinges on this. And, and what you had is the Black Priest who emerged as the multiverse trying to defend itself from being destroyed uh, as a means to try to balance out this collapse, right? So a lot of like huge parts going on way out there in the multiverse itself, which really seems to dwarf what's going on, you know, based on Earth. But you end up having this idea where, where, where the group kind of comes together and really it's Starbrand who kicks out the idea and says, okay, Okay, then here's what we'll do, right? We'll send one group out there to basically find Raboom Alal. Like we'll, 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 you know, one group will go out there, find Raboom Alal, and they will kill him. They will end the incur they'll, they'll, they'll end his reign. And basically, you know, try to find some way to stop the incursions through through his death. And then we'll send another group out there to face off against the Ivory Kings. And they will kill the Ivory Kings and basically destroy both of these warring parties. When they're out of the way, we can focus the totality of our efforts on finding a way to stop the incursions. And so that's when it's kind of thrown out there. Okay, now's our chance. Now, like, like literally flip a coin, right? Like whoever picks heads goes after Abuma Lal. Whoever picks tails goes after the Ivory Kings, right? From there, we switch back to, to Reed Richards and to all these guys. And we actually have have Reed Richards kind of sending off a message to Valeria, right? It's one of the things that Reed always does is basically communicate with his kids, kind of teach them lessons when he can, where he can. And one of the things that Hickman hits on here is that Reed has always kind of seemed dispassionate and disconnected when the reality is anything but. And he basically kind of goes and, and gives her this lesson on how to win battles, on how to win conflicts. And so he calls this one making plans and the proper execution thereof. And he basically says that he sees so many potential future outcomes, right? The, 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 the potential outcomes out there are, are just infinite. And there are some that are optimistic and there are, there are some that are less so. And so one of the things he tells her is you have to be your absolute best. 
and we kind of end up switching over to basically the Archangel Helicarrier, right? The one, the one ran by Captain America. And what Reed had done here was initiate the first step of the plan. That remember, Captain America and his forces track the Illuminati using their translocation, which is to say whenever the Illuminati teleport from one location to the next, the Captain America tracks the signal and then tries to locate them. And while he usually ends up being late, at the very least, it does give him the belief that he's, he's basically closing in on them faster and faster, right? The more they use this technology, the more adept S.H.I.E.L.D. becomes at tracking it, the faster they can get to its location. Location. And so what we end up having is Reed Richards teleporting a chess piece, just like three inches, just enough to set off a signal, enough for, for S.H.I.E.L.D. to pick it up. And so right off the bat, you immediately know it's a trap. And that's exactly what's what's said by Sam Wilson, right? You know, where, where Maria Hill and Sam Wilson are there as kind of advisors for, for Steve Rogers, the, the response of, of Sam Wilson is, okay, look, the issue here is that they were just in Rome, right? It wouldn't make any sense if they were more or less in the same vicinity to suddenly teleport to another location in the same place, right? They're still in Rome. And so Sam Wilson it's kind of like, it doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't add up. They know that we can track them. So they wouldn't be dumb enough to teleport and then teleport again, right? Like, because they know that we would find them. They, like, what this means is like, if they've done this, it's because they intend for us to find them. And Steve Rogers is like, I know it's a trap, right? But at this point, he doesn't care, right? It doesn't really matter to him. Switch over to James Rhodes. And what James Rhodes is doing is basically piloting a whole, you know, a veritable army of war machine robots, basically. He's piloting them all from a single device. Now, it has had somewhat of a mental toll, but at the end of the day, he still seems to be able to pull it off, but the translocation signal comes from this one particular area. And so you have all these war machines who show up there and they're looking for this signal and they're like, we're right on top of it, only for them to realize they are on top of it. They're on top of the Hulk who immediately comes smashing out of the ground, right? And just starts tearing these guys up. And that's when Reed comes in with this next lesson, right? He says, for example, it's been said many times that if you wait for all the information necessary to make a correct decision, the opportunity to make any decision at all might have passed you by. And then he says, of course, the opposite of that idea is the uncomplicated maxim, go with your gut. The argument there being instinct is an evolutionary good bet, which is true until you run into something or someone a little higher up on the food chain, or in some instances, maybe just a bit more hungry. Most people, even gifted ones like yourself, talking to Valeria, tend to favor one of these two principles, but the best course of action is an amalgamation, maintaining a constant awareness of both concepts and waiting to act until the moment they intersect waiting until both instinct and intellect collide. To put it bluntly, what you're looking for is a plan that can be executed with precision, but also implemented atemporally, minimize variables, maximize flexibility. This is an awesome lesson to learn. It's basically saying you want to be able, you want to be in a position to where you have a plan, but you also want to make sure that plan can adjust on the fly. You do not want to be rigid because if you're rigid, as soon as that plan ends, everything goes to pot. Now, here's the other cool thing that comes out of this, right? You basically end up having Captain America launching a couple different strikes. You've got the war machine suits that are out there. The Illuminati are now there. So you've got Black Panther, you've got Beast, you've got Reed Richards, you've got Captain Britain. The Incredible Hulk, of course, is there. And the Incredible Hulk Hulk is just laying waste, right, to all these different uh, these these different war machine robots. Enter Carol Danvers. One of the more interesting things here is is the power of Carol Danvers, right? I remember going to see in the Captain Marvel movie, and I, I I saw that interview where Foggy was like, Carol Danvers is the most powerful person in the Marvel Cinematic Universe as as her binary form. Yes, right. When she's channeling the power of a star, absolutely, she's the most powerful person in the in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Carol Danvers, when it's just Carol Danvers, not a chance. And that's exactly what happens here, right? Like literally, the Incredible Hulk, like she. She, she tackles the Incredible Hulk, just starts pummeling him. And then when she's done and she starts catching her breath, he's like, do you feel better? And then just pummels her into the sky, right? Let me tell you something. Carol Danvers is cool, but regular Carol Danvers, not a chance. No way she, she stands a chance against against like the Incredible Hulk. No, that, that's, that's not going to happen. No one believes that. <laughs> Nobody should believe that. But with Carol Danvers being sent flying again, the Incredible Hulk is back onto the battlefield, not having to focus on her. And we're right back into it again. And then Reed Richards continues on. He says, another thing thing you need to consider is consistency of disposition. Can you remain calm while executing your plan? The answer to this must always be Yes, psychological warfare is the tool most often used by anyone standing in opposition to you achieving your goals. Manipulation, ultimatums, the threat of physical or emotional harm, these are tools of resistance. And while they may not be sufficient to stop you, like barnacles on a ship, they are enough to cause drag and put your goals in peril. You must at all times maintain composure. Now I want to warn you, Valeria, there are those who will not understand this disposition. They will call you cold and unfeeling, which is untrue. 
we feel as much as anyone. We hurt, we cry, but keep it in check until later. Like that's, that's an incredibly important lesson that Valeria needs to learn, right? That the world will see her as somebody disconnected and unfeeling and uncaring. The reality of that is the exact opposite, that in order for that plan to succeed, she cannot be emotional, right? You cannot be an emotional person. You have to be able to stick to your guns. You've got to be able to stay strong, to keep your conviction in the face of overwhelming uncertainty. Only in doing that can you actually see your plans to fruition. And so with that being the case, you end up having Captain America, who's consistently, you know, who's, who's basically making his way over the site, right? The whole idea of the war machines and all that kind of stuff, that was a, that was a preliminary attack, right? That was an initial strike. It was there to try to try to maintain or at least create a kind of battle zone. And then once Captain America and his forces get there, then to deploy the actual package. And so once Captain America and his forces get to the location, Reed Richards chimes in again. And he says, and finally, we come to strategy, how to achieve your goals. I won't bother going into limited scenarios, clearly to find opponents or situations. These are simple and you are well beyond needing your father's advice on handling those. A ship pops out of nowhere. It says, attention, agents of shield. And then we go back to read. But when facing a well-seasoned or truly gifted opponent, you must always attempt to redefine your opponent's base understanding of the encounter. You attack their primary hypothesis. For example, if there is an expectation that a conflict is between two parties, one of them being yours, the first thing you do is you introduce a third. And that's when we end up finding out that Robert DaCosta is part of this, that Robert DaCosta is part of the plan of Reed Richards, that this has all been the plan of Reed the entire time. Robert DaCosta's new Avengers, all that stuff has all been a part of Reed's plan. And so what we end up doing is switching over to Dr. Doom, right? I know a lot of you guys were really curious about this. Dr. Doom, the Molecule Man, a lot of you guys really wanted to know what was going on. And it's kind of a funny thing here because Doom has been putting the pieces together, right? While everything else has been going on, while everything else has been happening, Robert DaCosta forming his own team that goes out into the multiverse and so on and so forth. You've got Captain America chasing down the Illuminati. You've got the Illuminati trying to stop the Cabal and all of them are trying to find some way to end the incursions. Dr. Doom has been working inside his Citadel to figure out, to, to answer questions, right? To get questions sorted out. And it's one of these things where he starts talking to the Molecule Man who is kind of progressively going crazier. And and what, what Dr. Doom really hits at here is there is something big going on and that the Molecule Man Owen Reese has everything to do with it, right? Like everything that's happening with the incursions seem to basically tie into Owen Reese. And the reason why is because the energy emanating off this fragment, this rock, the one that fell when the incursion happened on Earth in Latveria when we first encountered the map makers, Dr. Doom has been analyzing it. And the energy signature of this rock matches the en energy signature of Owen Reese. So something is going on here. And it's one of these things where Owen Reese is like, this is, you know, this is kind of strange, you know, like, and, and initially he almost kind of, kind of, you know, throws out the idea that Dr. Doom's a liar. And Dr. Doom's like, I'm not a liar, right? I never lie. And Owen's response is, yeah, but if what you believe is the truth, and if what you were told, you know, if, if somebody told you something and they said, this is the truth, and you believe it because they told you, but what they told you was a lie, are you not a liar? Maybe you're a liar unintentionally, but a liar nonetheless, because what you're saying is not true, regardless of the reasons for why you believe it. And this is basically Owen Reese telling Dr. Doom, nothing that you believe is going on here is actually right. Like nothing you believe is going on here is correct. Nothing, like nothing's transpiring. Like there's what you believe is happening. There's what the Avengers believe is happening. There's what, what Captain America thinks is happening. There's what everybody out there thinks is happening, but none of them really know the truth. And so he says, let me show you. Let's go on a trip. Snaps his fingers and the two of them disappear. Now, undoubtedly, you guys are probably asking where in the heck did they go? They teleported to the very beginning of the incursions. They're, they're teleporting to the place where the whole thing gets explained. We find out how the incursions started, we find out everything going on with like Raboom Alal, and we find out what's going on with, with the Ivory Kings and all that kind of stuff. Okay, I don't know how many of you guys follow The Chef's Table on Netflix. They're coming out with a new season, and this one's about barbecue. Dude, I am, I am so excited. I love Chef's Table. It's like the best cooking show in like the history of the world. It's on, dude, it's on Netflix. It's amazing. But uh, okay, we are continuing on with Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. And I, and I told, I told you guys, man, let me tell you something. I told you guys. Once you get into eight months later, where time runs out, that's when everything starts to pop off, right? I mean, I, 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 I told y'all, let me tell you something. I told y'all, that's when everything pops off. Okay, so in the last video, we basically had this, you had basically the Illuminati kind of 
initiating the shield where they were located at, right? Kind of pulling off this sort of conflict, right? They, they basically initiated the first phase because shield, you know, led by Captain America has been tracking down the Illuminati in order to hold them accountable for the fact that they've been destroying worlds, right? Or at least, you know, that's what they've had to do in order to, uh, to stave off the incursions. And so with that in mind, what they did is basically Reed Richards moved a piece, right? He simply just, you know, teleported this little chess piece, like three inches. And that translocation signal was enough to tip off shield to their location because it was all part of Reed's plan. And we ended up finding out that the idea of Reed was to, to kind of test Captain America to see what he was about. And then of course, we ended up seeing the introduction of, uh, of the Avengers world team, which is what Robert DaCosta's team is because there's so many Avengers named teams out there and it can get a little confusing. I always refer to them as the multiversal Avengers team. The overall gist is that as soon as he arrives on the scene, he immediately starts talking to Captain America, right? He chimes in and says like, the whole reason why I'm here is because it's all about love, bro. It's all about love. <laughs> You know, he's like, I love the concept of Avengers, right? The mightiest superheroes in the world, regardless of where they come from, the Avengers are the top tier protectors of the world. I have to ask, do we have a massive threat? Are we facing an impossible task? Yes. Is it large enough that the threat requires our protecting the entire planet? Absolutely. And finally, are we putting our differences aside? No. Why? Why are you not putting your differences aside? What I think we can do is we, and, and as he's kind of going through and going through this great big huge spiel, Captain America cuts him off, right? But the introduction of this third group, right? The introduction of Robert DeCosta's Avengers team was something that Captain America was actually kind of planning for. And that's the, that's the interesting thing because we'll find out how Reed perceives this here in a little bit. But as soon as that happens, he switches over to James Rhodes, right? Now remember, James Rhodes is remotely controlling all of, or I guess remote controlling all these different war machine armors. But the fact is, is that with the Incredible Hulk dispatched to the scene, the Incredible Hulk on, on behalf of the Illuminati is ripping apart all these different war machines, right? And that's literally what James Rose said. I'm on my like, I'm on my final wave. I'm on my last wave. After this, I don't have anything else. And so in response, you know, he says like, if you have something up your sleeve, now's the time to do it. Captain America says, that's exactly what I was thinking. He dispatches Maria Hill. Maria Hill says, just deploy the package. And what we end up finding out here, if you guys recall that video that we did, where we had the alternate reality Avengers who were evil and they conquered their world, that version of Bruce Banner stayed behind. And it was a ruse by Tony Stark and the main Marvel Universe Bruce Banner to hand over this alternate reality version and then pretend it was the main Marvel Universe Bruce Banner. So that basically this would allow Bruce from the from the main Marvel Universe to be hidden, right? To basically operate with nobody knowing that he was that, that he was not actually this version they had in Shield. But Captain America figured it out. Captain America realized what was going on. And remember, this version of Bruce is remote control, meaning the Incredible Hulk can be activated using your remote. And that's exactly what happens. They send him flying off the helicarrier. Captain America activates the the, the Incredible Hulk remote diode inside of his brain, and he manifests. Lands on the battlefield, it's Hulk versus Hulk. It's amazing, right? Because you just have like two versions of Hulk smashing on each other, right? Now, we don't really get to see a whole lot in the way of this conflict, but what this is designed to do is kind of hold things off, because in the middle of that, you end up having Manifold, who can teleport, who brings in Black Widow and, and Jessica Drew's Spider-Woman, and is like, hey, so uh, maybe we can talk some sense to you, uh, sense to you right? Because we're old friends, and we were on your side. And then Captain America immediately sees them teleport in, and is like, no. You guys are you guys are obviously with the enemy now. And their response is like, we're not working with the Illuminati and we're not working with you. There are no teams here. And Robert DeCosta's Avengers team is the only one that's doing what the Avengers should be doing, which is trying to figure all this out. The problem is that Carol Danvers has returned from low orbit after being hit by the Incredible Hulk. And so now that she's here, there's no real way for Black Widow or Jessica Drew to escape. And so they basically chime in to DeCosta and say like, getting out of here is not gonna be an easy solution. And that's when DeCosta says, okay, Shang-Chi, you're up. And this is why we got all those duplicate versions of Shang-Chi. This is why he got the ability to replicate, right, from one of the origin bomb sites. I was trying not to make it obvious why he did that, but basically what this means is the greatest martial arts master in the entirety of the Marvel Universe has now been dispatched with multiple copies of himself to infiltrate S.H.I.E.L.D. And Maria Hill immediately chimes in, and it's like, we're getting reports of Shang-Chi all over the place, and like, there's nothing we could, like, he's crushing all of our guys. Like, they can't, they can't hold off against him. It's Shang-Chi. Like, if we had some superpowered beings here, then that's fine, but like, we can't go against Shang-Chi. Chi here. So basically like this shield helicarrier is more or less compromised. I mean, given enough time, we're not going to have anybody left to run it. And so Captain America is like, okay, fine. Then we'll, we'll deploy the next step. So what this does is it leads to them basically landing on the surface. Now, something to note here, the art does switch. And the reason why the art switches is because at the time the story was being written, Marvel was running on a really tight timeline. And so they were basically running out of time uh, in order for Mike Diodato, who was the one who was doing the art in the first half of this book to basically keep up, right? So they end up having to switch over the other artists kind of bouncing back and forth 
forth a little bit. But basically, Captain America is like, okay. So you know, when he arrives on the surface, Beast and the Illuminati approach him and say, hey, look, like, please, like, stop tracking us down. Let us go. We're trying to find solutions here. Like, there's things that we think we haven't thought of yet. The response of Captain America is no. You guys have all these grand plans, right? You guys think you're so smart. Well, I'm no dummy either. I'm a master of military strategy. So yeah, you have your plans, but so do I. Boom, enter the mighty Avengers, right? Blue Marvel, Luke Cage, She-Hulk, right? Spectrum. These are some heavy hitters. And then Reed Richards chimes in. And Reed Richards says, the prolonged object. Remember, he started doing this when he was talking, he was teaching a lesson to his daughter Valeria, right? So he says, the prolonged object of any plan is not to get what you want, but to discover what your opponent is capable of. What you are interested in is gauging their response to your actions. And he says, when I spoke of challenging a gifted opponent's primary hypothesis, I used the example of disrupting a conflict between two parties, you and them, by introducing a third group. Your opponent's response to this will inform your next action. For instance, let us examine my recent conflict within the multifaceted Avengers machine as a test case for effective planning. Steve Rogers' response to the third party scenario, Robert DeCosta's Avengers World Team, was the introduction of an alternate universe Hulk analog. An effective choice, unpredictable, unexpected. But even given that, if the Hulk would have been his sole response, it would have been a futile effort, as he would have exposed his true intentions too early for the number of variables at play. But this is Steve Rogers we're talking about, Valeria. The Hulk did serve as an excellent branching scenario, enabling Captain Rogers to hold down two fronts. S.H.I.E.L.D. engaged with Robert DaCosta's Avengers team while he engaged with us. In fact, had he not suffered considerable losses maintaining a zone of conflict preventing us from an early tactical retreat via Translocator, the Hulk Gambit might have succeeded in making us introduce our assets into the field earlier than desired. But he did suffer losses, so he was forced to introduce a fourth party, his secret Avengers, immensely powerful tactically varied, an excellent stratagem, but unfortunately for him, his last piece available on the board. And then you have Captain America who chimes in, right? Richards, it's over, right? Like it's done you've lost, right? It's time to pay. And Reed responds, haven't we all paid enough this time? And then he chimes in again. Remember, as I said earlier, Valeria, the object of any plan is not to get what you want, but to discover what your opponent is capable of. And once you know that, you can manipulate the board to engineer and manage a successful end game. Captain America goes in for the punch, everybody gets locked down. And that's when he realizes the invisible woman. Oh my God, like Susan, no, like it's, it's the worst thing. It's it's a guaranteed loss for Captain America, right? Like that's it. It's it's over, right? Because like he remember he didn't know Susan Storm was working with Reed Richards. Like he thought that Susan had like defected from her husband, that she'd become disillusioned. Remember, she was the spy the entire time. We covered that in a previous story, and that's when Reed chimes in. He's like, "This is exactly right. It really is Susan Storm. It's disappointing, I'm sure, and you must be wondering how it was we pulled it off because you were so careful. You were doing psychic scans. You were scanning their minds on a daily basis, and you were telling them about." Some of them and then not telling them about the others. But while you were careful, we were even more careful. And and literally like Susan Storm comes walking off the walking off the ship of the Illuminati alongside Medusa and then Reed chimes in again, right? He says, the thing about end games is this. It's really two strategies in one. First, you show them what they guessed might have been coming, and then you show them what they didn't. And what Captain America did not see coming was Reed Richards approaching them for a parlay. That's what he didn't see coming. He did not see Reed Richards approaching him and saying, look, we need to talk, right? Like, that's why this is all happening. Like, we need to talk. Now, from here, we switch over to some point in the past of Wakanda when T'Challa was a kid. And his father calls him, right? His father T'Chaka calls him forward and says, look, I have a gift for you. And he's like, well, what is this? He says, like, this belonged to my father and to my father before him. Him. It's a king's blade, T'Challa, and it belongs to a king. Now, one thing to understand is about Black Panther's origin history, it's filled with things like this, right? It's filled with like these small little lessons he got from his father. It's filled from a multitude of scenarios where he was being given these small little trinkets or these little things. And it was designed for the purpose of making sure T'Challa understood the, the, the idea of heritage, the significance of where he comes from, of what his people stand for, and what it means to be a king of Wakanda. You're not just wielding power arbitrarily, right? You're wielding power in 
in such a way to where you're responsible for the lives of people around you, but you're also responsible for making sure you honor the heritage of the people who came before you. That's the importance of what it means to be a king. And to receive the king's blade like that, again, is him just kind of being moved forward in this direction, being continually groomed to becoming king. And so from here, we switch back over to Spain, right? We switch back over to the Illuminati and to uh, to, to Captain America. And, and it's, it's kind of interesting because Susan Storm's, you know, kind of approaching him, approaching Steve Rogers and so on, and basically says like, you know, like, like Captain America says, I'm going to give you three seconds to lower this shield. And Susan's like, I will, if you're going to, if you're willing to be a reasonable human being, right? Like if you're willing to chill, have a conversation. And that's kind of the cool thing. Captain America is not unreasonable. And that's one of the big differences here. The reason why Captain America acts the way he is now is because he genuinely believes he's right. Captain America was always really good at being able to separate his own personal emotion from what was happening in, in regards to, to like the events around him, being able to focus on the task at hand. And what he sees is not really the Illuminati who he's angered by. I mean, he is pissed off because they wiped his mind, you know, and basically kind of sent him forward on what was more or less a carrot and a stick. But he also sees them as criminals, people who have taken innocent lives and they have, right? It's what they've done. But in the end of the day, Captain America just doesn't seem to grasp the fact that it really is in the name of the greater good. Although now that I think about that, I will take that back. Captain America does grasp the fact that it is in the name of the greater good, but heinous things have been done in the history of mankind and the history of his life as a soldier in the name of the greater good, right? So I guess that's really where he gets a lot of his viewpoints from. But you know, at the end of the day, he kind of asks, like, was it really you two working together all along? And she's like, yeah, I was a spy this entire time. Now, it's kind of funny because Carol Danvers asked the same question you guys are going to ask. How did she get past all the mental scans and how did she avoid being detected as a spy? Hickman doesn't give us an answer, right? He doesn't give us an answer. Like, it's literally what she asked. Like, how did how did you get past all that? And Captain America responds, well, because they are who they, they are who they are, and we're simply mere mortals. We could never understand, you know, kind of being a being a bit of a smart aleck. And then Reed kind of starts to explain, and Captain America's like, I don't want to hear it. Like, I don't want to hear it. Like, I don't I don't want anything to do with that, right? Like, I know how you guys screw with people's heads. So Hickman kind of cuts us off right there. And it's a smart move. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter how Susan Storm managed to get past all the side scans. It's just that she did, right? She was just able to pull it off. But this is basically a great big huge parlay. You end up having like Beast basically chiming in, kind of being the voice of reason, because in reality, he's really one of the more non-biased people. And that's what made Beast unique. But, you know, where they kind of start to explain, like, we believe that we have a way to get the Cabal off, off the map, right? We can get rid of the Cabal. We can remove them. But what we can also do is once, once they're done, we can put Shields resources, advanced idea mechanics resources. We can pull all of our resources together and then we can find a way to stop the incursions, which is what, what we should have been doing the entire time. The funny thing about this and the reason why there's a parlay being brought here by Reed is because things are a lot more dire than Reed is letting on. More so than that, Captain America says, okay, we can do this, but the only way I'm doing this is if I know once this, once this is done, once the multiverse is saved and all that, you guys are going to stay in trial. Like you guys are going to pay for this. And Namor kind of chimes in and says that what we did, destroying worlds, it could not be avoided. The world that we destroyed with the Great Society, it had to be done. It was the only way to save our world. It was the only way to do it. If we had not done that, our world would have been obliterated. And yeah, I killed a world full of innocent people and I don't apologize for that. It was wrong, but I don't apologize for it. I should answer for what I did, but I saved my kingdom and I saved the billions of people here. Regardless of how you look at it, that's them. This is us. If I'm a parent and my child is hungry at home, I'm not making a sandwich for the kid across the street. I'm taking care of my own first. You can call it selfish if you want to. That's just the way that it is. And so so understanding that and with Namor being the first one to step up and say, I will let myself be held accountable to the courts, you know, to be put on trial for what it was that I did. Then in turn, Captain America starts asking everybody else, right? He asks Reed Richards, are you willing to do that? You, Susan Storm, are you willing to? Beast, are you willing to? And each of them are like, yes. Like if it comes to that, then we will surrender ourselves. And then he asks T'Challa, will you turn yourself and he says, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm not turning myself in, Captain America, and you're stupid for believing that I would. <laughs> and so that's kind of solidified, right? Captain America has no jurisdiction over Wakanda anyway. And the resources and the money that, that, that Wakanda has, although their vibranium doesn't really exist anymore uh, because of the, the events of Doom War, but the other resources they have are far too valuable. The world is not going to side with Captain America because they have more to lose by Black Panther shutting Wakanda's borders off to the world than they do by having those borders open. And if the difference between borders closed or borders open is T'Challa not being being put on trial for like blowing up a world, then he won't be put on trial, right? So Captain America is just really kind of in a weakened place here. There's really nothing he can do about that. But you end up having the plan basically being revealed. And Reed says that in just under two hours, uh, there's going to be another incursion and that Namor is going to make sure the Cabal is there when it happens, right? So jump forward two hours. It's probably the single greatest moment. It's, it's one of the best moments ever, right? So jump forward two hours, dude. I, man, let me tell you something, dude. I love this part. Jump forward two hours and you have the, you have the Cabal and you have Namor the Submariner. And remember, the Cabal's just destroying worlds, right? And he basically says, like, you know, like, yes, the incursion's coming. Like, it's 
it's almost here. Uh, and then finally, like it is here, right? So the Cabal teleports to the alternate world. They take the antimatter bomb with them. Now switch over to when Shuri became Black Panther, right? In the aftermath of Doom War, Shuri ended up becoming Black Panther because of the fact that T'Challa was injured. He couldn't play that role. And so because he was injured, he passed the mantle to her and then she became the new Black Panther. With her undergoing the trials and the test, remember, it wasn't just a temporary thing. Like the only way Wakanda will recognize a new Black Panther, the only way the Wakandan people will recognize that is if that person goes through all the trials. So Shuri had to go through all the trials to become the new Black Panther, which basically gave her that role, meaning T'Challa would no longer be in that role unless she stepped down and handed the mantle back to him. And so in light of that, he passes to her the King's Blade that his father gave to him, right? A ceremonial moment. And it's it's it's, it's cool. And so, so what you end up doing is jumping back to Captain America and Reed. And what they end up doing is, is, you know, kind of going over what this plan is. And one of the things that had happened was that while advanced idea mechanics, before they were bought by Robert DaCosta, when they were exploring the incursions and they were trying to find a way to stave them off, what they did is they had come up with this kind of platform device, right? And what this would do was essentially create an impenetrable force field. And the hope is that they would test it on an incursion, that they would send this, send this platform in between two Earths and the force field would be enough to hold the universes apart, right? So they wouldn't actually collapse with each other. And if that worked, then they would in turn build as many as they possibly could and then put them out there into the multiverse and literally just hold worlds from crashing into each other and basically stabilize the multiverse. Ultimately, it didn't work. The amount of energy that was coming from two worlds, you know, two universes colliding into each other was way more than the shield on this thing could carry. But Reed repurposes it and Reed says, what we're going to do here is we are going to activate this thing, right? We're going to, we're going to send this thing down to that world. And what it's going to do is it's going to activate the shield around the cabal and it's going to, it's basically going to trap them on the world so that when the, when the bomb, go, when the antimatter bomb goes off, the cabal are trapped inside the sphere and they can't get out, right? They'll die along with that world being destroyed. Now, once this is done, Namor's like, this is, this is the plan. Like, this is what I intend to do. So from here, we switch over, we switch back over to like the fall of Wakanda, right? Like remember when the cabal invaded Wakanda, when they destroyed the necropolis and Wakanda fell, you end up having Shuri who decided to stay behind, who approaches T'Challa and basically says, you're the only king left. This ceremonial king's knife belongs to you, right? This ceremonial blade, it belongs to you and make sure you put it where it belongs right now. Switch back to the current moment. You end up having like, you know, the Incredible Hulk using one of his, you know, universal telescopes, whatever it is, monitoring the incursion. The cabal are there, right? The cabal are there. They're fighting against the map makers, right? It's basically a dead world. So it's a map maker world. They deploy the craft, right? The Illuminati deploy the craft with the, with the force field up there. Basically, Namor activates the antimatter bomb and then goes to take off to the platform. And then from there, uh, basically it's kind of like, okay, like everybody's waiting on this moment. And then Susan Storm starts looking around and she's like, uh, read. And he's like, yeah. And she's like, where's T'Challa? And then like, as soon as Namor gets to the platform, T'Challa's like, I have something for you, Namor. And, and then it's like, what are you gonna do? Like, what do you, what do you have that blade for? And then you get this flashback to Shuri, right? Put the blade where it belongs. Wham! Right in the chest of Namor the Submariner. Oh, it's the coolest thing. Stabs him in the chest. And he's like, you really believe you could kill me with a knife? He's like, no, I just put the blade where it was supposed to go. That's not what's going to kill you. Teleport Black Bolt, right? Black Bolt teleports in, screams at Namor, sends him flying off, right? He says like, when you see my brother Maximus, tell him I said fair well, screams at Namor, sends him flying off the platform, crashing down to the ground. Then in turn, they activate the, uh, they activate the platform, right? And then like Black Bolt's like, what are you waiting for? And T'Challa's like, I'm waiting because with, with Namor being what he is, right? Being as capable and durable as what he is, that fall is not going to be enough to kill him, but it'll, it'll knock him out for, for a few minutes. But once he comes to, I want him to be awake. I want him to, to know what's going to happen to him. I want him to know it was me. I want him to fully realize that he's going to die in the explosion, right? In this antimatter bomb explosion. And there's no nothing he can do about it. Like from there, he activates the uh, activates the, the device and then the, the antimatter bomb goes off and then teleports back to Earth, right? Like flies back flies back through the incursion zone to where Earth is. And then when the question is like, where's, where's Namor? He simply just says, he's not coming. Okay, so we are continuing on with our Avengers and our new Avengers. Yes, we are. <laughs> we are continuing on. And uh, in this one, we pick up with the kind of coming together of the, the teams, right? Of the of the Illuminati and with Captain America's Avengers team, Sunspot's Avengers team, this long-awaited sit-down between these two groups. But the question people have is, why now? 
right? Like, why are we, why are we just now calling a meeting? Like, why, why is it that we're just now at this point? And why are things so dire that Reed Richards and the Illuminati saw no other option than to basically trap Captain America's team and then force them into a meeting? And, and the reason why is because Reed Richards kind of explains that with everything that's going on, that while the, the Illuminati were constantly on the run from Captain America's Avengers team, that they've also been monitoring the multiverse for multiple reasons, right? We saw that early in the story, they were monitoring the multiverse to see if there were other Earths who found ways to end the incursions or whatever it is. But one of the things that they realize is that some kind of an event happened out there. They don't know what that event is, but some kind of an event took place out in the multiverse. And where previously, you know, despite how far into the incursions we are, there were hundreds of thousands of universes left. Now, there's 22. Something happened, there's 22 universes left, and that's it. Like, no one, like, he doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know what it was that had happened. And when the question's like, okay, so, like, like, what's the plan, right? Like, you know, when, when Carol Danvers, like, you know, just, just tell us what your plan is, Reed's response is, like, our plan for what? What plan? Like, I mean, there's, there's no plan here. Like, there's, there's no great, like, I'm telling you guys so you know what's going on. There's no great plan that I have. I mean, I've got one, you know, one ace up my sleeve, but that's it. Like, like, that's, that's, that's it. Like, I have one last, like, like literally one last hope. Like I have a singular hope out there and that's it, right? That's, that's all we have. And when the question's like, what have you guys been doing all this time? Right? That's what Captain America asked, you know, like, what have you been doing? Like, like what's been happening here? You know, what does all of this mean? The response of, of Reed and Black Panther is, okay, well, it looks like our odds are better. And when they're like, well, what does that mean? It's like, well, we're going to miss every incursion except for one, the final incursion. We'll outlive all of them. And when the question's asked, like, well, what is, I mean, what happens, right? Like what happens when we get to the last incursion? His answer is, I don't know. Like, I, I literally have no idea. Like, I was hoping we'd never get to this point. <laughs> I was hoping we would never get to a place where we legitimately had to face the fact that the multiverse was going to end, but it's going to, right? Like something happened, it sped up the, the death of the entire multiverse, right? So now we're down to 22 universes left. They're gonna start crashing into each other. There's nothing we can do to stop them, right? Like they're, they're gonna start crashing into each other. We can hope that the heroes on those worlds, if that world even has any heroes, can somehow find a way to stave it off, but there's, there's nothing. And then Captain America's response is like, what have you guys been doing? Doing this whole time, right? Like, I mean, sure, we were chasing you guys down, whatever, but you're the smartest men in the world. What have you been doing? If you say you've been working on things and doing things while you were on the run, what were those things? And Reed Richards kind of gives T'Challa like this just sad look. Right? And he says, like, you know, while she was our prisoner, the Black Swan outlined some possible ways for us to survive the incursions. If the Earth is the incursion point, which is to say that if an Earth exists in a universe, then if that uni if that Earth collides with another Earth during an, inc an incursion, then, like, both universes will be destroyed. So we can do like so many other people did, which was to destroy their world, right? Destroy their Earth. And that would basically spare their universe, right? Like, we can, we can do that. We can see what happens. And so that's what they did, right? They basically created a cosmic cube, and they created a series of exodus planets, right? Planets within the universe where they could basically start, you know, like moving people, right? They could just find these worlds there or they could just make worlds, right? Like they can just create worlds out of nowhere that are just habitable, honestly, because it would take more time to look for a world than it would be to just make one. And they could make a series of them in like different solar systems or maybe even an entire solar system that's just colonized by humanity. But the problem with this, and this is why I love Jonathan Hickman, is the stars are dying. Remember, we covered that in a previous video, right? We, we talked about how you had those ex nihili and it seemed arbitrary. And I told you guys, it would become important later on that those stars were dying out early. That's the problem that they have. Because the universe is ending or the multiverse is ending, that means the universes are basically going to end sooner and the stars are just kind of giving up, right? They're basically just dying. And so because of that, like even if they do have a series of exodus planets, there won't really be a star there. Now, they do have the ability to create stars, right? Using using the cosmic cube. The problem is that with one of these, uh, one of these you know, suns going supernova, they had to get off like immediately and they ended up leaving the cube behind. And the result was that the continuous containment device for the cube's energies was destroyed. The, the cosmic cube's energies itself was not destroyed, but the containment device for the cube was. And so what they ended up doing was moving on to the next thing, right? Because making a cosmic cube is not an easy process and you need a lot of energy and a lot of resources in order to be able to do it. And so what they did is they moved on to the next thing, right? They hit up the cosmic entities. They hit up Galactus and they asked Galactus to arrange a meeting with the celestials so that all the cosmic entities could use their power to try to create a habitable place, right? Explaining everything that's going on, saying, hey guys, I don't know if you've known, there's an incursion going on. There's incursions across the multiverse, right? So an earth will pop up and basically it'll sit there. It'll start moving closer and closer over this, over the span of eight hours. And as soon as it hits our earth, both universes will be destroyed. We want to basically 
evacuate the entire Earth's population, right? Use your power to basically create a world for us, for us to live on, and then teleport everybody on our Earth to that new world, and then blow up our Earth and save our save our universe. And the uh, the cosmic entities were on board. They were totally on board with it, and then they disappeared. They just vanished out of like they were just gone why like why did they take off from there like it turned into okay like they they basically had brian braddock hit up the captain britain core and then basically go out there because remember the captain britain core is multiversal so the captain britain core was exploring the source of the multiverse but as soon as they started exploring it they were met by the arrival of the map makers and like they were obliterated pretty much everyone but captain but uh brian braddock from the main marvel universe was destroyed right they were completely wiped out by the uh by the map makers and so then in turn reed richards turned to franklin richards right he turned to his son to see if it was possible to use this power to create universes to somehow create either a new universe for them or to create a sustainable world but that didn't work nothing they did worked nothing worked everything they've tried has failed and it's every option that they have and so when the question is like if we don't really have a way to stop it like are we any closer to figuring out the cause of this right are we any closer to figuring out how these incursions are starting because remember robert DaCosta sent his multiversal avengers team out there for the same purpose right but maybe the illuminati have found something out and reed says like we've we've tried quite a few things and then suddenly he's cut off and the reason why is because he looks at everybody and says he's back and this was the ace in the hole of reed richards it's like okay who's back like like who's coming back like who's this one hope you had that's coming back and he says you know like eight months ago myself and tony like we sent somebody out into the multiverse to basically find the the source of the incursions but he was only supposed to be gone for a few weeks but like we assumed he'd been lost forever and when it's like okay like like he's like he's returned like who is this it's ant-man right it's hank pym like he's going by the name yellow jacket now but like it's ant-man and it's like he's like oh my god i'm finally back and it's like okay dude you're finally back like you're finally here relax chill for a minute but like tell us like what did you find did you find raboom alal did you succeed in finding him have you found the great destroyer did you find the cause of the incursions and the response of 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 hank pym is no i didn't find the great destroyer i found the ivory kings and he's and he's and they're like oh god like because remember the ivory kings this mystery group out there that are somehow involved right we covered that in a previous video that the ivory kings are at war with Raboom Alal and they're the other part of the incursion and so it's like okay like you know like literally Hank Pym is just insane he's out of his mind right just sputtering like I found the Ivory Kings I found the Ivory Kings right the white lords from wild space from out there from beyond I found the beyonders all hope is lost it's 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 lost there's nothing they can do there's nothing they can do like it's the beyonders right like any chance of hope they had is completely and totally gone why is it gone we'll find out in the next video <laughs> You guys didn't really think I was gonna leave you on a cliffhanger without a follow-up video, did you? You didn't you didn't think I was just gonna leave you guys hanging for like another two or three days or something like that, did you? No! Come on, guys. <laughs> So, um, we are continuing Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. Yes, we are. And because we're picking up from a video that we just did earlier today, we don't really need to do a whole great big huge, you know, kind of recap on what we've seen. Instead, what we do here is we pick up with the Ultimate Universe. Now, this is one of the coolest things, right? Like when this story came out, uh, which is why I love remastering these things. So when this story came out, the Ultimate Universe was still a big deal. And we all kind of knew that the main Marvel Universe was going to meet the Ultimate Universe somewhere along the line. Like, we knew that was going to happen. Now, for those of you guys who don't understand the significance of that, I treat the Ultimate Universe as, it were, as if it was the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Because the Ultimate Universe, or the, the MCU, is largely based off the Ultimate Universe. Now, the Ultimate Universe was launched in 2000, right? It was Brian Michael Bendis and Joe Quesada's answer to the question, what would happen or what would it look like if superheroes arrived today and they existed in the real world, right? It was a more updated version of the, the main Marvel Universe, is basically what it was. And it was cool when it first came out, you know, like Ultimate Spider-Man was was like far and away the most popular title they had. Um, Ultimate X-Men was okay. Ultimate Fantastic Four was kind of hit and miss depending on what it was. But um, that's why Nick, this version of Nick Fury looks the way it does because the MCU version of Nick Fury played by Samuel L. Jackson was based on this version of Nick Fury from the Ultimate Universe who was designed to look like Samuel L. Jackson. And a funny little story here, when, when Sam Jackson found out about that, like initially he was going to press charges or at least, you know, file copyright claim or whatever it was. But a deal was struck that if you could play Nick Fury in the MCU, then it'd be fine for Marvel to do this. I think that's what the case was. I'm sure there were some other things that probably went into it, but we also have Ultimate Reed Richards. Now, for those of you guys who are curious about the story of Ultimate Reed and how it leads into this, you'll find that down in the description. It's one of the reasons why I covered that a while ago uh, was because I knew it was going to come back and be important during this story. But the long and short of this is that this version of Reed was basically like a teenager who was super genius and was part of like a think tank. Eventually, he got hired on at S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, some crazy stuff happened. He ended up becoming evil. He created a giant sentient city and then destroyed most of Europe and then basically pretended to be a good guy, which is where he's at right now. 
But the idea is that at some period, you know, some point previously, um, about six six months before everything that's happening right now with the incursions, uh, Nick Fury had actually grabbed Reed Richards and said that he wanted to rebuild Shield, but he wanted to have it rebuilt in a way to where it could be better than what it was before. And so he has Reed here because he's the smartest man in the world, and he wants Reed to basically think of every single possible doomsday scenario, right? Everything that can go bad and how Shield can cope with it. And this seemed to basically include the idea of the incursions. Now at the time, it seemed to just be a concept, but once the incursions started happening then it became real right so it's like i'm gonna buy a gun in case somebody breaks into my house and then one day somebody does right that's basically what this was and so because of that uh you end up picking up basically what's going on in the ultimate universe right now and you find out a few things right like reed still has city right the the sentient city and basically he uses it it's kind of like an ai that he can talk to that analyzes different situations things like that more so than that we also find out the ultimate universe has been met with 67 incursions and that this version of reed has destroyed every single world right so much like you know in, in in a way that's totally different from the main marvel universe reed richards who basically tries to find a peaceful way to stop the incursions using science technology something like that this version of reed is evil right he's as evil as he ever was and just wiping out entire worlds blowing them up now he's right for doing that it's the smartest move to make but you know he's basically destroyed 67 different universes the other part of this is that when he's talking to city city finds out the same thing that reed richards from the main marvel universe found out at about the same time that there's only 22 universes left left now and and basically the the death of the multiverse seems to be speeding up and so at this point we switch over to the Shi'ar Empire now this is one of those little plots that is kind of small but big at the same time and Hickman basically held off until this small moment the last time we saw the Shi'ar Empire this great big huge space-faring empire was during the events of infinity but like if you guys recall the Shi'ar Empire the various other you know races that were out there the Kree the scroll so on and so forth the Badoon uh the annihilation wave of Annihilus they all teamed up to stop the builders right the builders were on a collision course for Earth and they were going to obliterate it. Now that was because the builders realized what was going on with the incursions and realized that the nexus point of the incursions is Earth. And so they were traveling from one universe to the next, blowing up and destroying the various Earths. This led to like this great big, huge, literally space armada, right? Like the entirety of the universe basically teamed up against the uh, against the builders because that's what it took. And of course they won. They destroyed the builders in the process. The issue with this is that with everything going on, the Shi'ar didn't know about the incursions. They had no idea that was going on. They were so focused on the builders and then they were so focused on the recovery effort after the massive losses they sustained in their war against the builders, it never occurred to them. But then suddenly, like one of their space vessels had basically observed what looked like an incursive Earth. There was like, there's two Earths here. Like that doesn't make any sense. And then one of the Earths was destroyed and then five lights escaped. And it's like, well, what are in those five lights? And that's when they immediately basically hit up the, uh, hit up the Magister, right? They hit up Gladiator, the guy who's running the show. And basically, you know, like Mentor, his, his head science guy basically says all the same thing that I just said, right? Like they just didn't really realize what was going on because there was so much that was happening and it's and it's kind of a nuts thing because at that point gladiator calls together like the brood and the uh like annihilus and his annihilation wave the head of the scrolls the head of the of the kree and the the supreme intelligence calls them all together and says okay the last time that we all united against a single threat it was the builders and had it not been for humans the, the group that we hate so much because they literally don't do anything but cause problems but had it not been for humans the avengers we never would have won that conflict it was by the virtue of thor throwing his hammer and killing one of the builders that we realized they can bleed. And if they can bleed, they we can kill it, right? Thank you, Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Predator movie. Probably the best line ever, right? If it bleeds, we can kill it. Dude, Predator is like one of the best movies ever. It's so amazing. Funny thing, Mariah, I don't think has ever seen Predator. And I don't understand that. If you, okay, let me know in the comment section, have you ever seen Predator? And if you have not seen Predator, uh, why? Why have you not seen it? It's like a movie everybody needs to see at least once. It's amazing. It's like Running Man, right? Like it's an amazing movie. But, uh, but nonetheless, he calls them all together and says like had it not been for thor we would have lost against the we would have lost the war against the builders so we owe humanity the debt right we owe them that debt because they literally saved us unfortunately that debt's never going to be paid because word has reached my ears that the multiverse is collapsing and the only way to save our multiverse is to destroy earth and so we have to unite our forces and travel to earth and blow it up right so now there's another threat to face right not only is it just the incursions right the black priests all these different things now the universe is turning its sights on the superheroes it's turning its sights on earth right so now they have to go to war against the heroes. And so having seen that, um, or at least, you know, dealing with that, we switch back to the ultimate universe. And we basically get this, this, this kind of thing from Reed Richards where he's making his way to the incursion point, right? And it's kind of like, okay, you know, like once he passes through the incursion point, then of course he's met by a blue earth, uh, you know, basically like a, a map maker world. The funny thing about this is that as he goes through there, we immediately jump back to, uh, to name of the Submariner and to the Cabal at the moment that, that Black Panther had basically pulled the trigger. And of course, once Namor hit the ground, the Cabal with all the 
map makers being destroyed immediately stop. And that's when when Black Swan chimes in and says it was Namor, right? I saw him fly out in the middle of all this, you know, to, to like to somewhere, but basically he's a runner, right? Like he was going to leave us here to die. And so in turn, you end up having Corvus Glaive who tells Thanos like, I can ask him if you want me to. And of course, you know, Corvus Glaive does. And that's when Namor starts giving him lip. He's like, I don't answer to you, right? You can't tell me what to do. Like, like I'm not, I, I don't answer to you in any way. And Thanos says, then answer to me, right? And it's the smart move for Namor to answer because him and Thanos are already in a rough patch, right? Thanos is already like, you know, uh, like, like a breath away from just like destroying Namor. And he could, he could totally obliterate Namor with the greatest of ease, right? Like it wouldn't be that difficult for him to do. And so Nam uh, Namor concocts a lie, right? He says like, I saw like this orb in the sky and I went to go check it out. And it was like some indestructible force field. And that's why I was injured because I tried to crash into it, you know, and, 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 you know, like I'm, I'm back here now, right? So it wasn't that I was trying to escape and leave you guys for dead. I was just trying to figure out what in the heck that was because we've never seen it during an incursion before. It's actually a smart lie. It's a really smart lie. That's what made Namor so cool is he was so cunning. And Thanos is not a telepath. He can't read the mind of Namor. So, well, at least he kind of is, but not really. Not on the level that he needs to be in order to understand whether or not Namor is lying. And so ultimately he just rolls with it. And so he asks like, how long do we have until the worlds collide? And he's like, it doesn't matter, right? Because you know, like the, the, the Illuminati, they can detonate a bomb, right? This is obviously something done by T'Challa and Reed Richards and all them. Like I figured that much out when I saw it, you know, like when I was actually up there looking at it and so on, but like, you know, they can detonate the bombs remotely. It doesn't really matter. And then suddenly a second countdown pops up and it's like, what in the hell is this? Like what in the world is this? And that's when Black Swan chimes in and says, okay, you know, like, like on a very rare occasion, you have an earth, like, like the way the incursions work, you have an earth just sitting out there, a second earth pops up and that second earth has eight hours before it hits the first earth. Right? And then like, it'll wipe out both universes. And so the job of any one people on that earth is to destroy the other world, right? That's kind of where the race comes in. But sometimes a third earth will pop up. It'll just pop up out of nowhere. You'll have a three-way incursion. And while it's not not really the worst thing, I mean, usually you kind of have to have like two methods of destruction to destroy the first world and the second world. It can be difficult, especially if like, you know, you end up having like two worlds that team up against you, depending on what the nature of those heroes are. From, from the way she kind of throws it out there, it usually ends up being like a fatal three-way, right? Where it's just like all three worlds go to war against each other. And all you have to do is just find a way to get an antimatter bomb on their world, blow it up. And then the second world, blow that up and spare your own. Uh, but what they do end up figuring out is because it's a third world, it gives them an escape. It gives them an escape buoy, right? It gives them the ability to get out of there, like to basically, you know, get out and to get away. And that's exactly what they do. This is how the Cabal and Namor survive that experience. Black Swan creates force fields. They leave that earth. They fly 1600 kilometers to the, to the third earth. And they basically end up surviving the experience, right? Like the, the earth that they were on before they destroy it. You in the antimatter bomb. Once they arrive here, it looks familiar, but different at the same time. And when the question is asked, like, what is this world? Then in turn, like Black Swan says, we should ask him only for us to find out they arrived in the ultimate universe. This is the first time in the history of Marvel comics where you see like characters from the ultimate universe meeting characters from the, the main Marvel universe on a broad scale. The only time this happened before was during the Spider-Man story where you saw Peter Parker from the main Marvel universe meeting Miles Morales from the ultimate universe. And that's how Brian Michael Bendis basically told all the naysayers, the people who hated Miles, who replaced Peter Parker in the Ultimate Universe to shut up because this is just the way it was going to be, which is pretty smart. They were just like, no, Peter Parker, he needs to say Spider-Man. And, and Bendis is like, shut up. No, he doesn't. You literally have eons of Spider-Man stories in the main Marvel Universe. And like all the naysayers eventually became fans, right? Or at least most of them became fans. The ones who didn't, it doesn't matter. But the, the, the cool thing is basically like you have them in the Ultimate Universe. Now, at this point, we switch over to the part of the story that all of you want to know. The Beyonders. <laughs> the part you're waiting for. Okay. So picking up with Hank Pym, basically he, he kind of starts saying like, it's the Beyonders, right? It's the nature of the Beyonders. Now, one of the questions you guys are undoubtedly going to ask, what is the difference, if any, between these Beyonders and the Beyonder from the original Secret Wars in 1984? All right. Hickman answers that with a quickness, right? It's like, okay. So basically what Hickman tells us here, kind of by way of Black Panther offering this explanation is he's like, okay, these don't look anything like the Beyonder that we saw from the Secret Wars. And there's more than one. The response of Hank Pym is yes. Like that's just, that's the nature of them. These things are harmonically adaptive, right? Like the way that we perceive them is not the way they are. We just perceive them as best we can, right? So they're like Galactus in that way. If you see Galactus in his most pure form, it's just in a mass of energy swirling around inside of a suit. That's what you would see. But different races see Galactus based on their own individual race, right? We learned that about the Trial of Reed Richards storyline way back in like the 80s, I think it was, 70s or the 80s. But basically if Galactus appears to the scrolls, he'll look like a scroll. If he shows up to the Kree, he'll look like a Kree. If he shows up to 
humans, he looks like he's human. With the Beyonders, it's somewhat similar in the sense that they don't really look human. It's not really in that way. It's just humanity or at least people trying to understand them as best they can, right? Like taking on some measure of a form. But the reality is they're pure states of energy. They don't really have any particular form. And the way that Hickman reconciles the original Beyonder with this Beyonder is he basically says the original Beyonder was more or less a child unit. And that's really what it was. The way this kind of explanation seems to work, if you take those two things and you combine them together, you look at like the original basis behind the Beyonder, right? Which is to say that a cosmic cube was, was well, at least the, the process to create a cosmic cube was created and half that energy went into the molecule man, Owen Reese. The other half of that energy just kind of went out into the universe. And that energy source basically became self-aware. What it really seems like here is the Beyonders just kind of manifest arbitrarily, right? They don't really give birth in the traditional sense. It's just at some point along the line, they just become sentient. And really we're just dealing with broad strokes here. It's, it's haphazard guessing is really all it is. Marvel never really gives us an explanation on how Beyonders come into existence. They're simply just there. But the idea is that had the Beyonder from Secret Wars stayed here long enough, it would have become as powerful as these, but it didn't, right? It didn't become that powerful. It was basically eliminated before it could be. And that's essentially what Hickman tells us here, you know, through Ant-Man, that these are Beyonders that have been around for a long, long time, right? They've been around for a very long time. They're far more powerful than the original Beyonder was. And so with that, you know, it's, it's kind of like, does, does any of this make sense? And the response of Captain America is no. And this is when we get the tale of, of Hank Pym, probably the coolest part of the entirety of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, probably the part that everybody was waiting on, to be honest with you guys. When this story first came out, it was the part everybody was waiting on, right? And so what we end up finding out is that, you know, at some point in time, you know, eight months prior to what's going on right now, that as Reed, as we'd found out in a previous video, that Reed Richards and Tony Stark Iron Man had sent Hank Pym out into the multiverse to try to find Raboom Alal, the cause of the incursions. But once he got out there, he started to run into a few complications, right? Ran and started to run into a few issues. He saw some cool universes, right? Some, some alternate realities where like, you know, Ultron had conquered the entirety of Earth or where like diners, dinosaurs had, had like run over everything, which is actually a universe in Marvel Comics. They've published that before. But the biggest issue he ran into is that, you know, universes are for the most part stacked for lack of a better word, right? I mean, they just kind of exist out there, but they're stacked layers. And basically it's like, it's like being out in the middle of space and trying to find North. Unless you have some kind of, you know, unless you have like a pole, which you don't really have, that's how you have like a North and a South pole. Like compasses use poles in order to pull that off. Because of that, there is no true North. And so it's like being, being out in the middle of the ocean and not knowing which way to go, right? There's land in, in no direction. You have no way to know which one's North, especially if there's no stars, right? There's literally no guiding path. And so what he had to do was start to find, it was kind of piece this together on his own, which he successfully did in kind of a haphazard way by shrinking down to the point where he could literally observe matter on the atomic scale, right? He shrunk down to the atomic level and then started watching how these different universes function, how energy swapped, how it moved. And he would notice that there were patterns in the sense that they would all kind of move in a general direction, which indicated, for lack of a better word, a sort of north, right? Now, what Hickman kind of seems to be pointing out here is that if the multiverse came into existence by virtue of an explosion, then like any explosion, it travels outward. And the further out you go, the further away things are. And that kind of seemed to be the case that that's more or less how Hank Pym picked it up. It's very, very, you know, metatextual, not definitive. But the, the big thing that he ends up picking up here is basically a refugee uh, space station, or at least kind of a space station thrown together from builders from refugee universes. Because what this means is that the main Marvel universe was not the only universe where the builders were defeated. The builders have been defeated by the Ivory Kings. They've been defeated by the Black Priests. They've been defeated by humanity in the main Marvel universe, right? But their goal was universal, or it was the same across the entirety of the multiverse. Travel different multiverses or travel different universes, find those Earths and destroy them. But regardless, the builder fleet is basically in a state of, uh, is tattered, in a, a state of shambles, right? There really isn't a whole lot left. And so because of the fact that, you know, they were decimated by Earth's population, or at least by the main Marvel universe, as well as whatever other builders they had out there who were decimated by whatever other forces were out there, this is kind of like their last shot, right? It's, this is literally the, the Alamo is basically what it is. What's left of their forces mustering here and trying to launch one last ditch effort. And what they're trying to do is take out the Ivory Kings. That's what they're trying to do, track them down and eliminate them. Now, what this does is it led to them eventually discovering uh, basically map makers, knowing that map makers were the key to locating the Ivory Kings, that what they needed was to find one, to crack its code and figure out where the Ivory Kings were at. But that's exactly what they did here, right? Them and a whole bunch of ex Nihilos basically ended up tracking down the map makers and then, you know, basically destroyed pretty much all their number, but located one of them, managed to bring one of them back, and then in turn managed to crack its, its you know, frequency. And where the main Marvel Universe had done that and used that as a way to, or at least Doctor Doom's forces had done that, and used that as a way to track all the places where the map makers had been, the way this worked out is that at the moment, it's sending out a beacon. The signal is constantly, is constantly emanating saying, hey, we're here. And so it basically looks like the Ivory 
Ivory Kings or it looks like whoever is, is essentially trying to like, like literally saying like map makers for those of you guys who are out there, come here, right? It looks to be the case. And because the, uh, because the builders were trying to track down the Ivory Kings, they follow the signal, right? They follow the, they follow its location. Now, what this does is it also leads to the return of Brian Braddock, right? Of Captain Britain. And when he shows up here, it's kind of like, yeah, like hang Pim's onto something. Like what's going on out there is nothing like what we thought it was. Like we thought it was, it was just the multiverse collapsing and Raboom Law was out there. He was the one who caused it. And it was just happening of its own accord. He was a prime mover. And like Ivory Kings have something to do with it. And there's Black Priest, but we didn't fully understand the, the full on scenario here. And when they ask him what it is he's referring to, he basically says that somewhere along the line that the Captain Britain Corps did the same thing as the builders. They located a map maker, they cracked the frequency, they realized what was going on. But what this frequency did is it brought in an absolute massive number of map makers. They basically honed in on the frequency to the Starlight Citadel, which was the headquarters of the Captain Britain Corps and destroyed everybody. Saturnine, who's the head of the Captain Britain Corps, ended up giving Brian Braddock all the information containing the, the, the Starlight Citadel secrets, basically saying, you're the last of us, sent him out, like kicked him out of the Starlight Citadel and everybody else was killed, right? Like every single other Captain Britain there was killed. The whole core was completely and totally wiped out. But as for the builders themselves, once they teleport to that location and they end up uh, arriving at this beacon, what they find out is it was basically a trap, but it was not a trap meant for the builders. It was not a trap that was meant for the Captain Britain Corps. The trap was meant for the cosmic entities. It was meant for the celestials. It was meant for Galactus. It was meant for all those things. And they bought it. They bought into the trap. They took the bait. And when they arrive there, like as soon as the builders get there, they end up, they end up, you know, when, when like Hank Pam hitches a ride with them, they all teleport to that location. The Beyonders are wiping out all the cosmic entities, right? They're obliterating all these celestials, just like wiping out all these celestial hosts. Uh, this great big huge battle is taking place in the space between incursions, right? Like when you have one earth, you have another earth. It takes place in that little space right there. And that's what makes it so wild is because what it does is it actually starts to bend and it starts to sort of wax and wane the very fabric of reality itself to where the two universes aren't really individual uni uh, universes anymore. It all kind of begins to blur together and you can almost see all the universes at the same time. And that's what's going on here is Hank Pym basically sees this massive battle, all these beyonders wiping out all these celestial hosts across the multiverse at the same time. Following that, the, the, the other cosmic entities like Eternity, Infinity, Master Order, Lord Chaos, they jump in. Every last one of them are totally obliterated, right? They're totally, completely and totally wiped out. Not only are they wiped out, they never had a chance in the first place. And so once this version of Eternity is destroyed, which Hickman kind of hits at the idea that it's the multiversal Eternity, right? The version of Eternity that represents the whole multiverse. But once that version is destroyed, then they start looking at Hank Pym. And it's kind of like, oh God, right? Like Hank Pym's going to die. But then he realizes it's not me they're looking at. The living tribunal has been dispatched by the one above all, right? The one above all told the living tribunal, get out there and take care of that. The living tribunal shows up to fight the Beyonders. They kill him too. They, they wipe out the living tribunal at the same time. It's all gone, right? The living tribunal is dead. The only hope, like the living tribunal was their one hope. It was the one thing that probably could have defeated the entirety of the Beyonders. And that's when the questions asked by Hank Pym, it's over. What chance do we have? The, the multiverse given form, the living tribunal, what hope do we have here? Like the Beyonders are just traveling around from one universe to the next, wiping everything out. What chance do we have here? We don't have any, there's no chance. There's no way for us to win. It's over. The multiverse is going to collapse. It's going to die. And there's nothing we can do about it. What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with Avengers and New Avengers by Jonathan Hickman. Yes, we are. We are following up to that enormous cliffhanger that I left you guys on. We're finally getting in to all the answers that you guys have been wanting, all the answers to all your questions. So what we end up doing here is picking up four days ago. And that's kind of the cool thing about this, this little bit of the story. We kind of go four days ago, then three days ago, then two days ago, and then one day ago and so on. But basically this four days ago moment, this happens essentially immediately after Hank Pym tells a story, right? About how like the Beyonders are there, the Beyonders were wiping out all the cosmic entities and kind of says the whole scenario is hopeless. And what they're looking for is evidence of this, right? Like, is it true that the Living Tribunal fell at the hands of the power of the Beyonders, right? Is this true? Because if it is, then it really is just a lost cause, right? And so what they end up doing is accessing the information of Tony Stark. And so accessing the information in his database, if you guys recall, Tony Stark found out the Living Tribunal had died a long time ago. Like we covered that during the events of Original Sin. So 
also Iron Man has known longer than anybody else. I need you guys to keep that in mind because that'll become one of the most important elements of everything going forward. But the idea here is that Beast and, uh, and Amadeus Cho and Hank Pym basically end up locating the corpse of the Living Tribunal. So it is verified the Living Tribunal has been dead. And then of course, you basically end up having the Incredible Hulk and you have Brian Braddock who are dispatched to go investigate, right? To go find the corpse of the Living Tribunal and see what's going on. From there, we, we jump forward one day. We switch to three days ago and we pick up with Nation X. Now, a little bit of an explanation here. We're remastering Avengers and New Avengers, right? So this takes place before Jonathan Hickman's, uh, Jonathan Hickman's X-Men run. So this takes place before everything that's happening in X-Men right now, which is why you don't see Krakoa, you don't see Charles Xavier with his helmet or anything like that. And this all takes place long before that. So the wind the clock back here a little bit, the way this kind of X-Men timeline works in terms of how we got here, and this is going to be kind of a, a really quick rundown. So those of you guys who are familiar with the X-Men with their history up to this point, bear with me for a second. For all you new people, the X-Men timeline kind of worked pretty consistently across the board until we got to the mid to late two, uh, 2000s, uh, in the sense that you had the, the Xavier School for Gifted youngsters out in Westchester, and that's just where they operated, right? They always functioned there. This changed during the events of Dark Reign, and Dark Reign was a story uh, that followed the events of Secret Invasion, right? So if you guys remember Civil War, the story of Civil War from Marvel Comics, Tony Stark became the new director of S.H.I.E.L.D. That led to the events of House of M and then Secret Invasion, and Secret Invasion revealed that the Skrull race had secretly been replacing superheroes. The fact that Tony Stark didn't know that was reason for him to be terminated as the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. He was replaced with Norman Osborn. Now, there's a few other reasons behind the scenes why that happened, but the overall just is that Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin, replaced Tony Stark, and then he basically turned S.H.I.E.L.D. into like this organization where he tried to use it to conquer the world. During that time, the X-Men got while the getting was good, and so they basically left Westchester, they left New York, and they went off the coast of San Francisco uh, to a place called Utopia. It was a, a kind of island that was granted to them by the mayor of San Francisco, and it was their own personal residence, right? So they took up residence in Utopia, and they'd always been there, right? Now, this leads into two things. It leads into Avengers versus X-Men, and it leads into an event called Schism. Avengers vs. X-Men was, as most of you guys know, the story where Cyclops had received a portion of the Phoenix Force and then killed Charles Xavier. Schism is a story that we have covered, you'll find that down in the description, but this was a story where basically Cyclops and Wolverine ended up splitting, right? So basically, you had Wolverine who took a portion of the mutants who were at Utopia and left and reopened the school in Westchester, and so you had two X-Men schools going on at that point in time. Nation X is basically what Utopia was called, that's more or less what this is, right? Now this goes into basically Robert DaCosta and, uh, and and Sam Guthrie Cannonball basically approaching Cyclops and saying, hey man, so like it's time for us to start getting involved. And Cyclops' response is, yeah, I mean, here at the end of days, it's time for us to get involved in this whole thing, right? The days of the X-Men sitting idly by and not really getting involved, those are over. Because what Cyclops says is what's going on out there is much bigger than, than like the Avengers or the Fantastic Four. Like we're looking at the end of times. And if we are looking at the end of times, then the name of the game is not saving what we have. The name of the game is resurrection. And what better for force out there embodies resurrection than the phoenix. And that's when we basically end up learning that Cyclops has a phoenix egg. The phoenix force will be reborn, and Cyclops intends to take possession of the phoenix force in its entirety. Now from here, we switch to two days ago, and we have this kind of discussion. There was a point where Valeria had slipped Reed Richards a note through Susan Storm that said, you can't win, time to find a way to not lose. And that's what Reed Richards had basically figured out. What Reed Richards has done here is basically create a raft, right? And he gives a credit, he's talking to Black Panther, he gives a credit to to, to Valeria and says like, basically she's the one that kind of gave me the idea for this. But that's when Valeria chimes in and says, yes, you've answered one question, but as with so many things, when one question's answered, another question gets asked. And so now the question you have to ask yourself is now that you have a means to escape the world, who gets to go? It's a limited capacity. Only so many people get to go. That's one of the reasons why Reed Richards is really one of the only people who could make this choice. If it were left to Black Panther, he'd probably choose his own people. But Reed is the one who makes the choice where it really kind of comes to the decision. And he says, what we need here are individuals who are multidisciplined. What's better to have on a life raft? A person who's skilled in, in you know, multiple forms of medicine as well as building things or a person who's only good at building things? An engineer or a person who's an engineer and a doctor? What's the best scenario to have there? And the response is a multifaceted person, right? A multidisciplined candidate. They should take priority over highly specialized ones. Now notice, they're not talking about average Joes here, right? They're not talking about regular individuals. In reality, there's no room for that. There's no room to scoop up as many people from New York as you can, they're gone. There's nothing you can do for them, right? They're just gonna die and that's just the way it is. And it sucks to be them. That's just how it goes sometimes. And so the only real way is to kind of focus on saving as many multidisciplined people as you can, those individuals who can help rebuild, and then later see if you can't find a way to bring different people back. And so that's when we get into the, to the real kind of kicker in this little bit of the video is we switch over to one day ago and you've got Sam Guthrie, you 
you've got Super Guardian. If you guys remember her, like in the early days of Hickman's run, she was the first human to ever, ever be brought into the Shi'ar Imperial Guard. And then of course, you've got Robert DaCosta, right? And they're all just kind of talking to each other, spend, spending time together and so on. And then Super Guardian is basically called away. And she's she's basically called by uh, by Gladiator, right? Now remember, Gladiator is the leader of the Shi'ar Empire, but at one point, he was the person who was the leader of the Imperial Guard. And the idea behind this is that he immediately kind of prefaces what it is that he's getting ready to say by telling her, I once served as the leader of the Imperial Guard, right? I led the forces of the Shi'ar Empire against multiple threats, both foreign and domestic. And I understand the sacrifice that we as the, as the Imperial Guard make in the name of our duty. But the reality is that being part of the Imperial Guard means you serve the Imperial Guard first, and then you serve whoever your loyalties are to second. And that's when he says, I'm recalling you, or I'm bringing you back into service of the Shi'ar Empire. Bring your family, you know, bring whoever it is that you need. You're reporting here. And her immediate response is like, no, I mean, I've, I've, I need like, I need time to be able to leave. And he's like, no, like you've got minutes, you know? And it's, and it's kind of like, okay, but like, it's a long distance to get there. Like I have to get them ready. And his response is, we're not nearly as far away from you as you think we are. Switch over to the outer solar system. So basically they're on the edge of the solar system of, of, of the Sol system. So they're out by like Pluto basically. And you end up having Gladiator talking to Oracle. Now, Oracle is both a kind of telepath of sorts, or really just a straight telepath for the Shi'ar Empire, but she's also one of the closest confidants of, of Gladiator, alongside Mentor, who's his other confidant, right? So they're basically his closest advisors. And Oracle's really kind of taking a reasonable approach here and saying, look, like, humanity has saved us, right? Humanity saved us during the events of Infinity, right? They, they're the ones who pulled out all the stops. Thor of Earth is the one who basically showed that we could destroy a builder. And because of Captain America's and you know his, his quick thinking and his knowledge in battle strategy, we came out on top. We're honor bound to them. We're honor bound to humanity. We can't just blow up their world. This is a sneak attack is what this is. Like literally we're mustering forces. We're sneaking to their planet and then we're going to annihilate it. We can't do that to them. And the response of Gladiator is that's a fair argument to make. And so the, he in turn turns to Mentor, right? And he tells Mentor, Oracle is besieging the honor of the Shi'ar Empire. And this is not something that falls on deaf ears. I am an honorable man and I understand the value of honor. Present your case to me and I will make my decision accordingly. And in turn, Mentor basically says, the first thing that needs to be said here is the reason why we're approaching Earth at, at the 11th hour is because I screwed up. I should have seen the signs before. And had I seen the signs before, we could have been a help in evacuation and helping them leave their world or possibly even combining our technology for the purpose of finding a solution to all this. Such as it is, I didn't see the signs until it was too late. And the only option we have now is to destroy their world. That's the only option we have. If we destroy Earth, we save the universe. And the response of Gladiator, you know, when, when you end up having Oracle saying this kind of blind nobility and all that kind of stuff, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't serve any real purpose. Gladiator, you're an honorable man. You have to be honor bound here. And Gladiator makes the tough choice here, right? Heavy is the head that wears the crown. His response is, yes, it is an honorable thing to spare Earth. It's an honorable thing to warn the superheroes who are there. We're coming. Get off your world as fast as you can. We're going to destroy it. But at the end of the day, I am not the leader of the Imperial Guard. I am not the leader of a fighting force. My loyalty is to the Empire, and my job is to do whatever I need to do to spare the Empire. And if the continued survival of Earth means a continued threat to the universe, and by extension, a continued threat to my people, then I will destroy the Earth if I have to. And that's where we are now. You basically end up having revealed that what's happened here is, is Gladiator has called together the entire Armada, right? All the fighting forces of the Kree, the Shi'ar, the Scrolls, the Badoon, the Brood. Basically, the universe has sided against Earth. But do not fret, Rob Kaur. Do not fret, Rob Kaur. I know right now you guys are probably looking down to see how much time we have left in this video. <laughs> With that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. No, I'm not going to do that to you guys. <laughs> do not fret, uh, because there is a saving grace. This saving grace comes in the form of a small little ship, which is out there with the rest of the big ships. And they're just kind of coasting along and they're trying to find some way to hack into the Imperial battle net that's being shared by all these different races. This group, of course, is none other than the Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> yes, the saving grace of humanity comes in a ragtag group of people who were led by what may very well be one of the most inept people in the history of the universe. So uh, you basically end up having Rocket Raccoon who like hacks into the, into the the battle net and comes to the realization this is really just a sneak attack right because the reason they're here was to ask the question like why are all the various forces coming together right like why are all these empires binding together like surely there's some major threat out there what in the heck could this threat possibly be and we are the guardians of the galaxy right our job is to protect the galaxy as best we can and so that's when they basically realize this entire armada has assembled to destroy the world like that's nuts and when you when you have like gamora and you've got a peter quill and they're like okay well we kind of have to warn the 
Earth, the response of Rocket Raccoon is, why would we do that? Why would we warn the Earth? Like, the Earth is a pain. Let them die, right? He's like, the only people, like, you know what people do, like, the kind of people who go running towards, uh, you know, a, a major conflict like this, who, who would, like, go to Earth and warn the superheroes there? Idiots are the kind of people who would do that. Switch forward, and you've got Rocket Raccoon talking to all these various superheroes on Earth, right? You got Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four, you've got Captain America, you basically have, like, you know, the Illuminati, the Avengers, and the New Avengers all assembled together. And, and their whole response is, no, we're not going to evacuate our world. We're going to try to find a way to stay, and we're going to go down with the ship if we can. And it's like, you guys are total idiots, right? Like, you guys are total idiots for doing that. Now, at this point, we switch over to the nature of Raboom Alal. Yes, we finally get the identity of Raboom Alal, the person who is the origin of the incursions, the reason why all this is happening in the first place. So, we end up switching to this alternate Earth, right? And we have the Black Priests of Doctor Strange that are led by Stephen Strange, who are now observing what is basically this doorway. Now, if you guys recall, in the early days of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, we talked about the origin of Black Swan, and we talked about the doors to the library, the library of worlds. And one of the things that Hickman explained here is that what you had is you had the Black Swans who were part of kind of a, like, a, a, they were basically a religious cult that served Raboom Alal, and that Raboom Alal resided inside the library of worlds, essentially, and that this library of worlds was originally a gift from the Ivory Kings, right? It was originally there, it was originally created by the Beyonders, and somewhere along the line, it was co-opted by Raboom Alal, right? He basically took it over and took it for himself, and then all the Black Swans are now there. And the idea is that there's different doorways to access this uh, this this library. They exist on different worlds. The problem that, that Doctor Strange and the, the Black Priest have is that up to this point, all the worlds they'd cataloged that had doorways to the Library of Worlds had all been destroyed in the incursions. And so they finally found one, right? They finally found one that had not been destroyed. But the issue is that the incursion is getting ready to happen here, right? This incursion is going to be happening within, you know, what? well, it's kind of referred to as like less than one unit of standard celestial time. Who knows what that means, right? We'll just say like an hour, right? And so because of that, it's kind of like, okay, then like we kind of have to get in here, right? We have to basically get to this doorway and then access the library. And so what it does is it leads to all the forces of the Black Priest descending onto these three Black Swans and attacking. The issue with this is that one of the Black Swans manages to get to the doorway and then shuts it while the rest are destroyed. And so what happens, of course, because they have a key, they're able to access the door after destroying the last of the Black Swans and then they enter. And so, of course, Doctor Strange uses his magic to basically find where it is this Black Swan had ran to in order to essentially follow the trail. And we end up going through like these, these really interesting places, right? I mean, this library is not a library in the traditional sense. It's a library in so far as it's a place that holds vast amounts of knowledge, but the form in which this knowledge takes shifts from one room to the next. And so in one room, you have like this wall of individuals who have all housed over the course of their lives or attained some wildly interesting forms of knowledge, right? Like magical artifacts or different kinds of spells or different things like that. And so one of these people, I don't know if you guys noticed, but one of these guys is Thanos. It's the face of Thanos, right? Which is probably just like an alternate reality where Thanos became like the Sorcerer Supreme or something along those lines. We're not really given any information, but you also have kind of like these glowing orbs that are basically repositories of information that are composed entirely of light. And that's kind of how this is, but eventually they get to a point whereby as soon as they try to speak, nothing happens. And the way this works is this is what's called a quiet room, right? This is basically a room where there are no words. And this is what's kind of crazy here because this is the room where the Black Swans launch their attack against the Black Priest. Because remember, the Black Priests have to use words in order to pull off their spells. And what is a Black Priest who can't speak? It's a powerless individual. And so because of that, the attack is launched by all the Black Swans and they immediately start wiping out all the Black Priests. But despite the Black Priest limitations, remember, Stephen Strange is the Sorcerer Supreme. And while he knows all the different spells of the Black Priest, Stephen Strange doesn't need to speak to cast his spells. And so because of that, the issue of Stephen Strange here isn't so much his inability to cast a spell, it's the fact that he's dealing with so many Black Swans who have such incredible power at their disposal. And so what this leads to is Stephen Strange casting these massive spells, doing all kinds of, of wildly, you know, capable abilities. But the issue with this is that ultimately it ends up seeing the fall of Stephen Strange, right? See Stephen Strange completely overpowered by all these black swans. The result is that he's subdued and taking him to the center of the library, right? To the center of the library of worlds and basically say like, we're going to present you with a, with Raboom Alal. And when they say like, you know, they basically tell him like, this is the furthest we can go. They drop him off and they leave. The explanation that's given here is that there are no black swans who know who Raboom Alal looks like. They don't know what he looks like. And the idea is that any, any black swan who looks upon Raboom Alal will basically go blind, right? And the only individuals that serve in his direct, you know, direct uh, vicinity are two old blind women, right? That's that's the only thing. Like, literally, they gouged their eyes out so they could never actually look upon who Raboom Alal is. And so the reality is that whoever this guy is, he wants to keep his identity
identity secret. And there's good reason for that. And this comes when he finally reveals himself. When Stephen Strange is standing before this pantheon and the doorway opens and the old blind woman can't see him, smoke fills the room and he simply says enter and the response of Boomalal is in all the worlds in all the universes I would never have expected to see you despite the fact that the only reason Stephen Strange is alive is because he caught the interest of Raboomalal that's the only reason why he wasn't killed by the Black Swans is because he caught the interest of Raboomalal and he instructed the Black Swans to bring him here as opposed to just killing him where he stood in the quiet room and Raboomalal finally reveals his identity and it's Doctor Doom now this is the question that has to be asked. This is the question that you guys are undoubtedly going to ask because this is this is literally Dr. Strand, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Doom, who was working with the Molecule Man. The Molecule Man, Owen Reese, is there. And the, the response to Dr. Dr. Strange is, what in the heck is going? Like, how are you here, right? Like, you're Raboom Allah? And the response to Dr. Doom is, yes, right? I've built a religion and it has stoked a grand fire within me. I'm the one who created the Black Swans. Now, here's the question that we kind of have to ask here. If Dr. Doom, is the person who started the incursions, then why is it that Dr. Doom was looking for the source of the incursions? How does this work? Well, he knows he's the one that created the incursions. What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are near the end. We have one more video left until we're completely and totally done with Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. What a ride it's been. It's been pretty wild, hasn't it? Right, it's been pretty crazy, hasn't it? But this is when we finally get to the point where we talk about the origin of the incursions, how it all started, why it's all happening, the whole nine yards. So uh, what we end up doing here is we pick up two weeks before, like two weeks ago, and you've basically got a gathering of the Illuminati. You've got Black Panther, you've got Reed Richards, you've got Brian Braddock, Captain Britain, you've got the Incredible Hulk, you've got uh, Beast, and you have Black Bolt of the Inhumans. And all of them have assembled around the cage containing Tony Stark right? Superior Iron Man. And what they're basically saying here is that there's been no small debate. They're trying to figure out what to do with Iron Man because this meeting takes place right before Captain America and his forces meet up with the Illuminati to find out what they're going to do about the incursions, right? That event, that video that we covered previously. What we end up getting here is this, this kind of thing where the idea of Tony Stark being there is kind of important because it is Tony Stark and he's so wildly intelligent and capable. The problem with this is the history between Tony Stark and Captain America, right? Remember that what, what kind of happened here is you had the events of, of the incursions kickstarting, right? So we had Iron Man trying to distract Captain America with the Avengers machine, like they had wiped his mind at the beginning of the whole thing, like the original Civil War event. It was it's all these scenarios that have taken place over the years where this kind of distrust has grown between Captain America and Tony Stark, leading up to the point where Captain America just sort of sees him as like almost his mortal enemy. And so if they allow Tony Stark to be there, this uneasy truce between the Illuminati and the forces of Captain America could completely come to an end. And so the best thing to do is to get him out of there, right? To just remove him from there. Not only that, Iron Man wants to die for something, right? He doesn't want to like die in a cage. And that's what's so crazy is because despite all of this, Iron Man still has an ace up his sleeve. And so ultimately they end up letting him leave, right? They end up letting him get out. Here's the irony about all this too. The true sin of Tony Stark is lost on everyone here, right? The worst thing Iron Man has ever done is lost on everybody here. None of them really know the worst thing that he's done so far, right? It just, seems bad. And so ultimately the cage is destroyed and Iron Man is just kind of let loose, right? He's just basically told, leave, do not come back here, right? Like go and do your old thing, you know, do, do whatever it is that you want to do, right? Like die well, it's the last day for it, but we don't ever want to see you again, right? He's officially been cast out of the Illuminati. Now at this point, we switched to two hours ago, right? So we're kind of back in the, in the current moment, but two hours beforehand, and we have Gladiator who basically speaks to the entire inhabitants of Earth, right? Just kind of shows up with like a hologram, different things like that, and basically says, you know, most of you here on this world will We'll never truly know the depths that your superheroes have gone to to save your world. You just don't know because they don't tell you, right? But recently we fought in a war against the builders, this multiversal race that was traveling from one universe to the next and wiping out the different earths that they came across. And because of the help of your earth's superheroes, we managed to stop them and we managed to wipe out most of the builder fleet. What was left escaped with their lives. They fled with their lives, right? We saw that when we ended up getting the tale of them, of, of, uh, of Hank Pym, that what was left of the builder fleet all consolidated in a singular location and then try to track down the map makers and we saw what happened to them, right? Basically, the builders have all pretty much been wiped out now by the either by humanity or by the map makers sent by the by the Ivory Kings, by the by the Beyonders. And so because of this, what you end up getting is basically like Gladiator saying it doesn't stop there, right? It doesn't just stop at our war, you know, at the war with the builders. Your Earth's heroes have saved us during the events of like maximum security. They they saved us during like the events of the original secret wars and 
the follow-up in Secret Wars 2 when the Beyonder came to your world. They saved us on a multitude of occasions. Operation Galactic Storm. All these things. Your Earth superheroes have saved the world. The Creed Scroll War. It's happened over and over and over again. And so it's with a heavy heart that I tell you now, despite all the things that your heroes have done and all the greatness that humanity has bestowed upon the universe in the times in which it saved us, your Earth is the reason why the universe is going to end. And so in order to preserve the universe, we're going to destroy your world. You've got two hours. And it's just like, damn, son. Like you, hey, hey, humanity, you got two hours to get your affairs in order. Like if you want to escape the world, now's the time to do it. Uh, good luck. Peace. Like it's basically it. <laughs> You got two hours to get while the getting's good. And that's when the Earth superheroes are like, okay, but notice this, they don't panic, especially Captain America. And this is the benefit. This is the biggest benefit of Steve Rogers. In the grand scheme of things, Steve Rogers ain't that great, right? He can just run really fast and punch really hard. Rahu. But when it comes down to like battle scenarios, he is the guy that you want in your corner because he keeps a level head, right? He keeps his head cool. Wind back to uh, the initial meeting that happened between Captain America's forces and the Illuminati, right? There's a point where Captain America is talking to Reed Richards. And one of the things that Reed says is that the intelligence difference between himself and Tony Stark is, is fractional. But the big difference between Tony Stark's intelligence and Reed Richards' intelligence is that Reed is smart, but he's usually single-minded, right? He focuses on one particular thing. The only time when he ever really focused on a grand number of things was during Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four run, when he was trying to solve the problem of everything. But usually whenever Reed is working on, or, you know, using his intelligence, it's to solve a particular problem. When that problem is solved, he moves on to the next one. Tony Stark is not that way. Tony Stark is the greatest multitasker in the entirety of the Marvel Universe. It's basically like if there were 15 or 20 Reed Richards all working on different things at the same time. That's what makes Tony Stark so intelligent. That's what makes him so capable. He can focus on multiple Earth-saving strategies at the same time, right? He's just always looking into the future, and he's always thinking what comes next, right? I'm in this scenario. I'm not thinking about the scenario in the moment. I'm thinking about what it's going to look like in five years or 10 years or something like that. That, like, like we mentioned in the previous video, is one of the most important things that you need to remember, that you absolutely have to remember. It's one of the most important things, right? This ability of Tony Stark to look to the future and to see what shape things are going to look like, to see what real chance of success they have, that's going to be the biggest sin of Tony Stark. The big, like the worst thing he ever did. That's what all this is going to be. It's all going to lead to that particular point. It's it's amazing. Like when it's revealed, it's amazing, right? It's absolutely amazing. But uh, Reed Richards basically gives Captain America this device created by Tony Stark, right? Created by Iron Man. And it's just one of the many things that he was working on is for him, it was almost like a little side project. This device basically, you know, it controls an object hidden within Jupiter. And this object within Jupiter is one of the planet killers of the builders from the builder war during infinity. Do you, I don't know if you guys recall that, but it was one of the vessels, one of the, the devices that the, the builders used to wipe out an entire world. And it's more than enough to destroy an armada. And this is one of the things that Tony Stark was working on in the, in the, with the whole builder war and everything going on while Tony Stark wasn't necessarily there. He understood the power of the builder and said, hey, we might need this at some point, right? We might need to use this. And so we basically constructed a device that would allow them to remotely control that planet killing ship. It's just it's just one of these things, just one of the little things that Tony Stark had up his sleeve. And the other part of that is, of course, we end up learning that uh, that Izzy, that, that, you know, Super Guardian didn't join the Shi'ar Guard, right? She didn't join uh, Gladiator. When he basically told her, like, you need to evacuate because we're going to wipe out the world, her response was, no, I can't do this. Like, I'm, I cannot do this. Like, I cannot turn my back on my people. I cannot side against humanity humanity, right? Everybody that I know is here. If you ask me to do anything else, I will, but I cannot do that one thing, right? And so ultimately she sides against the Imperial Guard. She stays alongside humanity. The other part of this is that at some point in the early days of the incursions, that what, what advanced idea mechanics had been working on was a series of satellites. And these satellites combined with Robert DaCosta's ability to basically kind of keep them going under the finances that he was offering advanced idea mechanics. The idea was to have these satellites basically harness the thermal energy of the earth. And that when that was done, they could literally fire off that thermal energy. So literally they could just use the heat of the earth as a weapon and fire it off. And that's exactly what happens. The issue with this is twofold. The first is that because of the sheer amount of energy this thing is able to enter, able to use, as soon as it's charged, they have to fire it right off the bat. Because if they don't, the Shi'ar and the, and the various armadas who are here, they're going to realize how powerful this energy signature is and they're going to move out of the way or they're going to be prepared for it, right? And so it's like, as soon as this is charged up, we have to fire, right? So it's like pulling a gun, right? As soon as you pull it, you have to shoot. Otherwise, 
otherwise, you know, they're going to be able to react accordingly. And so with that in mind, as soon as this thing powers up, it fires off and annihilates a massive portion of the armada. And, and Gladiator and them, they don't even know what happened, right? They're like, what in the, like, what was that? Like, what, what just happened, man? And it's like, like, we didn't know they had, like, we didn't know Earth had that kind of technology. We didn't know they had the ability to utilize the entirety of a planet's energy and fire it off at people. And, and one of the things Gladiator says is like, how many times are we really going to underestimate humans? And it makes sense, right? Because some of the most powerful beings in the entirety of the universe hail from humanity, right? The Marquis of Death, the Molecule Man Owen Reese, Franklin Richards, like Matthew Malloy, you know, Mad Jim Jaspers, like all these super powerful beings are human, right? Even Protege from the alternate reality is a human. It's, it's just how powerful these guys are. Well, I guess he was really more engineered, but nonetheless, you know, Protege is kind of a special example, but it's kind of like, okay, so the response of Gladiator is then ready our vessels, you know, and prepare for another attack, right? As soon as that happens, you immediately have the, uh, the planet killer ship that arrives on the scene. And so from one side, literally from the back of the armada, you've got the planet killing ship on the, from earth itself, you've got this massive energy source getting ready to fire off. And it's like the entire armada is cornered. There's really nowhere for them to go. And it's like, holy cow, earthlings have cornered an entire armada composed of, of some of the oldest races in the entirety of the universe. And Captain America's like open fire. And they literally just start attacking. Like this, like this planet killer just starts annihilating uh, all these different races, right? Like starts annihilating the, the entirety of the armada. The issue with this, right? The, the, the wrench in the works comes into play when Robert DaCosta goes to fire up the weapon again. And he's told by one of his science advisors, do not do that. Like if you fire this up and you keep doing that, like we're, you're going to approach a critical threshold and like, we're going to lose this facility. And DaCosta is like, why would we stop, man? Like, why would we stop doing this? Like we've got him on the run. He goes to fire it off again and destroys the facility, right? Their connection to the satellites are lost. The planetary weapon is gone. The Shi'ar immediately pick up on this and they're like, okay, the planetary weapon's gone. Alert the Kree, the scrolls, the Badoon alert them all. Let them know that Earth has no more defenses, right? Earth's, Earth's defense is down now. And his response is unlike send forth the annihilation wave, right? The forces of annihilus, which in turn will swarm the planet killer, uh, the planet killing ship, which is exactly what they do. They swarm the whole thing and destroy it, right? So now Earth has no real defense left. There's seemingly no real defense here, but Earth still kind of has, has its ace up its sleeve. And it comes in the form of the Illuminati. If you guys remember the video that we did before, where you had the rogue planet that came out of nowhere, that was basically sent there from Franklin Richards and the, the Avengers world in the future, it was sent. When, when Franklin Richards said it's being sent from the future to that point in time because the Earth would need it, this is the reason why. That when the, the planet was coming in, when it was when it was heading on a collision course and it was going to crash on the Earth, the only way to save the planet was to phase it, right? Was to basically create a device that would allow the, the Earth and the planet to kind of operate in the same space at the same time. And it moved the planet out of phase. So it was basically like a hologram, more or less. And so what this did is because it made that red rogue Earth intangible, it allowed the to occupy the same space. What the Illuminati do is they switch. They make the, the Earth itself intangible and they make the actual world tangible. And so essentially it, it provides a kind of layer of protection. They would have to destroy that red Earth in order to get to Earth, or I guess destroy that red world, that rogue world, in order to get to Earth. And it's not designed to be like a finality. It's a, it's a stopgap measure. And the reason why it's a stopgap measure is because the last great thing Tony Stark does, right? The great thing that Tony Stark does is he basically chimes into Reed Richards, right? This kind of jumps back a little bit, but he chimes into Reed Richards. And it's one of these things where they have a conversation and Tony says, like, in reality, like a gravity well is just a massive reactor, right? Like, that's really all the, the sun is. It's just a massive reactor, right? It's essentially an atomic bomb in space. What if we could harness that energy and what if we could use the sun as a weapon? Remember, Tony Stark made that Dyson sphere. Remember, that was one of the things that Tony Stark was working on in the early days of the incursions. This is why Jonathan Hickman writing is so good because everything becomes important at the end of the whole run. See, you guys understand why I love Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and new Avengers so much because all these things that seemed innocuous and unimportant and irrelevant at the beginning of the story and you find yourself asking what does this have to do with anything all becomes important at the end and that's the whole thing right like Iron Man is basically intending to to fire up the Dyson sphere and use the sun as a weapon and it's one of these things where like as soon as as Iron Man heard the armada right the the the, the spacefaring armada of the Kree and the scrolls and the Shi'ar and the Badoon and the the brood and all those guys were heading towards Earth, he immediately made a beeline for, for Saul's anvil. And it's one of these things where he kind of makes this quote and saying, I am Icarus. And the response of, of Tony Stark is, you do know the point of that story was that he flew too close to the sun and lost his wings. And Iron Man gives the best response ever. And he says, you know who thinks that way, Reed? And Reed says, who? And he says, people who have never flown. Switch over to Dr. Doom, right? See, so this, 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 this. 
Man, let me tell y'all something, man. This is, this is, this is, man, let me tell you something. It's amazing, right? It's just, it's such an amazing story. Okay, pick up with Dr. Doom and the Molecule Man, Owen Reese. The last, before we, we picked up with the idea that Dr. Doom was the Raboomalol, the last time we saw them is they had just kind of disappeared together and we didn't really know where they went to. What they end up doing here is basically, you know, kind of using a device and traveling throughout time and space. They go back 25 years and to an alternate reality. And the whole thing is that Molecule Man wants to show Dr. Doom something, right? He wants to help him understand what it is that needs to happen here. What he shows him is the origin of this of Molecule Man in an alternate reality. And you've got Owen Reese in this alternate universe basically working on a device. We can assume it's Acme Atomic Corporation. We don't really know. That's where the main Marvel Universe Owen Reese was working at when he got his powers. But this alternate reality version of Owen is working on a device, right? He's working on this thing. The device ends up, you know, kind of activating accidentally and blasts him with a boatload of energy. And he basically just kind of emerges with all this godlike power. He's a walking, talking cosmic cube. The exact same origin as the main Marvel Universe Owen Reese. And, and, and and the main Marvel Universe Owen Reese walks up to his alternate, you know, alternate reality counterpart and just kind of starts talking to him and says, like, do you remember, you know, that that when we were younger, that there was, you know, that it was spring and we were chasing a friend, right? We were chasing them through the woods. There was this beautiful white flower that was growing beside a large oak tree that had caught our attention. We stopped running so we could lean down and smell it. They both lived this, this whole experience. And so the Molecule Man, in turn, kills this alternate reality counterpart, right? He kills that version of himself and, and, and literally is kind of like, this is what we have to do now, right? It obliterates the entirety of his universe. It wipes out the entirety of that universe in the process, right? The destruction of that molecule man basically kills everything. And that's what's kind of cool is because Dr. Doom still doesn't quite understand what's going on. He's like, I don't understand this, right? You know, all molecule man is like, this is what you have to do. Like that memory of me is now gone. That memory that I had of, of that moment, we were running around and we were in the, in the forest and, and going after that white or, you know, stopping for that white flower. That memory is now gone. That part of me is now dead. That's just the way that it is. And he says, this is what you must now do, Dr. Doom. And Dr. Doom's like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Like, what, what does this mean? You know, and he's like, this is how, this, this is how people end up becoming, you know, calling you the great destroyer. And he hands him the knife and he's like, I don't understand exactly what you're referring to. So what he does, what Molecule Man does is he takes Dr. Doom to the library of worlds and says, there was a time in the Marvel multiverse, there was a time here when the Beyonders from the Beyondverse were observing our multiverse, right? And they used the library of worlds to do it. They were like scientists who were literally watching our multiverse like a Petri dish, wanted to see how it it worked. They wanted to understand all this kind of stuff. You know, before they got to where they are now, before they constructed this grand plan, they were trying to understand us. And he says, the library of worlds is where they did it, right? It is from this place that you will operate. And it's from this place that you will do everything in your power to stop the beyonders. You have to understand, I am not a human in the traditional sense. I am not a being in a normal sense. You know, I'm basically a bomb of the, of the beyonders. And this is where we start to get this kind of full on explanation of how all this works and what all's coming together. Together. What the Molecule Man says is that in all the different alternate realities that are out there, there are alternate versions of Dr. Doom. Now, notice this. He says that that, there, that, he, that Dr. Doom is somewhat unique in the sense that there are less of him than there should be. That's a direct reference to Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four. If you guys remember, if you either read that story or you saw our coverage on that story, that one of the things that was happening is that with the Council of Reed Richards, all these reads from alternate realities, they were going to different universes, they were taking different versions of Dr. Doom, and they were lobotomizing him, and they were sticking him down in the bottom of the Citadel. That's why Owen Reese says that Dr. Doom's unique in the sense that there's not one version of him in every reality, because while there was at one point, those different alternate reality versions were taken and they were lobotomized. But unlike, you know, different universes where, you know, where, where Dr. Doom might be a poet or he might be a good man or something like that, every version of Owen Reese across the universe or across the multiverse is the exact same. His origin is the exact same. The life he lived is the exact same. There is no differentiation. It's, it's exactly the same. So imagine if the life you lived up to this point where you're watching this video that this version of yourself was the exact same across the multiverse and that's the nature of owen reese and that's why he says i am the bomb of the beyonders the grand scheme that these guys have right where they use the library of worlds and they were observing the multiverse they were curious how life in the multiverse works the next step was well let's destroy it all like let's just blow it all up and let's just see what happens right but if we're gonna blow up every single universe how do we amass enough energy to pull that off okay so here's what we're going to do in every single universe that's out there we we are going to engineer a, a, a scenario, right? We're going to create a life source. And this life source, that progress is going to happen the, happen the same way across every single universe. So in every single
Marvel Universe, Owen Reese is born into the world and, and he basically grows up with that same life until he becomes an adult. He gets a job at some kind of technological institution. That might be the only thing that changes, but he gets some job at some kind of technological institution. He works on a, on a, on a kind of system that can basically create cosmic cubes. He ends up creating one, but ultimately there's no containment device for that cube. And so basically he absorbs a portion of the Beyonder's power. The other portion gravitates out into that universe. It becomes the Beyonder from the original Secret Wars. So every reality has its own version of the original Secret Wars from 1984. That child version of the Beyonder is ultimately defeated. And then eventually uh, Molecule Man and, and that Beyonder are coalesced into a singular entity. And then he basically goes forward with the full brunt of the power of the Beyonders basically. You know, and then he kind of lives his life going forward from there. It's always the same. And so the idea was we created him, right? The Beyonders created the Molecule Man. He's imbued with all that power. And their goal is to detonate, to literally blow up every single Molecule Man at the same time. That's the idea. That's the whole goal. It's like putting a stick of dynamite in every room at your house and then detonating them all at the same time. You blow your house to smithereens. That's what the Beyonders want to do. And what the Molecule Man tells Dr. Doom is this will wipe out the entirety of the multiverse. You have to stop them. And the only way to stop them is to deactivate the bomb. But because of the fact that every version of me, because we've, we've gone to this point now where every version of me comes into existence, the only real option you have is you can basically try to stop me. You can, you can go back further in time if you want to, but ultimately like I will end up coming to existence. There's no way to stop that. So the only way to really stop the bomb is to kill me as soon as my powers activate, right? As soon as, as soon as I basically gain my abilities or once I've gained my abilities to kill me, right? That's the only way to do it. And you have to travel from every universe to the next. And where Dr. Doom says, why is this simply my task? Why aren't you going to come with me? The molecule man says, because basically all these versions of myself, we share a singular mind. We all have the same memories with each version of myself that you destroy. I will lose a portion of myself in the process, right? So it's like if you traveled around the multiverse and killed all your multiversal counterparts or, or all your multiversal counterparts were killed, each time you would lose a little less intelligence, right? You would lose a little bit of yourself. Now, the, the bit of yourself you would lose is microscopic, but the more versions of yourself that are destroyed, the more of yourself you will lose, right? So where 0.0000001% of yourself will be lost with the first version of you that dies, by the time you get to destroying 100,000 versions of yourself, you've lost percentages, like literally whole percentages of your brain, right? You've lost percentages of your mind. You would steadily go insane and it would get to the point where you would just be kind of a, a vegetable more or less right so that's why molecule man says i mean i can go with you on this but understand that by the time you get to the to a point where you've destroyed enough universes i'm gonna be useless here and that's where dr doom kind of asked the question what's the point of all this right like why travel from one universe to the next and destroy you and he says because if you do that that yes it'll destroy the universe like yes you will basically be killing me and by virtue of doing that the energy that i let off will destroy entire universes but you're 25 years into the past right now which means you have 25 years until we get to the point where Doctor Strange meets you in the in the Library of Worlds. And so you have 25 years to kill as many of me as you can across the entirety of the multiverse. The hope of this is that it'll basically stop the Beyonder's ability to detonate all of me at one time. That instead, you'll be able to save something. You'll be able to save some measure of the multiverse. That's the origin of the incursions. The event that we talked about in the very beginning of Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, an event happened that led to the destruction of that world and it started a cascading effect that led to the universes crashing into each other that was dr doom killing molecule man in an alternate reality it wiped out that universe it created an explosive blast and pushes the universes next to it into the ones next to those universes and so the idea here is that dr doom is basically racing through time he's racing through time and racing through alternate realities trying to kill as many molecule men as he possibly can whilst trying to stabilize all those things at the same time now the reality of this is that the incursions was an unintended consequence of what Dr. Doom did, but it was a necessary result. It had to happen. There was no way to stop it, right? We knew the incursions were going to happen and Dr. Doom knew they would, but the idea was to travel through as many univer uh, universes as he could and kill as many molecule men as he possibly could to save at least something. Because by the time they got to the point where the incursions were taking place, the idea was they could try to stabilize things, that, that they could kind of keep the incursions from happening or slow them down or something along those lines and ultimately save the multiverse in the process, right? And by whatever manner and whatever means, because the multiverse exists by way of just decisions that are being made, right? So Dr. You know, Dr. Strange decides not to become the Sorcerer Supreme, you know, and instead to become somebody else, that's an alternate reality that the multiverse will eventually come
come back, right? Just by virtue of people's decision-making processes, if a, if a possibility exists, there exists a universe for it. And so it'll come back in no time at all. And so on his journey, what he ends up coming across, or at least when he, when he wipes out a molecule man, he ends up coming across a young girl who escaped a Sentinel camp, right? So this looks like a universe where the Sentinels had taken over the world, uh, much like we saw in like Days of Future Past. And because of what he did, you know, she kind of asks, why did you do that? And he says, because the death of the molecule man will spare universes, right? It'll, it'll basically spare all of reality. Now notice Dr. Doom has kind of hidden his image from this girl. She doesn't really know what he looks like. Instead, he's just kind of a bright light. So nobody really knows what his face is and nobody can really understand what he's doing because they don't know that it's Dr. Doom doing it. And so what he ends up realizing is that he needs to create a religion that because of the fact that a few, what is it? When, when, when Owen Reese is talking to him and says that like, you know, you've only killed a few thousand of me over the course of the last five years, you're going to have to kill billions and billions of me to really affect the plans of the Beyonders. Dr. Doom realizes I need more people to do this, right? I can't just do this on my own. I need an army to do it for me, right? I need armies of people that can literally travel around the multiverse with me and kill as many molecule men as we possibly can. And so that's when he ends up creating the Black Swans, right? The Black Swans originate in Dr. Doom's desire to kill as many molecule men as he could, and he couldn't do it enough on his own. Now, while he's doing that, 10 years in, the Beyonders begin to realize something's wrong. That like molecule men across the across the multiverse are being destroyed because of what use would they be as scientists if they weren't monitoring things, right? If they say, we're going to create all these molecule men, we're going to detonate them all at the same time, they would be terrible scientists if they just create a molecule man and then never paid attention to what happened to them. And so when one molecule man gets destroyed, they can kind of chalk that up and say, okay, like maybe it was just something that went wrong. Maybe it was one of these, maybe it was like a dark Phoenix saga in their universe. And like it led to the destruction of their whole universe because the Phoenix went nuts in that, in that universe. Who knows, right? One molecule man is no loss. Thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of molecule men dying. Something's wrong here, right? Something's off. And so what, what the Beyonders did is they basically created a virus. They created a, a computer code. And what this would do is it would spread throughout the multiverse. And any particular computer organism that uh, that achieved self-awareness uh, would and, and, and had the ability to, trans, to basically leave its own universe and go into the multiverse itself would eventually become corrupted by this virus. And it would be turned into a map maker. You guys saw that with the origin of the map makers, but it would become a map maker and it would serve the will of the Beyonders. And the whole purpose of the map makers were to chart worlds where the molecule men had been destroyed by the Black Swans and then to chase them down. So literally what you had here is you had Dr. Doom creating the Black Swans to kill molecule men. Because those molecule men were dying, the Beyonders ended up creating the map makers to find the Black Swans who were killing molecule men. So it was a cat and mouse game, right? Black Swans did the killing, the map makers tried to find them and tried to stop them before they could kill any more molecule men. And so with that being told, Dr. Strange now kind of asked the question, okay, if that's the case, then why is it that Black Swan is different? The Black Swan that we met never mentioned anything about a Molecule Man. She never mentioned anything about wanting to destroy them. She was just annihilating worlds. And the response of Dr. Doom is, I relied on blind faith. I told all the Black Swans that I had, here's what we're doing. You have to understand that what I'm doing is, is true, right? Like you have to believe me. And where so many of them believed him just through blind faith, oh, uh, you had some who didn't. You had some who defected, who questioned his own, his own methods, right? Who questioned what it was that he was doing. Those were the Black Swans that appeared to the Black Swan that we saw in the story that basically ended up joining the Cabal, right? The, the one that we saw at the beginning of Hickman's run. And so what they did is they became disillusioned. That Black Swan ended up basically kind of defecting and then trying to find a way to basically destroy these various worlds, right? But ultimately what she wanted to do is she wanted to find a world that she could inhabit. She wanted to stabilize the incursions, right? To keep the uh, multiverse from dying. And then once the multiverse was, was stabilized, right? And she did that by virtue of just destroying worlds, hoping that like, you know, that much like the Black Priest, that it would all kind of stabilize and kind of go back to normal and that the pendulum would stop swinging from left to right, so to speak, and basically find a, a resting place. Um, she ended up doing that just so she could basically find a world for her to settle down in and then recreate her family, right? That's her whole goal. That's why she's been doing what she's been doing. And so ultimately what it, what what Doctor Strange ends up asking is if they lost faith in you, then why? What did they see that led them to believe that your, your cause was not as righteous as you made it out to be? And what Doctor Doom ends up doing is opening this kind of, you know, kind of device, or I guess this kind of holding cell. And he opens this holding cell and he shows Doctor Doctor Strange what's inside. And Doctor Strange is like, my God, like why, why would you do something like that? Like what in the heck is going on? Doctor Doom got this idea from, from the, the Council of Reeds. What he ended up showing, uh, what he ended up showing Doctor Doom or Doctor Strange was basically a containment device full of molecule men. 
this thing is just full of them because the response of Dr. Doom is as he started to look around, he asked the question, okay, so if the Beyonders are all powerful, if the Beyonders are these beings that can do pretty much anything, then the question that has to be asked here is what would happen if they discovered, if they captured a black swan and they tortured her or they, they read her mind and the black swan told them everything they wanted to know, that I'm Rubu Malal, that I formed the black swan to destroy Molecule Man across the multiverse, what stops them from going back in time and like killing me when I'm a little kid or stops me from going back in time and killing me before I can start this conquest. And he says their powers are what stop them. That the, that the Beyonders, despite all their abilities, they're restricted to their own timeline. Now remember, we covered that earlier, that the Beyonders are stuck in linear time. They can't travel back and forth. They can do anything they want to, but they can only go forward. They can't go into the past. And so because of that, his idea is as we've destroyed these Molecule Men, that's the reason why they didn't rewind time and in, in that universe and save those Molecule Men. They can't. There's no way for them to. And so with me realizing that, I knew I found, a, I had a way to stop them, right? I knew I had a way to do that, that I could abduct Molecule Men. And if the Molecule Men basically harnessed the power of a Beyonder and I wanted to destroy the Beyonders, then instead of the these various Molecule Men being detonated all at the same time to destroy the multiverse, why not detonate all of them in the face of the Beyonders and wipe out all the Beyonders that way? And that's exactly what he did. That Dr. Doom ended up basically calling forth, challenging the Beyonders and saying like, like, come to me. Like it is I, you know, that, that when he approaches this kind of rift in space where the Beyonders were coming from, this sort of access portal to the Beyondverse, where, by the way, you do see the Hammer of Thor. We'll explain why it's there here in a little bit, because it's probably one of the greatest moments in all of Marvel storytelling. He challenges and he calls forth the Beyonders, right? Where they basically say, like, we are from beyond, dreamers, destroyers, all of reality, our whim, who dares stand before us? The response of Doctor Doom is, I do. And they say, what is this Doom, right? Some paltry man playing something more than what he is. And he says, fools, I am the destroyer. I have broken worlds to taunt you. I have shattered universes to mock you. I have taken what is yours and made it mine. Face me at your own peril if you dare face me at all. And so in turn, they realize this is the guy that's been killing all the Molecule Men, right? This is the guy that got in the way of our plans. And they say, for the short life left of anything, men and women will weep at the stories of what was done here to you on this day. And then in, in turn, and probably one of the greatest, spec and, and one of the greatest responses ever, right? Doom says, I say, no one will ever hear the word be Beyonder again. I will erase your name from history itself. And in their anger, the Beyonders come, pour come pouring out towards Dr. Doom. And he starts to kind of open this vessel, right? He starts to open this device, this, this kind of containment cell. And he says, you dared to test us. You dared to toy with us. I dare to throw back in your face. Damn your cause. Damn the cost. You will certainly die. And then suddenly Doom starts to realize this is not the way it was supposed to go. He sends all these molecule men towards the Beyonders. He does successfully manage to wipe out all the Beyonders, right? He does successfully manage to kill them all. But inadvertently in the process, Dr. Doom wiping out all the Beyonders is the reason why we went from 100,000, from hundreds of thousands of universes in the multiverse down to less than two dozen. He didn't mean to do it, but directly and inadvertently, Dr. Doom is the reason why the multiverse's destruction has been sped up. Dr. Doom is the reason why everything is going to die. There is a house in New Orleans, they call the rising sun, and it's been the ruin of many a poor boy. Oh God, I know I'm one. <laughs> I love that song. Dude, the animals were amazing. Like, we gotta get out of this place if it's the last thing we ever do. Dude, they like, the animals were amazing. How are you guys doing? How are you guys doing this morning? You guys doing good? It's 9.15 a.m. as I'm recording this, and we have reached it. The beginning of Secret Wars. Unanimously, you guys voted in the comment section that you wanted to see me remaster Secret Wars. So we are remastering Secret Wars. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to kick this off. We're going to kind of skip Secret Wars issue number zero because it's not really that important. We covered it last time around, but it's basically just the future foundation, right? The little kids who were building the life raft, and that's basically it. Not really all that relevant. Instead, what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of jump back a little bit, and we're going to pick up 178 days before the final incursion. Now, a lot of you guys asked this question when we recorded this. We had 
had Captain America's Mighty Avengers, which had basically become Captain America's Secret Avengers, right? Steve Rogers' Secret Avengers team. And a lot of guys are kind of asking, where's like, how did Blue Marvel get involved in all this and all that kind of stuff? And so what we end up doing here is we pick up at the Gym Theater, which is where the Mighty Avengers headquarters located. Now, if you are curious about how this team formed, as well as a lot of the members that are in it, uh, you can find that in a video down in the description. Uh, it'll basically be the, the Mighty Avengers video that we did where Doctor Strange ended up basically resurrecting Shumagorath or bringing Shumagorath into the Marvel Universe, right? That was during the events of Infinity, and that's where the Mighty Avengers, or I guess the second version of the Mighty Avengers reformed. But you got Steve Rogers here, and Steve Rogers basically approached the group before the big battle that we saw between the Mighty Avengers, the Illuminati, and Amadeus Cho's Avengers team. And he basically, he basically explains to them that like the multiverse is ending. And so with all this kind of being explained by Steve Rogers, and it's actually put very succinctly in this, this bit of an explanation here, right? The way that Al Ewing does it. And I think it's probably one of the easiest explanations to understand, right? Steve Rogers explains the incursions as like, you know, being in the supermarket and there's a pyramid of cans and somebody pulls one of the cans out from the bottom and the whole structure comes crashing down. Except instead of cans, you're talking about entire universes, which is a really good way to put the way the incursions were going on. Because one of the drawbacks to Hickman, as much as I love his writing, he can be a little wordy and he can, he'll use 10 words when five will do. And so I think that's kind of one of the downsides, although I still love his writing. And so basically it's, it's kind of Steve Rogers explaining like, you know, the Illuminati, the, the issue that they have is that in the beginning of all this, I tried to use the Infinity Gauntlet, right? And the Infinity Gauntlet worked to stop that one incursion, but we destroyed all the gems in the process, except for the Time Stone, which started yanking me through time. But notice this, the immediate response of Luke Cage is, wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me that the Illuminati have known about this the entire time, and so did you, right? Like you were part of that original Illuminati group. Now Luke Cage doesn't have the full story, but the response of, of Steve Rogers is, don't judge me. And it's one of these things where he's kind of like, well, it's different when I do it, right? But remember, the full story about all this is that yes, Steve Rogers originally knew what was going on with the incursions, and he told the Illuminati, we can't destroy worlds, right? Like we have to spare innocent lives. And it's kind of funny because, you know, of course his mind was wiped, which is what he tells everybody. That's why I didn't tell you before, because I didn't know until not too long ago when Original Sin happened and these memories were restored to me. But at the end of the day, the Mighty Avengers are kind of split, right? White Tiger is like, they're doing this to save entire universes. And the issue that Captain America has is, but like they're, they're taking innocent lives. And the, the, the reality of this, and this is an important thing to understand, not even trying to give Steve Rogers a hard time or call him dumb or anything like that. The reality of this is I think the Illuminati made the right call, right? Like there comes a point when you really have to make that choice. And that's the important thing here is Steve Rogers takes this stance that like all life is important. No, it's not either, right? Like not all life is important. That's just the way that it is. The big argument that Steve Rogers had is that in his mind, he saw the Illuminati and, and those guys becoming as bad as the people they were fighting. And there is that, that argument does kind of go around, right? It's one that a lot of people really have in the real world that when you're fighting an enemy, if you become as bad as the enemy you're fighting, then ultimately you become that enemy. But that's not true, right? It's Machiavellian. It's like dating 101. If you're struggling because of the fact that you're, you're struggling with like all the bad boys taking the girls, then learn to be Machiavellian. Be a good guy, but don't be afraid to take some literature from the, the handbook on how to be a dick, right? Like don't become a terrible person yourself, but borrow their tactics from time to time. And that's kind of what this required, right? That's what this was. It was don't become a villain, but don't be afraid to use some of the tactics the villains use. So long as you keep your eye on the prize, you're not going to lose your way. And that's the biggest issue with Captain America is he was always so narrow-minded and always so focused on always making sure they do the right things that he didn't really seem to understand the concept that sometimes in order to do the right thing, you got to do some bad things, right? That sometimes the ends really do justify the means. But because of that, again, there's a kind of rift here in the Mighty Avengers team. Not everybody's on board. And Captain, you know, Steve Rogers tells him, make your choice, right? Either you can side with me or you can side with them, but it's not going to be the same thing. Now, the other part of this is that the team kind of starts turning on Sam Wilson because Sam Wilson also had knowledge of this, right? Remember, Captain America is coming to them after he learned everything and is kind of dumping this information. But Sam Wilson knew before anybody else in the Mighty Avengers knew. And so the fact that he didn't come to them and tell them as part of their team kind of pisses them off. But one of the things that you kind of get here is you get this sort of jumping forward through days, right? From here, we jump to 84 days to live. And what you basically end up having here is essentially, you know, volunteers from the Mighty Avengers, because remember, unlike the main Avengers team, where it's largely just composed of superpowered beings, the Mighty Avengers was kind of a blend between Heroes for Hire and, and the Avengers team. And so far as you had the main Mighty Avengers roster, Luke Cage, White Tiger, uh, Blue Marvel, Spectrum, so on and so forth. But what you also had were basically people were, who were out there trying to help the world and not necessarily having superpowers. And one of the things that's kind of asked here is, is while the world is learning about the incursions, not everybody really sees it as like one of the biggest things in the world, right? That at the end of the day, like, you know, yes, the, the universe and the world is dying, but like, what are you going to do to stop it? On the other side of the equation, you have people who are kind of taking political stances to this. You pick up with like 26 
six days before the world ends. And you have some political pundits who were just like, these are terrorist planets, right? They're bad guys, they're enemies, they're they're enemy combatants, and we have to treat them that way, right? So, you know, Warhawk, hyper, hyper military, those kind of guys, you know, the ones that you don't really listen to because they're, you know, just disregard them but then you also have like the ultra super progressives right who were just like we gotta you know help them and help them understand that you know that we can see the multiverse the other ones you don't listen to either right like the people on the extreme sides of the spectrum one of the things you also get here is peter corbeau and peter corbeau is an old standing member of really the the x-men roster more so than anything else he was just a really really old friend of charles xavier's but again you know it's it's, it's one of these things where the other you know another major issue that the the mighty avengers are dealing with as something that kind of flies under the radar are mass suicides right people who who are just like the world is ending and, and instead of like facing the world ending they just kind of take their own life that the world is responding to this in a multitude of different ways now the the world's response which is to say the average human's response to this is actually be, going to become an amazing talking point once we get to like blue marvel right like the the role that blue marvel plays in all this but then you also have the conspiracy theorists right the people that you never listen to <laughs> The, you know, the guy who's like Stanford was an inside job, you know, and all that kind of stuff is kind of like, okay, whatever, man. Like, you know, but, but nonetheless, you know, you pick up with 19 days to live and this 19 days to live is basically like the, when the fight began to break out between the, uh, between Captain America's Avengers team and like the Illuminati. But once we get to 14 days to live, this is when you end up having like blue Marvel stepping in. And this is a really, really, this is a super cool moment here. And it's, and I was so glad to see it when I, when I saw it, because I was like, man, dude, it's about time somebody recognized this, right? So one once the battle's over, you've got the Illuminati, you know, who were talking to Captain America, but you've got Reed Richards and Black Panther who kind of stood to the side and they were talking to Blue Marvel. And, and, you know, Reed Richards kind of says, man, like that's, that was a, that was a crazy fight, you know, and it probably could have ended a lot quicker, Adam Brashear, because you were holding back. And had you not been holding back, you probably could have ended our, our whole movement pretty quickly, right? He could have ended this all super fast. And the, the kind of response that he says here is, you know, having the Avengers actually talk to each other, you know, Spectrum says having our Avengers talk to which was all we really wanted. And then in turn, Blue Marvel's like, yeah, these nonsensical squabbles really have gone on too long. And when facing something like this, we're vastly stronger acting together than we are apart. And Reed takes that as kind of a heartening response in the sense that Blue Marvel's like, yeah, this guy finally understands. And the response of Adam is, no, you're totally misunderstanding, Reed. Like, I didn't say that because I think you're making the right move here. I'm saying that because you're wrong. You've been wrong this entire time. And everything that's happened here has been your fault from the very start. And Black Panther's kind of like, no, we've been working on different things. And I assume you have too, Adam Brashear. You've been trying to find a way to stop the incursions and you haven't been able to do it, right? Nothing that you've been able to work on has been able to stop it. And at the end of the day, Spectrum's kind of like, but you're still not listening. And, and the question's like, why? And Adam Brashear's response was, because you could have talked to all of us. You could have talked to the rest of us. And hearing that come from Adam Brashear really does kind of change things. Like it kind of changes my perspective because my initial response to this was, okay, what good would it do to talk to all these various superheroes out there? But the funny thing about this is Adam Brashear Bashir really is smart. And I feel like Adam Bashir having been left out of all that is really kind of an, an indication of two things. One, that in Marvel Comics, Adam Bashir is woefully underrated. He's painfully underused. But the other part of this is that within the Marvel Universe, he's not really appreciated as a guy. Is he one of the top 10 smartest people in the world? Absolutely. And it's kind of a funny thing because he tells like Black Panther and he tells Reed Richards, you should have talked to us. A lot of the people out there, sure, they're not as smart as you are, but you literally have intelligent kids who were helping you build a raft. Why? Because kids have imagination because they think about things that you wouldn't normally be able to think of. And using that line of logic and then canceling out all the other superheroes makes no sense, right? It's, it's kind of nonsensical. And it's a cool thing because that's true because in response, you have Black Panther who says what Adam Brashear says that like, have you ever considered that the other 7 billion of us on the world might've liked to have had a say in things? The response of Black Panther is, have you asked them? You know, like, have you, have you asked that at all? And that's actually a great point to raise because what you're seeing is that in response to the end of the world, there's mass panic, mass hysteria, mass suicides. People are responding predictably. And that's kind of justifies the Illuminati's actions. You can't trust the average person with such a mind blowing piece of information because only two things are going to happen. Either they're going to refuse to believe it because it's just not what they want to believe or they're going to panic. No real constructive narrative can come out of telling 7 billion people on the in the world. Hey guys, uh, so the world is ending. The universe is ending too. You can't tell people that. And so at this point we transition away from that and we jump directly into Secret Wars number one. We officially start Secret Wars. Now remember, this is the final incursion 
incursion between Marvel's Ultimate Universe and the main Marvel Universe. These are the last two worlds in existence. Now, something that I also want to specify here, a lot of you guys asked the question early on in the story, and I don't remember if we answered this already, but a lot of you guys asked the question early on in the story. You said, okay, so what we have here are incursions. We have worlds crashing into each other. If two Earths crash into each other, it wipes out both universes. But if you destroy one of the Earths, then the universe that doesn't have an Earth just passes through the other universe and nothing happens, right? So all you have to do is destroy one world and the day is saved. So what do we have? Like, what about the universes where those Earths were already saved? Where like those Earths were either destroyed by the superheroes who resided in that universe, right? They evacuated their Earth, they blew the Earth up and saved their universe, or the universes where the Earths were destroyed by the other incursion. Those universes should be okay and they should be fine and they should be floating around out there. That's a very, very good question to ask. And the answer to that question came when Dr. Doom unleashed the Molecule Men on the Beyonders, right? Like all that energy being being set off, like it was just like this massive multiversal bomb. And whatever universes exist out there were destroyed by that bomb in the process, leaving only the main Marvel Universe and the Ultimate Universe. Now, the question you kind of have to ask here is why these two worlds, or like why these two universes, like shouldn't they have been destroyed in the process? Sure but it's just storytelling and that's basically it. But the idea here is that with the Ultimate Universe facing off against the main Marvel Universe, and, and I like to consider the Ultimate Universe the MCU, I feel like it makes it a lot more exciting. But the kind of question here that's being asked of Nick Fury, of, of the maker of this alternate reality version of Reed Richards is how much time do we have left? Maker's response is, okay, normally we would have eight hours from the time that the incursive Earth appears until the time they collide. But because of the fact that there are no other universes there, because that's it, basically we have like an hour before this incursion happens, right? So literally there's flying towards each other. And a lot of this is really chalked up to the explosion that led to the destruction of all the other universes, right? The, the, basically like this massive explosion just pushed these two on a collision course faster. But whatever the logic is, the result is that they have an hour before either both worlds end or one of the worlds is destroyed. The other part of this is that Maker doesn't really tell Nick Fury that there is no chance to win, right? He doesn't tell him there's no way for them to succeed. He let, just kind of lets Nick Fury believe that if they dispatch the Ultimates and all their helicarriers from the Triskelion into the uh, main Marvel universe onto that earth that like they can probably overpower those heroes and they can probably take the day but thanos remember thanos and the cabal are on the ultimate universe right they're there with ultimate universe reed richards and thanos asked the question why lie you know like why lie in the midst of all this right i mean they never really had a chance to win why not just tell them that and the response of reed is because it wouldn't do any good and when thanos says like everybody deserves to know when their time is up right people should know when there is no chance for them to fight anymore and just give themselves over to death the response of reed is it's not about that it's about buying time. That's all it is. These guys are cannon fodder. They don't know they're cannon fodder, but that's all they are. Right now, switch over to a couple things going on here. The first is the life raft of Reed Richards, right? The main Marvel Universe has its own life raft, and that was Reed and Valeria's answer to the idea of not losing, right? They can't win, but they cannot lose. And the only way to not lose is to build a raft using materials made of, of adamantium, uh, vibranium, and also using basically material from the Living Tribunal itself in order to, you know, solidify this, this vessel in such a way to where it can navigate what would be the multiversal space because there are no materials out there that, that exist in humanity that could survive the crashing of two universes into each other. That's why the death of the Living Tribunal was so important because part of the Living Tribunal's body can be used to reinforce this vessel and ensure that it does survive the, the crushing of these two universes, right? Now, there are other things kind of being thrown in there, but the idea here is that it's literally just grabbing as many people as they possibly can because the reality of this is that Reed and them hope that they could possibly stop the incursions or at least stop this final incursion. But once this final incursion started kicking off and then once the ultimate universe immediately dispatched their helicarriers and all their different superheroes to the main marvel universe then it became apparent there's no reasoning with these guys there's no rationalizing with these guys all we can do is basically stockpile as many resources as we can and just try to save the day the other part of this is that they've also lost scientists that in response to everything that's going on two of their of their specialists right in chemistry and physics decided to stay behind and be with their families in the end of times now it's not the biggest loss in the world and reed even says they were basically redundancies right they were backup scientists. So it's not the end of the world that we don't have them. You know, you also have like the X-Men, you have Beast who left the X-Men behind. But the big thing about this is, is there's, there's two expected scenarios between Reed and T'Challa. And that's why they have Manifold. Remember, Manifold is the guy, Eden, who can teleport to different locations or bring people to him. All he has to do is know that the need is there. And so the idea is that one, they basically get, you know, everything kind of goes as planned. They launch their they launch with their resurrection team, you know, and, and that's it. Manifold teleports on board and the day's saved, right? So the idea is that 
Manifold is basically going to reach out into the world and start plucking out different superheroes from where they are and say, okay, we'll bring them here. And then once all those superheroes are brought here, you know, protection roles, different things like that, that basically Manifold will teleport back and they'll say, okay, guys, cool. We got everybody. Let's go, you know, and just ride off into the sunset. The worst case scenario is that Manifold saves the day, but he doesn't make it. And the funny thing about this is everything that can go wrong is going to go wrong, right? Because the first thing that happens here is you've got Iron Man from the Ultimate Universe, you know, Tony Stark, who basically tell, you know, who flies to this location and brings his entire weapons platform with him. And then of course he faces off against Carol Danvers and that's that's more or less that. You've got Luke Cage who's, who's trying to tend to the day as best they can. Literally you have Storm, you have Thor who are using their powers to, you know, take down one of the helicarriers. And that's really what's happening here. The forces of S.H.I.E.L.D. from the Ultimate Universe are being wildly overpowered because where the Ultimate Universe was rooted more in real life, the main Marvel Universe was rooted more in fantasy. And so in a lot of ways, this is the answer to the question, what would happen if the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the Marvel Comics Universe went to war with each other? The Marvel Cinematic Universe would be vastly overpowered. They'd be wildly overpowered and crushed by a huge margin. But the other thing is that in the middle of all this, Sentinels come flying in. Now the Sentinels are controlled by Cyclops and Nation X, right? The X-Men have arrived and Cyclops shows up here with the Phoenix Egg. And that's what's nuts is because in addition to whatever forces the Avengers have, which are enough to seemingly take out the Helicarriers of S.H.I.E.L.D., now Sentinels are here. And these massive Sentinels start crushing everything. Now, the other part of this is that She-Hulk, the Incredible Hulk, Colossus, Nightcrawler, they all start realizing that all these are coming from a particular vessel, that they're all being dispatched from this one particular ship. And the only way to really shut down communications between like Iron Man and the various, you know, ultimate characters who were here on the main Marvel Universe and the Ultimate Universe itself is to destroy that vessel. And that's exactly what they do, right? You basically end up getting the fastball special, which is normally Colossus throwing Wolverine. Instead, it's Colossus throwing the Incredible Hulk. Sends him flying up into that vessel. He basically destroys, or at least, you know, attacks the, the Triskelion, takes out the Triskelion's uh, communication array, and that in turn cuts off their communications to all the helicarriers. So now all the helicarriers out there are not necessarily flying blind, but they can't talk back. They can't call for reinforcements or anything like that. You in turn end up having the maker who, who finally launches his move. And the response to this is, okay, with the Triskelion down, with all that being sorted out, now it's time for us to basically launch our final attack. And so what ends up happening is, of course, the dome starts to open up. Now, remember, we talked about this in, in our video on Ultimate Read, right? Which you'll find down as part of the best comic book stories of all time playlist down in the description. But uh, this version of Reed, you know, constructed this massive dome where time uh, time passed differently. Time passed faster within the dome. Reed himself, you know, made himself immune to it. But the idea was that basically time would, I think it was something like a thousand years of evolution took place inside this dome, which means that the, the various weapon systems that are, that are here on this dome are a thousand times more powerful than what's already there in the Ultimate Universe. And so Maker ends up launching all these different just hyper advanced ships directly into the main Marvel Universe. The funny thing about this is that stowing away on one of these is Miles Morales. <laughs> the Miles Morales is, you know, during his time as Spider-Man had come across all this. Now, a lot of that was explained in Miles Morales Spider-Man going into Secret Wars, going into this. But once these vessels arrive, they start unleashing holy hell, like literally just fire and brimstone, just raining it down on all the superheroes. And despite all their power, like it's obvious that this is basically the end of it, right? Like there's no real way to come out on top here. And so what you end up getting is this amazing moment, right? It's kind of the small little moment, but this amazing moment. Those of you guys who read this originally, when we covered this originally, you guys know what's coming. What you end up getting here is Frank Castle showing up, right? You've got uh, an email that's sent out by Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin, to all these various villains that he's worked with over the years, and even some that he hasn't. And basically says like, all of you, I dreamed of a glorious end, right? Me standing over the vanquished as the world looked up in envy, but it seems time that fickle mistress has robbed us all of such an opportunity. So I say this, if the world is truly ending, let it end thusly, with drink and joy at the sight of our enemy's greatest failure. Please join me for a most raucous celebration at the place where we met that time for the thing. I'm buying, sincerely, Wilson Fisk. All the various villains show up here, right? And it's considered to be a place where like nobody can get access to. Nobody knows about it. That's why he left this, you know, kind of ambiguous message, that time for the thing that we did, right? And so it's like, okay, cool. So like, we're all going to meet up at this one spot and only the villains know about it. Now, while they're all enjoying their drinks and they're watching the heroes fail and they're watching these super advanced weapons from the ultimate universe show up and just start raining down fire and brimstone and there's no real way for the heroes to win, here comes Frank Castle. And he says, gentlemen, they say that when you die, you can't take it with you, which begs the question question, what exactly am I going to do with all these bullets? He cocks his gun back, switch back to the battle, right? And it's just like, man, that's amazing. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's so cool, right? So with all this fire and brimstone raining down, immediately part of the resurrection team is taken out, right? Like part of, of uh, Reed Richards, you know, team is gone. It's, it's kind of like, okay. So like a lot of the resources that they had here, a lot of the things that they needed in order to resurrect themselves properly are gone, right? There doesn't really seem to be any real method of resurrecting the heroes anymore. Black Widow, Hawkeye, these guys are all basically dead. And so in turn, it's kind of like, you know, Black Panther tells, tells, uh, tells Manifold, okay, so like time for plan two. And so in response with, with everything going on, Manifold ends up firing up, right? Ends up using his powers. And while that happens, he ends up basically, you know, snatching up all these different characters. Star-Lord gets grabbed. You end up having Carol Danvers and Thor who gets snatched away. Spider-Man Peter Parker gets snatched away. But while all that's happening, you have Cyclops where the Phoenix egg finally hatches and he reaches inside and basically imbues himself with the entirety of the Phoenix force. And so while all this fire and brimstones being being rained down by the ultimate universe, right? With these, these super advanced ships that have been brought there by the ultimate universe version of Reed, suddenly Cyclops emerges with the Phoenix and it's dead, right? It's just lights out. It's just boom, 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 boom. Ship after ship after ship just gets annihilated, right? Like the vast power of the Phoenix force. Like, and so with that, like in that moment, it's like, okay, you know, Cyclops is teleported aboard by Manifold. They have everybody that they need. And the response of Reed is go. Like we have to get out, right? Like it's obvious we can't stop this incursion. There's nothing we can do here. The ultimate universe does the exact same thing and launches their ship as well. Cyclops is teleported aboard with the full totality of the Phoenix force and they bail, right? They're just like, like go like they launch this ship fly into the incursion point right the point between these two worlds where they're getting ready to collide the issue with this is that the worlds are literally being ripped apart by tidal forces right they're within the roche limit right those of you guys who don't know what that is whenever you see a movie like like for example if any of you guys ever saw melancholia and if you never did look up the ending for it well there's a point where like a giant world that's about i don't know maybe four or five times the size of earth crashes into the earth the reality is that wouldn't happen and even right now what you have is two world two earths crashing into each other that's not really what would happen right they they wouldn't actually impact each other. What would end up happening is the tidal forces of these worlds would pull themselves apart. And that's what would that's what would take place, right? If you had a planet that was four times the size of Earth that was careening towards Earth, you'd get to the Roche limit, which is the point where the gravitational pull of that world is so intense that it would literally start ripping the Earth to pieces, right? It would just start ripping out huge chunks of the planet. Physics and science is crazy, but the idea is that they end up flying in between the uh, in, in between the incursion point, which seems to be the best place for them to be. The problem with this is all these massive storms and all this craziness going on, one of the gravitational uh, gravitational attacks ends up ripping off a portion of the life raft, right? Which contains Susan Storm, Valeria, and Franklin Richards. And because all of this happens so incredibly fast that with, with Susan, Johnny Storm, like with basically every, every member of Reed's family except for himself, right? Like it's literally like Ben Grimm, Susan Storm, Johnny Storm, uh, Franklin, and Valeria. He does what he can, right? Like Susan basically fires up her force field to keep them from like disintegrating into the, into the space of nothingness, essentially. And so you end up having like this shield that immediately comes up in response to that right you know around the life craft and so reed's like t'challa left the shield down and he's like dude if we do that it's going to crush everything right like right now the shield capacity is at 92 percent i can do this reed but if i open this door and shield like shield integrity gets below 90 percent, i have to close it back otherwise we're going to lose everything and the response of reed is that's all i need right so this door takes five seconds right this shield takes five seconds to open right so you've got reed richards standing there right like standing standing on this edge just waiting waiting to like reach out and grab this vessel and yank it back in within the uh, within the life raft, right? So you got Reed standing there, you got Susan Storm using her force field and holding this entire thing together, right? Now, one thing to understand, Susan Storm is not just holding this together, her force field is holding off the collapse of a universe. She's literally holding two universes apart with her force field. But in this moment, you basically get this countdown, right? You get five, you get four, three, two, the shield starts to come undone. You get to one, the shield totally fails. Susan Storm, Franklin, Valeria, Johnny Storm, Ben Grimm are just yanked away, right? They just disappear into nothingness and there's nothing Reed can do. He loses his entire family in that instant. The worlds collide and what's left of the multiverse has totally been destroyed. The only survivors of this multiversal collapse are those who were in the Ultimate Universe life raft, those who were in the life raft in the main Marvel Universe, and they're only protected by the energy they use from the Living Tribunal to kind of create that shield. And the only other people there are the Molecule Man Owen Reese, Dr. Stephen Strange, and Doctor Doom. The end of the Marvel Universe has happened. What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with Secret Wars Part 2. I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I'm kind of amazed that people like 
really wanted me to remaster Secret Wars this badly. If I'd have known that, uh, I probably would have remastered it back when like no comics were being published at all. Uh, I probably would have just remastered it then, which I probably should have because like you guys have been saying you wanted it for a long time. So yeah, <laughs> I guess it makes sense. I will say this, once we're done with this, we're gonna go back and finish a series that we started like two or three years ago and never completed. And it's probably gonna knock your socks off. I have no clue if anybody's even going to care. <laughs> <laughs> but we're gonna find out. Uh, okay, so picking up with Secret Wars issue number two, this one really kind of kicks things off, and this is really our first introduction to the actual Secret Wars universe itself, right? Which is to say, after the incursions are over and after everything's ended, this kind of presents us with like this new landscape. And the first thing we do is we end up meeting this version of Thor from Higher Avalon. Now, this is one of the cool things that went on here, but this guy is essentially coming to wield the hammer of Thor, or at least to lift the hammer of Thor. And the reason why is because Mjolnir is kind of like the ultimate test, and it was a smart move for Hickman to do this. Only those who are deemed worthy can lift the hammer of Thor. And, and the way this works is that essentially uh, within this realm, within this, this world that we call battle world, you have all kinds of different lands, different things like that. But trying to become a member of the Thor core, as it's explained to us when this guy successfully lifts the hammer, basically means you become part of the police force, right? The policing agency designed to keep things in line. And each one of these members of the Thor core has a hammer themselves. They have a version of Mjolnir. So this is probably the most tried and true example of everybody gets the hammer of Thor. <laughs> everybody gets Thor's hammer. Now, the, the cool thing is that this version of Thor is kind of like the new recruit, and he's also led by Old Man Thor. The funny thing about this, with Old Man Thor, we're not really given any information about him. And in fact, with most of the Thors that we'll see here, we're not really given any information. And so with this guy, this version of Thor from Higher Avalon, successfully learning how to lift the hammer, or at least, you know, being able to lift it and demonstrating his worthiness and being inducted into the Thor core, he's told by Old Man Thor, you know, when, when he asks, like, what do I do now? He says like, now your job is to protect the laws of the All Father, right? To protect the laws of God King Doom, the God who watches over all of us, basically showing that Dr. Doom is now the one running the show. And so from there, we end up having this little bit of a celebration among these various Thors, right? In the sense that like this new Thor from Higher Avalon successfully managed to lift everything. And then we're given this brief bit of an explanation in terms of the origin of how this whole place came to be. Now we, as the reader know, all this came to be by virtue of the incursions and all that kind of stuff. But notice this, the way this explanation is given is that there was nothing followed by everything, swirly burning specks of creation that circled life-giving suns, God Doom created the light. The origin story for all things and existence as it's being given here and basically believed by seemingly everybody across the battle world is that God King Doom created all existence. They're all here because of him, that things have always been this way. And that's what's so wild about this is that old man Thor kind of tells us that what, it, what he says directly and what he says indirectly, as well as Thor from higher Avalon that all of this has always been this way. There was nothing before any of this, right? There was whatever happened to exist before, if anything existed at all. But at the moment, all things as they exist now have always been this way. The reason why this matters and the reason why I want to kind of grill that in there is because what we end up doing is basically jumping to the kingdom of Utopolis. And, and we're going to, we'll make sense of all these different kingdoms, these different locations and so on. I kind of like the mystery and the intrigue that kind of come, uh, comes along with it, but we basically end up picking up with what amounts to the future foundation, right? Now, a lot of you guys, if you don't recall, the Future Foundation, before the events of the incursions and all that kind of stuff, were established as the smartest children in the world. Really, the smartest children in the Marvel Universe. They were basically led by Valeria Richards. And this is our first real indication here that not everyone believes the story of God King Doom. Now, one of the other things that kind of goes on here is that Hickman kind of gives us this picture that there's huge differences between those who are part of the inner circle and those who are just average citizens. And so because of that, while we're not necessarily given all the definitive answers here, this kid Bentley is just kind of like a lot of what we're told here doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, right? Like if we look at this place, right? We look at like all these beings who were here, right? It looks like giant chunks of rock beings that seem to have existed at some point in time that like all this really points to the idea that all these things here are not naturally occurring, right? That they were here at some point along the line and they were seemingly destroyed or wiped out. Now, the other part of this is that looking at the way that a lot of these figures look, they look like different versions of Galactus. You can kind of make them out slightly, but they look like different iterations of Galactus. And what this really seems to point to is that some somewhere along the line between the collapse of the multiverse and the beginning of this, that you had different versions of Galactus who were here and seemingly all of them were destroyed. But the long and short of this here is that Bentley, like other people here, are looking around the landscape and have been for some time, but looking around the landscape of, of everything here and kind of saying a lot of this stuff 
is is stuff that's been here for a long time these aren't natural formations but the other big thing that they stumble across here is one of the vessels right one of the life rafts from the collapse of the multiverse now at this point this is when things get wicked cool right because we basically end up switching back over to old man thor and to thor of higher avalon and we're basically told that there is a trial convening here and the person they're basically going to meet or going to grab is mr sinister himself now he resides in a place called bar sinister uh this is kind of like his own little kingdom more or less but once they get in here sinister initially starts talking trash to them it's kind of like you know like what are you guys doing here you know that kind of thing you know kind of giving them a bit of a hard time so on and so forth and just kind of making a mockery of them now it kind of makes sense given the fact that sinister is basically a baron and we'll talk about what that means here in a second and the authority of the barons doesn't necessarily supersede the authority of the thor Corps, but the thor Corps is kind of looked at as just henchmen right they're just kind of like you guys are cops right nobody takes you seriously like that kind of a thing and so because of that basically they're they're teleported to doomstat right to the, the castle of victor von doom and once they arrive here of course there's a great big huge pool which makes sense why wouldn't victor von doom have a pool but the other cool thing we get here is galactus standing at the entryway there's another caveat to this version of galactus which is probably one of the coolest things but this giant court is being convened here now we get these little tidbits by jonathan hickman kind of showing us some of the things that were saved in the aftermath of the incursions presumably you know we're really just kind of definitively by dr doom like we have the world tree of idriso the purpose of which really seems to be more ceremonial than anything else to kind of solidify the fact that he's sitting on the world tree so he's kind of sitting uh at the top of all worlds that are out there more or less the idea here is that sinister is being put on trial because according to the house of braddock and higher avalon so higher avalon is basically like excalibur comics more or less but in the realm of higher avalon they've accused sinister of allying himself with the realm of of hyperion and the idea is that by allying these two forces they can basically present themselves as an opposition to higher avalon and that's not the way that it's supposed to work that what you have here on battle world is you have different kingdoms or universes for lack of a better word little bits of universes that were basically saved by dr doom and brought here in this location and the idea is that each one of these universes is given its own baron which is to say a person that presides over this 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 location and that within each of these these kingdoms barons have absolute authority so long as they do not subvert the rule of god king doom but even then they're not necessarily allowed to ally themselves and get rid of other barons they kind of have to maintain this uneasy truce by one the the citizens of their kingdoms not crossing over in the other kingdoms and then two the barons ensuring that doesn't happen but one of the cool things that's kind of given to us as an explanation is that within the court itself that some of these these skirmishes some of these issues that are created between barons can be solved peacefully other times less so so like the alliances between upper and lower egyptia basically you know like khonshu the god of uh the god of uh moon knight more or less uh in other instances you end up having people who have lost for example uh the former baroness madeline Pryor, who was unseated by the by the new baron summers and then you have instances where like a person will come in and they'll just take over the entire kingdom and if the baron can't maintain their role if they can't maintain power then they will lose in this instance you basically end up having the horsemen of apocalypse each of which had their own individual kingdoms but then apocalypse basically went in and conquered each one of the kingdoms and then made himself the baron of all those kingdoms and that was honored by god king doom and basically said i recognize your authority now all the kingdoms reside or at least those four kingdoms reside under you and so because of the accusations coming from higher avalon that's led by jamie braddock who's the brother of brian braddock if you guys recall our more recent x-men videos that jamie braddock is basically a reality warping character he's exceedingly powerful because of the fact that the accusations come from him then in turn sinister says that i choose to confront my accusers in an arena i choose to confront them in battle and so he ends up facing off against brian braddock since brian braddock was the one that accused him in the first place and so when that happens you basically end up having this bit of a of a fight that takes place between the two of them that seems to last like a second like literally brian braddock just takes the head off sinister and it's like well that's the end of him but where you have this 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 kind of situation where this one girl who's talking to maestro who's this version of hulk that rules his own individual kingdom called future imperfect uh that she's kind of like yeah you know like sinister's dead man that was fast the response of maestro is sinister is it's nowhere near as easy to kill him and because of the power of sinister because of his, his healing factor and all that kind of stuff he's still able to talk even with a disembodied head and he finds himself disappointed and in turn goes and attacks brian braddock and so when that happens he has the upper hand he goes to launch the killing strike which is perfectly within his his ability to do and then suddenly is stopped by god king doom and god king doom says all of you on your knees and everybody bows and when that happens he basically says i don't really care about your petty squabbles right like you're here because that's what the court calls for it's our tradition all that kind of stuff but i don't really care the real reason why i even agree to honor this whole thing in the first place is because within the kingdom of higher avalon i've heard word that you guys are are housing people who are looking to subvert me you guys are housing people who are looking to overthrow my rule and i would have their names and i would have them now 
And so it's kind of like, if you cannot give me their names, then I will doom all of you guys, right? Like I'll, I'll kill everybody here. Like I'll wipe out the entire kingdom of Avalon. I'll do whatever I need to do. I will raise that place to the ground. And so when that whole thing, like when he basically says the entire royal family will be subjugated, ultimately it leads to Susan Storm kind of chiming in and saying, no, have mercy, right? Like have mercy, Victor Von Doom. Do not kill these guys. And so because of that, we get a couple interesting scenarios here. The first is that undoubtedly you guys are going to ask, who is this, right? Like did Susan Storm really side with Victor Von Doom? Are they really a couple now? We'll answer that later. <laughs> we'll get an answer to that later on. But the other thing here is that because of the fact that Victor Von Doom is basically showing mercy here, that what ends up happening is that Jamie, uh, Jamie Braddock ends up being sent to the shield or the wall. For those of you guys who are familiar with uh, Game of Thrones, but he's basically sentenced to the shield. And then, uh, then Brian Braddock is elevated to become the new Baron of Higher Avalon. And he's instructed that his job is to root out those individuals who are trying to subvert the authority of, of God King Doom. If he can't, then God King Doom will get rid of him and then he'll raise the entirety of Higher Avalon, right? He'll snap his fingers, everybody will die, and that'll be the end of it. And so following that, we end up picking up with uh, with Valeria Richards and you end up having her talking to Stephen Strange, right? Stephen Strange is very much alive here after the collapse of the multiverse. I know a lot of you guys will probably have a lot of questions. Don't worry, everything will be explained, all right? Just bear with me here. Just stick with me. You're the envelope. I'm a stamp, right? Stick with me and we'll go places. Like that's that's basically what this is. Or maybe it's the other way around. It doesn't really matter. The regardless of this, uh, of course, this is basically Valeria kind of briefing Stephen Strange on everything they'd found. That that kind of, you know, boat, that, that life raft, at least we know what it is, that vessel that was sitting out there in the middle of nowhere. The cool little caveat with the character of Galactus is that he's actually accompanied by Franklin Richards, right? Franklin Richards is just here with Galactus not necessarily as his pet, but kind of, it seems like he's almost like in charge of Galactus, right? Kind of controlling Galactus. But switching over to the shield, what ends up happening here is because we're again following Thor from Higher Avalon, who is from, you know, the realm of, of Jamie Braddock and all them, as well as Old Man Thor, that when Jamie Braddock gets here, he's basically given a type of suit, right? A kind of protective suit, and then basically sent over the wall. And the reason why this matters and being given these weapons, this arms and armament, is because on the other side of the shield, outside that, you know, this, this place that basically kind of houses the entirety of all the kingdoms are there outside this shield are the marvel zombies right the marvel zombies just reside outside this place and that's what's so crazy we're kind of given this this bit of an explanation here that where where jamie is fighting off as best he can and uh, seemingly doesn't really seem to be in possession of his reality warping powers and isn't really able to fight off against these zombies in any real measurable way so of course we know it's only a matter of time before he falls that we end up learning that on the other side of this wall is really just a war-torn place right that you've got all you got the whole marvel zombie horde out there you've got the annihilation wave of of a nihilist, right? They make their yearly migration. This just kind of move, you know, their seasonal migration, they go from one place to another. And then the worst of all the forces out there are the Ultron AIs, right? These guys are just hell bent on always trying to find a way through the wall or over the wall and into the main kingdom itself. But back in the sphere of Castle Doom, we get this, this cool bit of a conversation here that where you end up having Thor, from, uh, really old man Thor, and you get higher Avalon Thor, when they show up here and they start talking to Stephen Strange, that they're kind of like, okay, like, is there anything else that you need us for, right? This trial's now over. Jamie's been sentenced to the shield. He's on the other side. He's probably going to die. Is there anything else that you need from us? The answer of Stephen Strange is yes, I have one more task for you. I need you guys to go out to this location. I need you guys to seal it off. I need you guys to quarantine this. No one can know about about this. No one in the other kingdoms can know about it. And when you're done, you will tell no one about this, right? You will never tell anybody. And so what you end up getting is a handful of the Thor Corps who end up going out to this location, right? Once they get there, they meet outside this, this ship. And one of them, one of the, the little worker guys who's kind of around there, which looks like one of the Maloids, probably one of the forces of the Mole Men, they end up actually opening the vessel unintentionally, right? Now, as soon as they open this, all hell breaks loose, right? Like this thing gets opened up and Thor, this this old man Thor is like, oh my God. And then he's just like, he tells, he tells higher Avalon Thor, go, like, get the hell out of here. Like, go and find reinforcements. Spears start come flying out of nowhere, right? Like this old man Thor gets impaled, falls to the ground, and he's like, go, go tell the sheriff, we found death here. The guy goes to use his hammer, gets hit with an ax in the chest, right? And then he gets impaled through the head with a spear. And it's just like, Jesus. And then like, as soon as, as soon as like, you kind of look back and you see what's going on, it's Thanos and the, and the Black Order, right? It's the cabal of Thanos. And he's like, what is this place? And then, and then like the maker comes out and like, we have no idea what this place is. Like, it's 
not like it's not the universe that we came from like is it some kind of composite universe is it a whole new reality like like we have no idea what's happened all we know is the multiverse collapsed and that's what's so confusing about all this is by all standards of measurement when the multiverse collapses it crunches down into a singularity of energy and then explodes back out in a big bang and then a new multiverse is formed and so from their perspective they're in a whole new multiverse as far as they know they have no idea what any of this is and so ultimately proxima midnight ends up finding one of these forces right she ends up finding one of these guys here and and basically thanos takes this guy and starts starts interrogating him like tell me creature like where are we if you don't tell me i will rend you limb from limb right i will tear you apart i will i will destroy everything you know and love and i will make you beg for death and this guy's just like this place like the the highborn call it latverian right believers call it god's kingdom but everyone else we common folk we call it something else we call it battle world all right, what's going on guys this is rob and we are back with secret wars i know it's been a little while um i was feeling a bit under the weather and kind of burnt out last week uh so i just kind of disappeared for a little while uh, apologize about that it's just every once in a while i just kind of get to a point where i'm just like because i want to say that for about two years we've been doing this virtually non-stop and sometimes i forget that because i love what i do so much that sometimes i forget that i'm just going just just running all the time and like every once in a while even i just need to stop and take a break so what i may end up doing here in the next little while maybe once we finish this i may end up taking a break for like a week or two but i'll let you guys know ahead of time right i won't just disappear on you guys but what we're doing here is we're picking back up with secret wars right this is this is part three i think it is and the cool thing about this is that this opens up with dr stephen strange and dr doom now what you end up having here is stephen strange basically going over what's happening across the entire world of battle world for victor von doom now here's one thing that i do want to specify to you guys because a lot of you guys have asked about this are we going to cover any of the tie-ins for secret wars they're not really tie-ins for those of you guys who are new to comic books the way tie-ins usually work is you'll have like an event right so let's let's take for example civil war that's probably one of the most popular crossover events that marvel's done in recent memory we'll take the events of civil war you have the main civil war story which was seven issues long but we know the main civil war story focused on captain america versus iron man the tie-ins were things like the heroes for hire tie-ins where iron man had gone to like misty knight and to shang chi and a few other people like colleen wing and so on and basically said use your detective skills to find Captain America because Captain America has gone underground and I can't find him and that's what their story focused on and then there were things like the X-Men tie-ins right where Iron Man went to the X-Men and tried to recruit them to his side and they said no we don't want to have anything to do with that but usually tie-ins directly involve the events that are going on in the main story with Secret Wars it's not really that way Secret Wars the, the various tie-ins that we saw were just basically stories involving that one particular thing if we if you read Civil War and you saw a, a Black Panther tie-in which there was although it was the wedding of Black Panther and Storm. But let's say you had a Black Panther tie-in and it was focusing on what T'Challa was doing during the events of Civil War, but had nothing to do with the Civil War event itself. That's basically every single story that goes on here aside from the main Civil War event. Some of them are really cool, like Old Man Logan, different things like that. Most of them are not. <laughs> So I'll, I'll leave it to you guys if there are any in particular that you're interested in seeing, but I just want to kind of nip that in the bud real quick. But Stephen Strange is basically running over everything that's happening within the realm of Battle World, right? So the Green North, as it's called, more or less Planet Hulk. You know, he's kind of like, you know, they're doing what they always do, which is kind of raging and so on and so forth. But there's not really a whole lot happening here. And the reality is that, that Dr. Doom is just kind of like, why do you always do this, Stephen? Like, why do you always come in here every morning, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and read me what's going on over the course of Battle World, which is never really anything that I need to worry about. Like, why? Like, why do you do this? And the response to Stephen Strange is interesting here because it gives us some insight into what happened immediately following the destruction of all the Beyonders and all that power being readily available out there, right? We know that Dr. Doom has taken that power, that Dr. Doom has the power of the Beyonders, hence the reason why he looks so amazing. But the other thing here that's kind of given to us is that in that immediate moment, that initially Stephen Strange was offered the power of the Beyonders, right? That Stephen Strange could have taken the power of the Beyonders, but he chose not to. He didn't want that absolute power. Power, but it does bother him. He does look back on that and say, like, I could have been you. So it seems to be some base level of jealousy, not in the extreme, but kind of like, I could have been this guy. But the other part of this is that for him, for Stephen Strange, because he didn't really want that much power, he kind of looks around at what's left, right? Everything that's there. That battle world is composed of what few universes they could save, as well as whatever they could save from like the main Marvel universe and just kind of hodgepodge it all together. But he looks around and says, this is all that's left. There's nothing left in the multiverse but this. There's no cosmic entity. 
entities. There's no other realities. There's no nothing. We're it. It's us and like the one above all up there somewhere. And that's all there is. And so he understands the value of this. He understands the importance of what little they have left. And he basically does what he does because for him, it's honoring that, right? It's honoring all those individuals who died and the collapse of the multiverse, whether they wanted to or not, the destruction of all things. And basically saying like, because this is what little we have left, it's that important. And so I play my part because of the fact that I like to acknowledge this is all we really have left. The other part of this is that towards the end of their meeting, towards the end of their discussion, that you end up having, you know, Stephen Strange getting an alert, basically, that tells him, of course, that Thanos and all of them have escaped the raft, right? Now, if you guys remember, in the last video that we did, Valeria Richards, or at least Valeria Von Doom, as she's known now, the daughter of Victor Von Doom and Susan Storm, had basically shown up to Doctor Strange and said, hey, look, we found this device, this, this great big huge ship out there somewhere, and Stephen Strange sent the Thor Corps in order to quarantine it, right? All these different Thors, the police force of Battleworld, he sent them over there and basically said, quarantine this, make sure nobody gets in nobody gets out of course thanos the black the the black order so like prox from midnight corvus glaive name of the submariner all those guys basically managed to escape killed one of the thors but by the time everybody else got back there and stephen strange is arriving here thanos and all those guys are gone right and so stephen strange uses not really the eye of agamotto the all-seeing eye instead he uses the replacement that was given to him by dr doom by god king doom and basically kind of starts analyzing things now this is the big difference here is that using this eye he can basically understand where characters are supposed to be in time and space right are they of this particular universe are they of this particular time and what he realizes is that Thanos and the guys in, inside this ship are not from this time period like they're not from this this battle world universe they're from elsewhere now Stephen Strange immediately starts putting pieces together but when he asks the question like does anybody know where they went to did any of you guys see where they went the response is we don't know the newest recruit Thor had taken off to go get help while everybody was gone and no one no one was there to watch them Thanos and them you know kind of scampered off and so the idea is they were strong enough to kill one of the most powerful versions of Thor that was out there right this this older version of Thor, which means they must be strong and they must be fast. And so they could be 500 leagues from here, right? They could be 100 leagues, 400 leagues, who really knows? And so Stephen Strange says, fine, call it 500 leagues, fan out, find them, and then bring bring at least one of them back to me alive, right? Don't kill them all. And that's kind of the important thing here. He says, I get that you guys are pissed. I get that one of your member was killed by these guys, and I know you guys want blood, and that's fine. But before you guys get blood, I need information. He's like, go find them, bring them back, and then we'll kind of, we'll, we'll settle up, you know, once it's all said and done. Now, once those various Thor take off the newest recruit Thor still stays behind right because for him it's still his first day <laughs> it's this guy's first day on the job right and like oh you know everything's just kind of popping off but Stephen Strange at that point then calls out to the ship and basically says I know you're in there get out here right like we're alone you can stop hiding it's time for you to come out and the person he's talking to inside the ship is Miles Morales right like Miles Morales keep in mind when we were covering the incursions he was from the ultimate universe right he stowed away on that raft that left the ultimate universe so like he's basically been here the entire entire time. Now, the cool thing about this is that as soon as he arrives, he starts sputtering to Stephen Strange, right? He's like, look, I have no idea what happened, man. Like, the last thing I know, I was sneaking onto this ship, you know, and Stephen Strange is trying to ask questions, right? Like, you've been on board this vessel this entire time. Who are the other people who were with you? And Miles is like, I don't know, man. Like, the last thing I remember, there was a world in the sky, and like, all hell was breaking loose, and like, there was a big invasion and all that kind of stuff. And Stephen Strange is like, wait a minute, a world, are you saying that you remember everything before Battle World? And that's not how it's supposed to be. That's not how any of this is supposed to be. Now, the cool thing about this is that from here we pick back up with dr doom one of the best things about dr doom's character and i feel like nobody can write him better than jonathan hickman but one of the best things about dr doom's character is that if you look at him before the events of civil war he was always trying to acquire absolute power for one of two reasons the first reason was to free his mother's soul from from uh from mephisto because of the fact that she had sold her soul for some measure of power and then once she had been killed he had her soul for all eternity ultimately in the book um what is it it was the dr strange and dr doom book and i don't remember what it was called. They ended up freeing the soul of Victor Von Doom's mom. She went to heaven and that was basically the end of that. The other reason why Dr. Doom acquires absolute power is because his hunger for power is insatiable, right? He's like Galactus, except on a much smaller scale and always trying to attain absolute power. That's always been the crux of his character. And there was never really a definitive answer on what he would do if he gained that much. We got an answer a couple times during the original Secret Wars event, but it wasn't as though he had like lost his mind and tried to kill everybody. Instead, he just saw himself as a ruler of all things right? He was just kind of like, now I've attained this absolute power. What he's done here, and this is what's kind of cool here, what he's done here is he actually looks at, looks at himself from a very interesting introspective direction, but also he's struggling with kind of an existential crisis. And the reason why is because as he's talking to Susan Storm, Susan Storm starts saying, hey, like I went down to the town square. I basically made myself invisible, but I went down to the town square. I was walking around and people were singing about the song of the man in the sun. And when the question is like, well, like, what are you talking about? We end up learning that at some point in the early days of Battleworld's formation, that 
Johnny Storm, the Human Torch, had risen up against Victor Von Doom. And when that happened, Victor Von Doom had basically subjugated Johnny Storm and he was going to kill him, but he left his fate to Susan Storm. And Susan Storm chose that Johnny Storm should become the sun. And the result is that once he was basically killed, his body was put into the sky that basically, at least I believe he was killed, but his body was put into the sky and it orbits battle world. And he's literally the sun. And it's one of these things because Susan Storm says, I think you're failing to understand the bigger picture here. And when Victor Von Doom asks, what are you talking about? Her response is people are giving praise to the sun and it's no small thing to be worshipped. And what she basically says is the sun is a thing that's up there that people can see, that people can communicate with. They give praise to it because it's a tangible thing that's in there day after day, week after week, month after month. But you are shut up here in your citadel. You never really show people who you are or what you're about. They have a better understanding of what the sun is than they do you. And what you need to do, Victor, is you need to go down into the kingdom and let your people see you as you truly are. And the response of Victor is no. But it's not done out of arrogance. If anything, it's actually done out of fear. Is that, That's really kind of the biggest thing that's hit here. The funny thing about this is that Victor Von Doom says how many gods receive praise when they were seen. Gods receive the most amount of praise when they're not seen because people cannot tangibly see the things that the gods do. Basically, some things happen and then they chalk it up to God. And the best you ever really get is somebody somewhere witnessing an event that takes place and then writing it down somewhere and then it just gets passed on, right? The nature of the Bible. Whether or not you choose to believe it is up to you. And there's some people who look at that and say, okay, well, there was Jesus, but Jesus was probably a schizophrenic, right? He heard voices, believed he was the son of God. There are other people who look at that and say, no, he legitimately was the son of God. And he really did the things the Bible said he did and then came back to life after three days, right? Came back to life on Easter, I think is when it is. When it is. But, you know, nonetheless, in the modern day, all these different kind of events that are written about in the Bible, if they cannot be scientifically explained are just chalked up to faith. And the whole idea of Victor Von Doom is maybe I should have just been a prime mover, right? Created all of this and then left. And then people would have truly praised me as a God because he's here. And because he's tangible, despite all the power that he possesses, he still thinks like a mortal, which means he's afraid of being killed. He's afraid of all this coming crashing down, but it's, it, there's a little more to it, right? It's not just that fear. There's actually a lot more that goes into it, which we'll cover it a little bit later. But what we end up doing here is we switch to the hidden Isle of Agamotto. And what this basically appears to be is an island that not even Victor Von Doom can see, right? It's a, a section of battle world that only Stephen Strange knows about and only Stephen Strange can access along with whoever it is that he chooses to bring here. And when he ends up bringing Miles and Thor here, we end up learning that he found the other vessel at some point in time, but he never really gave any thought to it. The reason why this matters and the reason why this is important is because remember, Stephen Strange was not on Earth when the vessel was created, right? He was not on Earth when Reed Richards and the Illuminati and the rest of those guys were basically creating this life raft as a means to like escape the collapse of the incursions. You remember, he was out in space with like the Black Priests and then eventually with Doctor Doom and facing off against the Beyonders. He had no idea any of this happened. And so for a vessel to just kind of arbitrarily wash up on the shores of Battleworld for him was just like, okay, this is just part of whatever world happened to exist out there. And he never really gave it any thought. He's like, you know, like we put this place together with a hodgepodge of different worlds and maybe this was just part of one of those worlds, you know, maybe that's just all it was. And there, that was it. You know, with the, the more recent ship that's identical to this one having been opened up and then people coming out of it, then suddenly he's like, okay, there's more going on here than I initially thought. And that's when he basically ends up having this battle world version of Thor open the raft. And when that happens, you get Jane Foster Thor, you get Carol Danvers, Peter Parker, Spider-Man, and you get Star-Lord Peter Quill, survivors here. And they initially don't know if this is really Stephen Strange, right? They're like, we don't really know if it's you. But of course, you know, he kind of challenges them a little bit. And then he's met by the arrival of Cyclops, who's in the full possession of the Phoenix Force. Keep in mind, one of the things to remember is that yes, there was a Phoenix Egg. And yes, during the events of Avengers versus X-Men, you did have the Phoenix Five, but those those five pieces of the Phoenix Force had all coalesced down into the Phoenix Egg. And so Cyclops is in possession of the full totality of the Phoenix's powers. He is an omniversal force of power. That's what he is now. This gave us a massive hint as to what was going to happen. The reason being that if the Phoenix Force really is the sum total of all life that has ever currently does and will ever exist, then it means that Cyclops is the walking embodiment of everything that ever existed across the entirety of the multiverse before the event events of Battle World and everything that will come after, which basically solidifies that we were going to get, you know, everything coming after that. Now, it also kind of made sense from a public a publishing initiative. It wasn't as though Marvel was like, okay, guys, we finished Battle World. Time to close the doors. Everybody, you're fired. It's been real, guys. Peace. Like, it, it, that wasn't going to happen, right? Like... <laughs>
<laughs> but it's, it's important to understand Cyclops has a vast amount of power right now. But the fact remains that with Black Panther, of course, showing up, Black Panther basically solidifies, yes, we're from the main Marvel Universe when he says Memento Mori and Stephen Strange responds Illuminatus. So basically like it's the calling card, but then he basically starts telling them what, seeming, what seems to be going on here, right? Everything that's kind of happening here, that in reality for the people, for, for these guys inside this ship, it's been an hour. That for this hour, Reed Richards has basically been grieving over the loss of Susan and the loss of, of Johnny and, and all those guys who basically just ended up disintegrating, pa basically perishing, or at least seem to have perished in the collapse of the multiverse. But what he says here is that you guys have been gone for a very long time. It's been an hour for you. Eight years have passed here on this battle world. The reason why this works, and the, at least the reason why this seems to work, although it does seem kind of kind of throwaway, and we're kind of led to our own imagination here, is that when it comes to what had happened out there, that they've basically just been in stasis. That we can largely assume that with the collapse of the multiverse, also say also came the death of time and space, right? That like time doesn't pass, and there was there was no real space out there, right? There was just this giant empty white void. And grabbing what was left and throwing it down there, then it was basically it. Now on Battle World, time seemed to pass, but for them, just kind of being out there, they were left in stasis. And the idea is that when Stephen Strange keeps chiming in and basically saying that like God is the person who saved us, God's the person that created all of this, all that kind of good stuff, then suddenly you have the question asked by Reed, who is God. How is it possible that like nobody here knows, right? Because that's that's the thing that Stephen Strange says. Nobody on Battleworld knows how things used to be. Despite coming from universes that used to exist, none of them know how things were eight years before all of this. And this is probably one of the biggest things because when Peter asks the question, how is that possible? The response to Stephen is, well, how much of eight years ago do you recall? You might recall a moment from eight years ago, but you don't recall the world as you saw it when you were walking around downtown, you know, and just like getting ready to go into a store. You don't recall every facet of eight years ago. And it's very easy to manipulate that. It's very easy to say, well, I mean, you remember this moment from eight years ago, but you don't remember everything else from eight years ago. And here's everything else that was going on eight years ago. That combined with the fact that education, which is to say like what people are taught in battle world is tightly controlled by Dr. Doom basically means that people are only taught what they're allowed to be taught. And so over the last eight years or so, the thought process and the memories of all the people on battle world have basically been kind of converged and moved and coalesced. They've all essentially been convinced that battle world has always been this way and nothing was ever anything before this. And so again, when the question is asked by Reed, like, who is it, right? Who, who is this God that saved all of us? The response to Steven is, it's Doom. That Victor Von Doom saved us all. And they're all in just like total shock. Like, what in, what in the hell? And that's when T'Challa starts to pick up on things. And he says, how long ago did you find our raft? And Steven says, like, I found it three years ago. And I knew that there was something inside of Great Consequence, but I had to weigh that against other things. Reed gets pissed. He's like, wait a minute. So you're telling me that Victor Von Doom, a guy who spent his entire life trying to acquire absolute power so he can effectively subjugate all of creation has achieved that goal. And you had to weigh that against other considerations. Like what could have possibly been the other consideration that you had to weigh this against? And the response of Steven is, it's easy to explain. He's very good at playing God. At that point, we switch back over to Thanos, right? We jump directly to Thanos after having killed some food and basically made a meal and everybody's finished feasting. And one of the things that Maximus picks up on Maximus the Mad picks up on is the sun orbits the earth and not the other way around, right? Whatever this land happens to be, the sun orbits it. And it's just these small little things that seem strange. These small little things that seem so weird, which obviously they've picked up on the fact that this is not the earth they came from, that wherever it is that they're at, it's starkly different from where they used to be. And so in that time, you end up having, you know, the ultimate universe version of Reed Richards who says, we should not have killed that older Thor, right? We should not have killed that guy. We should have asked him things. We should have taken him prisoner and asked him things. He could have given us answers about what this place is about how all this stuff works and everybody's really kind of like yeah man like we really should right like they're all looking down to the fire the whole time Thanos is looking up right he's just kind of looking up into the stars and and so on and so forth and he's like there's no need for mercy right there's no need to regret what was lost and the question of, of Black Swan is like really because like I think that if we had kind of asked him what was going on here that he could have given us answers to our questions even if only under like pain of death and the response of Thanos is no the answers will find us I absolutely know that it will and when he's asked how do you know Thanos says because I I'm looking up the entirety of the Thor core. All these different versions of Thor are all descending down upon Thanos. They are all coming to find them. Okay, so we are back with Secret Wars 2015. Yes, we are. We are back with the Secret Wars event and we have Thanos and the Cabal fighting like 30 Thors. And here's the cool thing about this, right? Here's the cool thing about this. Like, as soon as this whole battle goes down, we're kind of given this, this sort of monologue, right? From, from Stephen Strange, right? Stephen Strange says, here's something you need to understand about how this world is different from the old one, right? The Earth that was, the universe that was, the multiverse that was, these were all 
all formed by some higher order, some alien, ethereal, other thing that perfectly constructed not just the material nature of everything, but the rules that governed it as well. But this world, this new world, it was formed from the shattered remnants of broken worlds. I know, for I watched Doom will them into singularity. If there's one thing you hear, let it be this. This new world is unnatural, and survival is its first and highest purpose. And that's the reality of this, right? The the Despite all the glitz and glamour, and despite like all the different kingdoms and how ordered and structured they may be, this battle between all these Thors and Thanos is the very nature of battle world, right? That it really is just a place of testing. It's a terrible place to live in. Only the strong really survive here. If you're too strong to rule a kingdom, then in turn, your rule will be will be taken over and you'll be subjugated by whoever takes your place. And if you try to fight against it, you'll be eliminated, right? But it's one of these things where only the weak are the ones who are ruled and only the strong are the ones who do the ruling. And it's not so clear cut as, you know, strong in, in terms of physical strength. It's strong in character, strong in gumption. Are you the kind of person that's capable of getting things done? Or are you the kind of person who looks to others to do things for you, right? To, to fix problems, to solve issues, different things like that. You just kind of stick your head in the sand and hope things just get better, right? That's the nature of what we're talking about here. Now, in terms of physical brute force, all these Thors are wrecked, right? They, they're they totally wrecked by, by Thanos and the Cabal. Like, they just weren't prepared. That's all it is, right? But when you switch back to Doctor Strange and you pick up with, like, Spider-Man, with Peter Parker, with Miles Morales, you pick up with Jane Foster Thor, you know, all that kind of stuff, you basically have this kind of explanation that's given because Reed asks, how did all this happen, right? How did this take place? place like what led to this and the explanation given to us by by dr strange kind of fills in uh really a lot of the gaps between what we saw at the end of hickman's avengers the new avengers and the beginning of now and or at least the start of battle world and what we're basically told is that in the final moments of that battle right in the final moments when dr doom molecule man owen reese and stephen strange approached the beyonders approached that fissure and when the beyonders asked who they were doom responded you know i am doom and i'm the person who's going to end your reign and they basically released all those molecule men on the beyonders and destroyed the beyonders and why out pretty much all the rest of the multiverse in the process that what this did is it left all this energy for the beyonders out there right it left all the energy of the beyonders just kind of sitting out there now we don't know exactly what it was that took place there in that moment but again that's one of the things that hickman does he kind of gives us these small little tidbits here and there these small little moments over the course of the story but the response to stephen strange is i looked into what was basically omnipotence the ability to do anything that i wanted to to have so much power that i could alter reality in virtually any way that i wanted to and i turned away from it right I was not ready for that kind of power, but Doom was, and Doom took that power and saved all there was that was left to save. And now Stephen Strange serves him. And that's the, that's kind of the crazy thing is because what, what, you know, when Miles chimes in and says like, so, so like everything, like everything's gone, like all my family, all my friends, everything that I know and love is completely and totally gone. The response of, of Stephen Strange is not all of it, right? Some version, some small pit, uh, bit of your New York still exists, right? It still remains as well as some small portion of Wakanda. But keep in mind, they're small little pieces. It's not the world that we knew. And that's what's kind of nuts here. The the, the question that's asked by Cyclops, and this is a really cool question here. The question that's asked by Cyclops is Stephen Strange. If you had the power, if you had the means to basically be the one who could have played God and the world that you have is not the world you want, then isn't it your responsibility to burn it down and raise up something better? Isn't it, if the world that you live in is not the world that you want, isn't it your job to fix it? Isn't it your job to basically do that? That's the burden that comes with this kind of power, right? It's the burden that comes with Doom's power. It's the burden that comes with your power. That if you don't like the world that Doom created, then your job is to undo it. Your job is to challenge Doom, bring him into his rule, bring him down and make a better world, right? And this is on the surface, it's easy to kind of look at this as just like a comic book thing, but that's true even here in the real world, right? If we don't like the world that we live in, if we don't like the environment we live in, whether it's the, the direction that the country is going in or the direction that your life is going in or the house that you're living in or the relationships, the friendships, all that kind of stuff, then it's your job to fix it, right? It's not your job to wait for someone else to fix it. It's your job to fix it. And it's your job to find a means to fix it with other people if that's what it requires, right? It's not your job to rest on your laurels and just hope that things get better, right? Because doing things changes things. Doing nothing keeps things exactly as they are. And that's the whole point that Cyclops makes here is with this power that I possess, then I will step up and I will do your job for you, right? Like if you are not willing to challenge Doom and bring him into his reign, then I will challenge Doom and I will bring an end to his reign, right? So the full power of
of the Phoenix Force. And that's what's kind of nuts about this is, remember, this is an omniversal source of energy. This is a massive source of power, right? Right on par with the Living Tribunal. And so when that happens in the midst of all this, you end up having one of these versions of Thor who basically uses his hammer to, to essentially send an SOS. They call it to prayer, right? To, you know, praying to God. But basically, it's a means to communicate with God, to communicate with Doom directly, and to basically tell him everything that's going on, everything that's happening. And it's kind of nuts because what's basically told here is that there's chaos in the kingdom, right? That the Thor Corps has been dispatched and they are they have called for reinforcements. So hundreds and hundreds of other Thors are going to descend down on here. But with these few Thors that are here, the, the battle is going poorly. And of course, you end up having, you know, uh, Victor Von Doom, you have Susan Storm and these guys who basically end up going to what's more or less a projector screen and watching all this take place. And Doom initially kind of is kind of dismissive of it, right? It's just kind of like, well, I mean, you know, it's not a great big huge thing. Like the Thor Corps will ultimately prevail. These forces really can't be that strong. But between Valeria and Susan, we're given some pretty significant information here. The first thing Valeria says is there are multiple versions of this Thanos character from across the multi or across the battle world, right? Each different universe, you know, we, we, we have some in some universes or some kingdoms. We don't have one in other kingdoms. But despite all the different versions of Thanos that we have out there, this is the most powerful version that I've ever seen. The other part of this is Susan is just like, look, not even my force fields can withstand that many blunt, that many attacks from like a hammer of Thor. So this person must be powerful, right? Like this guy Maximus the Mad, he must just be that powerful. And so that's when it's kind of like, okay, like, you know, Doom almost begins a process of saying, okay, we need to get involved. But then Stephen Strange shows up. And when Stephen Strange arrives, he brings his forces with him. The crazy thing about this is that watching all these different, these different people engage in battle, Valeria's response is, okay, like, yes, it seems more favorable. And yes, it seems like the Thor Corps may have another chance here or may, may have a chance of success against these forces, but we don't know the power of these guys. We don't know what level of power they possess. You know, if we sent in like a whole bunch of the Maloids, sure, we could send in a thousand of them, they would get crushed. Just because you have a, a, a higher number does not mean that you have the advantage. It just means you have a higher number, right? All things being equal. And so in turn, while that's going on, Susan like directs, you know, Victor Von Doom to the monitor and says like that guy there, right? The, the guy in blue with the beard, like, I don't know what it is about him, but like something, he feels different. There's something about him. You know, there's something special about this guy. And so in response to that, Doom basically says, okay, now it's time for me to act. Because again, what she's referring to is Reed Richards, right? This is the person that Victor Von Doom has been hunting for ever since he recreated Battleworld. He's been trying to find Reed Richards. And so he basically says, I will return shortly. Doom arrives on the scene. And when he does, everything stops. All fighting stops. And it's not even because he makes them, it's because of his presence, right? The power of Doom. Like he shows up, God has arrived onto the battlefield. And he immediately addresses Reed Richards. And Reed's response is like, this is like, this is really somewhat of an amazing thing that you've done here, right? An artificial construct of reality, a world where there should be nothing. Like, look at what you've made. This is a, this is an incredible achievement. But the question I have to ask here is what good have you done here, right? Like you put yourself on a throne, but like, what good have you done? Like, what have you done to make this world a better place? Have you just arrived here and you've, you've come into power and now you've made things worse? Can you really call yourself any measure of a leader at all? If what you've done is made this a crappier place. And the funny thing about this is Doom kind of dances around it and says like, I've always had a throne. I've had a throne for quite some time. It's my birthright. I've placed myself a good bit higher than that. And Thanos chimes in and says, have you? Because if you have, I have my doubts because you don't refer to yourself as God. And if a person is going to play God, then they shouldn't shy away from it. And the response of Doom is I am God. And then just unleashes on everybody. And essentially it's like, like literally just levitates them into the air and says, this is but a small sampling of the power that I possess. I'm not even beginning to consider the possibility of what it means to actually try here, right? Like this is just that small, that infinitesimal amount of the power that I have. So I'm going to give you guys an option. You guys are going to bend your knees, right? You're going to bend your knee to my power. And if you don't, if you don't recognize me as your God, then I will wipe you out. And so from there, then you have the Phoenix Force who steps in, right? You got Cyclops who steps in and says, I don't need your mercy. I don't need to bend to your knee. I don't need anything of that, of, of that, right? I am a, I'm a, I'm a reality shaper. I'm the Phoenix Force. I represent the sum total of all life that currently does, has ever, and will ever exist. And in the end, you're just like every other man, right? Playing at something greater than what you are. You are just a guy, right? You're just a guy with an incredible amount of power. I am life incarnate, right? I am what it means to be alive incarnate, the, the source of life energy itself. And where he goes to melt the helmet of Dr. Doom, then suddenly Cyclops is seized, right? Literally seized by Victor Von Doom. And when he says like, like where Cyclops is going on this grand speech about the future, like the future, like this planet's yours? No, let me help you understand something. Like the future you dream of, boy, that dream is dead. That dream is over. And he snaps the neck of Cyclops, right? Just like the entire Phoenix Force is obliterated, like just destroyed at the hands of Dr. Doom 
and the power he possesses. While all that's going on, Stephen Strange sees the writing on the wall and he tells he tells Black Panther, over the years that I've been here on Battleworld, I have seen many things and I have hidden most all of them. But he says, remember this one thing. Remember what I'm doing here. Remember this sacrifice that I'm making today. And he in turn whisks everybody here, all the like Namor the Submariner, Thanos, uh, T'Challa, all of them, whisks them all away. And it's only him and Victor Von Doom. And the question that Dr. Doom asks is like, where have you sent them? And the response of Steven is, I scatter them to the wind. And then when, when Doom asks, he says, why? Like, why would you do that? And the response of Steven is, because we both knew what was about to happen, that they would refuse. They would not bend their knee to you. They would not fall under your rule. And with that being the case, you would eliminate them in with, with extreme prejudice, right? You would have killed them. And he, and he tells them like, I haven't even told Reed Richards about the fact that you have Susan Storm and you have Valeria and you have Franklin, that you have them here, right? I haven't even told him that. I haven't told him any of that stuff. And when he, when the, when the demand of, of Doom is call them back, the response of Steven is no. And Doom says, you will not test me, Steven. And the, and the response of Steven Strange is, I'm sorry, but I can't, right? Like at the end of the day, you're afraid of him, right? Like you're afraid of Reed Richards. You're like, what do you think he'll do when he found out about the life you stole? What do you think he's going to do? At the moment, he's entertained. At the moment, he's curious about all this, but neither you nor I have really found and really discovered what Reed Richards could do if he put his mind to task on bringing you down. If that was his singular one focus, if that was his one thing, and that's the only thing that he wanted to do was to bring you down, what would it look like? Imagine how hard and how fast you would fall if that was his one and only goal. And so having said that, Steven's like, you are afraid of Reed Richards. And if I'm being honest with you, I think you should be. And with that insult, thwack, like Stephen Strange annihilated. Stephen Strange is just killed by Victor Von Doom. Okay, so we are getting back into Secret Wars. Yes, we are. People have been asking, when do we get the next Secret Wars video? You get it right now. <laughs> so what we end up doing here is picking up in the aftermath of Stephen Strange's death at the hands of Doctor Doom, right? The fact that, that God King Doom had killed Stephen Strange because in a lot of ways, Stephen Strange betrayed him. But nobody knows that's what's happened, right? Nobody knows that that's what, what, what uh, Victor Von Doom did. Instead, we pick up with this massive funeral procession for Stephen Strange, which kind of makes sense because the way this procession is given to us by one one of the members of the Thor Corps, seemingly its oldest member, he basically says that, that, you know, kind of gives us the story in terms of how everybody out there views it. That in the beginning, there was nothing, and then there was everything. And that only God, King Doom, and Stephen Strange were the ones who witnessed all of creation. Now, this gives us a little more insight into what happened, right? We as the reader know that before all of this was the main Marvel Universe, right? You know, the Avengers, Fantastic Four, X-Men, so on and so forth. And that we ended up having Doctor Doom by one means or another, which we'll actually find out in the story, basically created Battle World, right? You in the power of the Beyonders, he created Battle World, and that's how all of this came into existence. But what's basically been told here, or at least the, the belief that everybody has here, is that there was nothing before Battle World, right? There was no multiverse, no nothing, right? It was simply just an empty void, just an empty space, and then God King Doom saw the creation of all things. Now, an important thing to understand here is what the One Above All has been doing, because a lot of people were asking that question. When we first covered this, and even during the first civil, uh, the first Secret Wars, when this, when this whole thing went down, people were asking all over the place, what's the One Above All doing? Why doesn't the One Above All get involved? here. The reason that I would really offer here is because the one above all isn't really concerned about this kind of thing. And there's a couple reasons for this. The first is because of the fact that the multiverse collapses and dies. It's just the nature of things, right? It was inevitable the multiverse was going to die. If the multiverse was a concept that was never supposed to die, and then it did die at the hands of really Doom and, and uh, Doctor Strange and all the stuff that had happened in terms of the collapse of the multiverse, then the one above all may very well have gotten involved here. But the reality is that it was expected to die, and we've seen it die before, right? The multiverse has died and been re born up until this story had been done like six times. And so because of that, it was just the natural cycle of things. And so there's no reason to believe the one above all would get involved here. The other part of this is that the one above all, as Marvel puts it forward to us, is kind of the creator of the omniverse, right? So it's Marvel's answer to the question, how do all things in existence exist, right? The DC universe, the DC multiverse, the real world that we live in, all that kind of stuff. It was all created by the one above all, right? DC has their own answer for that question in the form of the presence. Spawn has that has that, that question answered in the form of the mother of creation or whatever it was that it was called, right? I mean, different comic book publications and different titles offer this type of character in their own way. And so if that's the case, the death of the Marvel multiverse in the space of all creation is an infinite to, you know, infinitesimally small thing, right? So it'd be like, oh my God, you know, like a small island out there in the middle of nowhere was blown up by like a hydrogen bomb. We wouldn't care because it has nothing to do with anything, it has nothing to do with us, and it has no real bearing on anything that we have going on. So what concern would it be to us, right? That's the kind of logic that the 
one above all operates in. Now, again, this is me just kind of guessing. We're not given an answer here to anything, but I did want to throw that out there because a lot of people have been asking that in the comments, where's the one above all in the midst of all this? The one above all is doing whatever it does, right? Just sitting around watching Golden Girls and eating chocolate. Who knows? <laughs> Who has any idea? It's watching Avatar The Last Airbender for the 1,000th time like Mariah does because she says it's the greatest show ever, which I don't necessarily agree with. That title belongs to none other than dun, 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 The Wire. Having said that... <laughs> You know, with this funeral procession basically concluding, uh, everything more or less just kind of kind of coming to an end, Franklin Richards pays his tribute to Stephen Strange and then kind of makes this declaration that whenever it is that he finds these individuals who did all this, that he's going to unleash holy hell, right? That's just the power of Franklin. Now, at that point, it switches over to God King Doom, basically kind of in this garden and in this little bit of a, this real cemetery kind of honor memorial for Stephen Strange when he's met by Valeria. And she starts to put these pieces together immediately, right? The the, the explanation offered here by, by uh, by Dr. Doom is that the forces that were out there were the ones who led to Stephen Strange's death. He doesn't say it in so many words. He doesn't say that he didn't do it, but at the same time, he doesn't say that he did. He's just like, there were forces at play there and Stephen Strange died. And just kind of alludes to the fact that those various people who were out there basically pointed the finger to like Thanos, the Cabal, those kind of guys. They were the reason why, you know, uh, Dr. Strange died. Valeria is not really buying it. She puts on the illusion that she is. She puts on the illusion that like, yeah, you know, I mean, okay, I kind of get where you're coming from, but at the end of the day, she's not buying into it. And that's an important distinction to understand here because as that happens, she starts asking questions like, I don't understand how it was that they all escaped. If these forces out here killed your closest friend, surely you, God King Doom, would have just eradicated them like that, right? You would have just taken them out and that would have been the end of them. Why didn't you do that? And the response of Doom is because in that moment, I probably would have destroyed the world and I needed to step back. I needed to kind of relax. And it doesn't really make any sense because God King Doom has never presented himself as a person who's out of control of his emotions, right? Who's out of control of his ability to use his power. And so it doesn't really make any sense that a guy who is so in control of himself and possesses the power of God would in turn have his best friend killed by some enemy forces out there and then do nothing, right? And then somehow they get away. It just doesn't add up. But where she kind of begins to poke and prod, Doom basically cuts her off and says, stop asking questions, right? That right in and of itself is more or less an admission of guilt, right? But he's like, stop asking questions. What I need for you to do is to go find these forces. I need you to track them down. Are you the daughter of Doom? Are you capable of all things? And her response is yes. And Doom says, then find them. And then of course, looks at the statue of Stephen Strange and says, damn you, Stephen. Now at this point, this is when we start to get this kind of explanation, right? This, this, this little bit of really as much as, uh, as much as, is, is uh, you know, Hickman gives us insofar as what happened in those moments between the collapse of the multiverse and the, the, the formation of Battle World, right? He doesn't give us like a full on one shot, which when this story came out, that's kind of what I was expecting. I was expecting like Secret Wars number seven or Secret Wars number five or number six or whatever to just be like a full on story that was just like, here's everything that happened, right? You know, just kind of filling in all that stuff. But what we end up doing here is picking up with Dr. Doom when he travels into this kind of hidden bunker below Doomstead, right? Below his castle. And we're met with the Molecule Man Owen Reese, that what Dr. Doom has been doing is keeping him down here. Now, the reason why is because the Molecule Man is the source of the of, of Dr. Doom's powers. And the way this worked is one of these really intriguing things is that when Dr. Doom goes down there and tells the Molecule Man, Stephen Strange is dead, the Molecule Man's like, man, that's crazy. Like, how is that even possible? You know, it's, it's one of these things where, where, you know, Molecule Man's like, you know, like what and like, how could this have possibly taken place? And what they do is kind of give us a run over of what we already know insofar as like the nature of the Molecule Man he was created by the Beyonders. We, you know, one of them was designed to detonate in every single universe. They were going to blow them all up at the same time and wipe out the whole multiverse. That was the Beyonders plan. But what the Beyonders didn't account for, and this is an exceedingly important thing because it also applies to Dr. Doom. What the Beyonders did not account for was the Molecule Man having choice. It's one thing they didn't consider, right? And that's kind of the nature of what it means when it comes to beings who fancy themselves gods. In order for the Molecule Man to effectively blend in with the world and for no one to really see that there was something off about him, they gave him the ability of free will. And the reason why this matters is because free will is both a benefit, but it's also a drawback. And when it comes to a well-developed plan like this, it was a drawback because what it meant was that the Molecule Man, where you had different Molecule Men from different realities who were pursuing different goals, ambitions, who did different things, the Molecule Man from the main Marvel Universe allied itself with Doctor Doom. And just by virtue of that one decision, it led to what was supposed to be the end of the, of the Beyonders' plans. But what we had talked about in the collapse of the multiverse and something that we're kind of clearing up here 
When you had Doctor Doom traveling from universe to universe killing Molecule Men, the reality was the clock was ticking. It was only a matter of time before the Beyonders implemented their plan, they hit the button and detonated all the Molecule Men across the multiverse and destroyed the multiverse in the process. The hope of Doctor Doom was that he was he could basically race against time and mitigate the amount of destruction that would be done and the multiverse would be saved. That's why he created the, the army of the Black Swans, so that they could kind of continue on this mission in Doctor Doom's absence. And the reason why we had Doctor Doom's absence is because he began to realize very, very fast there was no way to do this. There was no way to kill enough Molecule Men to mitigate the bomb or mitigate the destruction of the multiverse. And so instead, what they started doing was capturing Molecule Men. And that's when they started putting Molecule Men in this kind of chamber and holding on to them. And when the time came that they would confront the Beyonders, which is exactly what they did, they would detonate all the Molecule Men at the Beyonders and basically destroy the Beyonders. And that's what took place here, right? That's what we saw at the very end, or at least, you know, near the end of, uh, of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers run. The part that we didn't see is that what they did is that in the destruction of all these different, uh, all these Beyonders, their power basically just kind of coalesced, right? It was a source of energy that just kind of existed out there. And the idea of Doctor Doom and, and Doctor Strange and the Molecule Man was to capture that energy, to basically capture it and, and hold on to it, put it in a containment device and use it. But the issue is that, you know, Doctor Doom can't simply just absorb the power of all the Beyonders into himself. It would drive him crazy and it would destroy him. But the Molecule Man was created by the Beyonders to be a conduit it for their power and that's what happens here is that the is that the molecule man sits down inside this chamber surrounded by all the power of the beyonders and what the molecule man does is he gave victor von doom a portion of that power now that allows him to do virtually anything he wants to way more than anybody else could do and it allowed him to basically save what was left right so he really is god but the irony of all this is that dr doom does not have the full totality of the beyonders power he only has a portion of it and that's the kind of power that we're dealing with here right omnipotence on a multiversal scale, the ability to stop and do virtually anything that you want to. That's what's so wild here is that as he has this kind of conversation, he basically tells, you know, the, tells the Molecule Man, I'm the one that did it, right? I'm the one who killed Stephen Strange. And the response of Molecule Man is, I know, you reek of guilt. But at the end of the day, Victor Von Doom says, it was in the greater good, right? I did what I had to do in order to preserve Battleworld, in order to preserve all that is. And the Molecule Man's response is, but have you really though? Because I feel like all you've done here is you've seeded doubt in those who didn't have it before. People are asking questions. People want to know why the best friend of God was killed and God didn't do anything to stop those or destroy those who killed his best friend. People are going to start doubting you. And what you've begun to do here is you've basically seeded this doubt in such a way that everything is going to start unraveling. Forces that previously were not working against you are going to start working against you now. And what we do is we switch over to the Department of Science with the Future Foundation, who were previously just the smartest kids in the world and are now the smartest people on Battleworld. And what goes on is that you have Valeria Richards, who basically assembles the entire team. And what this team has been doing is for the last year, they've been working on a device that allows them to basically analyze God King Doom's power, right? Originally, it was just kind of research. It was curiosity. But the fact that Battleworld basically emanates all the power of Victor Von Doom made it exceedingly difficult to differentiate between him and somebody else. And so the result of that is once they were able to basically isolate his frequency, for lack of a better word, then it allowed them to basically un understand his power and then look at everything else, right? So it was like they were seeing everything in black and white, and then they basically managed to find a way to see color, right? They were seeing red and blue and green and all that kind of stuff. And so what it means is that when they were analyzing this, they realized that there was only one person out there whose level of power spiked in the same way that Dr. Dooms did on the time when Stephen Strange was killed. And that was Stephen Strange's power. While they don't know the details, what they've basically figured out here is that in that time when Victor Von Doom teleported to the battlefield, that Dr. Strange's power spiked and then Victor Von Doom's power spiked and then Stephen Strange died. And so again, while they don't know the details, it basically points to the idea that, that Dr. Doom killed Stephen Strange. And so that's why Valeria basically says, here's what's going to happen. We're going to follow this to its definitive end, right? We're going to follow this no matter where it goes, no matter where it leads us. I will deal with whatever hassle we get from the throne, right? Whatever hassle we get from Dr. Doom, he starts asking questions, but we are going to find out where this thread goes. And if this thread leads us to a place where we discover that Victor Von Doom is the one who killed Stephen Strange, then we act accordingly. We treat him as a traitor to battle world, right? Despite the fact that he's on the throne, he's a traitor to all the people here and all the rules that he created. If it turns out that he's innocent, then we punish those who are guilty. But we basically do not stop, right? It doesn't matter who we find that's at fault here, we will find somebody. And so what we get are these small little moments where you find out where some of these people went, right? You find out that Black Panther and then with a Submariner were teleported to Egyptia, one of the kingdoms out there, that uh, Carol Danvers was teleported to Bar Sinister, where you have, you know, Mr. Sinister kind of ruling the whole area. Jane Foster, who was teleported to Doomguard, where she basically hangs out with all the, all the Thor, 
course. And you've got Black Swan who was teleported to Doomstat. But the most important thing here, and the single biggest thing here, is that Thanos has been teleported to the shield. Thanos has been teleported to the one barrier that separates him from the army of the undead, from Marvel Zombies. And as we know, Thanos loves the idea of death. Wouldn't it be wild if Thanos allied himself with Marvel Zombies? Well, uh, outside in the cold distance, a wildcat did growl. Two riders were approaching, and the wind began to howl. Hey! <laughs> What's going on guys? This is Rob. And I really feel like if Secret Wars from 2015 had a soundtrack, one of the songs would be All Along the Watchtower by Jimi Hendrix because it is an amazing song. We are picking back up with Secret Wars 2015 and, and this kind of jumps forward basically three weeks. Now, again, here's kind of the funny thing is in the, the three weeks that this has happened, or the three weeks since we had issue number five going into issue number six, that we kind of had this scenario play out where we ended up having some of the forces of Thanos' Cabal, who were basically basically captured. Corvus Glaive and Proxima Midnight had been sent to two different locations. They ended up coming across each other and then found themselves in the realm of Apocalypse, right? So basically, the battle world story of uh, Age of Apocalypse. And they were overwhelmed quite readily by Apocalypse's forces, and not even by a little bit, right? It's one of the things that's kind of established here, is that like Apocalypse and his horsemen just crushed these guys, right? And it kind of makes sense when you're talking about somebody as powerful as Apocalypse. I do think it's interesting to see the character of Apocalypse in this light, right? And he's actually going to have an amazing amazing moment towards the end of the story when he takes on the entirety of the Thor Corps and actually starts to win. But because of the fact that they've, the, the two of them have basically been captured, Valeria, of course, appears to, to God King Doom. And God King Doom's real response is, who are these guys, right? Like, what's the whole idea behind these guys? And initially, Valeria is like, okay, you know, we, we've been able to kind of probe their mind a little bit. And what we, what we believe is this guy's name is Corbus. And when he asked Black Swan, who of course was also one of the people who was, who was scattered and then found her way to Doomstat, he asked her, like, is this correct? And she says, no, that's not correct at all. They're not companions. They're not teammates. They're husband and wife, right? The male is Corvus Glaive, and the woman is Proxima Midnight. They're their surviving members of the Black Order of Thanos, right? They're the, the last remnants of the of really the Cole Obsidian. And so with that, when that's kind of thrown out there, one of the things that's interesting is that you have Susan Storm who kind of chimes into uh starts talking to talking to Doctor Doom. And the idea here was that when Black Swan showed up here at Doomstat, one of the things to keep in mind is she was one of the Black Swans of Doctor Doom. So Doctor Doom recognizes what she is and he recognizes, you know, the role that she was supposed to play before the collapse of the multiverse in the sense that in that collapse, he created her or at least brought her in alongside a whole bunch of other black swans for the purpose of just killing molecule men across the multiverse. But remember, black swans don't know that it's Dr. Doom. They had no idea that he was Raboom Alal. They were never allowed to actually see him. And so because of that, it seems as though she kind of picks up on who Doom is, that he's Raboom Alal. We're not really given a definitive, you know, kind of, I recognize you, you're Raboom Alal. We're not really given that, right? It's just kind of, you know, she sort of seems to indicate that she knows who he is, right? And because of the fact that Doom knows who she is, this kind of unspoken understanding between the two is not really made, made uh, you know, evident to Susan Storm or anybody else. And it's why, under normal circumstances, when Susan Storm chimes in and she says, if this woman, Black Swan, has really repented the way that she says she has, and she's seen the error of her ways, then why should you have to ask her for this information? Why wouldn't she just giving it, you know, give it willingly? And Doom basically gives her a pass, right? It's just kind of like, well, you know, it's a little bit different here. And just kind of chalks it up to that. The other explanation that we get is that, for the most part, Black Swan can't really offer any explanation on where anybody is, right? That's kind of what Doom asks, like, tell me where they all are. And she doesn't know. And Corvus Glaive and Proxima Midnight don't know. They were just kind of scattered to random locations by Stephen Strange before Doom killed him. They don't know where anybody else is. And so when the question is asked of Valeria, do we know anything of their plans? Do we do we know where the other uh, others are? Do we know any of this stuff? The response of Valeria is no. We have no idea where they are and we have no idea what they're doing. Now, keep in mind, Valeria doesn't believe Dr. Doom when he says that, like, when he says, like, Stephen Strange was killed by, like, the forces out there, right? She knows he's hiding something, she just doesn't know what it is. And so what you end up getting is this kind of scenario where you basically switch back over to Reed Richards of the main Marvel Universe and Reed Richards of the Ultimate Universe, who are operating in the body of what looks to be a Galactus or a Celestial, right? But like the body of a technological being. Now, the other thing that's kind of going on here is that these, you know, devices are basically being created by both versions of Reed Richards in order to kind of look out into Battle World and to find something. Now, what that something is, we don't fully know, but it looks as though one of them had been successful and and basically a kind of mission was undertaken by people, by, by you know, a couple forces from the main Marvel Reed Richards to achieve whatever that goal is. And we'll find out what it is, right? I'm just kind of being a little, yeah, I don't want to give it away at the moment. But the cool thing here is that Ultimate Reed versus main Marvel Universe Reed, they're distinctly different, right? Ultimate Reed Richards is by all standards of measurement, a dick, right? That's 
basically what he is. He's far more heavy handed. He's got no qualms with killing. He only really cares about himself. The main Marvel Universe Reed Richards is totally opposite, right? He cares about something more than himself and he's really more of an explorer, right? Like he cares more about exploring and seeing what's out there than he does about straight up being like a guy who fights people. Now don't misunderstand that. He's not a pacifist, right? He's not somebody who's just like resting on his laurels and like just waiting on the world to change. Like he's actually a person out there doing things, right? He's actually, you know, fighting and, and you know, when he needs to and that kind of, that kind of a thing. And so what we end up learning is that during this time, somewhere along the line, you ended up seeing the rise of a person called the prophet. Now, the, the reality of this is Hickman doesn't necessarily connect these two things. He kind of leaves it to us. But in the early stories, when we first started Secret Wars, one of the things that we learned is that there were those out there who had lost faith in God King Doom. They didn't really believe that he was as great of a leader as he said he was, or in the absence of him actually being out there for the world to see. That dissent, which is to say early people who were looking at his rule and saying we can overthrow him, began to turn into a movement. But it didn't really have a leader, right? It didn't really have anybody running the show. And so it would have been very easy to destroy in a number of different ways. But with the rise of the prophet, this has now become a thing where they actually have somebody who's leading this movement, who can basically say, here's what we need to do, and kind of organizing all that stuff. Now, the implication here is that this prophet exists by virtue of the actions of Ultimate Reed Richards, that he seems to have sent somebody out there to organize this rebellion against God King Doom. And he won't tell the main Marvel Universe Reed Richards who it is, or if he's, if he's even actually involved at all. Hickman's more or less just kind of like, I mean, you know, I mean, he basically is, right? I mean, that's, that's basically what Hickman tells us here, but, you know, he doesn't necessarily give us a definitive answer. The other discussion that's kind of going on is that where the main Marvel Universe read is kind of withholding his own information and saying like, I'm not going to tell you what kind of secret mission I have going on at the moment. The big discussion point, the big talking point here is whether or not to kill Dr. Doom. And the problem with this is that Reed is like, I'm not ready to do something like that. Now, the reality is that's the failing of Reed, right? That's the failing of Reed Richards is that Reed Richards actually ends up disarming himself in a lot of different ways, right? Where he could take up arms and he could make sure that he and his own are protected, that he does that within the confines of his belief system. But if you're a person who always believes in trying to talk problems out and you're facing off against a person who wants to take up arms and kill you, you're going to lose that fight. And so words versus guns, which one hurts more, right? guns, right? Because that can end your life, right? That can kill you. You know, words, not so much. Like if I call you a dick, that's not going to be as bad as me like shooting you, right? Because like you would die. And that's the problem with Reed, right? The, the biggest issue that Reed Richards has, and really the biggest issue that a lot of superheroes have is they kind of maintain this line where they're like, what defines us as heroes is that we don't do whatever we need to do to get rid of the bad guys, right? It's kind of a hallmark of comics, right? We don't kill the bad guys because if we did, we'd become just as bad as the bad guys. But keep in mind, this is not real life. It's a comic book. It's designed to end however a writer ends it. In the real world, if you're not willing to become as bad as the bad guys, you're going to lose. It's kind of one of these important distinctions to understand here. Yes, there's time to talk, but sometimes you also got to carry a big stick, right? And so what you end up getting here is Ultimate Reed Richards, who basically shows the main Marvel Universe Reed, if it's not really something that you're so big on, then look at the reality of the situation. Dr. Doom has in his possession Franklin Richards, Valeria Richards, Susan Storm. This should have been your life by all standards of measurement. You're okay with this? And Reed, of course, kind of takes the, the traditional superhero high road and, and more or less kind of ignores it and says the problem as I see it is determining how Victor came into such power. Now, in the mind of Reed, this is semantics, right? Killing Dr. Doom, overthrowing Dr. Doom, right? Taking his power and overthrowing him is all more or less the same thing. But again, it's not, right? It's, they're, they're two distinctly different things. If you kill a guy, he can never take power again. If you overthrow him, he can find a way back, right? And so it's one of these cool things because the secret mission that the main Marvel Universe Reed Richards sent or, or really kind of had going on came in the form of Peter Parker and Miles Morales, right? Now, on the surface, it seems kind of throwaway. This is one of the small little things about Marvel Comics that Jonathan Hickman pays attention to. For years and years and years, Spider-Man was shown as being a character who was intelligent in terms of his wherewithal when it came to technology, but he was never really shown as being somebody that was on par with like Reed or could figure out things that like Reed Richards couldn't figure out, stuff like that. He's a legit superhero and he's incredibly intelligent, right? So because of that, that's one of the reasons why Spider-Man's here. That and the fact that he and, he and Miles are the only ones that Reed can really trust for a task like this, right? So maybe it's just one of these things where it's just diminished opportunities or diminished, you know, uh, resources. But regardless of the situation, they're looking for the source of Dr. Doom's power. The funny thing is, so is Valeria, right? We covered that. The Valeria and the Future Foundation were looking for the source of Reed's power. Now, Peter Parker recognizes Valeria, but Valeria does not recognize Peter Parker. There's a reason for this, right? There's a reason why this is the case, and we'll find out why that is here in a little bit, because we would expect her to. Because of this, you kind of get this, this interesting sort of exchange where he asks the question, like, are you coming in? And she says, no, like, I'm not going in there. Like, at this point, I'm a kid, right? I can't 
can't emotionally handle all this stuff. But she does ask a question. She's like, there is something that I need to know here. And Peter's like, okay, what's the question? And she says, you were on that vessel, the one that was found. And Peter Parker says, yes, right? It was, it was one of those two vessels and it was basically a life raft. And then she asks, you guys didn't kill Stephen Strange, did you? And the response of Peter is, no, none of us did. None of us on the raft killed Stephen Strange. And that's when it's kind of like, okay, that's exactly what I thought. Now, once they descend down into the source of power, that's when we kind of get this explanation of how Battle World works. It's, it's really, really fast. But basically, the idea of Battle World existing is that when we saw in the previous video that Battle World existing was by virtue of the fact that God King Doom was basically holding it together, that all creation before the events of Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, right? So before the collapse of the multiverse, was all created by a being out there of incredible power, right? The one above all. And the one above all orchestrated and, and kind of designed this in such a way to where it was a it was a puzzle that fit perfectly together. What Doctor Doom is doing here is basically cramming a square peg into a round hole. These worlds don't belong together. They're not supposed to be together. It's why it's kind of described as like tectonic plates that are grinding against each other and puzzle pieces that don't fit. It's not supposed to be that way. The imperfect structure of Battle World is designed to reflect the imperfect nature of Doctor Doom. That a human with all the flaws that a human has is trying to play God in comparison to a being out there that literally is perfect in every conceivable way and cannot make mistakes because everything that happens happens according to their will. And so again, it's just kind of a kind of a small little reflection, a small little nuance to the nature of Battle World and the problem with Doom. That Battle World is just waiting to fall apart. But once they get down there, they're met with the Molecule Man Owen Reese. Now the Molecule Man recognizes both of them, or recognizes Peter. He knows exactly who Peter is. And when he asks them for something to eat, Miles Morales pulls out a hamburger. Now, the funny thing about this is that while they were in suspended animation, for them, eight years didn't actually pass, right? It was just like an hour or two. And so technically he only had, you know, once they got out of the ship, he only had that hamburger in his pocket for about an hour, but it's also been three weeks. So this is a three week old hamburger that he feeds to Owen Reese and Owen doesn't care. He's just like, it's delicious. <laughs> I have been dying for something to eat and I don't really much care what it is. But once he has a full stomach, then he kind of starts basically picking up on why they're here. You guys are looking for a certain thing. And what you're looking for is the source of Dr. Doom's power. That's literally when you end up having the Molecule Man who chimes in and says, you're in it. Like I am the source of Dr. Doom's power. I'm the reason why he is the way he is, or at least how he's able to do the things he's able to do. Now from here, we kind of jump over to, uh, to, to, you know, God King Doom having a conversation with Baroness uh, Madeline Pryor and then with the Baron's Apocalypse and Mr. Sinister. Now, Madeline, uh, Madeline Pryor requires a smidge of explanation here, but basically she comes from a realm called Inferno. But Inferno was an actual storyline that took place in Marvel Comics, and that's all Battle World really is. It's just a series of worlds where those stories just never ended. But Madeline Pryor is basically a clone of Jean Grey, right? The idea was that at some point in the main Marvel Universe, long before the events of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, Mr. Sinister came to the realization that if Jean Grey and Cyclops ever had a kid, it'd be insanely powerful and Sinister could use that kid for his own ends. But Jean Grey ended up dying. And so what he did is, is prior to that he had cloned Madeline Pryor and then when Jean Grey died a piece of the Phoenix Force activated Madeline and basically brought her to life and uh, that in turn allowed Sinister to send her out into the world and to basically have a child with Cyclops which grew up to be Cable. But this kind of leads into the events of, of Inferno. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in between right I'm kind of hopping and skipping around here. The long and short of this is that Madeline Pryor is pretty powerful but in this realm she runs she rules the entire kingdom that is the Inferno Kingdom right the Inferno storyline in that particular section of Battle World. And so you also have Maestro here and Maestro is kind of interesting because he's like, if I wanted your throne, God King Doom, I would take it. But it's one of these things where he kind of asks them, like, should I really be concerned about this uprising? And he kind of gets these, these sort of thrown away, thrown away answers, things like that, until you get to Apocalypse. And the response of Apocalypse is the prophet is real and the uprising is real. And the fact in the in the face of the fact that people don't see you, they don't realize that they they know you're there, but they but they don't really have any way to, to get to you. And and for the most part, you never really say anything. Your inaction here has allowed dissent to basically grow. In effect, you have an illness in your kingdom and you've never treated it and it's grown. And so the only way to really deal with this is to kill him. You have to kill the pro the prophet and you have to kill all the people who support him. You have to basically send a message out there in saying, if you stand against me, you will die. Now that won't necessarily end everything. Fear only goes so far. And then fear turns into anger and anger turns into the inability to stop that force, whatever that force happens to be. You piss off people enough and you give them nothing to lose, then they'll do whatever they have to do in order to win. And so in, in reality, it'll work in the moment, but this is also kind of the failing of, of Apocalypse, right? Like if I hammer them hard enough, then they will eventually acquiesce. But what happens if you come across a foe that's not willing to acquiesce? The more you hammer them, the more angry they become and the more, more of a desire to fight back that's instilled in them. That was kind of the failing of Apocalypse for a long, long time. And so in response to Apocalypse's advice, you in turn have Dr. Doom who basically tells the other barons, then get out there and quell this threat on your own. I'm not going to send out the entire Thor Corps to do this. You do it on your own, right? You are an extension 
opposite of my power. And if you quell this uprising in your kingdoms, then it'll become apparent that I'm the one who's doing it. It's kind of wild to know that God King Doom, despite having all this power, is not really willing to use it to quell this threat. Because the truth is, he could basically just say, round up everybody out here who is, who's part of that rebellion, and then bring them to me. And then basically, like, organize the entirety of all the kingdoms, bring them all together, or make them all watch on some kind of screen or something like that. And then all these different forces who were out there who were part of the rebellion turn their skin inside out or torture them to the point where they go insane or remove the skin off their bodies. Like you could do any number of things to send a message that basically says the punishment that awaits you is so extreme that it's not even worth trying in the first place, right? Because usually that's the only thing that really works to create a punishment that's so astronomically extreme that it pulls away and it, and it basically strips people of any desire to even want to fight in the first place now the other thing goes on here is we transition over to to susan storm and susan storm is telling this bedtime story to franklin richards and what this does is explain probably something that you guys a lot of you guys have been wondering about which is the nature of like susan storm franklin valeria like why franklin and valeria refer to dr doom as dad and why susan storm sees him as her husband the reason for this is, is kind of given to us in the nature of their origins that before the multiversal collapse in the world they came from that when they became the fantastic four there was no reed richards right that all you had was dr franklin storm you had johnny storm you had ben Grimm, and you had susan that reed was not part of the picture we're not really told why probably because just reed and susan never met right they just never never bumped into each other but they ended up traveling going through the whole thing where they were hit by cosmic rays basically the origin of the fantastic four and when they came back to earth they became superheroes but then somewhere along the line they were met by the arrival of an incursion and that incursion almost destroyed the reality but what god king doom ended up doing was basically reaching in and plucking them from that reality now that's when they basically arrived on battle world right they were brought here by dr doom but at the time that they were brought here battle world was a dark place it was a place of testing it was a place of conflict it was basically perpetual war but in the moment where basically the forces of apocalypse his horsemen were going to kill susan and they were going to kill johnny storm and ben Grimm, that you ended up having of course dr storm who was killed but you also had god God King Dune, who looked down upon Susan and all them and spared their lives and basically married them, right? He married Susan Storm uh, and then in turn, she gave birth to Franklin and Valeria, right? So simply they come from a universe where there was no Reed Richards, right? So this is not Susan and Franklin and Valeria and all them from the main Marvel universe because they're dead. You in turn switch over to Name One the Submariner and Black Panther. Now these two guys, enemies, right? Mortal enemies, they hate each other. But what they've also realized is that the multiverse is gone. The world they lived in is gone. The kingdoms they had are basically gone that atlantis was burned to the ground atlantis is gone you know that namor is a kingdom of ash and that that black panther is a king of the dead they don't really represent kings of anything tangible in the real world they're just two guys who were out there and so fighting on behalf of their kingdoms is nonsense the biggest goal here is let's fulfill this purpose right we're currently out here and we're trying to find the the hidden isle of agamotto we're trying to find the island of dr stephen strange and so once they end up getting there of course you end up having black panther who basically presents the key he, like, he literally presents the key that he was given to him by Stephen Strange that grants him access into the actual island itself, into the into the building. But the problem is that once he gets in, he's met by a test, right? That kind of this disembodied, you know, holographic head of Stephen Strange pops up and says, you found this thing to him and you have a key. But if you have the key, it means I died. The problem with this is, did I give you the key or did you take it off my corpse? Did you kill me and take it? The only way for you to basically access the secrets of this place is to pass a test, is to answer this riddle, Memento Mori. And the Black Panther responds, Illuminatus. This is the way in which the Illuminati determined who they were supposed to be. Now, remember, we saw that during Hickman's of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. There was a small moment where you saw that that whole thing taking place. And so with that being the case, you end up having Stephen Strange who basically tells them, like, I'm glad you passed, right? I hope that my passing was of some measure of consequence, right? Some knowledge that I had of Battle World, of how it was formed, all that kind of stuff, will be gone forever. But there are some things that I left behind. I left two major artifacts for you. The first one is the Siege Courageous, not to be confused with the Siege Perilous. The Siege each perilous in Marvel Comics is a device that if you pass through it, it allows you to start your life over again. Uh, if the, the, the Siege Courageous itself means if you pass through it, that one, it'll teleport you wherever you want to go, and two, it'll move you to your true potential, right? So as you pass through it, you'll be you'll basically become the best version of yourself. But he says, the second thing that I left you is perhaps the only thing out there capable of stopping Victor Von Doom. This thing exists because Battle World itself is a collection of different lands, but on the bigger scale, it's a collection of realities. And if you can manipulate the power of those realities, you could basically have God. But being able to manipulate the power of this reality is only one facet. This artifact will also allow you to manipulate the time of this reality.
reality and the space of this reality. And that's the cool thing because he basically says like, what I'm leaving behind for you is an infinity gauntlet. Black Panther, this is this is an amazing moment. In Marvel Comics, Black Panther gets the infinity gauntlet. And the, and the response to Stephen Strange is use it wisely. And if you must, use it quickly for it just may be the only thing on this world which can smite God King Doom. Okay, so we are picking back up again with Secret Wars. Yes, we are. We are picking back up with Secret Wars Part 7. Now, here's the thing about Secret Wars, right? As much as I love Jonathan Hickman, he is not without his faults. And if I'm being honest with you guys, I never agreed with the idea that Secret Wars was nine parts. I always felt like Secret Wars should have been about 12 parts. And the reason why is because there's a lot that happens in this story, but as much that happens in like these final issues and issues seven, eight, and nine, it could have been expanded a lot more if we'd seen more issues. Now, such as it was, for those of you guys who remember when this story first came out, because I do. It was late constantly. <laughs> In fact, Marvel launched all new, all different Marvel before Secret Wars was finished. And so we actually found out how the story ended before the story actually ended, right? Which is kind of disappointing. But the long and short of this is that I feel like more could have been done. But regardless, this is basically the point at which we have, what's in effect, the rebel leader, right? The prophet, as he's been called. Now, once the prophet reveals himself, we basically end up finding out it's Maximus the Mad. But here's the importance of this, right? Here's why this matters. It's not what Jonathan Hickman tells us is what Jonathan Hickman doesn't directly tell us. So the way this whole idea with the prophet and the uprising and the way all this happened is that God King Doom was a guy who basically ruled Battleworld in the same way he ruled Latveria. In the main Marvel universe before the events of Secret Wars, when Doctor Doom was simply just the king of Latveria, he resided within his own tower, but he would almost never go among the people. And in fact, that's one of the things that, that he made reference to uh, that Hickman really kind of gave us in, in during the events of Avengers and New Avengers, which is why the stories kind of fit together so well. If you recall that moment where Namor the Submariner, after he formed the Cabal and then lost control and ended up approaching Doctor Doom, Doctor Doom told him no. He basically said, do you believe that if my, my constituents wanted to get rid of me that they couldn't, that they couldn't tear me down, they couldn't find some way to destroy me, but they love me. I give them a place to, I give them a place to sleep. I give them a place they call home and I keep them safe. And so before they go to bed at night and they pray whatever to whatever God they believe in, they give thanks to me. That kind of arrogance and that kind of hubris has ultimately cost Doom everything because the assumption was that when he became God King Doom, he could rule in the same way that he ruled Latveria. But there's a difference between ruling a singular kingdom that sees you as this absolute God and ruling an entire place of people who have only really known you for about eight years or so. They believe that it's always been that way, but belief is a very, a very thin line of logic. Beliefs can change at any point in time. And that was the whole idea behind the revolution, the uprising, and the prophet is that people never saw God King Doom. He never spent time among them. And so they saw him as a being who exists out there, but they lost faith in him very, very fast because he never really did anything to show his power, to show that he was absolute outside of the creation of Battleworld. People's belief in him existed by way of things he had previously done, not things he's doing now. And so because of that, that faith began to turn into questioning. It began to turn into, is he really as powerful as he says he is? Is he really able to do all these things? That basically seeded the, the downfall of Doom insofar that all it took was one person to come along and to organize that failing faith, right? All it took was one person to come along and to stoke those fires of doubt in God King Doom and then create just a giant flaming inferno. And that's what Maximus did. But Maximus has only been doing this for the last three weeks, right? Remember, Maximus was part of the group, part of the cabal that came out of that craft. And then when Doctor Strange scattered everybody to the winds, Maximus was scattered with them. But Maximus doing this was done at the behest of the Maker, right? To find a way to bring down Victor Von Doom. And the easiest way to bring down a god whose existence can't really be verified because you never see him is to simply just not believe in him. And that's it's a true statement. For example, like if we looked at the real world here and you took the god of Abraham from Christianity here in America, and then suddenly everybody stopped believing in him, then of what, of what significance would he have? And that's how it is with God King Doom. And that's what kind of led to all this stuff, you know, all this, this, this total collapse. And so once that takes place, of course, the prophet Maximus basically leads all of his forces directly to the realm of Dr. Doom. Now, the other part of this is that you end up seeing Black Swan, who basically says like, you know, as your right hand, if you want Doom, I will go down there and I can help turn the tide in your favor. And his response is no. It's one of these things where it's like, those who stood against me will be judged. And ultimately you kind of have Susan Storm kind of cast it off and say, well, this is going to be just like all the other times before, right? All the other times people rose up against you and you quelled that, that threat, you know, by using your Thors, it'll be just the same way. But Valeria says, no, this is different, right? This is something more. And Doom says, yes. He says, summon my Thors. That's where Doom solidifies his collapse. Because if, if people, if the entire basis behind this rebellion is stemmed in the fact that people never see Doom, and so they don't really know what power he possesses outside of the few times that he may use it to make somebody do something when they're in the various courts, right? When he made everybody kneel or something like that, 
then no one's going to be concerned about him. But if he had shown up down here, right? If he had just teleported down here and just wiped out all the all the forces that were disloyal to him, that would solidify his power, right? That would solidify what he has and people's faith would return to him because in turn, it's okay. He is as powerful as he says he is. Like God King Doom really is the person that he claims to be. And so with that being the case, you of course have Sinister and his guys who step in. Now, Sinister has kind of taken, or at least Carol Danvers has kind of joined Sinister. And so far as like she's sort of on his side, been manipulated and kind of become the darker version of herself. But they also end up turning on Baroness Madeline Pryor. This is one of these instances where I say another two or three issues would have done it well because it would have expanded on this a little bit. Such as it is, the only real beef these two have is the fact that, you know, Sinister had to kind of acquiesce to a degree, right? They have kind of a, a tenuous alliance and that's it, right? That, that's really all it is. But Sinister just doesn't like her. And that's kind of the reason for him to turn on her, but also because of the fact that Sinister is looking around at everything that's happening and as an opportunist is saying the winning side is not God King Doom. But the problem is that as soon as that happens, right, he's basically attacked from behind and then his head is chopped off. Of course, he's killed by Holocaust, but he was attacked from behind by Apocalypse and Apocalypse arrives here on the scene. Now, this is one of those times when I would have read this like a single issue of Apocalypse fighting all the Thors by himself because it's amazing when it happens, right? We only get it for like half a page, but it's amazing when it happens because you basically have Apocalypse kind of talking trash to Sinister a little bit saying like, you know, I'm glad to be back here on the battlefield, this place of testing, right? Where the strong are lifted up and the weak are basically eliminated, right? Their inability to survive in this harsh conflict means they were never fit to survive in the first place. And it's just one of these things where you kind of, you kind of switch over to Doom Guard, right? The arrival of the Thors. But the funny thing is that where Doom experiences all these Thors to come raining down and really on his side, it doesn't happen. And the reason why is because when all the different superheroes were scattered across Battleworld, Jane Foster Thor was sent to uh, sent to, to Doom Guard, right? She was basically sent there to be among the Thors. And when she arrived here, she seeded doubt, right? She told all the Thors here, I've known Doom for a long time. And this, this world that you believe is not what it is. It's not always been this way. This guy's been spilling lies. He's been telling you lies nonstop since he came to power. He didn't create everything. He's not the reason why everything is the way that it is. There was a life and there was a multiverse before God King Doom. He's simply just been lying to you about your entire history. But rise up against him, cast him off, and let's recreate things and make things better. And while there have been a bunch of uh, a bunch of the Thors here who disagreed, that it kind of led to a massive sort of conflict, right? You had the faithful versus the unfaithful. And in that moment, you basically have, you know, Jane Foster Thor, who brings a stop to the whole conflict and calls on all the Thors and says, you know in your hearts that my words are true. You know that something's wrong here, that something's not right here, that things are off, and you know that God King Doom is the source of it. You know that he is not even, he's, he's not a god. He's not a good god. He's not what you believe he is. Help me fight him off. Come to my aid, right? Fight alongside me and let's bring, let's bring God King Doom down. And that's exactly what the Thors do. They ally themselves with Jane Foster's cause against God King Doom and God King Doom is betrayed yet again. Now, at this point, we switch over to Apocalypse, right? This is the thing, this is the point that I love the most, right? And, uh, let me tell you something. I love this the most, right? Apocalypse has always been one of my favorite characters in Marvel Comics. And really up until, really, I guess after the point that Walter and Louise Simonson left the X-Men or left X Factor, he's always kind of just been underused in Marvel Comics. He's never really been used to his full potential. The only exception to that is during Rick Remender's Uncanny X-Force, right? Which is an amazing story. If you guys want me to cover that, let me know. There's a lot of older stories, you know, from like the mid 2000s, from like maybe 10 years ago that we just never really covered. So like, let me know if you guys want me to cover that kind of stuff, right? Because it's an amazing story, right? Like it takes place in the future and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, it's, it's Wolverine's X-Factor team uh, or really X-Force team. It's a really, really cool story. But the idea behind this is that Apocalypse basically takes on a full contingent of the Thor core and holds them off. This is Apocalypse versus like 15 Thors, right? By himself. And that's possible, right? That's possible with Apocalypse. You're talking about a guy who can control the density of his body, a guy that can give himself virtually any superhuman power. And this is the age of Apocalypse version of Apocalypse. He was brokenly overpowered, right? Like, like that 1990s version of Apocalypse, it was nuts how powerful he was. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> the age of Apocalypse version of his character would crush Apocalypse from the main Marvel universe, right? It was it was nuts. It was kind of wild. But you basically have this thing where, where, where Apocalypse is talking to Sinister and he's like, you can fall no further, Sinister. Like your head's been chopped off. You've been proven to be weak. You're not a person that can make it in this world of testing. Your condition can get no worse. And he says, really? Well, I believe that it can. And that's when this massive, right? Just this massive ship. And if you guys who read Secret Wars originally, you know exactly what's coming. This massive ship comes floating over top of the whole battlefield field, right? Just this massive vessel. It's just like this huge shield 
helicarrier and he says i think it can for the maestro is here right maestro hulk has arrived you have maestro hulk who steps up on top of the platform surveys the entirety of battle world surveys this whole massive conflict and he says world breakers go and then just like this army of hulks this army of world breaker hulks just descends down on this whole battle and dude it's, it's like damn dude as soon as that happened i was like what it was bonkers man it was crazy man i was just like wow dude like there's a whole army of hulks here now like it's crazy and so what you end up doing is you switch over to reed richards right like the the, the maker and reed richards and that's when the maker reveals this has all been my plan right this huge uprising fanning the flames of this of this revolution this has all been my doing organizing the my Maestro, bringing together the profit. I put all of this together. And here's the funny thing. It's a great plan. Like, yes, Maker's a bad guy, but like he literally helped to orchestrate it really by, by virtue of his actions, single-handedly orchestrated the downfall of God King Doom. Now from the other side, that's when the more, the more subtle hand begins to come into play in the form of the main Marvel Universe Reed Richards. And he says, okay, now we have to unleash our plan, right? We unleash my part of the plan. This is probably the single best moment of this whole comic. You guys, man, you guys, you guys who read this originally, Y'all know what I'm y'all know what I'm talking about. We switch over to T'Challa. We switch over to Black Panther. And Reed says, are you ready? And he's like, yes. And he says, okay, if this fails, there's no success for us. We will lose. There's no way for us to come out on top. And so he says, if this happens and we don't make it, then that means this is the end. And Black Panther says, then I will see you on the other side, my friend. He says, trust me, death is just a different kind of journey to a land that I am the king of. And he says, until then, Reed, good luck. Remember, Black Panther's the king of the dead, right? He was made that, he was put in that position by the Panther God Bass after he lost his role of Black Panther to his sister Shuri, or really gave it up to his sister Shuri. And so it's one of these things where Namor's is kind of like, you know, while you were saying that, I nearly started crying. <laughs> it's hilarious but what where they're at the reason why this matters is they're at the shield right they're at the wall that separates battle world from like all of the marvel zombies out there right black panther takes some explosives and throws them at the wall and blows a giant hole in the wall he sets up the siege courageous and as soon as that wall blows open the question is is is, is like namor he's like why are we here like what's on the other side of that wall and black panther says the dead and he basically sticks out his hand and all the the, the skin of like all these zombies starts itching right they all kind of start kneeling and one of them's like it's easier it's better when you kneel and he says listen to me it is said that one who travels through a siege courageous is granted a new life a second chance an opportunity to become something better to be something more come with me and we will travel through it to the greatest battle any world has ever seen together we'll face a false god and strike him down do you know what they call what is waiting for you on the other side of the siege courageous glory and honor and that's when when Higwin kind of tells tells us Black Panther basically controls the dead. Like that's, he's the king of the dead, right? Like they're compelled to follow him because he effectively rules over all of them. And so it's one of these things where they're kind of like, I mean, we're, we're, we're compelled to follow you, but like, why? Like, maybe we should talk about this, you know? Like, it's, it's it, you know, maybe we should kind of have a conversation about this. And that's when you have Name of the Submariner who chimes in, and he's like, what are you guys waiting for? Your king is waiting for an answer. Your king has asked you to join him in the greatest battle that any world has ever seen, and you're hesitating? And so, so you basically have, you know, Jamie Braddock, who's like, so glory and honor? And they're like, glory and honor! And so Black Panther basically leads all of the Marvel zombies into the battle against God King Doom. All right, what's going on guys? This is Rob. Um, I've got stuff that I got to do today. I have an amazing day today, which by the way, uh, make sure you guys come over to twitch.tv slash eat codes tonight. Myself and Mariah are gonna be playing Fall Guys and doing drinking games. <laughs> <laughs> we're literally probably gonna get drunk on stream, but uh, it's gonna be amazing. But uh, we're picking back up with Secret Wars, right? We're picking back up with Secret Wars and we're near the end. We are on issue number eight and there are nine issues. I wish there'd been 12, but such as it is, we only have nine. So in the last video, we talked about how this massive battle at the at Doomstat, at the realm of God King Doom, was basically leading to the fall of everything, right? The collapse of, of Doomguard. And the whole point behind this was, or at least one of the major things that happened here is you had the arrival of Maestro and his world breakers, right? Which was more than enough to turn the tide of battle. But the other thing that we had going on here, and I'm not entirely sure that we covered this, was Thanos traveling to the shield. Now we did cover the segment where Thanos got to the shield, but once he was there, he actually ended up having a conversation with the face of Ben Grimm, where we 
basically learned that the thing was the shield that protected battle world from all the other threats that were out there right the annihilation horde marvel zombies all that kind of stuff and the way this played out was that thanos had really kind of told ben Grimm, like you've been lied to this whole time that in another universe in another time and place long before the creation of battle world that there was existence there were things that were there that you were told this has always been this way by god king doom and that was a falsehood more so than that in the world before this the reality before all of this you were a hero like you were a superhero right and so essentially it's you've been lied to this whole time are you going to take that sitting down or are you going to stand up and it was thanos playing on the nature of ben Grimm. ben Grimm, to a degree is a very prideful character but more so than that he believes in doing what's right and if god king doom is in fact a false king and he's ruling battle world under false pretenses then thing basically believes in standing up to that right he believes in confronting god king doom and bringing that to an end also because god king doom lied when he said that his family was dead in fact they're all alive all that kind of stuff but the reality of this is that ben Grimm shows up here and immediately attacks maestro right immediately starts going to town on maestro and in doing so basically crushes the ship and seems to destroy maestro in the process now do i believe that ben Grimm could kill the maestro no and just because you're of a certain size does not mean that your strength increases proportionally but i guess we can kind of assume that it does with ben Grimm. and keep in mind this is an alternate version of the thing right this is not the main marvel universe version of his character so it could be that he's stronger than maestro right again that's what you're dealing with when it comes to alternate reality characters whose powers aren't fully fleshed out right we're kind of left to believe that he's similar but we can kind of guess and, and make our own call but the other part of that is that there's a massive explosion that takes place and initially the response of black swan is that the rebels have basically breached the castle but the response of doom is no right we would know if the lowest levels have been breached that must have been something else and so what you end up getting is basically black swan who kind of goes to investigate and you've got valeria richards you know who's kind of like okay you know like there's not a whole lot we can do here right like basically the whole realm of battle world is essentially falling in this massive conflict but the next thing that happens is you have terax the enlightened who if you guys recall during jonathan hickman's avengers and new avengers was the herald of galactus in an alternate reality and when he sees this version of galactus standing here he initially approaches him and says hey like you know in an alternate reality i was your herald i will be your herald again and then he's killed by galactus and we end up finding out this isn't really galactus as we know him instead it's basically franklin richards using him as a kind of puppet and we also sort of always knew that but it is really the most pure display of the power of franklin right we saw that during hickman's fantastic four that franklin richards as an adult resurrected galactus from the dead it only makes sense to kind of continue the jonathan hickman theme of writing that franklin richards would basically take over galactus he would control him and use him for whatever his own ends are now the reality of this is it doesn't really seem to be galactus as we know him it's really more of him just kind of in a in almost kind of like a dead state so to speak and franklin just using him in that way but regardless there's a massive battle that takes place between franklin and galactus here or really just franklin and ben Grimm, and you kind of get this this thing where once franklin basically reveals the fact that he is in effect the son of god king doom that's when you know ben Grimm begins to pick up like okay wait a minute so you're susie's kid right and he's like yeah it's like so you're telling me that susan storm married dr doom and they had kids together and the response of franklin is yeah and the and the issue is that ben Grimm can't attack franklin right he's his nephew he's like i'm not gonna kill you like i'm not gonna kill you here i can't kill my own family so you do whatever it is that you have to do and franklin richards does that he literally blows ben Grimm apart right he kills ben Grimm on the spot which was nuts when it happened it was like geez everything is quite literally collapsing the other thing that goes on here and it's kind of a small little moment here is of course you have the maker and you have reed richards in the main marvel universe who basically locate the source of dr doom's power thanks to the efforts of peter parker and miles morales and then essentially travel to that location leaving uh peter quill behind in order to keep an eye on the ship right to basically make sure that nobody takes the ship but the other thing that goes on is there's this massive explosion right this kind of you know huge kind of you know huge boom that takes place and that's when doom realizes here they come right because with ben Grimm basically abandoning his role of the shield it leaves a gaping hole right and doom knew that from that hole would come like the annihilation horde or something like that and that's exactly what happened the annihilation horde comes pouring in all of whom are led by thanos and so with that happening you basically have valeria who tells her mom come with me right like it's important that you understand the bigger picture here we've been lied to for a long time you need to really understand what's going on here with dr doom the other part of this this is probably one of the coolest moments in the whole story you pick back up with peter quill right and you have black swan who shows up here to confront peter quill you know where he's kind of looking at the ship making sure that it's all in good working order you know she's like what are you doing you know he, he spots her and it's like what are you doing and she's like i'm serving my god right destroying those who stand against him and so it becomes obvious right off the bat the two of them are going to fight and peter quill does what he always does which is kind of goof off and joke around that kind of a thing you know he kind of tells her like do not come back here like like do not come here if you do like you're gonna fall right i'm not the kind of guy who deals with like idle threats i'm not the kind of guy who's 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 you know kind of goes along with 
that sort of stuff. Like, I'm a genuine tough guy, right? The next scene, he goes flying through a wall. And he's like, my spleen! <laughs> And so with that being the case, he's like, okay, he starts rifling through, you know, the various parts of him. And he's like, I'm trying to find, like, I can't find this thing. Like, like, where is this thing? And ultimately ends up locating it. And so he tells, you know, this thing that he's looking for, he tells Black Swan, like, back off. Like, if you don't, I will use this. And she's like, what is this, some kind of idle threat? Like a man with nothing left to lose thinks he can intimidate me with some false threat. And he's like, okay, just remember, I told you so. And he takes this little twig and he throws it into the world tree, right? He says, say hello to my little friend. And he throws it into the world tree. And then the world tree basically turns into Groot. <laughs> Groot grows to this monumental size and just explodes out of Castle Doom. And it's like, oh my God, right? From there, you pick up with Susan and Valeria who are going to the location of Doctor Doom's power only to meet with like Reed Richards from the main Marvel Universe and like the maker. And Reed is just kind of like, hello, Susan, kind of dismissive to a degree. But then you jump from them and you pick up with Thanos, right? And this is probably the coolest moment in the whole story, right? Thanos shows up, like once God King Doom arrives on the scene, Thanos shows up and is like, enough. And that's when God King Doom greets Thanos. And he, and he asks him, he says like, you brought this, you brought down the wall, you pierced the shield, you did all this so carefully and costly, but for what? Right? For this? Like to, to bring down Battleworld? Is that really what it was? Like, do you want to be a baron of the waste to rule the Annihilation Horde? If that's what you want to do, then do that, right? I will permit you to keep the Horde, you know, and, and basically it's an embodiment of my goodwill, right? I'm presenting you with a gift. And Thanos is offended. He's like, you present me with a gift? Like, you forget I was a god once, right? The Infinity Gauntlet gave me that power. And when I was a god, I did not use those powers as a mortal would, as you have, saving what you can. No, I wielded them as a god should, in judgment of all living things. And that's when he calls Doom out. He's like, you're a pretender. You're a weak god, right? This power controls you. You do not control this power. It is you who should bow to me. Dr. Doom is like, but do you have an infinity gauntlet right now? And the response of, of Thanos is no, but I'm still Thanos, the mad titan, the great tyrant. And, that, and for you, that will be enough. Doom plunges his hand into the heart of Thanos and just incinerates him and he's like it looks like that's not true and so then he in turn looks to Annihilus and he's like you owe me for this you and not you allied yourself with Thanos with the intention of coming here and bringing down my empire I am owed penance for this and so there are heretics attacking my castle you will destroy them like your annihilation horde will travel to this location and it will destroy them now with the with the incredible hulks with the world breakers just kind of lambasting everything Groot making his way towards Galactus and all this pandemonium happening suddenly the siege courageous opens and and it's just kind of like okay like something's coming through and then that's when all these zombies start pouring out and doom's like crap like <laughs> it's what he didn't account for right like these zombies come pouring through and there's so many of them and they are for the most part technically immortal there's no real way to kill them they take over these incredible hulks like that right like i mean literally they all start falling before the hulks doom's doing what he can blasting them with his power and trying to destroy as many of them as he can and then suddenly you have black panther who shows up comes through the siege courageous with the infinity gauntlet and says doom your reign is over and it ends with us black panther with the infinity gauntlet versus god king doom all right, what's going on, guys? This is Rob, and we are picking back up again with Secret Wars conclusion. Uh, we are wrapping this whole thing up. In the last video, we basically covered Black Panther and probably the greatest moment of his of, of the character's history, I think, when he basically led an army of the dead while wielding the Infinity Gauntlet against God King Doom. But as soon as he shows up here, he immediately calls calls Doom out, right? He's like, look, like your whole, like this is all over, right? This is this is all done. And initially he kind of looks at this and he believes that it's Black Panther's doing, right? That it's basically this great big huge scenario where you've got all these, you got all these armies that are descended on battle world, right? You've got zombies and all this kind of stuff. And it looks like something that Black Panther did. He's incredibly intelligent in that way. And that's why Doom kind of says, this looks like something that you would do because we've seen this kind of thing happen before, right? Doom War, when Dr. Doom invaded La or invaded Wakanda, we've seen this kind of thing play out. Even though Black Panther was more or less on his way out by then, we've seen that play out. And so in response, like it's it's one of these things where Black Panther is kind of like, you know, to, to, to be a God, like being good, having all this power and all that kind of stuff, you can't have that. You're mortal, right? You're basically there's not a whole lot to you. Like you're basically pretending to be a god as if you're somehow higher than everybody else, but you fall prey to the same moral fallacies that everybody else does. And so it's, it's the same thing where he kind of calls out Black Panther and says, are you really any different here? And, and in reality, Black Panther kind of sees himself fighting on the side of righteousness. And in a lot of ways he is, right? He's not as emotionally invested in battle world as God King Doom is. But the result is that he basically ends up using the Infinity Gauntlet to rematerialize Doom to essentially turn him into glass, it would seem. And then you have Namor the Submariner who throws a spear and then shatters it all. And he's kind of like, 
like there's no way it could be that easy right there's no way it could be that easy to destroy god king doom and the response of black panther is no it's not i mean it's not that simple of course doom ends up reconstituting himself and then he says fine if that's how you want to do this if you want to fight in this way then let's fight the way gods fight let's fight above the clouds you know let's fight in the sky right let's fight in the heavens the way the gods would fight now this right here is inherently the problem with dr doom and it's the big difference between dr doom and black panther in terms of how they rule their kingdoms and in terms of how they see themselves right it's why the attempts of dr doom to call out black panther didn't really work here because t'challa is a is a king of the people and and really for him his loyalty is strictly to his people and the, the funny thing about it is doom is much the same way in the sense that he loves and cares about his Lat latverian people and he loves and cares about the people here too the major difference between these two guys is how they see themselves in relation to their people that black panther sees himself as one of his people dr doom sees himself above his people and that's kind of the big difference there right his arrogance is sort of what always kind of seemed to be his shortcoming that's something that we'll actually you know sort of revisit here in a little while and so from here we transition over to reed richards right well i guess both versions the ultimate universe reed richards who we call the maker and then reed richards from the main marvel universe the one that you guys are all familiar with and you basically have him you know have, kind of have susan storm and valeria arriving on the scene around the same time that both reeds show up here in order to access the source of dr doom's power and susan immediately calls him out right the only real knowledge she has of reed richards are the pictures she saw when basically it looked like he and the rest of the uh the heroes who survived the incursions had killed dr strange and that's where reed's kind of like i'm not the one who did this right like i'm not the one who killed stephen strange i'm not responsible for that right it was doom and where she responds and says you mean god he says no i mean victor right victor von doom is not some god that you believe he is however well intentioned this world of his is i mean to put things back to the way they're supposed to be i mean to end this charade and it's one of these things where he's like this is not the life that you were supposed to have right you were never supposed to be married to dr doom right it's not the life that valeria was supposed to have and it's not the life that franklin was supposed to have now notice this the the on the surface you kind of look at this as yeah i mean reed's right right it's not the life they're supposed to have you know they're supposed to be living in a certain way no no no. reed's angry here and he's jealous to a degree right he's angry because of the fact that doom stole his life and he's he's jealous because of the fact that doom has his life right like he's he's angry and jealous in those ways and it's one of these things where it's like these this really isn't the way things are supposed to be you're supposed to be with me that's basically what this is right like you're supposed to be my wife you're supposed to be with me these are supposed to be my kids and it makes sense right i mean keep in mind this is susan storm and valeria they're not from this universe right like they're they're not from the main marvel universe they were from some alternate reality where reed richards never existed or basically was never part of the fantastic four that's where they come from so they they've never met reed right they've never had any kind of a life with reed but reed is kind of talking to the susan storm that he remembers having and the valeria he remembers having in them through what's basically you know susan storm and valeria here because these are the biological children of dr doom right susan and franklin or i'm sorry uh, valeria and franklin are the biological kids of doom and so it's kind of like you know i'm gonna like i'm going to end all this right i'm going to end this whole great big huge farce and you have this really cool battle something that kind of takes place here on the side you have this massive battle between doom and black panther and it's cool insofar as it's almost very reminiscent of like the old like mad jim jasper stories reality was being twisted and distorted in a whole bunch of just crazy wonky looking ways and that's what's going on here more so than that these two are even the power of the infinity gauntlet appears to be equal to the power of god king doom now there's a reason for this god king doom despite having the power of the beyonders does not have the totality of the beyonders power that's owen reese owen reese has all the power of the beyonders unto himself and he lends it he gives a portion of it to god king doom to allow doom to do what he needs to do and what this seems to indicate is that the portion of power that, that dr doom has is equal to the power of the infinity gauntlet now why is that the case because the story had to be told that's really the long and short of it right and i'm not even trying to be glib the story needed to be told and that's why we are the way we are but it makes it cool and it makes it interesting because you end up having both reeds who basically show up here and they encounter the molecule man and it's one of these things where dr doom and black panther are kind of reduced down to just bare knuckle fist fighting is really what it kind of comes down to but you've also got you know both reeds talking directly to the molecule man and in the midst of this conversation the maker basically create like kind of brings out this device and immediately targets reed richards from the main marvel universe and what this device is designed to do is create what's essentially a temporal bubble that in the universe that the maker comes from in the ultimate universe this technology was used to basically hyper evolve people but what it can be done or what it can be used for here is to actually reverse people's aging to essentially make them younger to reverse them revert them back on an evolutionary state and that's what happens with with reed he literally starts reverting back and turning in you know going into a primate form and then will seemingly kind of continue down until there's basically nothing left whatsoever but while that's happening where he kind of makes this offhanded remark you know he basically kind of tells him like like when we were up there and you were talking to susan you were displaying a kind of weakness that cannot be tolerated you were showing emotion and that kind of weakness cannot be tolerated here you've become a threat right you've become a liability and that's why he was targeted the way he was and so when he kind of 
Nevada asks who's interested in a weepy god, the response of the Molecule Man is me. And he basically kills the maker, right? He literally just kind of cuts him into pieces, turns him into what looks like pizza, and then presumably devours it. Like he eats the, he eats the maker. And then he tells Reed like, wake up, right? Like Doom's gonna be here soon. And so you kind of have this fight going down between between T'Challa and, and Doom, and Dr. Doom ultimately ends up getting the upper hand, which you wouldn't think would be the case because of the fact that, you know, Dr. Doom is just a guy who's pretty decent at fighting, you would assume, and Black Panther's a master of like multiple martial arts. You end up finding out that Black Panther actually let himself lose here. And the reason why is because this was all designed to be a ruse. It was designed to keep Dr. Doom looking to the left while Reed and everybody moved on the right. And so in his frustration and his irritation, Doom teleports directly to where, to basically essentially to where Reed and all those guys are, right? He teleports directly to their location. And that's when he confronts Richard. This is all you're doing. This is all your scheme. Like all of this is, is it reeks of you. It reeks of something that you would do. It smells like Reed Richards. And he kind of says like what I've done here, like while you may want to tear this down, while you may want to say that, that you could find a better solution, there is no better solution here, right? Your entire life, you've been distracted with the modern concerns so precious to you and your kind, ethics and order and society. When all that's ever mattered was survival. I saved millions. Owen saved millions. He says, what was it you said when you appeared here on my world? All you could save was yourself. You couldn't even save your own family. That right there pisses off Reed, right? He's like, how dare you? He's like, I'm God King Doom. I've dared quite a bit. And he basically goes to snap his fingers and kill Reed and nothing happens. And the reason why is because what Molecule Man's done is shut off Dr. Doom's access to the Beyonder's powers. Now it's just Dr. Doom in his base form versus Reed in his base form. Now, here's the thing to understand here about this, about this, this conflict. This is easy to look at as something that's just kind of been there, right? This is just Reed Richards and Dr. Doom fighting at the end of Secret Wars order to decide what happens next. No, 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 no. This is a bad, this is a, a fist fight. Like this is a bare knuckle, drag out, knockdown fist fight that's been waiting to happen for decades. Just from a publishing standpoint, we've been waiting for this since like the introduction of Dr. Doom and the Fantastic Four. There's always been instances where Doom has always been jealous of Reed and there's been instances where Reed was jealous of, of, of Doom. But regardless of this of the scenario, this is the most bare bones, like died in the wool, natural conflict between these two guys. Just bare bones, knock down, drag out, bare knuckle fighting. More so than that, there's personal animosity here. The stance of Doom is like, does Reed really think this was easy? That any of this has ever been easy? That would power really make choices more palatable? That if anything, it makes them harder. Because when you're a person who just rules over a kingdom, all you really have to care about, all you really have to concern yourself about is whether or not the people in that kingdom stay loyal to you. And there's there's things you have to do in order to ensure that, right? Make sure that they're they're safe, they're comfortable, that kind of a thing. But when you're standing at the end of all things, right? The end of the multiverse, and you have this absolute power at your disposal, and you have to pick and choose between who lives and who dies, that's a heavy burden, right? Heavy is the head that wears the crown, but it's the choice that Doom made. And that means he accepted all the burden that came with it. So the question becomes this, if Dr. Doom accepted the struggle of what it meant to be king, does he now have any real justification to complain about it, right? You can't be a person who says, I believe in getting up at five o'clock every morning and then complain about getting up at five o'clock every morning, right? It was your choice. <laughs> you chose this. You now have no reason to complain because it was a choice you made. If you don't like it, do something about it. And it's kind of interesting here because the stance of Reed is the difficult thing for him was sitting there in this time period, right? And, and you know, once he once he emerged from this this vessel and realized that Doom had basically stolen his life, he had to sit there and watch while he planned and while he schemed and while he mechanized in order to bring Doom down. He had to all the while take those feelings and push them down in order to make sure he did what needed to be done, right? That that Doom really did steal the family. He stole the life of, of Reed Richards. He wanted to become Reed. And that's the funny thing about this is that what it shows is that Doom's life is dissatisfactory, right? He doesn't, he doesn't enjoy it. He's unhappy with the life he has when he compares it to the life of Reed Richards. He wants Reed's life. He wants to be Reed. Like he wants to have that lifestyle. And I would dare say it's not even the nature of being like an explorer or any, anything like that. It's the fact that Reed never gives up, right? Reed never quits. That Reed always keeps going. Reed Richards is kind of the walking, talking embodiment of what a superhero is in, in Marvel Comics. He's Marvel Comics most person, at least on, on a person, a personality level, is the most pure version of Superman that you could get. That Doom, in comparing himself to Reed, feels like a half measure. And so that's one of the things where he, he, he asked Reed Richards, like, do you believe that you could have done better? Like, you think you're better than I am. And the response of Reed is, no, I don't think I'm better than you are. I think you could have been better than what you were. And he says, no, 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 no. In this moment right now, do you believe that if you had all this power, you believe that if you had had attained the power of the Beyonders at the end of all things, at the edge of all creation, the edge of the, of the multiverse, the end of it, do you believe that if that power had gone to you, that you could have, you could have done 
much better than me. You believe that, don't you? And Reed's response is yes. And so do you. And the response to Doom is he's he's like, yes, damn you. Like, I I agree. Like, I agree with what you're saying, Reed. Like, like Victor has basically acquiesces here and says, Yes, fine, you're right. If you had had this power, you probably would have done a better job than I had. Owen Reese hears that and says, Well, if both of you agree, snap, right? That's the end of Battle World. Just like that. Boom! It all basically comes to an end. That you end up having Owen Reese, who gives all of his power, who, who, who basically takes away the power power that Dr. Doom had and he gives it to Reed Richards. Now, in these moments when everything is dying and everything is being destroyed, Susan Storm, Valeria Franklin, like they're all dead. Like they're all basically being destroyed here. Uh, you know, everybody on Battleworld, one of the only people who survives is when you when you have T'Challa, who literally looks like he holds on to the reality stone. I know it's not red. The color of the stones change all the time in Marvel Comics, right? Just because it's red in the MCU doesn't mean anything, right? The reality stone, I think, has been like two or three different colors over the course of Marvel's publication history, but he grabs a stone and holds on to it to basically allow himself to like survive the whole experience. Everything seems to go back to normal and he basically wakes up in Wakanda, kind of comes to in Wakanda. The stone is destroyed, but he's there, right? He's there right back at basically where all of this started. And so Black Panther kind of looks around and says like right now, you know, in, in, in this world that we live in, this earth that we live on, that space has basically been abandoned by humanity. That there was a time in human history when humans explore the spaceways, right? When in, insofar as like we went to the moon and th different things like that. But politics and other priorities and spending have given way or have kind of overtaken that. So humanity has lost its edge in exploration. Humanity doesn't care about exploring things and doesn't really doesn't really care about improving itself anymore. Humanity cares about money. And so we as Wakandans, we will be the ones to lead humanity into a better future, right? We will drag humanity to the stars. We will drag them into the future, even if they don't want to go. We will make them go there, right? We will make humanity become the best version of itself. And this is our very first time. It's our very first time that we as a Wakandan civilization are looking to the stars and actually leaving the planet, right? It's a big deal. The other part of this, the next thing that happens is we end up finding out that Miles Morales, who up to this point in the Ultimate Universe, his mom had died, that Owen Reese actually resurrects her from the dead when everything seems to go back to normal because of the fact that Miles Morales brought him a sandwich, right? He basically says, I owe you one, right? For giving me a burger. And so he basically helps to kind of complete Miles' life because up to the time that this story was written back in 2015, a major part of Miles' life was that he struggled with the fact that he didn't have his mom. He struggled with that, with not having her in his life, right? With the fact that she had basically died. That was something that was a huge, a huge turning point for his character when it happened, right? When his mom died, it was a massive hit for him. And so then you basically pick up with kind of what's going on here, right? With, with, you kind of pick up eight months later, you know, with everything that's sort of going on in this moment. And you basically kind of get this explanation of what was happening with regards to the collab, right? You know, when, when everything kind of was destroyed, right? When battle world came to an end and when that power was passed on to Reed Richards, that what Reed Richards did is what he believed Dr. Doom should have done the entire time. That at that point in time, when the incursions completed, right? When we got to the end of Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, there was no stopping the collapse of the multiverse, right? There was nothing Reed could have done to end that. The difference is that Dr. Doom made it, he made himself a king, right? He made a kingdom unto himself. What Reed Richards believed should have been done is that it should have been recreated, right? That once the Beyonders were basically destroyed, the multiverse should have been recreated again. Things should have been set back to the way they were before with a few changes here and there. Now, this is where a lot of people like myself said, Marvel missed a golden opportunity to reboot. And, and I still say to this day, Marvel got cold feet. I still say that Marvel got cold feet and they ended up not rebooting because of the fact that they were scared, but it would have been the smartest move to make, right? Because while Reed says things should have gone back to the way they were before, they may very well could have. And in fact, they actually did. But the beauty of a reboot is that it could basically kind of retell these stories, not really retell the same old stories, but basically kind of give us a fresh start for new people, right? The way DC did with the new 52. Instead, they didn't do that. But what Reed's doing here is he's kind of have a multifaceted system going on. Owen Reese, to kind of start with him, he's the foundation of all of this. Owen Reese is currently in the in possession of the totality of the Beyonder's power, right? He's in, in, in total possession of that. And so what Owen Reese is doing, basically he's serving as this unlimited repository of power because in creating these universes, basically Owen Reese has the ability to create these universes, right? So he has the power that can be used to create the universes. Franklin Richards basically coalesces that power into the form of a universe as a universal shaper. And then Reed Richards is the one who kind of directs Franklin Richards in terms of what form and fashion these universes should for the most part take. And that each time one of these universes is created, that a portion of Owen Reese is removed and put in that universe, right? That's one of the things that Hickman covered towards the end of Secret Wars is that the, the beginning of the incursions was the fact that you know, an Owen Reese was killed in a, in a different reality and that led to the destruction of his universe and that this ultimately kicked off the whole incursion event. And so it's kind of setting things right, right? There's a different Owen Reese in every single universe. Every universe has to have one. Now you would think, and this is kind of the irony of this, you would think Reed would have kind of looked at that and said, ah, oh, but like maybe we shouldn't though, right? Because like the destruction of an Owen Reese leads to like the death of that universe. So maybe we shouldn't do that. 
that, right? So that on the offhand, if like Owen Reese gets killed again in some universe somewhere that it doesn't start the incursions again, right? We don't have to worry about that. Uh, that probably would have been the smarter move, <laughs> but ultimately not. And the, the funny thing about this is that from Valeria's standpoint, the biggest thing about all this is that they have the ability now, once this, this multiverse is recreated by Owen Reese, Franklin Richards, and, uh, and Reed Richards, that they now get to explore it and to kind of see how all that stuff works. But this was kind of the send off, right? To the, to the Fantastic Four to a degree. But the other thing that we end up finding out here is that Reed has basically brought back Susan and Valeria Franklin, the members of the Future Foundation, right? All these people who had basically perished in the collapse of the multiverse, right? In that little moment when the Ultimate Universe and the main Marvel Universe were crashing into each other, he brought them back, right? He, he basically restored them. And we know that because Susan looks at him and says like the, the life raft had broken and I thought we were done and then you saved us, right? So Reed had gone back to that moment, right? Right before basically he lost everybody and kind of began reconstituting things. More so than that, he basically says that in looking at what he could do, that there were fundamental things, some small things that he realized he could fix. That Doom had kind of become a person, he kind of become a shut-in and really isolated himself from humanity and his face was really kind of an external manifestation of that. He didn't want people to see who he was and he basically hid himself and hid his face behind a mask. Initially, it was, I don't want people to see my face. That gradually turned into, I don't want people to see me. And that's why he just kind of remained so hidden because that's kind of the, the, the problem with Doom, right? That's one of the major issues is that he's afraid of the world, right? He's, he's, he's afraid of the world seeing him for who he really is and fixing his face, which is exactly what Reed did was a way to kind of make Dr. Doom whole, right? It was a, it was a way to kind of return him to the person that he should have been, right? That if he had never lost his face in the first place and it hadn't set him down this path of isolation, then perhaps all this kind of arrogance that he, the, that he had harbored in his early years would have given way to a bit of modesty and humbleness. Who knows? But at the very least, it's a good shot, right? To just kind of say, hey, I don't really hold grudges against you too bad. Here's your face back. <laughs> but that concludes the event, guys. That wraps up Secret Wars 2015. We are done. Okay, I want to know, what do you guys think, right? I'll post a comment down below. I want to know, know what you guys think. What did you think about the whole run of Jonathan Hickman's Avengers all the way up to Secret Wars? What did you guys think? Because I say to this day, it's probably the single greatest comic book epic that's ever been written. Like, it's amazing. I absolutely love this series of stories. It's, it's so cool. And I'm so glad I remastered it because I just kind of had this itch to remaster the whole thing. And I'm glad we finally finished it. But it's been one heck of a ride. Thank you guys for watching. You guys are amazing. I love you guys to death. <laughs> but if you guys are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Core. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like. And I will catch you all later. Peace. <laughs>